This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Miller, Canal Winchester, Ohio. Eighty Years and More, Chapter One Childhood. The psychical growth of a child is not influenced by days and years, but by the impressions passing events make on its mind. What may prove a sudden awakening to one, giving an impulse in a certain direction that may last for years, may make no impression on another. People wonder why the children of the same family differ so widely, though they have had the same domestic discipline, the same school and church teaching, and have grown up under the same influences and with the same environments. As well wonder why lilies and lilacs in the same latitude are not all alike in color and equally fragrant. Children differ as widely as these in the primal elements of their physical and psychical life. Who can estimate the power of antenatal influences or the child's surroundings in its earliest years, the effect of some passing word or sight on one that makes no impression on another? The unhappiness of one child under a certain home discipline is not inconsistent with the content of another under this same discipline. One yearning for broader freedom is in a chronic condition of rebellion. The other, more easily satisfied, quietly accepts the situation. Everything is seen from a different standpoint. Everything takes its color from the mind of the beholder. I am moved to recall what I can of my early days, what I thought and felt, that grown people may have a better understanding of children and do more for their happiness and development. I see so much tyranny exercised over children, even by well-disposed parents, and in so many varied forms, a tyranny to which these parents are themselves insensible, that I desire to paint my joys and sorrows in as vivid colors as possible, in the hope that I may do something to defend the weak from the strong. People never dream of all that is going on in the little heads of the young, for few adults are given to introspection and those who are incapable of recalling their own feelings under restraint and disappointment can have no appreciation of the sufferings of children who can neither describe nor analyze what they feel. In defending themselves against injustice they are as helpless as dumb animals. What is insignificant to their elders is often to them a source of great joy or sorrow. With several generations of vigorous enterprising ancestors behind me, I commenced the struggle of life under favorable circumstances on the twelfth day of November, 1815, the same year that my father, Daniel Cady, a distinguished lawyer and judge in the state of New York, was elected to Congress. Perhaps the excitement of a political campaign, in which my mother took the deepest interest, may have had an influence on my prenatal life and given me the strong desire that I have always felt to participate in the rights and duties of government. My father was a man of firm character and unimpeachable integrity, and yet sensitive and modest to a painful degree. There were but two places in which he felt at ease, in the courthouse and at his own fireside. Though gentle and tender, he had such a dignified repose and reserve of manner that as children we regarded him with fear rather than affection. My mother, Margaret Livingston, a tall, queenly-looking woman, was courageous, self-reliant, and at her ease under all circumstances and in all places. She was the daughter of Colonel James Livingston, who took an active part in the War of the Revolution. Colonel Livingston was stationed at West Point when Arnold made the attempt to betray that stronghold into the hands of the enemy. In the absence of General Washington and his superior officer, he took the responsibility of firing into the vulture, a suspicious-looking British vessel that lay at anchor near the opposite bank of the Hudson River. It was a fatal shot for André, the British spy, with whom Arnold was then consummating his treason. Hit between wind and water, the vessel spread her sails and hastened down the river, leaving André with his papers to be captured, while Arnold made his escape through the lines before his treason was suspected. On General Washington's return to West Point, he sent for my grandfather and reprimanded him for acting in so important a matter without orders, thereby making himself liable to court-martial. 
but after fully impressing the young officer with the danger of such self-sufficiency on ordinary occasions, he admitted that a most fortunate shot had been sent into the vulture. For, he said, we are in no condition just now to defend ourselves against the British forces in New York, and the capture of this spy has saved us. My mother had the military idea of government, but her children, like their grandfather, were disposed to assume the responsibility of their own actions. Thus the ancestral traits in mother and children modified, in a measure, the dangerous tendencies in each. Our parents were as kind, indulgent, and considerate as the Puritan ideals of those days permitted, but fear, rather than love, of God and parents alike predominated. Add to this our timidity in our intercourse with servants and teachers, our dread of the ever-present devil, and the reader will see that under such conditions nothing but strong self-will and a good share of hope and mirthfulness could have saved an ordinary child from becoming a mere nullity. The first event engraved on my memory was the birth of a sister when I was four years old. It was a cold morning in January when the brawny Scotch nurse carried me to see the little stranger, whose advent was a matter of intense interest to me for many weeks after. The large pleasant room with the white curtains and bright wood fire on the hearth, where panada, catnip, and all kinds of little messes which we were allowed to taste were kept warm, was the center of attraction for the older children. I heard so many friends remark, "'What a pity it is she's a girl!' that I felt a kind of compassion for the little baby. True, our family consisted of five girls and only one boy, but I did not understand at that time that girls were considered an inferior order of beings. To form some idea of my surroundings at this time, imagine a two-story white frame house with a hall through the middle, rooms on either side, and a large back building with grounds on the side and rear which joined the garden of our good Presbyterian minister, the Reverend Simon Hossack, of whom I shall have more to say in another chapter. Our favorite resorts in the house were the garret and cellar. In the former were barrels of hickory nuts, and on a long shelf large cakes of maple sugar and all kinds of dried herbs and sweet flag, spinning wheels, a number of small white cotton bags filled with bundles marked in ink, silk, cotton, flannel, calico, etc., as well as ancient masculine and feminine costumes. Here we would crack the nuts, nibble the sharp edges of the maple sugar, chew some favorite herb, play ball with the bags, whirl the old spinning wheels, dress up in our ancestors' clothes, and take a bird's-eye view of the surrounding country from an enticing scuttle-hole. This was forbidden ground, but nevertheless we often went there on the sly, which only made the little escapades more enjoyable. The cellar of our house was filled in winter with barrels of apples, vegetables, salt meats, cider, butter, pounding barrels, wash tubs, etc., offering admirable nooks for playing hide-and-seek. Two tallow candles threw a faint light over the scene on certain occasions. This cellar was on a level with a large kitchen where we played blind man's buff and other games when the day's work was done. These two rooms are the center of many of the merriest memories of my childhood days. I can recall three colored men, Abraham, Peter, and Jacob, who acted as men-servants in our youth. In turn, they would sometimes play on the banjo for us to dance, taking real enjoyment in our games. They are all at rest now, quote, with old Uncle Ned in the place where the good niggers go, unquote. Our nurses, Lockie Danford, Polly Bell, Mary Dunn, and Cornelia Nicoloy, peace to their ashes, were the only shadows on the gaiety of these winter evenings for their chief delight was to hurry us off to bed, that they might receive their bow, or make short calls in the neighborhood. My memory of them is mingled with no sentiment of gratitude or affection. In expressing their opinion of us in after years, they said we were a very troublesome, obstinate, disobedient set of children. I have no doubt we were in constant rebellion against their petty tyranny. Abraham, Peter, and Jacob viewed us in a different light, and I have the most pleasant recollections of their kind services. In the winter outside the house we had the snow with which to build statues and make forts and huge piles of wood covered with ice, which we called the Alps, so difficult were they of ascent and descent. There we would climb up and down by the hour, if not interrupted, which, however, was generally the case. 
it always seemed to me that in the height of our enthusiasm we were invariably summoned to some disagreeable duty which would appear to show that thus early i keenly enjoyed outdoor life theodore tilton has thus described the place where i was born Quote, birthplace is secondary parentage and transmits character johnstown was more famous half a century ago than since for then though small it was a marked intellectual center and now though large it is an unmarked manufacturing town before the birth of elizabeth cady it was the vice-ducal seat of sir william johnson the famous english negotiator with the indians during her girlhood it was an arena for the intellectual wrestlings of kent tompkins spencer elisha williams and abraham van vechten who as lawyers were amongst the chiefest of their time it is now devoted mainly to the fabrication of steel springs and buckskin gloves so like wordsworth's early star it has faded into the light of common day but johnstown retains one of its ancient splendors a glory still fresh as at the foundation of the world standing on its hills one looks off upon a country of enameled meadowlands that melt away southward toward the mohawk and northward to the base of those grand mountains which are god's monument over the grave of john brown Unquote. harold frederick's novel in the valley contains many descriptions of this region that are true to nature as i remember the mohawk valley for i first knew it not so many years after the scenes which he lays there before I was old enough to take in the glory of this scenery and its classic associations, Johnstown was to me a gloomy-looking town. The middle of the streets was paved with large cobblestones over which the farmers' wagons rattled from morning till night, while the sidewalks were paved with very small cobblestones over which we carefully picked our way, so that free and graceful walking was out of the question. The streets were lined with solemn poplar trees, from which small yellow worms were continually dangling down. Next to the Prince of Darkness I feared these worms. They were harmless, but the sight of one made me tremble. So many people shared in this feeling that the poplars were all cut down and elms planted in their stead. The Johnstown Academy and churches were large square buildings, painted white, surrounded by these same somber poplars, each edifice having a doleful bell which seemed to be ever tolling for school, funerals, church, or prayer meetings next to the worms those clanging bells filled me with the utmost dread they seemed like so many warnings of an eternal future visions of the inferno were strongly impressed on my childish imagination it was thought in those days that firm faith in hell and the devil was the greatest help to virtue it certainly made me very unhappy whenever my mind dwelled on such teachings and i have always had my doubts of the virtue that is based on the fear of punishment Perhaps I may be pardoned a word devoted to my appearance in those days. I have been told that I was a plump little girl, with very fair skin, rosy cheeks, good features, dark brown hair, and laughing blue eyes. A student in my father's office, the late Henry Bayard of Delaware, an uncle of our recent ambassador to the court of St. James's, Thomas F. Bayard, told me one day, after conning my features carefully, that I had one defect which he could remedy. "'Your eyebrows should be darker and heavier,' said he, "'and if you will let me shave them once or twice, "'you will be much improved.' "'I consented, and slight as my eyebrows were, "'they seemed to have had some impression, "'for the loss of them had a most singular effect on my appearance. "'Everybody, including even the operator, "'laughed at my odd-looking face, "'and I was in the depths of humiliation "'during the period while my eyebrows were growing out again.' It is scarcely necessary for me to add that I never allowed the young man to repeat the experiment, although strongly urged to do so. I cannot recall how or when I conquered the alphabet, words in three letters, the multiplication tables, the points of the compass, the chicken pox, whooping cough, measles, and scarlet fever. All these unhappy incidents of childhood left but little impression on my mind. I have, however, most pleasant memories of the good spinster Maria Yost, who patiently taught three generations of children the rudiments of the English language, and introduced us to the pictures in Murray's spelling book, where old Father Time, with his scythe, and the farmer stoning the boys in his apple trees, gave rise in my mind to many serious reflections. Miss Yost was plump and rosy, with fair hair, and had a merry twinkle in her blue eyes, and she took us by very easy stages through the old-fashioned school books. 
The interesting readers children now have were unknown sixty years ago. We did not reach the temple of knowledge by the flowery paths of ease in which our descendants now walk. I still have a perfect vision of myself and sisters as we stood up in the classes, with our toes at the cracks in the floor, all dressed alike in bright red flannel, black alpaca aprons, and around the neck a starched ruffle that, through a lack of skill on the part of either the laundress or the nurse who sewed them in, proved a constant source of discomfort to us. I have since seen full-grown men, under slighter provocation than we endured, jerk off a collar, tear it into, and throw it to the winds, chased by the most soul-harrowing expletives. But we were sternly rebuked for complaining, and if we ventured to introduce our little fingers between the delicate skin and the irritating linen, our hands were slapped, and the ruffle readjusted a degree closer. Our Sunday dresses were relieved with a black sprig and white aprons. We had red cloaks, red hoods, red mittens, and red stockings. For oneself to be all in red six months of the year was bad enough, but to have this costume multiplied by three was indeed monotonous. I had such an aversion to that color that I used to rebel regularly at the beginning of each season when new dresses were purchased, until we finally passed into an exquisite shade of blue. No words could do justice to my dislike of those red dresses. My grandfather's detestation of the British redcoats must have descended to me. My childhood's antipathy to wearing red enabled me later to comprehend the feelings of a little niece who hated everything pea-green, because she had once heard the saying, neat but not gaudy, as the devil said when he painted his tail pea-green. So when a friend brought her a cravat of that color, she threw it on the floor and burst into tears, saying, I could not wear that, for it is the color of the devil's tail. I sympathized with the child and had it changed for the hue she liked. Although we cannot always understand the ground for children's preferences, it is often well to heed them. I am told that I was pensively looking out of the nursery window one day when Mary Dunn, the Scotch nurse who was something of a philosopher, in a stern Presbyterian said, Child, what are you thinking about? Are you planning some new form of mischief? No, Mary, I replied. I was wondering why it was that everything we like to do is a sin and that everything we dislike is commanded by God or someone on earth. I am so tired of that everlasting no, no, no. At school, at home, everywhere it is no. Even at church all the commandments begin, thou shalt not. I suppose God will say no to all we like in the next world, just as you do here. Mary was dreadfully shocked at my dissatisfaction with the things of time and prospective eternity, and exhorted me to cultivate the virtues of obedience and humility. I well remember the despair I felt in those days as I took in the whole situation over the constant cribbing and crippling of a child's life. I suppose I found fit language in which to express my thoughts, for Mary Dunn told me years after how our discussion roused my sister Margaret, who was an attentive listener. I must have set forth our wrongs in clear, unmistakable terms, for Margaret exclaimed one day, I tell you what to do. Hereafter, let us act as we choose, without asking. Then, I said, we shall be punished. Suppose we are, said she. We shall have had our fun at any rate, and that is better than to mind the everlasting no and not have any fun at all. Her logic seemed unanswerable, so together we gradually acted on her suggestions. Having less imagination than I, she took a common-sense view of life and suffered nothing from anticipation of troubles while my sorrows were intensified fourfold by innumerable apprehensions of possible exigencies. Our nursery, a large room over a back building, had three barred windows reaching nearly to the floor. Two of these opened on a gently slanting roof over a veranda. In our night robes, on warm summer evenings, we could, by dint of skillful twisting and compressing, get out between the bars, and there, snugly braced against the house, we would sit and enjoy the moon and stars and what sounds might reach us from the streets, while the nurse, gossiping at the back door, imagined we were safely asleep. I have a confused memory of being often under punishment for what in those days were called tantrums. I suppose they were really justifiable acts of rebellion against the tyranny of those in authority. 
I have often listened since with real satisfaction to what some of our friends had to say of the high-handed manner in which Sister Margaret and I defied all the transient orders and strict rules laid down for our guidance. If we had observed them, we might as well have been embalmed as mummies for all the pleasure and freedom we should have had in our childhood. As very little was then done for the amusement of children, happy were those who conscientiously took the liberty of amusing themselves. One charming feature of our village was a stream of water called the Cayadutta, which ran through the north end, and in which it was our delight to walk on the broad slate stones when the water was low in order to pick up pretty pebbles. These joys were also forbidden, though indulged in as opportunity afforded, especially as Sister Margaret's philosophy was found to work successfully, and we had finally risen above our infantile fear of punishment. Much of my freedom at this time was due to this sister, who afterward became the wife of Colonel Duncan McMartin of Iowa. I can see her now, hat in hand, her long curls flying in the wind, her nose slightly retrousse, her large dark eyes flashing with glee, and her small straight mouth so expressive of determination. Though two years my junior, she was larger and stronger than I, and more fearless and self-reliant. She was always ready to start when any pleasure offered, and if I hesitated she would give me a jerk and say emphatically, Oh, come along! And away we went. About this time we entered the Johnstown Academy, where we made the acquaintance of the daughters of the hotel keeper and the county sheriff. They were a few years my senior, but as I was ahead of them in all my studies, the difference of age was somewhat equalized, and we became fast friends. This acquaintance opened to us two new sources of enjoyment. The freedom of the hotel during court week, a great event in village life, and the exploration of the county jail. Our Scotch nurse had told us so many thrilling tales of castles, prisons, and dungeons in the old world that to see the great keys and iron doors, the handcuffs and chains, and the prisoners in their cells seemed like a veritable visit to Mary's native land. We made frequent visits to the jail and became deeply concerned about the fate of the prisoners, who were greatly pleased with our expressions of sympathy and our gifts of cake and candy. In time we became interested in the trials and sentences of prisoners, and would go to the courthouse and listen to the proceedings. Sometimes we would slip into the hotel where the judges and lawyers dined and help our little friend wait on table. The rushing of servants to and fro, the calling of guests, the scolding of servants in the kitchen, the banging of doors, the general hubbub, the noise and clatter were all idealized by me into one of those royal festivals Mary so often described. To be allowed to carry plates of bread and butter, pie and cheese, I counted a high privilege. But more especially, I enjoyed listening to the conversations in regard to the probable fate of our friends, the prisoners in the jail. On one occasion, I projected a few remarks into a conversation between two lawyers, when one of them turned abruptly to me and said, Child, you'd better attend to your business. Bring me a glass of water. I replied indignantly, I am not a servant. I am here for fun. In all these escapades, we were followed by Peter, black as coal and six feet in height. It seems to me now that his chief business was to discover our whereabouts, get us home to dinner, and take us back to school. Fortunately, he was overflowing with curiosity, and not averse to lingering a while where anything of interest was to be seen or heard, and as we were deemed perfectly safe under his care, no questions were asked when we got to the house if we had been with him. He had a long head, and through his diplomacy we escaped much disagreeable surveillance. Peter was very fond of attending court. All the lawyers knew him, and wherever Peter went, the three little girls in his charge went, too. Thus, with constant visits to the jail, courthouse, and my father's office, I gleaned some idea of the danger of violating the law. The great events of the year were the Christmas holidays, the Fourth of July, and general training, as the review of the county militia was then called. The winter gala days are associated in my memory with hanging up stockings and with turkeys, mince pies, sweet cider, and sleigh rides by moonlight. My earliest recollections of those happy days, when schools were closed, books laid aside, and unusual liberties allowed, center in that large cellar kitchen to which I have already referred. There we spent many winter evenings in uninterrupted enjoyment. A large fireplace with huge logs shed warmth and cheerfulness around. 
In one corner sat Peter sawing his violin, while our youthful neighbors danced with us and played blind man's buff almost every evening during the vacation. The most interesting character in this game was a black boy called Jacob, Peter's lieutenant, who made things lively for us by always keeping one eye open, a wise precaution to guard himself from danger, and to keep us on the jump. Hickory nuts, sweet cider, and olicokes, a Dutch name for a fried cake with raisins inside, were our refreshments when there came a lull in the fun. As St. Nicholas was supposed to come down the chimney, our stockings were pinned on a broomstick, laid across two chairs in front of the fireplace. We retired on Christmas Eve with the most pleasing anticipations of what would be in our stockings next morning. The thermometer in that latitude was often twenty degrees below zero, yet bright and early we would run downstairs in our bare feet over the cold floors to carry stockings, broom, etc. to the nursery. The gorgeous presents that St. Nicholas now distributes show that he too has been growing up with the country. The boys and girls of 1897 will laugh when they hear of the contents of our stockings in 1823. There was a little paper of candy, one of raisins, another of nuts, a red apple, an olicoke, and a bright silver quarter of a dollar in the toe. If a child had been guilty of any erratic performances during the year, which was often my case, a long stick would protrude from the stocking. If particularly good, an illustrated catechism or the New Testament would appear, showing that the St. Nicholas of that time held decided views on discipline and ethics. During the day we would take a drive over the snow-clad hills and valleys in a long red lumber sleigh. All the children it could hold made the forests echo with their songs and laughter. The sleigh bells and Peter's fine tenor voice added to the chorus seemed to chant as we passed, Merry Christmas to the farmer's children and to all we met on the highway. Returning home we were allowed as a great Christmas treat to watch all Peter's preparations for dinner. Attired in a white apron and turban, holding in his hand a tin candlestick the size of a dinner plate, containing a tallow candle, with stately step he marched into the spacious cellar with Jacob and three little girls dressed in red flannel at his heels. As the farmers paid the interest on their mortgages in barrels of pork, head cheese, poultry, eggs, and cider, the cellars were well crowded for the winter, making the master of an establishment quite indifferent to all questions of finance. We heard nothing in those days of greenbacks, silver coinage, or a gold basis. Laden with vegetables, butter, eggs, and a magnificent turkey, Peter and his followers returned to the kitchen. There, seated on a big ironing table, we watched the dressing and roasting of the bird in a tin oven in front of the fire. Jacob peeled the vegetables, we all sang, and Peter told us marvelous stories. For tea he made flapjacks, baked in a pan with a long handle, which he turned by throwing the cake up and skillfully catching it descending. Peter was a devout Episcopalian and took great pleasure in helping the young people decorate the church. He would take us with him and show us how to make evergreen wreaths. Like Mary's lamb, wherever he went we were sure to go. His love for us was unbounded and fully returned. He was the only being, visible or invisible, of whom we had no fear. We would go to divine service with Peter Christmas morning and sit with him by the door in what was called the Negro pew. He was the only colored member of the church, and after all the other communicants had taken the sacrament, he went alone to the altar. Dressed in a new suit of blue with gilt buttons, he looked like a prince, as with head erect he walked up the aisle, the grandest specimen of manhood in the whole congregation. And yet so strong was prejudice against color in 1823 that no one would kneel beside him. On leaving us on one of these occasions, Peter told us all to sit still until he returned. But no sooner had he started than the youngest of us slowly followed after him and seated herself close beside him. As he came back, holding the child by the hand, what a lesson it must have been to that prejudiced congregation! The first time we entered the church together, the sexton opened a white man's pew for us, telling Peter to leave the judge's children there. Oh, he said, they will not stay there without me. But as he could not enter, we instinctively followed him to the negro pew. Our next great fete was on the anniversary of the birthday of our republic. The festivities were numerous and protracted, beginning then as now at midnight with bonfires and cannon. 
while the day was ushered in with the ringing of bells, tremendous cannonading, and a continuous popping of firecrackers and torpedoes. Then a procession of soldiers and citizens marched through the town, an oration was delivered, the Declaration of Independence read, and a great dinner given in the open air under the trees in the grounds of the old courthouse. Each toast was announced with the booming of cannon. On these occasions Peter was in his element, and showed us whatever he considered worth seeing, but I cannot say that I enjoyed very much either general training or the Fourth of July, for in addition to my fear of cannon and torpedoes, my sympathies were deeply touched by the sadness of our cook whose drunken father always cut antics in the streets on gala days, the central figure in all the sports of the boys, much to the mortification of his worthy daughter. She wept bitterly over her father's public exhibition of himself, and told me in what a condition he would come home to his family at night. I would gladly have stayed in with her all day, but the fear of being called a coward compelled me to go through those trying ordeals. As my nerves were all on the surface, no words can describe what I suffered with those explosions, great and small, and my fears lest King George and his minions should reappear among us. I thought that, if he had done all the dreadful things stated in the Declaration of 76, he might come again, burn our houses, and drive us all into the street. Sir William Johnson's mansion of solid masonry, gloomy and threatening, still stood in our neighborhood. I had seen the marks of the Indian's tomahawk on the balustrades, and heard of the bloody deeds there enacted. For all the calamities of the nation, I believed King George responsible. At home and at school we were educated to hate the English. When we remember that every Fourth of July the Declaration was read with emphasis, and the orator of the day rounded all his glowing periods with denunciations of the mother country, we need not wonder at the national hatred of everything English. Our patriotism in those days was measured by our dislike of Great Britain. In September occurred the great event, the review of the county militia, popularly called Training Day. Then everybody went to the race course to see the troops and buy what the farmers had brought in their wagons. There was a peculiar kind of gingerbread and molasses candy to which we retreated on those occasions, associated in my mind to this day with military reviews and standing armies. Other pleasures were roaming in the forests and sailing on the mill pond. One day, when there were no boys at hand and several girls were impatiently waiting for a sail on a raft, my sister and I volunteered to man the expedition. We always acted on the assumption that what we had seen done we could do. Accordingly, we all jumped on the raft, loosened it from its moorings, and away we went with the current. Navigation on that mill pond was performed with long poles. But, unfortunately, we could not lift the poles, and we soon saw we were drifting toward the dam, but we had the presence of mind to sit down and hold fast to the raft. Fortunately, we went over right side up and gracefully glided down the stream, until rescued by the ever-watchful Peter. I did not hear the last of that voyage for a long time. I was called the captain of the expedition, and one of the boys wrote a composition, which he read in school describing the adventure and emphasizing the ignorance of the laws of navigation shown by the officers in command. I shed tears many times over that performance. End of chapter 1 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Miller, Canal Winchester, Ohio. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Chapter 2 School Days When I was eleven years old, two events occurred which changed considerably the current of my life. My only brother, who had just graduated from Union College, came home to die. A young man of great talent and promise, he was the pride of my father's heart. We early felt that this son filled a larger place in our father's affections and future plans than the five daughters together. Well do I remember how tenderly he watched my brother in his last illness, the sighs and tears he gave vent to as he slowly walked up and down the hall 
and when the last sad moment came and we were all assembled to say farewell in the silent chamber of death how broken were his utterances as he knelt and prayed for comfort and support i still recall too going into the large darkened parlor to see my brother and finding the casket mirrors and pictures all draped in white and my father seated by his side pale and immovable as he took no notice of me after standing a long while i climbed upon his knee when he mechanically put his arm about me and with my head resting against his beating heart we both sat in silence he thinking of the wreck of all his hopes in the loss of a dear son and i wondering what could be said or done to fill the void in his breast at length he heaved a deep sigh and said oh my daughter i wish you were a boy throwing my arms about his neck i replied i will try to be all my brother was then and there i resolved that i would not give so much time as heretofore to play but would study and strive to be at the head of all my classes and thus delight my father's heart all that day and far into the night i pondered the problem of boyhood i thought that the chief thing to be done in order to equal boys was to be learned and courageous so i decided to study greek and learn to manage a horse having formed this conclusion i fell asleep my resolutions unlike many such made at night did not vanish with the coming light i arose early and hastened to put them into execution they were resolutions never to be forgotten destined to mold my character anew as soon as i was dressed i hastened to our good pastor rev simon hossack who was always early at work in his garden doctor i said which do you like best boys or girls why girls to be sure i would not give you for all the boys in christendom my father i replied prefers boys he wishes i was one and i intend to be as near like one as possible i am going to ride on horseback and study greek will you give me a greek lesson now doctor i want to begin at once yes child said he throwing down his hoe come into my library and we will begin without delay he entered fully into the feeling of suffering and sorrow which took possession of me when i discovered that a girl weighed less in the scale of being than a boy and he praised my determination to prove the contrary the old grammar which he had studied in the university of glasgow was soon in my hands and the greek article was learned before breakfast then came the sad pageantry of death the weeping of friends the dark rooms the ghostly stillness the exhortation to the living to prepare for death the solemn prayer the mournful chant the funeral cortege the solemn tolling bell the burial how I suffered during those sad days! What strange, undefined fears of the unknown took possession of me! For months afterward, at the twilight hour, I went with my father to the new-made grave. Near it stood two tall poplar trees, against one of which I leaned, while my father threw himself on the grave with outstretched arms as if to embrace his child. At last the frosts and storms of November came, and threw a chilling barrier between the living and the dead, and we went there no more. During all this time I kept up my lessons at the parsonage and made rapid progress. I surprised even my teacher, who thought me capable of doing anything. I learned to drive, and to leap a fence and ditch on horseback. I taxed every power, hoping some day to hear my father say, Well, a girl is as good as a boy after all but he never said it. When the doctor came over to spend the evening with us, I would whisper in his ear, Tell my father how fast I get on. And he would tell him, and was lavish in his praises. But my father only paced the room, sighed, and showed that he wished I were a boy. And I, not knowing why he felt thus, would hide my tears of vexation on the doctor's shoulder. Soon after this I began to study Latin, Greek, and mathematics with a class of boys in the academy, many of whom were much older than I. For three years one boy kept his place at the head of the class, and I always stood next. Two prizes were offered in Greek, 
I strove for one and took the second. How well I remember my joy in receiving that prize! There was no sentiment of ambition, rivalry, or triumph over my companions, nor feeling of satisfaction in receiving this honor in the presence of those assembled on the day of the exhibition. One thought alone filled my mind. Now, said I, my father will be satisfied with me. So as soon as we were dismissed, I ran down the hill, rushed breathless into his office, laid the new Greek testament, which was my prize, on his table, and exclaimed, There! I got it! He took up the book, asked me some questions about the class, the teachers, the spectators, and, evidently pleased, handed it back to me. Then, while I stood looking and waiting for him to say something which would show that he recognized the equality of the daughter with the son, he kissed me on the forehead and exclaimed with a sigh, Ah, you should have been a boy! My joy was turned to sadness. I ran to my good doctor. He chased my bitter tears away and soothed me with unbounded praises and visions of future success. He was then confined to the house with his last illness. He asked me that day if I would like to have, when he was gone, the old lexicon, testament, and grammar that we had so often thumbed together. Yes, but I would rather have you stay, I replied, for what can I do when you are gone? Oh, he said tenderly, I shall not be gone. My spirit will still be with you, watching you in all life's struggles. Noble, generous friend! He had but little on earth to bequeath to any one, but when the last scene in his life was ended, and his will was opened, sure enough there was a clause saying, My Greek lexicon, testament, and grammar, and four volumes of Scott's commentaries, I will to Elizabeth Cady. I never look at these books without a feeling of thankfulness that in childhood I was blessed with such a friend and teacher. I can truly say, after an experience of seventy years, that all the cares and anxieties, the trials and disappointments of my whole life, are light when balanced with my sufferings in childhood and youth from the theological dogmas which I sincerely believed, and the gloom connected with everything associated with the name of religion, the church, the parsonage, the graveyard, and the solemn tolling bell. Everything connected with death was then rendered inexpressibly dolorous. The body covered with a black pall was borne on the shoulders of men. The mourners were in crape and walked with bowed heads, while the neighbors who had tears to shed did so copiously and summoned up their saddest facial expressions. At the grave came the sober warnings to the living and sometimes frightful prophecies as to the state of the dead. All this pageantry of woe and visions of the unknown land beyond the tomb often haunted my midnight dreams and shadowed the sunshine of my days. The parsonage with its bare walls and floors, its shriveled mistress and her blind sister, more like ghostly shadows than human flesh and blood. The two black servants, racked with rheumatism and odoriferous with the pungent oil they used in the vain hope of making their weary limbs more supple. The aged parson, buried in his library in the midst of musty books and papers, all this only added to the gloom of my surroundings. The church, which was bare, with no furnace to warm us, no organ to gladden our hearts, no choir to lead our songs of praise and harmony, was sadly lacking in all attractions for the youthful mind. The preacher, shut up in an octagonal box high above our heads, gave us sermons over an hour long, and the chorister, in a similar box below him, intoned line after line of David's psalms, while like a flock of sheep at the heels of their shepherd, the congregation, without regard to time or tune, straggled after their leader. Years later, the introduction of stoves, a violoncello, Wesley's hymns, and a choir split the church in twain. These old Scotch Presbyterians were opposed to all innovations that would afford their people paths of flowery ease on the road to heaven. So when the thermometer was twenty degrees below zero on the Johnstown Hills, four hundred feet above the Mohawk Valley, we trudged along through the snow, foot stoves in hand. To the cold hospitalities of the Lord's house. 
there to be chilled to the very core by listening to sermons on predestination, justification by faith, and eternal damnation. To be restless or to fall asleep under such solemn circumstances was a sure evidence of total depravity and of the mechanisms of the devil striving to turn one's heart from God and his ordinances. As I was guilty of these shortcomings and many more, I early believed myself a veritable child of the evil one and suffered endless fears lest he should come some night and claim me as his own. To me he was a personal, ever-present reality crouching in a dark corner of the nursery. Ah, how many times have I stolen out of bed and sat shivering on the stairs where the hall lamp and the sound of voices from the parlor would, in a measure, mitigate my terror. Thanks to a vigorous constitution and overflowing animal spirits, I was able to endure for years the strain of these depressing influences, until my reasoning powers and common sense triumphed at last over my imagination. The memory of my own suffering has prevented me from ever shadowing one young soul with any of the superstitions of the Christian religion. But there have been many changes, even in my native town, since those dark days. Our old church was turned into a mitten factory, and the pleasant hum of machinery and the glad faces of men and women have chased the evil spirits to their hiding places. One finds at Johnstown now beautiful churches, ornamented cemeteries, and cheerful men and women quite emancipated from the nonsense and terrors of the old theologies. An important event in our family circle was the marriage of my oldest sister, Trefina, to Edward Bayard of Wilmington, Delaware. He was a graduate of Union College, a classmate of my brother, and frequently visited my father's house. At the end of his college course he came with his brother Henry to study law in Johnstown. A quiet, retired little village was thought to be a good place in which to sequester young men bent on completing their education, as they were there safe from the temptations and distracting influences of large cities. In addition to this consideration, my father's reputation made his office a desirable resort for students who furthermore not only improved their opportunities by reading Blackstone, Kent, and Story, but also by making love to the judge's daughters. We thus had the advantage of many pleasant acquaintances from the leading families in the country, and in this way it was that four of the sisters eventually selected most worthy husbands. Though only twenty-one years of age when married, Edward Bayard was a tall, fully developed man, remarkably fine-looking, with cultivated literary taste and a profound knowledge of human nature. Warm and affectionate, generous to a fault in giving and serving, he was soon a great favorite in the family, and gradually filled the void made in all our hearts by the loss of the brother and son. My father was so fully occupied with the duties of his profession, which often called him from home, and my mother so weary with the cares of a large family, having had ten children, though only five survived at this time, that they were quite willing to shift their burdens to younger shoulders. Our eldest sister and her husband therefore soon became our counselors and advisers. They selected our clothing, books, schools, acquaintances, and directed our reading and amusements. Thus the reins of domestic government, little by little, passed into their hands, and the family arrangements were in a manner greatly improved in favor of greater liberty for the children. The advent of Edward and Henry Bayard was an inestimable blessing to us. With them came an era of picnics, birthday parties, and endless amusements, the buying of pictures, fairy books, musical instruments, and ponies, and frequent excursions with parties on horseback. Fresh from college, they made our lessons in Latin, Greek, and mathematics so easy that we studied with real pleasure and had more leisure for play. Henry Bayard's chief pleasures were walking, riding, and playing all manner of games, from Jack Straws to chess with the three younger sisters, and we have often said that the three years he passed in Johnstown were the most delightful of our girlhood. Immediately after the death of my brother, a journey was planned to visit our grandmother Katie, who lived in Canaan, Columbia County, about twenty miles from Albany. My two younger sisters and myself had never been outside of our own county before, and the very thought of a journey roused our enthusiasm to the highest pitch. 
On a bright day in September we started, packed in two carriages. We were wild with delight as we drove down the Mohawk Valley with its beautiful river and its many bridges and ferry boats. When we reached Schenectady, the first city we had ever seen, we stopped to dine at the old Givens Hotel, where we broke loose from all the moorings of propriety on beholding the paper on the dining-room wall, illustrating in brilliant colors the great events in sacred history. There were the patriarchs with flowing beards and in gorgeous attire, Abraham offering up Isaac, Joseph with his coat of many colors thrown into a pit by his brethren, Noah's ark on an ocean of waters, Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, Rebecca at the well, and Moses in the bulrushes. All these distinguished personages were familiar to us, and to see them here for the first time in living color made silence and eating impossible. We dashed around the room, calling to each other, Oh, Kate, look here! Oh, Madge, look there! See little Moses? See the angels on Jacob's ladder? Our exclamations could not be kept within bounds. The guests were amused beyond description, while my mother and elder sisters were equally mortified. But Mr. Bayard, who appreciated our childish surprise and delight, smiled and said, I'll take them around and show them the pictures, and then they will be able to dine, which we finally did. On our way to Albany we were forced to listen to no end of dissertations on manners, and severe criticisms on our behavior at the hotel, but we were too happy and astonished with all we saw to take a subjective view of ourselves. Even Peter in his new livery, who had not seen much more than we had, while looking out of the corners of his eyes, maintained a quiet dignity, and conjured us not to act as if we had just come out of the woods and had never seen anything before. However, there are conditions in the child's soul in which repression is impossible, when the mind takes in nothing but its own enjoyment, and when even the sense of hearing is lost in that of sight. The whole party awoke to that fact at last. Children are not actors. We never had experienced anything like this journey, and how could we help being surprised and delighted? When we drove into Albany, the first large city we had ever visited, we exclaimed, Why, it's general training here! We had acquired our ideas of crowds from our country militia reviews. Fortunately, there was no pictorial wallpaper in the old city hotel. But the decree had gone forth that on the remainder of the journey, our meals would be served in a private room with Peter to wait on us. This seemed like going back to the nursery days and was very humiliating. But eating even there was difficult, as we could hear the band from the old museum, and as our windows opened on the street, the continual panorama of people and carriages passing by was quite as enticing as the Bible scenes in Schenectady. In the evening we walked around to see the city lighted, to look into the shop windows, and to visit the museum. The next morning we started for Canaan, our enthusiasm still unabated, though strong hopes were expressed that we would be toned down with the fatigues of the first day's journey. The large farm with its cattle, sheep, hens, ducks, turkeys, and geese, its creamery, looms, and spinning wheel, its fruits and vegetables, the drives among the grand old hills, the blessed old grandmother, and the many aunts, uncles, and cousins to kiss, all this kept us in a whirlpool of excitement. Our joy bubbled over of itself. It was beyond our control. After spending a delightful week at Canaan, we departed, with an addition to our party, much to Peter's disgust, of a bright, coal-black boy of fifteen summers. Peter kept grumbling that he had children enough to look after already, but as the boy was handsome and intelligent, could read, write, play on the Jew's harp and banjo, sing, dance, and stand on his head, we were charmed with this new-found treasure, who proved later to be a great family blessing. We were less vivacious on the return trip, whether this was due to Peter's untiring efforts to keep us within bounds, or whether the novelty of the journey was in a measure gone, it is difficult to determine. But we evidently were not so buoyant, and were duly complimented on our good behavior. When we reached home and told our village companions what we had seen in our extensive travels, just seventy miles from home, they were filled with wonder, 
and we became heroines in their estimation. After this we took frequent journeys to Saratoga, the Northern Lakes, Utica, and Peterborough, but were never again so entirely swept from our feet as with the biblical illustrations in the dining-room of the old Givens Hotel. As my father's office joined the house, I spent there much of my time when out of school, listening to the clients stating their cases, talking with the students, and reading the laws in regard to woman. In our Scotch neighborhood, many men still retained the old feudal ideas of women and property. Fathers at their death would will the bulk of their property to the eldest son, with the proviso that the mother was to have a home with him. Hence it was not unusual for the mother, who had brought all the property into the family, to be made an unhappy dependent on the bounty of an uncongenial daughter-in-law and a dissipated son. The tears and complaints of the women who came to my father for legal advice touched my heart, and early drew my attention to the injustice and cruelty of the laws. As the practice of the law was my father's business, I could not exactly understand why he could not alleviate the sufferings of these women. So in order to enlighten me, he would take down his books and show me the inexorable statutes. The students, observing my interest, would amuse themselves by reading to me all the worst laws they could find, over which I would laugh and cry by turns. One Christmas morning I went into the office to show them, among other of my presents, a new coral necklace and bracelets. They all admired the jewelry and then began to tease me with hypothetical cases of future ownership. Now, said Henry Bayard, if in due time you should be my wife, those ornaments would be mine. I could take them and lock them up, and you could never wear them except with my permission. I could even exchange them for a box of cigars, and you could watch them evaporate in smoke. With this constant bantering from students and the sad complaints of the women, my mind was sorely perplexed. So when, from time to time, my attention was called to these odious laws, I would mark them with a pencil, and becoming more and more convinced of the necessity of taking some active measures against these unjust provisions, I resolved to seize the first opportunity, when alone in the office, to cut every one of them out of the books, supposing my father and his library were the beginning and end of the law. However, this mutilation of his volumes was never accomplished. For dear old Flora Campbell, to whom I confided my plan for the amelioration of the wrongs of my unhappy sex, warned my father of what I proposed to do. Without letting me know that he had discovered my secret, he explained to me one evening how laws were made, the large number of lawyers and libraries that were all over the state, and that if his library should burn up it would make no difference in woman's condition. When you are grown up and able to prepare a speech, said he, you must go down to Albany and talk to the legislators. Tell them all you have seen in this office, the sufferings of these Scotch women robbed of their inheritance and left dependent on their unworthy sons. And if you can persuade them to pass new laws, the old ones will be a dead letter. Thus was the future object of my life foreshadowed, and my duty plainly outlined by him who was most opposed to my public career when in due time I entered upon it. Until I was sixteen years old, I was a faithful student in the Johnstown Academy with a class of boys. Though I was the only girl in the higher classes of mathematics and languages, yet in our plays all the girls and boys mingled freely together. In running races, sliding downhill and snowballing, we made no distinction of sex. True, the boys would carry the school books and pull the sleighs uphill for their favorite girls but equality was the general basis of our school relations. I dare say the boys did not make their snowballs quite so hard when pelting the girls, nor wash their faces with the same vehemence as they did each other's, but there was no public evidence of partiality. However, if any boy was too rough or took advantage of a girl smaller than himself, he was promptly thrashed by his fellows. There was an unwritten law and public sentiment in that little academy world that enabled us to study and play together with the greatest freedom and harmony. From the academy, the boys of my class went to Union College at Schenectady. When those with whom I had studied and contended for prizes for five years came to bid me good-bye 
and I learned of the barrier that prevented me from following in their footsteps. No girls admitted here. My vexation and mortification knew no bounds. I remember now how proud and handsome the boys looked in their new clothes as they jumped into the old stagecoach and drove off, and how lonely I felt when they were gone, and I had nothing to do, for the plans for my future were yet undetermined. Again I felt more keenly than ever the humiliation of the distinctions made on the ground of sex. My time was now occupied with riding on horseback, studying the game of chess, and continually squabbling with the law students over the rights of women. Something was always coming up in the experiences of everyday life, or in the books we were reading, to give us fresh topics for argument. They would read passages from the British classics quite as aggravating as the laws. They delighted in extracts from Shakespeare, especially from The Taming of the Shrew an admirable satire in itself on the old common law of England. I hated Petruchio as if he were a real man. Young Baird would recite with unction the famous reply of Milton's ideal woman to Adam, God thy law, thou mine. The Bible, too, was brought into requisition. In fact, it seemed to me that every book taught the divinely ordained headship of man. But my mind never yielded to this popular heresy. End of chapter 2 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Miller, Canal Winchester, Ohio. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Chapter 3 Girlhood Mrs. Willard's seminary at Troy was the fashionable school in my girlhood, and in the winter of 1830, with upward of a hundred other girls, I found myself an active participant in all the joys and sorrows of that institution. When in family council it was decided to send me to that intellectual mecca, I did not receive the announcement with unmixed satisfaction, as I had fixed my mind on Union College. The thought of a school without boys, who had been to me such a stimulus both in study and play, seemed to my imagination dreary and profitless. The one remarkable feature of my journey to Troy was the railroad from Schenectady to Albany, the first ever laid in this country. The manner of ascending a high hill going out of the city would now strike engineers as stupid to the last degree. The passenger cars were pulled up by a train, loaded with stones, descending the hill. The more rational way of tunneling through the hill or going around it had not yet dawned on our Dutch ancestors. At every step of my journey to Troy I felt that I was treading on my pride, and thus in a hopeless frame of mind I began my boarding school career. I had already studied everything that was taught there except French, music, and dancing, so I devoted myself to these accomplishments. As I had a good voice, I enjoyed singing, with a guitar accompaniment, and having a good ear for time, I appreciated the harmony in music and motion, and took great delight in dancing. The large house, the society of so many girls, the walks about the city, the novelty of everything made the new life more enjoyable than I had anticipated. To be sure, I missed the boys, with whom I had grown up, played with for years, and later measured my intellectual powers with. But as they became a novelty, there was a new zest in occasionally seeing them. After I had been there a short time, I heard a call one day, Heads out! I ran with the rest and exclaimed, What is it? Expecting to see a giraffe or some other wonder from Barnum's Museum. Why don't you see those boys? said one. Oh, I replied, is that all? I have seen boys all my life. When visiting family friends in the city, we were in the way of making the acquaintance of their sons, and as all social relations were strictly forbidden, there was a new interest in seeing them. As they were not allowed to call upon us or write notes, unless they were brothers or cousins, we had in time a large number of kinsmen. 
There was an intense interest to me now in writing notes, receiving calls, and joining the young men in the streets for a walk, such as I had never known when in constant association with them at school and in our daily amusements. Shut up with girls, most of them older than myself, I heard many subjects discussed of which I had never thought before, and in a manner it were better I had never heard. The healthful restraint always existing between boys and girls in conversation is apt to be relaxed with either sex alone. In all my intimate association with boys up to that period I cannot recall one word or act for criticism, but I cannot say the same of the girls during the three years I passed at the seminary in Troy. My own experience proves to me that it is a grave mistake to send boys and girls to separate institutions of learning, especially at the most impressible age. The stimulus of sex promotes alike a healthy condition of the intellectual and the moral faculties, and gives to both a development they never can acquire alone. Mrs. Willard, having spent several months in Europe, did not return until I had been at the seminary some time. I well remember her arrival, and the joy with which she was greeted by the teachers and pupils who had known her before. She was a splendid-looking woman then in her prime, and fully realized my idea of a queen. I doubt whether any royal personage in the old world could have received her worshippers with more grace and dignity than did this far-famed daughter of the Republic. She was one of the remarkable women of that period, and did a great educational work for her sex. She gave free scholarships to a large number of promising girls, fitting them for teachers, with a proviso that when the opportunity arose, they should, in turn, educate others. I shall never forget one incident that occasioned me much unhappiness. I had written a very amusing composition describing my room. A friend came in to see me just as I had finished it, and as she asked me to read it to her, I did so. She enjoyed it very much and proposed an exchange. She said the rooms were all so nearly alike that with a little alteration she could use it. Being very susceptible to flattery, her praise of my production won a ready assent, but when I read her platitudes I was sorry I had changed, and still more so in the denouement. Those selected to prepare compositions read them before the whole school. My friends was received with great laughter and applause. The one I read not only fell flat, but nearly prostrated me also. As soon as I had finished, one of the young ladies left the room, and, returning in a few moments with her composition book, laid it before the teacher who presided that day, showing her the same composition I had just read. I was called up at once to explain, but was so amazed and confounded that I could not speak, and I looked the personification of guilt. I saw at a glance the contemptible position I occupied, and felt as if the last day had come that I stood before the judgment seat and had heard the awful sentence pronounced, Depart ye wicked into everlasting punishment. How I escaped from that scene to my own room I do not know. I was too wretched for tears. I sat alone for a long time when a gentle tap announced my betrayer. She put her arms around me affectionately and kissed me again and again. Oh, she said, you are a hero. You went through that trying ordeal like a soldier. I was so afraid when you were pressed with questions that the whole truth would come out and I'd be forced to stand in your place. I am not so brave as you. I could not endure it. Now that you are through it and know how bitter a trial it is, promise that you will save me from the same experience. You are so good and noble. I know you will not betray me. In this supreme moment of misery and disgrace, her loving words and warm embrace were like balm to my bruised soul, and I readily promised all she asked. The girl had penetrated the weak point in my character. I loved flattery. Through that means she got my composition in the first place, pledged me to silence in the second place, and so confused my moral perceptions that I really thought it praiseworthy to shelter her from what I had suffered. However, without betrayal on my part, the trick came to light through the very means she took to make concealment sure. After compositions were read, they were handed over to a certain teacher for criticism. Miss X had copied mine, and returned to me the original. I had not copied hers, so the two were in the same handwriting, one with my name outside, 
and one with Miss X's. As I stood well in school, both for scholarship and behavior, my sudden fall from grace occasioned no end of discussion. So as soon as the teacher discovered the two compositions in Miss X's writing, she came to me to inquire how I got one of Miss X's compositions. She said, Where is yours you wrote for that day? Taking it from my portfolio, I replied, Here it is. She then asked, Did you copy it from her book? I replied, No. I wrote it myself. Then why did you not read your own? We agreed to change, said I. Did you know that Miss X had copied that from the book of another young lady? No, not until I was accused of doing it myself before the whole school. Why did not you defend yourself on the spot? I could not speak. Neither did I know what to say. Why have you allowed yourself to remain in such a false position for a whole week? I do not know. Suppose I had not found this out. Did you intend to keep silent? Yes, I replied. Did Miss X ask you to do so? Yes. I had been a great favorite with this teacher, but she was so disgusted with my stupidity, as she called my timidity, that she said, Really, my child, you have not acted in this matter as if you had ordinary common sense. So little do grown people in familiar surroundings appreciate the confusion of a child's faculties under new and trying experiences. When poor Miss X's turn came to stand up before the whole school and take the burden on her own shoulders she had so cunningly laid on mine, I readily shed the tears for her I could not summon for myself. This was my first sad lesson in human duplicity. This episode unfortunately destroyed in a measure my confidence in my companions and made me suspicious even of those who came to me with appreciative words. Up to this time I had accepted all things as they seemed on the surface. Now I began to wonder what lay behind the visible conditions about me. Perhaps the experience was beneficial, as it is quite necessary for a young girl, thrown wholly on herself for the first time among strangers, to learn caution in all she says and does. The atmosphere of home life, where all disguises and pretensions are thrown off, is quite different from a large school of girls, with the petty jealousies and antagonisms that arise in daily competition in their dress, studies, accomplishments, and amusements. The next happening in Troy that seriously influenced my character was the advent of the Rev. Charles G. Finney, a pulpit orator who, as a terrifier of human souls, proved himself the equal of Savonarola. He held a protracted meeting in the Rev. Dr. Beeman's church, which many of my schoolmates attended. The result of six weeks of untiring effort on the part of Mr. Finney and his confreres was one of those intense revival seasons that swept over the city and through the seminary like an epidemic, attacking in its worst form the most susceptible. Owing to my gloomy Calvinistic training in the old Scotch Presbyterian church, and my vivid imagination, I was one of the first victims. We attended all the public services, beside the daily prayer and experience meetings held in the seminary. Our studies for the time held a subordinate place to the more important duty of saving our souls. To state the idea of conversion and salvation as then understood, one can readily see from our present standpoint that nothing could be more puzzling and harrowing to the young mind. The revival fairly started. The most excitable were soon on the anxious seat. There we learned the total depravity of human nature and the sinner's awful danger of everlasting punishment. This was enlarged upon until the most innocent girl believed herself a monster of iniquity and felt certain of eternal damnation. Then God's hatred of sin was emphasized and his irreconcilable position toward the sinner so justified that one felt like a miserable, helpless, forsaken worm of the dust in trying to approach him, even in prayer. Having brought you into a condition of profound humility, the only cardinal virtue for one under conviction, in the depths of your despair you were told that it required no Herculean effort on your part to be transformed into an angel, to be reconciled to God, to escape endless perdition. The way to salvation was short and simple. 
we had naught to do but to repent and believe and give our hearts to Jesus, who was ever ready to receive them. How to do all this was the puzzling question. Talking with Dr. Finney one day, I said, I cannot understand what I am to do. If you should tell me to go to the top of the church steeple and jump off, I would readily do it, if thereby I could save my soul. But I do not know how to go to Jesus. Repent and believe, said he. That is all you have to do to be happy here and hereafter. I am very sorry, I replied, for all the evil I have done, and I believe all you tell me, and the more sincerely I believe, the more unhappy I am. With the natural reaction from despair to hope, many of us imagined ourselves converted, prayed and gave our experiences in the meetings, and at times rejoiced in the thought that we were Christians, chosen children of God rather than sinners and outcasts. But Dr. Finney's terrible anathemas on the depravity and deceitfulness of the human heart soon shortened our newborn hopes. His appearance in the pulpit on these memorable occasions is indelibly impressed on my mind. I can see him now, his great eyes rolling around the congregation, and his arms flying about in the air like those of a windmill. One evening he described hell and the devil and the long profession of sinners being swept down the rapids, about to make the awful plunge into the burning depths of liquid fire below, and the rejoicing hosts in the inferno coming up to meet them with the shouts of the devils echoing through the vaulted arches. He suddenly halted, and pointing his index finger at the supposed procession, he exclaimed, There! Do you not see them? I was wrought up to such a pitch that I actually jumped up and gazed in the direction to which he pointed, while the picture glowed before my eyes and remained with me for months afterward. I cannot forbear saying that although high respect is due to the intellectual, moral, and spiritual gifts of the venerable ex-president of Oberlin College, such preaching worked incalculable harm to the very souls he sought to save. Fear of the judgment seized my soul. Visions of the lost haunted my dreams. Mental anguish prostrated my health. Dethronement of my reason was apprehended by friends. But he was sincere, so peace to his ashes. Returning home, I often at night roused my father from his slumbers to pray for me, lest I should be cast into the bottomless pit before morning. To change the current of my thoughts, a trip was planned to Niagara, and it was decided that the subject of religion was to be tabooed altogether. Accordingly, our party, consisting of my sister, her husband, my father, and myself, started in our private carriage, and for six weeks I heard nothing on the subject. About this time Gall and Spurzheim published their works on phrenology, followed by Combs' Constitution of Man, his moral philosophy, and many other liberal works all so rational and opposed to the old theologies that they produced a profound impression on my brother-in-law's mind. As we had these books with us, reading and discussing by the way, we all became deeply interested in the new ideas. Thus, after many months of weary wandering in the intellectual labyrinth of the fall of man, original sin, total depravity, God's wrath, Satan's triumph, the crucifixion, the atonement, and salvation by faith, I found my way out of the darkness into the clear sunlight of truth. My religious superstitions gave place to rational ideas based on scientific facts, and in proportion, as I looked at everything from a new standpoint, I grew more and more happy day by day. Thus, with a delightful journey in the month of June, an entire change in my course of reading, and the current of my thoughts, my mind was restored to its normal condition. I view it as one of the greatest crimes to shadow the minds of the young with these gloomy superstitions, and with fears of the unknown and the unknowable to poison all their joy in life. After the restraints of childhood at home and in school, what a period of irrepressible joy and freedom comes to us in girlhood with the first taste of liberty! Then is our individuality in a measure recognized and our feelings and opinions consulted. Then we decide where and when we will come and go, what we will eat, drink, wear, and do, to suit one's own fancy in clothes, to buy what one likes, and wear what one chooses is a great privilege to most young people. 
to go out at pleasure to walk to ride to drive with no one to say us nay or question our right to liberty this is indeed like a birth into a new world of happiness and freedom this is the period too when the emotions rule us and we idealize everything in life when love and hope make the present an ecstasy and the future bright with anticipation then comes that dream of bliss that for weeks and months throws a halo of glory round the most ordinary characters in everyday life holding the strongest and most common-sense young men and women in a thraldom from which few mortals escape the period when love in soft silver tones whispers his first words of adoration painting our graces and virtues day by day in living colors in poetry and prose stealthily punctuated ever and anon with a kiss or fond embrace what dignity it adds to a young girl's estimate of herself when some strong man makes her feel that in her hands rest his future peace and happiness though these seasons of intoxication may come once to all yet they are seldom repeated how often in after life we long for one more such rapturous dream of bliss one more season of supreme human love and passion after leaving school until my marriage i had the most pleasant years of my girlhood with frequent visits to a large circle of friends and relatives in various towns and cities the monotony of home life was sufficiently broken to make our simple country pleasures always delightful and enjoyable an entirely new life now opened to me the old bondage of fear of the visible and the invisible was broken and no longer subject to absolute authority i rejoiced in the dawn of a new day of freedom in thought and action my brother-in-law edward bayard ten years my senior was an inestimable blessing to me at this time especially as my mind was just then opening to the consideration of all the varied problems of life to me and my sisters he was a companion in all our amusements a teacher in the higher departments of knowledge and a counselor in all our youthful trials and disappointments he was of a metaphysical turn of mind and in the pursuit of truth was in no way trammeled by popular superstitions he took nothing for granted and like socrates went about asking questions nothing pleased him more than to get a bevy of bright young girls about him and teach them how to think clearly and reason logically one great advantage of the years my sisters and myself spent at the troy seminary was the large number of pleasant acquaintances we made there many of which ripened into lifelong friendships from time to time many of our classmates visited us and all alike enjoyed the intellectual fencing in which my brother-in-law drilled them he discoursed with us on law philosophy political economy history and poetry and together we read novels without number the long winter evenings thus passed pleasantly mr baird alternately talking and reading aloud scott bulwer james cooper and dickens whose works were just then coming out in numbers from week to week always leaving us in suspense at the most critical point of the story our readings were varied with recitations music dancing and games as we all enjoyed brisk exercise even with the thermometer below zero we took long walks and sleigh rides during the day and thus the winter months glided quickly by while the glorious summer on those blue hills was a period of unmixed enjoyment at this season we arose at five in the morning for a long ride on horseback through the beautiful mohawk valley and over the surrounding hills every road and lane in that region was as familiar to us and our ponies as were the trees to the squirrels we frightened as we cantered by their favorite resorts part of the time margaret christie a young girl of scotch descent was a member of our family circle she taught us french music and dancing our days were too short for all we had to do for our time was not wholly given to pleasure we were required to keep our rooms in order mend and make our clothes and do our own ironing the latter was one of mother's politic requirements to make our laundry lists as short as possible ironing on hot days in summer was a sore trial to all of us but miss christie being of an inventive turn of mind soon taught us a short way out of it she folded and smoothed her undergarments with her hands and then sat on them for a specified time 
We all followed her example and thus utilized the hours devoted to our French lessons, and while reading Corinne and Telemaque, in this primitive style, we ironed our clothes. But for dresses, collars and cuffs, and pocket handkerchiefs, we were compelled to wield the hot iron. Hence, with these articles, we used all due economy, and my mother's object was thus accomplished. As I had become sufficiently philosophical to talk over my religious experiences calmly with my classmates who had been with me through the Finney Revival meetings, we all came to the same conclusion that we had passed through no remarkable change, and that we had not been born again, as they say, for we found our tastes and enjoyments the same as ever. My brother-in-law explained to us the nature of the delusion we had all experienced, the physical conditions, the mental processes, the church machinery by which such excitements are worked up, and the impositions to which credulous minds are necessarily subjected. As we had all been through that period of depression and humiliation, and had been oppressed at times with the feeling that all our professions were errant hypocrisy and that our last state was worse than our first he helped us to understand these workings of the human mind and reconciled us to the more rational condition in which we now found ourselves he never grew weary of expounding principles to us and dissipating the fogs and mists that gather over young minds educated in an atmosphere of superstition we had a constant source of amusement and vexation in the students in my father's office. A succession of them was always coming fresh from college and full of conceit, aching to try their powers of debate on graduates from the Troy Seminary. They politely questioned all our theories and assertions. However, with my brother-in-law's training in analysis and logic, we were a match for any of them. Nothing pleased me better than a long argument with them on woman's equality, which I tried to prove by a diligent study of the books they read and the games they played. I confess that I did not study so much for love of the truth or my own development in those days as to make those young men recognize my equality. I soon noticed that after losing a few games of chess, my opponent talked less of masculine superiority. Sister Madge would occasionally rush to the defense with an emphatic, Fudge for these laws all made by men. I'll never obey one of them. And as to the students with their impertinent talk of superiority, all they need is such a shaking up as I gave the most disagreeable one yesterday. I invited him to take a ride on horseback. He accepted promptly and said he would be most happy to go. Accordingly, I told Peter to saddle the toughest-mouthed, hardest-trotting carriage horse in the stable. Mounted on my swift pony, I took a ten-mile canter as fast as I could go, with that superior being at my heels calling, as he found breath, for me to stop, which I did at last and left him in the hands of Peter, half dead at his hotel, where he will be laid out with all his marvelous masculine virtues for a week at least. Now do not waste your arguments on these prigs from Union College. Take each in turn the ten-mile circuit on old Boney, and they'll have no breath left to prate of woman's inferiority. You might argue with them all day, and you could not make them feel so small as I made that Popinjay feel in one hour. I knew old Boney would keep up with me if he died for it, and that my escort would neither stop nor dismount except by throwing himself from the saddle. Oh, Madge, I exclaimed, what will you say when he meets you again? If he complains, I will say the next time you ride, see that you have a curb bit before starting. Surely a man ought to know what is necessary to manage a horse, and not expect a woman to tell him. Our lives were still further varied and intensified by the usual number of flirtations, so called, more or less lasting or evanescent, from all of which I emerged, as from my religious experiences, in a more rational frame of mind. We had been too much in the society of boys and young gentlemen, and knew too well their real character, to idealize the sex in general. In addition to our own observations, we had the advantage of our brother-in-law's wisdom. Wishing to save us as long as possible from all matrimonial entanglements, he was continually unveiling those with whom he associated, and so critically portraying their intellectual and moral condition that it was quite impossible in our most worshipful moods, to make gods of any of the sons of Adam. However, in spite of all our own experiences, and of all the warning words of wisdom from those who had seen life in its many phases, we entered the charmed circle at last, 
all but one marrying into the legal profession, with its odious statute laws and infamous decisions. And this, after reading Blackstone, Kent, and Story, and thoroughly understanding the status of the wife under the old common law of England, which was in force at that time in most of the states of the Union. End of chapter 3 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Miller, Canal Winchester, Ohio. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Chapter 4. Life at Peterborough The year with us was never considered complete without a visit to Peterborough, New York, the home of Garrett Smith. Though he was a reformer and was very radical in many of his ideas, yet being a man of broad sympathies, culture, wealth, and position, he drew around him many friends of the most conservative opinions. He was a man of fine presence, rare physical beauty, most affable and courteous in manner, and his hospitalities were generous to an extreme, and dispensed to all classes of society. Every year representatives from the Oneida tribe of Indians visited him. His father had early purchased of them large tracts of land, and there was a tradition among them that as an equivalent for the good bargains of the father, they had a right to the son's hospitality, with annual gifts of clothing and provisions. The slaves, too, had heard of Garrett Smith, the abolitionist, and of Peterborough as one of the safe points, and wrote for Canada. His mansion was, in fact, one of the stations on the Underground Railroad for slaves escaping from bondage. Hence they, too, felt they had a right to a place under his protecting roof. On such occasions the barn and the kitchen floor were utilized as chambers for the black man from the southern plantation and the red man from his home in the forest. The spacious home was always enlivened with choice society from every part of the country. There one would meet members of the families of the old Dutch aristocracy, the Van Rensselaers, the Van Vectens, the Schuylers, the Livingstons, the Bleekers, the Brickerhoffs, the Ten Eyck's, the Millers, the Seymours, the Cochrans, the Biddles, the Barclays, the Wendells, and many others. As the lady of the house, Anne Carol Fitzhugh, was the daughter of a wealthy slaveholder of Maryland, many agreeable Southerners were often among the guests. Our immediate family relatives were well represented by General John Cochran and his sisters, General Baird and his wife from West Point, the Fitzhughes from Oswego and Geneseo, the Bacchuses and Tallmans from Rochester, and the Swifts from Geneva. Here one was sure to meet scholars, philosophers, philanthropists, judges, bishops, clergymen, and statesmen. Judge Alfred Conkling, the father of Roscoe Conkling, was in his late years frequently seen at Peterborough. Tall and stately, after all life's troubled scenes, financial losses, and domestic sorrows, he used to say there was no spot on earth that seemed so like his idea of paradise. The proud, reserved judge was unaccustomed to manifestations of affection and tender interest in his behalf, and when Garrett, taking him by both hands, would in his softest tones say, Good morning, and inquire how he had slept and what he would like to do that day, and Nancy would greet him with equal warmth and pin a little bunch of roses in his buttonhole, I have seen the tears in his eyes. Their warm sympathies and sweet simplicity of manner melted the sternest natures and made the most reserved amiable. There never was such an atmosphere of love and peace, of freedom and good cheer in any other home I visited, and this was the universal testimony of those who were guests at Peterborough. To go anywhere else after a visit there was like coming down from the divine heights into the valley of humiliation. How changed from the early days when as strict Presbyterians they believed in all the doctrines of Calvin! Then an indefinite gloom pervaded their home. Their consciences were diseased. They attached such undue importance to forms that they went through three kinds of baptism. At one time Nancy would read nothing but the Bible, sing nothing but hymns, and play only sacred music. 
She felt guilty if she talked on any subject except religion. She was, in all respects, a fitting mate for her attractive husband. G exquisitely refined in feeling and manner, beautiful in face and form, earnest and sincere, she sympathized with him in all his ideas of religion and reform. Together they passed through every stage of theological experience, from the uncertain ground of superstition and speculation to the solid foundation of science and reason. The position of the Church in the anti-slavery conflict, opening as it did all questions of ecclesiastical authority, Bible interpretation, and Church discipline, awakened them to new thought and broader views on religious subjects, and eventually emancipated them entirely from the old dogmas and formalities of their faith, and lifted them into the cheerful atmosphere in which they passed the remainder of their lives. Their only daughter, Elizabeth, added greatly to the attractions of the home circle, as she drew many young people round her. Beside her personal charm, she was the heiress of a vast estate and had many admirers. The favored one was Charles Dudley Miller of Utica, nephew of Mrs. Blandina Bleeker Dudley, founder of the Albany Observatory. At the close of his college life, Mr. Miller had not only mastered the languages, mathematics, rhetoric, and logic, but had learned the secret windings of the human heart. He understood the art of pleasing. These were the times when the anti-slavery question was up for hot discussion. In all the neighboring towns, conventions were held in which James G. Burney, a southern gentleman who had emancipated his slaves, Charles Stewart of Scotland, and George Thompson of England, Garrison, Phillips, May, Beriah Green, Foster, Abby Kelly, Lucretia Mott, Douglas, and others took part. Here, too, John Brown, Sanborn, Morton, and Frederick Douglass met to talk over that fatal movement on Harper's Ferry. On the question of temperance, also, the people were in a ferment. Dr. Cheever's pamphlet, Deacon Giles's distillery, was scattered far and wide, and as he was sued for libel, the question was discussed in the courts as well as at every fireside. Then came the Father Matthew and Washingtonian movements, and the position of the church on these questions intensified and embittered the conflict. This brought the Cheevers, the Pierponts, the Delavans, the Nortons, and their charming wives to Peterborough. It was with such company and varied discussions on every possible phase of political, religious, and social life that I spent weeks every year. Garrett Smith was cool and calm in debate, and as he was armed at all points on these subjects, he could afford to be patient and fair with an opponent, whether on the platform or at the fireside. These rousing arguments at Peterborough made social life seem tame and profitless elsewhere, and the youngest of us felt that the conclusions reached in this school of philosophy were not to be questioned. The sisters of General Cochrane, in disputes with their Dutch cousins in Schenectady and Albany, would end all controversy by saying, this question was fully discussed at Peterborough and settled. The youngsters frequently put the lessons of freedom and individual rights they heard so much of into practice and relieved their brains from the constant strain of argument on first principles by the wildest hilarity in dancing, all kinds of games and practical jokes carried beyond all bounds of propriety. These romps generally took place at Mr. Miller's. He used to say facetiously that they talked a good deal about liberty over the way, but he kept the goddess under his roof. One memorable occasion in which our enthusiasm was kept at white heat for two hours I must try to describe. The words cannot do it justice, as it was preeminently a spectacular performance. The imagination even cannot do justice to the limp, woebegone appearance of the actors in the closing scene. These romps were conducted on a purely democratic basis, without regard to color, sex, or previous condition of servitude. It was rather a cold day in the month of March, when Cousin Charlie, as we called Mr. Miller, was superintending some men who were laying a plank walk in the rear of his premises. Some half-dozen of us were invited to an early tea at Good Deacon Huntington's. Immediately after dinner, Miss Fitzhugh and Miss Van Schaak decided to take a nap, that they might appear as brilliant as possible during the evening. That they might not be late, as they invariably were, 
Cousin Lizzie and I decided to rouse them in good season with a generous sprinkling of cold water. In vain they struggled to keep the blankets around them. With equal force we pulled them away, and whenever a stray finger or toe appeared we brought fresh batteries to bear until they saw that passive resistance must give place to active hostility. We were armed with two watering pots. They armed themselves with two large-sized syringes used for showering potato bugs. With these weapons they gave us chase downstairs. We ran into a closet and held the door shut. They quietly waited our forthcoming. As soon as we opened the door to peep out, Miss Fitzhugh, who was large and strong, pulled it wide open and showered us with a vengeance. Then they fled into a large pantry where stood several pans of milk. At this stage Cousin Charlie, hearing the rumpus, came to our assistance. He locked them in the pantry and returned to his work whereupon they opened the window and showered him with milk, while he, in turn, pelted them with wet clothes, soaking in tubs nearby. As they were thinly clad, wet to the skin, and the cold March wind blew out round them, we were all in fatigue costume in starting. They implored us to let them out, which we did, and, in return for our kindness, they gave us a broadside of milk in our faces. Cousin Lizzie and I fled to the dark closet, where they locked us in. After long, weary waiting, they came to offer us terms of capitulation. Lizzie agreed to fill their guns with milk, and give them our watering pots full of water. And I agreed to call Cousin Charlie under my window until they emptied the contents of guns and pots on his head. My room was on the first floor, and Miss Fitzhugh's immediately overhead. On these terms we accepted our freedom. Accordingly, I gently raised the window and called Charlie confidentially within whispering distance, when down came a shower of water. As he stepped back to look up and see whence it came, and who made the attack, a stream of milk hit him on the forehead. His heels struck a plank and he fell backward, to all appearance knocked down with a stream of milk. His humiliation was received with shouts of derisive laughter, and even the carpenters at work laid down their hammers and joined in the chorus. But his revenge was swift and capped the climax. Cold and wet as we all were, and completely tired out, we commenced to disrobe and get ready for the tea party. Unfortunately, I had forgotten to lock my door, and in walked Cousin Charlie with a quart bottle of liquid blacking, which he prepared to empty on my devoted head. I begged so eloquently, and trembled so, at the idea of being dyed black, that he said he would let me off on one condition, and that was to get him, by some means, into Miss Fitzhugh's room. So I ran screaming up the stairs, as if hotly pursued by the enemy, and begged her to let me in. She cautiously opened the door, but when she saw Charlie behind me, she tried to force it shut. However, he was too quick for her. He had one leg and arm in, but at that stage of her toilette, to let him in was impossible, and there they stood, equally strong, firmly braced, she on one side of the door and he on the other. But the blacking he was determined she should have. So, gauging her probable position, with one desperate effort he squeezed in a little farther, and raising the bottle, he poured the contents on her head. The blacking went streaming down over her face, white robe, and person, and left her looking more like a bronze fury than one of Eve's most charming daughters. A yard or more of the carpet was ruined, the wallpaper and bedclothes spattered, and the poor victim was unfit to be seen for a week at least. Charlie had a good excuse for his extreme measures, for as we all by turn played our tricks on him, it was necessary to keep us in some fear of punishment. This was but one of the many outrageous pranks we perpetuated on each other. To see us a few hours later, all absorbed in an anti-slavery or temperance convention, or dressed in our best, in high discourse with the philosophers, one would never think we could have been guilty of such consummate follies. It was, however, but the natural reaction from the general serious trend of our thoughts. It was in Peterborough, too, that I first met one who was then considered the most eloquent and impassioned orator on the anti-slavery platform, Henry B. Stanton. 
He had come over from Utica with Alvin Stewart's beautiful daughter, to whom report said he was engaged. But as she soon after married Luther R. Marsh, there was a mistake somewhere. However, the rumor had its advantages. Regarding him as not in the matrimonial market, we were all much more free and easy in our manners with him than we would otherwise have been. A series of anti-slavery conventions was being held in Madison County, and there I had the pleasure of hearing him for the first time. As I had a passion for oratory, I was deeply impressed with his power. He was not so smooth and eloquent as Phillips, but he could make his audience both laugh and cry. The latter, Phillips himself said he never could do. Mr. Stanton was then in his prime a fine-looking, affable young man, with remarkable conversational talent, and was ten years my senior, with the advantage that number of years necessarily gives. Two carriage-loads of ladies and gentlemen drove off every morning, sometimes ten miles, to one of these conventions, returning late at night. I shall never forget those charming drives over the hills in Madison County, the bright autumnal days and the bewitching moonlight nights. The enthusiasm of the people in these great meetings, the thrilling oratory, and lucid arguments of the speakers all conspired to make these days memorable as among the most charming in my life. It seemed to me that I never had so much happiness crowded into one short month. I had become interested in the anti-slavery and temperance questions and was deeply impressed with the appeals and arguments. I felt a new inspiration in life and was enthused with new ideas of individual rights and the basic principles of government, for the anti-slavery platform was the best school the American people ever had on which to learn Republican principles and ethics. These conventions and the discussions at my cousin's fireside I count among the great blessings of my life. One morning, as we came out from breakfast, Mr. Stanton joined me on the piazza, where I was walking up and down, enjoying the balmy air and the beauty of the foliage. "'As we have no convention,' said he, on hand, "'what do you say to a ride on horseback this morning?' I readily accepted the suggestion, ordered the horses, put on my habit, and away we went. The roads were fine, and we took a long ride. As we were returning home, we stopped often to admire the scenery, and perchance each other. When walking slowly through a beautiful grove, he laid his hand on the horn of the saddle, and to my surprise made one of those charming revelations of human feeling which brave knights have always found eloquent words to utter, and to which fair ladies have always listened with mingled emotions of pleasure and astonishment. One outcome of those glorious days of October, 1839, was a marriage in Johnstown, the 10th of May, 1840, and a voyage to the Old World. Six weeks of that charming autumn ending in the Indian summer with its peculiarly hazy atmosphere, I lingered in Peterborough. It seems in retrospect like a beautiful dream. A succession of guests was constantly coming and going, and I still remember the daily drives over those grand old hills crowned with trees now gorgeous in rich colors, the more charming because we knew the time was short before the cold winds of November would change all. The early setting sun warned us that the shortening days must soon end our twilight drives, and the moonlight nights were too chilly to linger long in the rustic arbors or shady nooks outside. With the peculiar charm of this season of the year, there is always a touch of sadness in nature, and it seemed doubly so to me, as my engagement was not one of unmixed joy and satisfaction. Among all conservative families, there was a strong aversion to abolitionists and the whole anti-slavery movement. Alone with Cousin Garrett in his library, he warned me, in deep, solemn tones, while strongly eulogizing my lover, that my father would never consent to my marriage with an abolitionist. He felt in duty bound, as my engagement had occurred under his roof, to free himself from all responsibility by giving me a long dissertation on love, friendship, marriage, and all the pitfalls for the unwary, 
who without due consideration formed matrimonial relations. The general principles laid down in this interview did not strike my youthful mind so forcibly as the suggestion that it was better to announce my engagement by letter than to wait until I returned home. As thus I might draw the hottest fire while still in safe harbor, where Cousin Garrett could help me defend the weak points in my position. So I lingered at Peterborough to prolong the dream of happiness and postpone the conflict I feared to meet. But the judge understood the advantage of our position as well as we did and wasted no ammunition on us. Being even more indignant at my cousin than at me, he quietly waited until I returned home, when I passed through the ordeal of another interview with another dissertation on domestic relations from a financial standpoint. These were two of the most bewildering interviews I ever had. They succeeded in making me feel that the step I proposed to take was the most momentous and far-reaching in its consequences of any in this mortal life. Heretofore my apprehensions had all been of death and eternity. Now life itself was filled with fears and anxiety as to the possibilities of the future. Thus these two noble men, who would have done anything for my happiness, actually overweighted my conscience and turned the sweetest dream of my life into a tragedy. How little strong men, with their logic, sophistry, and hypothetical examples, appreciate the violence they inflict on the tender sensibilities of a woman's heart in trying to subjugate her to their will! The love of protecting too often degenerates into downright tyranny. Fortunately, all these somber pictures of a possible future were thrown into the background by the tender missives every post brought me, in which the brilliant word-painting of one of the most eloquent pens of this generation made the future for us both as bright and beautiful as spring with her verdure and blossoms of promise. However, many things were always transpiring at Peterborough to turn one's thoughts and rouse new interest in humanity at large. One day, as a bevy of us girls were singing and chattering in the parlor, Cousin Garrett entered, and in mysterious tones said, I have a most important secret to tell you, which you must keep to yourselves religiously for twenty-four hours. We readily pledged ourselves in the most solemn manner individually and collectively. Now, he said, follow me to the third story. This we did, wondering what the secret could be. At last, opening a door, he ushered us into a large room, in the center of which sat a beautiful quadroon girl, about eighteen years of age. Addressing her, he said, Harriet, I have brought all my young cousins to see you. I want you to make good abolitionists of them by telling them the history of your life, what you have seen and suffered in slavery. Turning to us, he said, Harriet has just escaped from her master, who is visiting in Syracuse, and is on her way to Canada. She will start this evening, and you may never have another opportunity of seeing a slave girl face to face, so ask her all you care to know of the system of slavery. For two hours we listened to the sad story of her childhood and youth, separated from all her family and sold for her beauty in a New Orleans market when but fourteen years of age. The details of her story I need not repeat. The fate of such girls is too well known to need rehearsal. We all wept together as she talked, and when Cousin Garrett returned to summon us away, we needed no further education to make us earnest abolitionists. Dressed as a Quakeress, Harriet started at twilight with one of Mr. Smith's faithful clerks in a carriage for Oswego, there to cross the lake to Canada. The next day her master and the marshals from Syracuse were on her track in Peterborough and traced her to Mr. Smith's premises. He was quite gracious in receiving them, and while assuring them that there was no slave there, he said that they were at liberty to make a thorough search of the house and grounds. He invited them to stay and dine, and kept them talking as long as possible, as every hour helped Harriet to get beyond their reach. For although she had eighteen hours the start of them, yet we feared some accident might have delayed her. 
The master was evidently a gentleman, for on Mr. Smith's assurance that Harriet was not there, he made no search, feeling that they could not do so without appearing to doubt his word. He was evidently surprised to find an abolitionist so courteous and affable, and it was interesting to hear them in conversation at dinner, calmly discussing the problem of slavery, while public sentiment was at white heat on the question. They shook hands warmly at parting, and expressed an equal interest in the final adjustment of that national difficulty. In due time the clerk returned with good news that Harriet was safe with friends in a good situation in Canada. Mr. Smith then published an open letter to the master in the New York Tribune, saying, quote, that he would no doubt rejoice to know that his slave Harriet, in whose fate he felt so deep an interest, was now a free woman, safe under the shadow of the British throne. I had the honor of entertaining her under my roof, sending her in my carriage to Lake Ontario just eighteen hours before your arrival. Hence my willingness to have you search my premises." Unquote. Like the varied combinations of the kaleidoscope, the scenes in our social life at Peterborough were continually changing from grave to gay. Some years later we had a most hilarious occasion at the marriage of Mary Cochran, sister of General John Cochran, to Chapman Biddle of Philadelphia. The festivities which were kept up for three days involved most elaborate preparations for breakfasts, dinners, etc., there being no Delmonico's in that remote part of the country. It was decided in family council that we had sufficient culinary talent under the roof to prepare the entire menu of substantials and delicacies from soup and salmon to cakes and creams. So gifted ladies and gentlemen were impressed into the service. The Fitzhughes all had a natural talent for cooking, and chief among them was Isabella, wife of a naval officer, Lieutenant Swift of Geneva, who had made a profound study of all the authorities from Archistratus, a poet in Syracuse, the most famous cook among the Greeks, down to our own Miss Leslie. Accordingly, she was elected manager of the occasion, and to each one was assigned the specialty in which she claimed to excel. Those who had no specialty were assistants to those who had. In this humble office, assistant at large, I labored throughout. Cooking is a high art, a wise Egyptian said long ago, quote, The degree of taste and skill manifested by a nation in the preparation of food may be regarded as to a very considerable extent proportioned to its culture and refinement." Unquote. In early times men only were deemed capable of handling fire, whether at the altar or the hearthstone. We read in the scriptures that Abraham prepared cakes of fine meal and a calf tender and good, which with butter and milk he set before the three angels in the plains of Mamre. We are told, too, of the chief butler and chief baker as officers in the household of King Pharaoh. I would like to call the attention of my readers to the dignity of this profession, which some young women affect to despise. The fact that angels eat shows that we may be called upon in the next sphere to cook even for cherubim and seraphim. How important, then, to cultivate one's gifts in that direction! With such facts before us, we stirred and pounded, whipped and ground, coaxed the delicate meats from crabs and lobsters and the succulent peas from the pods, and grated corn and cocoa nut with the same cheerfulness and devotion that we played Mendelssohn's songs without words on the piano, the Spanish fandango on our guitars, or danced the minuet, polka, lancers, or Virginia reel. During the day of the wedding, every stagecoach was crowded with guests from the north, south, east, and west, and as the twilight deepened, the carriages began to roll in with neighbors and friends living at short distances until the house and grounds were full. A son of Bishop Cox, who married the tall and stately sister of Roscoe Conkling, performed the ceremony. The beautiful young bride was given away by her uncle Garrett. The congratulations, the feast, and all went off with fitting decorum in the usual way. The best proof of the excellence of our viands was that they were all speedily swept from mortal view, and every housewife wanted a recipe for something. 
As the grand dinner was to come off the next day, our thoughts now turned in that direction. The responsibility rested heavily on the heads of the chief actors, and they reported troubled dreams and unduly early rising. Dear Belle Swift was up in season, and her white soup stood serenely in a tin pan on an upper shelf before the town clock struck seven. If it had not taken that position so early, it might have been incorporated with higher forms of life than that into which it eventually fell. Another artist was also on the wing early, and in pursuit of a tin pan in which to hide her precious compound, she unwittingly seized this one, and the rich white soup rolled down her raven locks like the oil on Aaron's beard, and enveloped her in a veil of filmy whiteness. I heard the splash and the exclamation of surprise, and entered the butler's pantry just in time to see the heiress of the Smith estate standing like a statue, tin pan in hand, soup in her curls, her eyebrows and eyelashes, collar, cuffs, and morning dress saturated, and Belle at a little distance looking at her and the soup on the floor with surprise and disgust depicted on every feature. The tableau was inexpressibly comical, and I could not help laughing outright, whereupon Belle turned on me, and with indignant tone said, If you had been up since four o'clock making that soup, you would not stand there like a laughing monkey without the least feeling of pity. Poor Lizzie was very sorry, and would have shed tears, but they could not penetrate that film of soup. I tried to apologize, but could only laugh the more when I saw Belle crying, and Lizzie standing as if hoping that the soup might be scraped off her and gathered from the floor and made to do duty on the occasion. After breakfast, ladies and gentlemen, alike in white aprons, crowded into the dining room and kitchen, each to perform the allotted task. George Biddle of Philadelphia and John B. Miller of Utica, in holiday spirits, were irrepressible everywhere at the same moment, helping or hindering as the case may be. Dear Belle, having only partially recovered from the white soup catastrophe, called Mr. Biddle to hold the ice cream freezer while she poured in the luscious compound she had just prepared. He held it up without resting it on anything, while Belle slowly poured in the cream. As the freezer had no indentations round the top or rim to brace the thumbs and fingers, when it grew suddenly heavier, his hand slipped and down went the whole thing, spattering poor Belle and spoiling a beautiful pair of gaiters, in which, as she had very pretty feet, she took a laudable pride. In another corner sat Wilthea Bacchus grating some coconut. While struggling in that operation, John Miller, feeling hilarious, was annoying her in divers ways. At length she drew the grater across his nose, gently as she intended, but alas, she took the skin off, and John's beauty for the remainder of the festivities was marred with a black patch on that prominent feature. One can readily imagine the fun that must have transpired where so many amateur cooks were at work round one table with all manner of culinary tools and ingredients. As assistant at large, I was summoned to the cellar, where Mrs. Cornelia Barclay of New York was evolving from a pan of flour and water that miracle in the pie department called puff paste. This, it seems, can only be accomplished where the thermometer is below 40, and near a refrigerator where the compound can be kept cold until ready to be popped into the oven. No jokes or nonsense here. With queenly dignity, the flour and water were gently compressed. Here one hand must not know what the other doeth. Bits of butter must be so deftly introduced that even the rolling pin may be unconscious of its work. As the artist gave the last touch to an exquisite lemon pie, with a mingled expression of pride and satisfaction on her classic features, she ordered me to bear it to the oven. In the transit I met Madame Bell. Don't let that fall, she said sneeringly. Fortunately, I did not, and returned in triumph to transport another. I was then summoned to a consultation with the Committee on Toasts, consisting of James Cochran, John Miller, and myself. Mr. Miller had one for each guest already written, all of which we accepted and pronounced very good. Strange to say, a most excellent dinner emerged from all this uproar and confusion. The table, with its silver, china, flowers, and rich viands, the guests in satins, velvets, jewels, soft laces, and bright cravats, together reflecting all the colors of the prism, looked as beautiful as the rainbow after a thunderstorm. 
Twenty years ago I made my last sad visit to that spot so rich with pleasant memories of bygone days. A few relatives and family friends gathered there to pay the last tokens of respect to our noble cousin. It was on one of the coldest days of grey December that we laid him in the frozen earth to be seen no more. He died from a stroke of apoplexy in New York City at the home of his niece, Mrs. Ellen Cochran Walter, whose mother was Mr. Smith's only sister. The journey from New York to Peterborough was cold and dreary, and climbing the hills from Canastota in an open sleigh, nine hundred feet above the valley, with the thermometer below zero before sunrise, made all nature look as somber as the sad errand on which we came. Outside the mansion everything in its wintry garb was cold and still, and all within was silent as the grave. The central figure, the light and joy of that home, had vanished forever. He who had welcomed us on that threshold for half a century would welcome us no more. We did what we could to dissipate the gloom that settled on us all. We did not intensify our grief by darkening the house and covering ourselves with black crepe, but wore our accustomed dresses of chastened colors, and opened all the blinds that the glad sunshine might stream in. We hung the apartment where the casket stood, with wreaths of evergreens, and overhead we wove his favorite mottoes in living letters. Equal rights for all. Rescue Cuba now! The religious services were short and simple. The Unitarian clergyman from Syracuse made a few remarks. The children from the orphan asylum, in which he was deeply interested, sang an appropriate hymn, and around the grave stood representatives of the Biddles, the Dixwells, the Sedgwicks, the Barclays, and Stantons, and three generations of his immediate family. With a few appropriate words from General John Cochran, we left our beloved kinsman alone in his last resting place. Two months later, on his birthday, his wife, Anne Carol Fitzhugh, passed away and was laid by his side. Theirs was a remarkably happy union of over half a century, and they were soon reunited in the life eternal. End of chapter 4 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Chapter 5 Our Wedding Journey My engagement was a season of doubt and conflict, doubt as to the wisdom of changing a girlhood of freedom and enjoyment for I knew not what, and conflict because the step I proposed was in opposition to the wishes of all my family. Whereas heretofore friends were continually suggesting suitable matches for me and painting the marriage relation in the most dazzling colors, now that state was represented as beset with dangers and disappointments, and men of all God's creatures as the most depraved and unreliable. Hard-pressed, I broke my engagement after months of anxiety and bewilderment. Suddenly I decided to renew it, as Mr. Stanton was going to Europe as a delegate to the world's anti-slavery convention, and we did not wish the ocean to roll between us. Thursday, May tenth, 1840, I determined to take the fateful step, without the slightest preparation for a wedding or a voyage. But Mr. Stanton, coming up the North River, was detained on Marcy's Overslaw, a bar in the river where boats were frequently stranded for hours. This delay compelled us to be married on Friday, which is commonly supposed to be a most unlucky day. But as we lived together, without more than the usual matrimonial friction, for nearly half a century, had seven children, all but one of whom are still living, and have been well sheltered, clothed and fed, enjoying sound minds in sound bodies, no one need be afraid of going through the marriage ceremony on Friday for fear of bad luck. The Scotch clergyman who married us, being somewhat superstitious, begged us to postpone it until Saturday, but as we were to sail early in the coming week, that was impossible. That point settled, the next difficulty was to persuade him to leave out the word obey in the marriage ceremony. 
as I obstinately refused to obey one with whom I supposed I was entering into an equal relation, that point too was conceded. A few friends were invited to be present, and in a simple white evening dress I was married. But the good priest avenged himself for the points he conceded by keeping us on the rack with a long prayer and dissertation on the sacred institution for one mortal hour. The Reverend Hugh Mayer was a little stout fellow, vehement in manner and speech, who danced about the floor as he laid down the law in the most original and comical manner. As Mr. Stanton had never seen him before, the hour to him was one of constant struggle to maintain his equilibrium. I had sat under his ministrations for several years, and was accustomed to his rhetoric, accent, and gestures, and thus was able to go through the ordeal in a calmer state of mind. Sister Madge, who had stood by me bravely through all my doubts and anxieties, went with us to New York and saw us on board the vessel. My sister Harriet and her husband, Daniel C. Eaton, a merchant in New York City, were also there. He and I had for years a standing game of tag at all our parties, and he had vowed to send me tag to Europe. I was equally determined that he should not. Accordingly, I had a desperate chase after him all over the vessel, but in vain. He had the last tag and escaped. As I was compelled under the circumstances to conduct the pursuit with some degree of decorum, and he had the advantage of height, long limbs, and freedom from skirts, I really stood no chance whatever. However, as the chase kept us all laughing, it helped to soften the bitterness of parting. Fairly at sea, I closed another chapter of my life, and my thoughts turned to what lay in the near future. James G. Burney, the anti-slavery nominee for the presidency of the United States, joined us in New York, and was a fellow passenger on the Montreal for England. He and my husband were delegates to the world's anti-slavery convention, and both interested themselves in my anti-slavery education. They gave me books to read, and as we paced the deck day by day, the question was the chief theme of our conversation. Mr. Burney was a polished gentleman of the old school, and was excessively proper and punctilious in manner and conversation. I soon perceived that he thought I needed considerable toning down before reaching England. I was quick to see and understand that his criticisms of others in a general way, and the drift of his discourses on manners and conversation, had a nearer application than he intended I should discover, though he hoped I would profit by them. I was always grateful to anyone who took an interest in my improvement, so I laughingly told him one day that he need not make his criticisms any longer in that roundabout way, but might take me squarely in hand and polish me up as speedily as possible. Sitting in the saloon at night after a game of chess, in which perchance I had been the victor, I felt complacent and would sometimes say, "'Well, what have I said or done to-day open to criticism?' So, in the most gracious manner, he replied on one occasion, "'You went to the masthead in a chair, which I think very unladylike. I heard you call your husband Henry in the presence of strangers, which is not permissible in polite society. You should always say Mr. Stanton. You have taken three moves back in this game.' "'Bless me,' I replied. "'What a catalogue in one day! I fear my mentor will despair of my ultimate perfection.' I should have more hope, he replied, if you seem to feel my rebukes more deeply, but you evidently think them of too little consequence to be much disturbed by them. As he found even more fault with my husband, we condoled with each other, and decided that our friend was rather hypercritical, and that we were as nearly perfect as mortals need be for the wear and tear of ordinary life. Being both endowed with a good degree of self-esteem, Neither the praise nor the blame of mankind was overpowering to either of us. As the voyage lasted eighteen days, for we were on a sailing vessel, we had time to make some improvement, or at least to consider all friendly suggestions. At this time Mr. Burney was very much in love with Miss Fitzhugh of Genesio, to whom he was afterward married. He suffered at times great depression of spirits, but I could always rouse him to a sunny mood by introducing her name. That was a theme of which he never grew weary, and while praising her a halo of glory was to him visible around my head, and I was faultless for the time being. There was nothing in our fellow passengers to break the monotony of the voyage. They were all stolid, middle-class English people, returning from various parts of the world to visit their native land. 
When out of their hearing, Mr. Burney used to ridicule them without mercy. So one day, by way of making a point, I said with great solemnity, Is it good breeding to make fun of the foibles of our fellow men who have not had our advantages of culture and education? He felt the rebuke and blushed, and never again returned to that subject. I am sorry to say I was glad to find him once in fault. Though some amusement, in whatever extraordinary way I could obtain it, was necessary to my existence, yet, as it was deemed important that I should thoroughly understand the status of the anti-slavery movement in my own country, I spent most of my time reading and talking on that question. Being the wife of a delegate to the world's convention, we all felt it important that I should be able to answer whatever questions I might be asked in England on all phases of the slavery question. The captain, a jolly fellow, was always ready to second me in my explorations into every nook and cranny of the vessel. He imagined that my reading was distasteful and enforced by the older gentleman, so he was continually planning some diversion, and often invited me to sit with him and listen to his experiences of a sailor's life. But all things must end in this mortal life, and our voyage was near its termination when we were becalmed on the southern coast of England and could not make more than one knot an hour. When within sight of the distant shore, a pilot boat came along and offered to take anyone ashore in six hours. I was so delighted at the thought of reaching land that after much persuasion Mr. Stanton and Mr. Burney consented to go. Accordingly, we were lowered into the boat in an armchair, with a luncheon consisting of a cold chicken, a loaf of bread, and a bottle of wine, with just enough wind to carry our light craft toward our destination. But instead of six hours, we were all day trying to reach the land, and as the twilight deepened and the last breeze died away, the pilot said, We are now two miles from shore, but the only way you can reach there tonight is by a rowboat. As we had no provisions left, and nowhere to sleep, we were glad to avail ourselves of the rowboat. It was a bright moonlight night, the air balmy, the water smooth, and with two stout oarsmen we glided swiftly along. As Mr. Burney made the last descent and seated himself, doubtful as to our reaching shore, turning to me he said, The woman tempted me, and I did leave the good ship. However, we did reach the shore at midnight, and landed at Torquay, one of the loveliest spots in that country, and our journey to Exeter the next day lay through the most beautiful scenery in England. As we had no luggage with us, our detention by customs officers was brief, and we were soon conducted to a comfortable little hotel which we found in the morning was a bower of roses. I had never imagined anything so beautiful as the drive up to Exeter on the top of a coach, with four stout horses trotting at the rate of ten miles an hour. It was the first day of June, and the country was in all its glory. The foliage was of the softest green, the trees were covered with blossoms, and the shrubs with flowers. The roads were perfect. The large, fine-looking coachman, with his white gloves and reins, his rosy face and lofty bearing, and the postman in red, blowing his horn as we passed through every village, made the drive seem like a journey in fairyland. We had heard that England was like a garden of flowers, but we were wholly unprepared for such wealth of beauty. In Exeter we had our first view of one of the great cathedrals in the old world, and we were all deeply impressed with its grandeur. It was just at the twilight hour when the last rays of the setting sun, streaming through the stained glass windows, deepened the shadows and threw a mysterious amber light over all. As the choir was practicing, the whole effect was heightened by the deep tones of the organ reverberating through the arched roof, and the sound of human voices as if vainly trying to fill the space above. The novelty and solemnity of the surroundings roused all our religious emotions and thrilled every nerve in our being. As if moved by the same impulse to linger there a while, we all sat down, silently waiting for something to break the spell that bound us. Can one wonder at the power of the Catholic religion for centuries with such accessories to stimulate the imagination to a blind worship of the unknown? Sitting in the hotel that evening and wanting something to read, we asked the waiter for the daily papers. As there was no public table or drawing-room for guests, but each party had its own apartment, we needed a little change from the society of each other. 
Having been, as it were, shut from the outside world for eighteen days, we had some curiosity to see whether our planet was still revolving from west to east. At the mention of papers in the plural number, the attendant gave us a look of surprise and said he would get it. He returned, saying that the gentleman in number four had it, but he would be through in fifteen minutes. Accordingly, at the end of that time, he brought the newspaper, and after we had had it the same length of time, he came to take it to another party. At our lodging house in London, a paper was left for half an hour each morning, and then it was taken to the next house, thus serving several families of readers. The next day brought us to London. When I first entered our lodging house in Queen Street, I thought it the gloomiest abode I had ever seen. The arrival of a delegation of ladies the next day from Boston and Philadelphia changed the atmosphere of the establishment and filled me with delightful anticipations of some new and charming acquaintances, which I fully realized in meeting Emily Winslow, Abby Southwick, Elizabeth Neal, Mary Grew, Abby Kimber, Sarah Pugh, and Lucretia Mott. There had been a split in the American anti-slavery ranks, and delegates came from both branches, and as they were equally represented at our lodgings, I became familiar with the whole controversy. The potent element which caused the division was the woman question, and as the Garrisonian branch maintained the right of women to speak and vote in the conventions, all my sympathies were with the Garrisonians, though Mr. Stanton and Mr. Burney belonged to the other branch, called political abolitionists. To me there was no question so important as the emancipation of women from the dogmas of the past, political, religious, and social. It struck me as very remarkable that abolitionists, who felt so keenly the wrongs of the slave, should be so oblivious to the equal wrongs of their own mothers, wives, and sisters, when, according to the common law, both classes occupied a similar legal status. Our chief object in visiting England at this time was to attend the World's Anti-Slavery Convention, to meet June 12, 1840, in Freemasons Hall, London. Delegates from all the anti-slavery societies of civilized nations were invited, yet when they arrived, those representing associations of women were rejected. Though women were members of the National Anti-Slavery Society, accustomed to speak and vote in all its conventions, and to take an equally active part with men in the whole anti-slavery struggle, and were there as delegates from associations of men and women, as well as those distinctively of their own sex, yet all alike were rejected because they were women. Women, according to English prejudices at that time, were excluded by scriptural texts from sharing equal dignity and authority with men in all reform associations. Hence it was to English minds preeminently unfitting that women should be admitted as equal members to a world's convention. The question was hotly debated through an entire day. My husband made a very eloquent speech in favor of admitting the women delegates. When we consider that Lady Byron, Anna Jameson, Mary Howitt, Mrs. Hugo Reed, Elizabeth Fry, Amelia Opie, Anne Green Phillips, Lucretia Mott, and many remarkable women, speakers and leaders in the Society of Friends, were all compelled to listen in silence to the masculine platitudes on woman's sphere, one may form some idea of the indignation of unprejudiced friends, and especially that of such women as Lydia Maria Child, Maria Chapman, Deborah Weston, Angelina and Sarah Grimke, and Abby Kelly, who were impatiently waiting and watching on this side, in painful suspense to hear how their delegates were received. Judging from my own feelings, the women on both sides of the Atlantic must have been humiliated and chagrined, except as these feelings were outweighed by contempt for the shallow reasoning of their opponents, and their comical pose and gestures in some of the intensely earnest flights of their imagination. The clerical portion of the convention was most violent in its opposition. The clergymen seemed to have God and his angels especially in their care and keeping, and were in agony lest the women should do or say something to shock the heavenly hosts. Their all-sustaining conceit gave them abundant assurance that their movements must necessarily be all-pleasing to the celestials, whose ears were open to the proceedings of the world's convention. 
Deborah, Hulda, Vashti, and Esther might have questioned the propriety of calling it a world's convention, when only half of humanity was represented there. But what were their opinions worth compared with those of the Rev. A. Harvey, the Rev. C. Stout, or the Rev. J. Burnett, who, Bible in hand, argued woman's subjection, divinely decreed when Eve was created? One of our champions in the convention, George Bradburn, a tall, thick-set man, with a voice like thunder, standing head and shoulders above the clerical representatives, swept all their arguments aside by declaring with tremendous emphasis that, if they could prove to him that the Bible taught the entire subjection of one half of the race to the other, he should consider that the best thing he could do for humanity would be to bring together every Bible in the universe and make a grand bonfire of them. It was really pitiful to hear narrow-minded bigots, pretending to be teachers and leaders of men, so cruelly remanding their own mothers, with the rest of womankind, to absolute subjection to the ordinary masculine type of humanity. I always regretted that the women themselves had not taken part in the debate before the convention was fully organized and the question of delegates settled. It seemed to me then, and does now, that all delegates with credentials from recognized society should have had a voice in the organization of the convention, though subject to exclusion afterward. However, the women sat in a low curtain seat like a church choir, and modestly listened to the French, British, and American Solons for twelve of the longest days in June, as did also our grand garrison and Rogers in the gallery. They scorned a convention that ignored the rights of every woman who had fought side by side with them in the anti-slavery conflict. Quote, After battling so many long years, said Garrison, for the liberties of African slaves, I can take no part in a convention that strikes down the most sacred rights of all women. Unquote. After coming three thousand miles to speak on the subject nearest his heart, he nobly shared the enforced silence of the rejected delegates. It was a great act of self-sacrifice that should never be forgotten by women. Thomas Clarkson was chosen president of the convention and made a few remarks in opening, but he soon retired as his age and many infirmities made all public occasions too burdensome, and Joseph Sturge, a Quaker, was made chairman. Sitting next to Mrs. Mott, I said, as there is a Quaker in the chair now, what would he do if the Spirit should move you to speak? Ah, she replied, evidently not believing such a contingency possible. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. She had not much faith in the sincerity of abolitionists, who, while eloquently defending the natural rights of slaves, denied freedom of speech to one-half the people of their own race. Such was the consistency of an assemblage of philanthropists. They would have been horrified at the idea of burning the flesh of the distinguished women present with red-hot irons, but the crucifixion of their pride and self-respect, the humiliation of the spirit, seemed to them a most trifling matter. The action of this convention was the topic of discussion, in public and private, for a long time, and stung many women into new thought and action, and gave rise to the movement for women's political equality, both in England and the United States. As the convention adjourned, the remark was heard on all sides, it is about time some demand was made for new liberties for women. As Mrs. Mott and I walked home, arm in arm, commenting on the incidents of the day, we resolved to hold a convention as soon as we returned home, and form a society to advocate the rights of women. At the lodging house on Queen Street, where a large number of delegates had apartments, the discussions were heated at every meal, and at times so bitter that at last Mr. Burney packed his valise and sought more peaceful quarters. Having strongly opposed the admission of women as delegates to the convention, it was rather embarrassing to meet them during the intervals between the various sessions, at the table and in the drawing-room. These were the first women I had ever met who believed in the equality of the sexes and who did not believe in the popular orthodox religion. The acquaintance of Lucretia Mott, who was a broad liberal thinker on politics, religion, and all questions of reform, opened to me a new world of thought. As we walked about to see the sights of London, I embraced every opportunity to talk with her. 
It was intensely gratifying to hear all that, through years of doubt, I had dimly thought, so freely discussed by other women, some of them no older than myself, women, too, of rare intelligence, cultivation, and refinement. After six weeks' sojourn under the same roof with Lucretia Mott, whose conversation was uniformly on a high plane, I felt that I knew her too well to sympathize with the orthodox friends, who denounced her as a dangerous woman because she doubted certain dogmas they fully believed. As Mr. Burney and my husband were invited to speak all over England, Scotland, and Ireland, and we were uniformly entertained by orthodox friends, I had abundant opportunity to know the general feeling among them toward Lucretia Mott. Even Elizabeth Fry seemed quite unwilling to breathe the same atmosphere with her. During the six weeks that many of us remained in London after the convention, we were invited to a succession of public and private breakfasts, dinners, and teas, and on these occasions it was amusing to watch Mrs. Fry's sedulous efforts to keep Mrs. Mott at a distance. If Mrs. Mott was on the lawn, Mrs. Fry would go into the house. If Mrs. Mott was in the house, Mrs. Fry would stay out on the lawn. One evening, when we were all crowded into two parlors and there was no escape, the word went round that Mrs. Fry felt moved to pray with the American delegates, whereupon a profound silence reigned. After a few moments, Mrs. Fry's voice was heard deploring the schism among the American friends, that so many had been led astray by false doctrines, urging the spirit of all good to show them the error of their way, and gather them once more into the fold of the great shepherd of our faith. The prayer was directed so pointedly at the followers of Elias Hicks, and at Lucretia Mott in particular, that I whispered to Lucretia at the close, that she should now pray for Mrs. Fry, that her eyes might be open to her bigotry and uncharitableness, and be led by the Spirit into higher light. "'Oh, no,' she replied. "'A prayer of this character, under the circumstances, is an unfair advantage to take of a stranger, but I would not resent it in the house of her friends.' In these gatherings we met the leading Quaker families and many other philanthropists of different denominations interested in the anti-slavery movement. On all these occasions our noble garrison spoke most effectively, and thus our English friends had an opportunity of enjoying his eloquence, the lack of which had been so grave a loss in the convention. We devoted a month sedulously to sightseeing in London, and in the line of the traveler's duty we explored St. Paul's Cathedral, the British Museum, the Tower, various prisons, hospitals, galleries of art, Windsor Castle and St. James Palace, the zoological gardens, the schools and colleges, the chief theatres and churches, Westminster Abbey, the House of Parliament, and the courts. We heard the most famous preachers, actors, and statesmen, in fact, we went to the top and bottom of everything, from the dome of St. Paul to the tunnel under the Thames, just then in the process of excavation. We drove through the parks, sailed up and down the Thames, and then visited every shire but four in England, in all of which we had large meetings, Mr. Burney and Mr. Stanton being the chief speakers. As we were generally invited to stay with friends, it gave us a good opportunity to see the leading families, such as the Ashhursts, the Alexanders, the Priestmans, the Braithwaites, the Buxtons, the Gurneys, the Pieces, the Wighams of Edinburgh, and the Webbs of Dublin. We spent a few days with John Joseph Gurney at his beautiful home in Norwich. He had just returned from America, having made a tour through the South. When asked how he liked America, he said, I like everything but your pie crust and your slavery. Before leaving London, the whole American delegation, about forty in number, were invited to dine with Samuel Gurney. He and his brother, John Joseph Gurney, were at that time the leading bankers in London. Someone facetiously remarked that the Jews were the leading bankers in London until the Quakers crowded them out. One of the most striking women I met in England at this time was Miss Elizabeth Peace. I never saw a more strongly marked face. Meeting her forty years after on the platform of a great meeting in the town hall at Glasgow, I knew her at once. She is now Mrs. Nicholl of Edinburgh, and though on the shady side of eighty, is still active in all the reforms of the day. 
It surprised us very much at first, when driving into the grounds of some of these beautiful Quaker homes, to have the great bell rung at the lodge, and to see the number of liveried servants on the porch and in the halls, and then to meet the host in plain garb, and to be welcomed in plain language. How does thee do, Henry? How does thee do, Elizabeth? This sounded peculiarly sweet to me, a stranger in a strange land. The wealthy English Quakers we visited at that time, taking them all in all, were the most charming people I had ever seen. They were refined and intelligent on all subjects, and though rather conservative on some points, were not aggressive in pressing their opinions on others. Their hospitality was charming and generous, their homes the beau ideal of comfort and order, the cuisine faultless, while peace reigned over all. The quiet, gentle manner, and the soft tones in speaking, and the mysterious quiet in these well-ordered homes were like the atmosphere one finds in a modern convent, where the ordinary duties of the day seem to be accomplished by some magical influence. Before leaving London we spent a delightful day in June at the home of Samuel Gurney, surrounded by a fine park with six hundred deer roaming about always a beautiful feature in the English landscape. As the Duchess of Sutherland and Lord Morpeth had expressed a wish to Mrs. Fry to meet some of the leading American abolitionists, it was arranged that they should call at her brother's residence on this occasion. Soon after we arrived, the Duchess with her brother and Mrs. Fry, in her state carriage with six horses and outriders, drove up to the door. Mr. Gurney was evidently embarrassed at the prospect of a lord and a duchess under his roof. Leaning on the arm of Mrs. Fry, the duchess was formally introduced to us individually. Mrs. Mott conversed with the distinguished guests with the same fluency and composure as with her own countrywomen. However anxious the English people were as to what they should say and do, the Americans were all quite at their ease. As Lord Morpeth had some interesting letters from the island of Jamaica to read to us, we formed a circle on the lawn to listen. England had just paid one hundred millions of dollars to emancipate the slaves, and we were all interested in hearing the result of the experiment. The distinguished guest, in turn, had many questions to ask in regard to American slavery. We found none of that prejudice against color in England which is so inveterate among the American people. At my first dinner in England I found myself beside a gentleman from Jamaica, as black as the ace of spades. After the departure of the Duchess, dinner was announced. It was a sumptuous meal, most tastefully served. There were half a dozen wine-glasses at every plate, but abolitionists in those days were all converts to temperance, and as the bottles went around there was a general head-shaking, and the right hand extended over the glasses. Our English friends were amazed that none of us drank wine. Mr. Gurney said he had never before seen such a sight as forty ladies and gentlemen sitting down to dinner, and none of them tasting wine. In talking with him on that point, he said, "'I suppose your nursing mothers drink beer?' I laughed and said, "'Oh, no, we should be afraid of befogging the brains of our children.' "'No danger of that,' said he. We are all bright enough, and yet a cask of beer is rolled into the cellar for the mother with each newborn child. Colonel Miller from Vermont, one of our American delegation, was in the Greek war with Lord Byron. As Lady Byron had expressed a wish to see him, that her daughter might know something of her father's last days, an interview was arranged, and the colonel kindly invited me to accompany him. His account of their acquaintance and the many noble traits of character Lord Byron manifested, his generous impulses and acts of self-sacrifice, seemed particularly gratifying to the daughter. It was a sad interview, arranged chiefly for the daughter's satisfaction, though Lady Byron listened with a painful interest. As the colonel was a warm admirer of the great poet, he no doubt represented him in the best possible light and his narration of his last days was deeply interesting. Lady Byron had a quiet, reserved manner, a sad face, and a low, plaintive voice, like one who had known deep sorrow. I had seen her frequently in the convention and at social teas, and had been personally presented to her before this occasion. Altogether I thought her a sweet, attractive-looking woman. We had a pleasant interview with Lord Brougham also. 
The Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society sent him an elaborately carved inkstand made from the wood of Pennsylvania Hall, which was destroyed by a pro-slavery mob. Mr. Burney made a most graceful speech in presenting the memento, and Lord Brougham was equally happy in receiving it. One of the most notable characters we met at this time was Daniel O'Connell. He made his first appearance in the London Convention a few days after the women were rejected. He paid a beautiful tribute to woman, and said that if he had been present when the question was under discussion, he should have spoken and voted for their admission. He was a tall, well-developed, magnificent-looking man, and probably one of the most effective speakers Ireland ever produced. I saw him at a great India meeting in Exeter Hall, where some of the best orators from France, America, and England were present. There were six natives from India on the platform, who, not understanding anything that was said, naturally remained listless throughout the proceedings. But the moment O'Connell began to speak, they were all attention, bending forward and closely watching every movement. One could almost tell what he said from the play of his expressive features, his wonderful gestures, and the pose of his whole body. When he finished, the natives joined in the general applause. He had all Wendell Phillips's power of sarcasm and denunciation, and added to that the most tender pathos. He could make his audience laugh or cry at pleasure. It was a rare sight to see him dressed in repeal cloth in one of his repeal meetings. We were in Dublin in the midst of that excitement, when the hopes of new liberties for that oppressed people all centered on O'Connell. The enthusiasm of the people for the repeal of the Union was then at white heat. Dining one day with the great liberator, as he was called, I asked him if he hoped to carry that measure. No, he said, but it is always good policy to claim the uttermost, and then you will be sure to get something. Could he have looked forward fifty years and have seen the present condition of his unhappy country, he would have known that English greed and selfishness could defeat any policy, however wise and far-seeing. The successive steps by which Irish commerce was ruined, and religious feuds between her people continually fanned into life, and the nation subjugated, form the darkest page in the history of England. But the people are awakened at last to their duty, and for the first time organizing English public sentiment in favor of home rule. I attended several large enthusiastic meetings when last in England, in which the most radical utterances of Irish patriots were received with prolonged cheers. I trust the day is not far off when the beautiful Emerald Isle will unfurl her banner before the nations of the earth, enthroned as the Queen Republic of those northern seas. We visited Wordsworth's home at Grasmere along the beautiful lakes, but he was not there. However, we saw his surroundings, the landscape that inspired some of his poetic dreams, and the dense rows of hollyhocks of every shade and color leading from his porch to the gate. The gardener told us this was his favorite flower. Though it had no special beauty in itself, taken alone, yet the wonderful combination of royal colors was indeed striking and beautiful. We saw Harriet Martineau in her country home, as well as at her house in town. As we were obliged to converse with her through an ear trumpet, we left her to do most of the talking. She gave us many amusing experiences of her travels in America, and her comments on the London Convention were rich and racy. She was not an attractive woman in either manner or appearance, though considered great and good by all who knew her. We spent a few days with Thomas Clarkson in Ipswich. He lived in a very old house with long, rambling corridors surrounded by a moat which we crossed by means of a drawbridge. He had just written an article against the colonization scheme, which his wife read aloud to us. He was so absorbed in the subject that he forgot the article was written by himself and kept up a running applause with, Hear, hear! The English mode of expressing approbation. He told us of the severe struggles he and Wilberforce had gone through in rousing the public sentiment of England to the demand for emancipation in Jamaica, but their trials were mild compared with what Garrison and his coadjutors had suffered in America. Having read of all these people, it was difficult to realize, as I visited them in their own homes from day to day, that they were the same persons I had so long worshipped from afar. End of chapter 5
Chapter Six Eighty Years and More. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter Six Homeward Bound. After taking a view of the wonders and surroundings of London, we spent a month in Paris. Fifty years ago there was a greater difference in the general appearance of things between France and England than now. That countries only a few hours' journey apart should differ so widely was to us a great surprise. How changed the sights and sounds! Here was the old diligence slumbering along with its various compartments and its indefinite number of horses, harnessed with rope and leather, sometimes two, sometimes three abreast, and sometimes one in advance, with an outrider belaboring the poor beast, without cessation, and the driver yelling and cracking his whip. The uproar, confusion, and squabbles at every stopping place are overwhelming. The upper classes, men and women alike, rushing into each other's arms, embrace and kiss, while drivers and hostlers on the slightest provocation hurl at each other all the denunciatory adjectives in the language, and with such vehemence that you could expect every moment to see a deadly conflict. But today, as fifty years ago, they never arrive at that point. Theirs was and is purely an encounter of words, which they keep up as they drive off in opposite directions, just as far as they can hear and see each other, with threats of vengeance to come. Such an encounter between two Englishmen would mean the death of one or the other. All this was in marked contrast with John Bull and his island. There the people were as silent as if they had been born deaf and dumb. The English stagecoach was compact, clean, and polished from top to bottom. The horses and harness, glossy and in order, the well-dressed, dignified coachman who seldom spoke a loud word or used his whip, kept his seat at the various stages, while hostlers watered or changed the steeds. The postman blew his bugle-blast to have the mail in readiness, and the reserved passengers made no remarks on what was passing, for in those days Englishmen were afraid to speak to each other for fear of recognizing one not of their class, while to strangers and foreigners they would not speak except in case of dire necessity. The Frenchman was ready enough to talk, but unfortunately we were separated by different languages. Thus the Englishman would not talk, the Frenchman could not, and the intelligent, loquacious American driver, who discourses on politics, religion, national institutions, and social gossip, was unknown on that side of the Atlantic. What the curious American traveler could find out himself from observation and pertinacious seeking he was welcome to, but the Briton would waste no breath to enlighten Yankees as to the points of interest or customs of his country. Our party consisted of Miss Pugh, Abby Kimber, Mr. Stanton, and myself. I had many amusing experiences in making my wants known when alone, having forgotten most of my French. For instance, traveling night and day in the diligence to Paris, as the stops were short, one was sometimes in need of something to eat. One night, as my companions were all asleep, I went out to get a piece of cake or a cracker, or whatever of that sort I could obtain, but owing to my clumsy use of the language I was misunderstood. Just as the diligence was about to start, and the shout for us to get aboard was heard, the waiter came running with a piping hot plate of sweetbreads nicely broiled. I had waited and wondered why it took so long to get a simple piece of cake or biscuit, and lo, a piece of hot meat was offered me. I could not take the frizzling thing in my hand, nor eat it without bread, knife, or fork, so I hurried off to the coach, the man pursuing me to the very door. I was vexed and disappointed while the rest of the party were convulsed with laughter at the parting salute and my attempt to make my way alone. It was some time before I heard the last of the sweetbreads. When we reached Paris we secured a courier who could speak English to show us the sights of that wonderful city. Every morning early he was at the door, rain or shine, to carry out our plans, which with the aid of our guidebook we had made the evening before. In this way, going steadily day after day, we visited all points of interest for miles round and sailed up and down the Seine. The Palace of the Tuileries, with its many associations with a long line of more or less unhappy kings and queens, was then in its glory, and its extensive and beautiful grounds were always gay with crowds of happy people. 
These gardens were a great resort for nurses and children, and were furnished with all manner of novel appliances for their amusement, including beautiful little carriages drawn by four goats with girls or boys driving, boats sailing in the air, seemingly propelled by oars, and hobby-horses flying round on whirligigs with boys vainly trying to catch each other. No people have ever taken the trouble to invent so many amusements for children as have the French. The people enjoyed being always in the open air, night and day. The parks are crowded with amusement seekers, some reading and playing games, some sewing, knitting, playing on musical instruments, dancing, sitting around tables in bevies, eating, drinking, and gaily chatting. And yet when they drive in carriages or go to their homes at night, they will shut themselves in as tight as oysters in their shells. They have a theory that night air is very injurious in the house, although they will sit outside until midnight. I found this same superstition prevalent in France fifty years later. We visited the Hotel des Invalides, just as they were preparing the sarcophagus for the reception of the remains of Napoleon. We witnessed the wild excitement of that enthusiastic people, and listened with deep interest to the old soldiers' praises of their great general. The ladies of our party chatted freely with them. They all had interesting anecdotes to relate of their chief. They said he seldom slept over four hours, was an abstemious eater, and rarely changed a servant, as he hated a strange face about him. He was very fond of a game of chess, and snuffed continuously, talked but little, was a light sleeper, the stirring of a mouse would awaken him, and always on the watch-tower. They said that in his great campaigns he seemed to be omnipresent. A sentinel asleep at his post would sometimes waken to find Napoleon on duty in his place. The ship that brought back Napoleon's remains was the Belle Poule, the beautiful hen, which landed at Cherbourg, November thirtieth, 1840. The body was conveyed to the church of the Invalides, which adjoins the tomb. The Prince de Joinville brought the body from St. Helena, and Louis-Philippe received it. At that time each soldier had a little patch of land to decorate as he pleased, in which many scenes from their great battles were illustrated. One represented Napoleon crossing the Alps. There were the cannon, the soldiers, Napoleon on horseback, all toiling up the steep ascent, perfect in miniature. In another was Napoleon, flag in hand, leading the charge across the bridge of Lodi. In still another was Napoleon in Egypt, before the pyramids, seated impassive on his horse, gazing at the Sphinx as if about to utter his immortal words to his soldiers. Here, forty centuries look down upon us. These object lessons of the past are all gone now, and the land used for more prosaic purposes. I little thought, as I witnessed that great event in France in 1840, that fifty-seven years later I should witness a similar pageant in the American Republic, when our nation paid its last tributes to General Grant. There are many points of similarity in these great events. As men they were alike aggressive and self-reliant. In Napoleon's will he expressed the wish that his last resting place might be in the land and among the people he loved so well. His desire is fulfilled. He rests in the chief city of the French Republic, whose shores are washed by the waters of the Seine. General Grant expressed the wish that he might be interred in our metropolis, and added, Wherever I am buried, I desire that there shall be room for my wife by my side. His wishes, too, are fulfilled. He rests in the chief city of the American Republic, whose shores are washed by the waters of the Hudson, and in his magnificent mausoleum there is room for his wife by his side. Several members of the Society of Friends from Boston and Philadelphia, who had attended the World's Anti-Slavery Convention in London, joined our party for a trip on the continent. Though opposed to war, they all took a deep interest in the national excitement and in the pageants that heralded the expected arrival of the hero from St. Helena. As they all wore military coats of the time of George Fox, the soldiers, supposing they belonged to the army of some country, gave them the military salute wherever we went, much to their annoyance and our amusement. In going the rounds, Miss Pugh amused us by reading aloud the description of what we were admiring and the historical events connected with that particular building or locality. 
We urged her to spend the time taking in all she could see and to read up afterward. But no, a history of France and Galignani's guide she carried everywhere, and while the rest of us looked until we were fully satisfied, she took a bird's-eye view and read the description. Dear little woman, she was a fine scholar, a good historian, was well informed on all subjects and countries, proved an invaluable traveling companion, and could tell more of what we saw than all the rest of us together. On several occasions we chanced to meet Louis Philippe dashing by in an open barouche. We felt great satisfaction in remembering that at one time he was an exile in our country, where he earned his living by teaching school. What an honor for Yankee children to have been taught by a French king the rudiments of his language! Having been accustomed to the Puritan Sunday of restraint and solemnity, I found that day in Paris gay and charming. The first time I entered into some of the festivities I really expected to be struck by lightning. The libraries, art galleries, concert halls, and theaters were all open to the people. Bands of music were playing in the parks, where whole families with their luncheons spent the day, husbands, wives, and children on an excursion together. The boats on the Seine and all public conveyances were crowded. Those who had but this one day for pleasure seemed determined to make the most of it. A wonderful contrast with that gloomy day in London, where all places of amusement were closed and nothing open to the people but the churches and drinking saloons. The streets and houses in which Voltaire, Lafayette, Mademoiselle de Stal, Mademoiselle Roland, Charlotte Corday, and other famous men and women lived and died were pointed out to us. We little thought then of all the terrible scenes to be enacted in Paris, nor that France would emerge from the dangers that beset her on every side into a sister republic. It has been a wonderful achievement, with kings and popes all plotting against her experiment, that she has succeeded in putting kingcraft under her feet, and proclaimed liberty, equality, fraternity for her people. After a few weeks in France we returned to London, traveling through England, Ireland, and Scotland for several months. We visited the scenes that Shakespeare, Burns, and Dickens had made classic. We spent a few days at Huntingdon, the home of Oliver Cromwell, and visited the estate where he passed his early married life. While there one of his great admirers read aloud to us a splendid article in one of the reviews written by Carlyle, giving the protector, as his friend said, his true place in history. It was long the fashion of England's historians to represent Cromwell as a fanatic and hypocrite, but his character was vindicated by later writers. Never, says Macaulay, was a ruler so conspicuously born for sovereignty. The cup which has intoxicated almost all others sobered him. We saw the picturesque ruins of Kenilworth Castle, the birthplace of Shakespeare, the homes of Byron and Mary Chaworth, wandered through Newstead Abbey, saw the monument to the faithful dog, and the large dining-room where Byron and his boon companions used to shoot at a mark. It was a desolate region. We stopped a day or two at Ayr and drove out to the birthplace of Burns. The old house that had sheltered him was still there, but its walls now echoed to other voices, and the fields where he had toiled were plowed by other hands. We saw the stream and banks where he and Mary sat together, the old stone church where the witches held their midnight revels, the two dogs, and the bridge of air. With Burns, as with Sappho, it was love that awoke his heart to a song. A bonny lass who worked with him in the harvest field inspired his first attempts at rhyme. Life with Burns was one long, hard struggle. With his natural love for the beautiful, the terrible depression of spirits he suffered from his dreary surroundings was inevitable. The interest great men took in him when they awoke to his genius came too late for his safety and encouragement. In a glass of whiskey he found at last the rest and cheer he never knew when sober. Poverty and ignorance are the parents of intemperance, and that vice will never be suppressed until the burdens of life are equally shared by all. We saw Melrose by moonlight, spent several hours at Abbotsford, and lingered in the little sanctum sanctorum where Scott wrote his immortal works. It was so small that he could reach the bookshelves on every side. 
We went through the prisons, castles, and narrow streets of Edinburgh, where the houses are seven and eight stories high, each story projecting a few feet, until at the uppermost opposite neighbors could easily shake hands and chat together. All the intervals from active sightseeing we spent in reading the lives of historical personages in poetry and prose until our sympathies flowed out to the real and ideal characters. Lady Jane Grey, Anne Boleyn, Mary Queen of Scots, Ellen Douglas, Jeanie and Effie Deans, Highland Mary, Rebecca the Jewess, De Vernon, and Rob Roy all alike seemed real men and women, whose shades or descendants we hope to meet on their native heath. Here among the Scotch lakes and mountains Mr. Stanton and I were traveling alone for the first time since our marriage, and as we both enjoyed walking we made many excursions on foot to points that could not be reached in any other way. We spent some time among the Grampian Hills, so familiar to every schoolboy, walking and riding about on donkeys. We sailed up and down Loch Katrine and Loch Lomond. My husband was writing letters for some New York newspapers on the entire trip, and aimed to get exact knowledge of all we saw. Thus I had the advantage of the information he gathered. On these long tramps I wore a short dress, reaching just below the knee, of dark blue cloth, a military cap of the same material that shaded my eyes, and a pair of long boots made on the masculine pattern then generally worn, the most easy style for walking, as the pressure is equal on the whole foot and the ankle has free play. Thus equipped, and early trained by my good brother-in-law to long walks, I found no difficulty in keeping pace with my husband. Being self-reliant and venturesome in our explorations, we occasionally found ourselves involved in grave difficulties by refusing to take a guide. For instance, we decided to go to the top of Ben Nevis alone. It looked to us a straightforward piece of business to walk up a mountainside on a bee-line, and so, in the face of repeated warnings by our host, we started. We knew nothing of zigzag paths to avoid the rocks, the springs, and swamps. In fact, we supposed all mountains smooth and dry, like our native hills that we were accustomed to climb. The landlord shook his head and smiled when we told him we should return at noon to dinner. And we smiled, too, thinking he placed a low estimate on our capacity for walking. But we had not gone far when we discovered the difficulties ahead. Some places were so steep that I had to hold on to my companion's coat-tails, while he held on to rocks and twigs, or braced himself with a heavy cane. By the time we were halfway up we were in a dripping perspiration. Our feet were soaking wet, and we were really too tired to proceed. But after starting with such supreme confidence in ourselves, we were ashamed to confess our fatigue to each other, and much more to return and verify all the prognostications of the host and his guides so we determined to push on and do what we had proposed. With the prospect of a magnificent view and an hour's delicious rest on the top, we started with renewed courage. A steady climb of six hours brought us to the goal of promise. Our ascent was accomplished. But alas, it was impossible to stop there. The cold wind chilled us to the bone in a minute. So we took one glance at the world below, and hurried down the south side to get the mountain between us and the cold northeaster. When your teeth are chattering with the cold, and the wind threatening to make havoc with your raiment, you are not in a favorable condition to appreciate the grand scenery. Like the King of France, with twice ten thousand men, we marched up the hill and then marched down again. We found descending still more difficult, as we were in constant fear of slipping, losing our hold and rolling to the bottom. We were tired, hungry, and disappointed, and the fear of not reaching the valley before nightfall pressed heavily upon us. Neither confessed to the other the fatigue and apprehension each felt, but with fresh endeavor and words of encouragement we cautiously went on. We accidentally struck a trail that led us winding down comfortably some distance, but we lost it and went clambering down as well as we could in our usual way. To add to our misery, a dense scotch mist soon enveloped us, so that we could see but a short distance ahead, and not knowing the point from which we started, we feared we might be going far out of our way. The coming twilight, too, made the prospect still darker. Fortunately our host, having less faith in us than we had in ourselves, sent a guide to reconnoitre, 
and just at the moment when we began to realize our danger of spending the night on the mountain and to admit it to each other the welcome guide hailed us in his broad accent his shepherd dog led the way into the beaten path as i could hardly stand i took the guide's arm and when we reached the bottom two donkeys were in readiness to take us to the hotel we did not recover from the fatigue of that expedition in several days, and we made no more experiments of exploring strange places without guides. We learned, too, that mountains are not so hospitable as they seem, nor so gently undulating as they appear in the distance, and that guides serve other purposes besides extorting money from travelers. If under their guidance we had gone up and down easily, we should always have thought we might as well have gone alone so our experience gave us a good lesson in humility. We had been twelve hours on foot, with nothing to eat, when at last we reached the hotel. We were in no mood for boasting of the success of our excursion, and our answers were short to inquiries as to how we had passed the day. Being tired of traveling and contending about women's fear with the Rev. John Scoble, an Englishman who escorted Mr. Burney and Mr. Stanton on their tour through the country, I decided to spend a month in Dublin. While the gentlemen held meetings in Cork, Belfast, Waterford, Limerick, and other chief towns, finishing the series with a large enthusiastic gathering in Dublin, at which O'Connell made one of his most withering speeches on American slavery, the inconsistency of such an institution, with the principles of a Republican government giving full play to his powers of sarcasm, on one occasion, when introduced to a slaveholder, he put his hands behind his back, refusing to recognize a man who bought and sold his fellow beings. The Rev. John Scoble was one of the most conceited men I ever met. His narrow ideas in regard to woman, and the superiority of the royal and noble classes in his own country, were to me so exasperating that I grew more and more bellicose every time we traveled in company. He was terribly seasick crossing the channel, to my intense satisfaction. As he always boasted of his distinguished countrymen, I suggested, in the midst of one of his most agonizing spasms, that he ought to find consolation in the fact that Lord Nelson was always seasick on the slightest provocation. The poverty in Ireland was a continual trial to our sensibilities. Beggars haunted our footsteps everywhere, in the street and on the highways, crouching on the steps of the front door and on the curbstones and surrounding our carriage wherever and whenever we stopped to shop or make a visit the bony hands and sunken eyes and sincere gratitude expressed for every penny proved their suffering real as my means were limited and i could not pass one by i got a pound changed into pennies and put them in a green bag which i took in the carriage wherever i went it was but a drop in the ocean but it was all I could do to relieve that unfathomed misery. The poverty I saw everywhere in the old world, and especially in Ireland, was a puzzling problem to my mind. But I rejected the idea that it was a necessary link in human experience, that it always had been and always must be. As we drove day by day in that magnificent Phoenix Park of 1,500 acres, one of the largest parks, I believe, in the world, I would often put the question to myself, what right have the few to make a pleasure ground of these acres, while the many have nowhere to lay their heads, crouching under stiles and bridges, clothed in rags and feeding on seaweed with no hope in the slowly passing years of any change for the better? The despair stamped on every brow told the sad story of their wrongs. Those accustomed to such everyday experiences brush beggars aside as they would so many flies, but those to whom such sights are new cannot so easily quiet their own consciences. Everyone in the full enjoyment of all the blessings of life, in his normal condition, feels some individual responsibility for the poverty of others. When the sympathies are not blunted by any false philosophy, one feels reproached by one's own abundance. I once heard a young girl about to take her summer outing, when asked by her grandmother if she had all the dresses she needed, reply, Oh, yes, I was oppressed with a constant sense of guilt when packing to see how much I had, while so many girls have nothing decent to wear. More than half a century has rolled by since I stood on Irish soil and shed tears of pity for the wretchedness I saw, and no change for the better has as yet come to that unhappy people. 
Yet this was the land of Burke, Grattan, Shile, and Emmet, the land into which Christianity was introduced in the fifth century, St. Patrick being the chief apostle of the new faith. In the sixth century Ireland sent forth missionaries from her monasteries to convert Great Britain and the nations of northern Europe. From the eighth to the twelfth century Irish scholars held an enviable reputation. In fact, Ireland was the center of learning at one time. The arts, too, were cultivated by her people, and the round towers still pointed out to travelers are believed to be the remains of the architecture of the tenth century. The ruin of Ireland must be traced to other causes than the character of the people or the Catholic religion. Historians give us facts showing English oppression sufficient to destroy any nation. The short dark days of November intensified in my eyes the gloomy prospects of that people, and made the change to the Sirius of the Cunard Line, the first regular Atlantic steamship to cross the ocean, most enjoyable. Once on the boundless ocean one sees no beggars, no signs of human misery, no crumbling ruins of vast cathedral walls, no records of the downfall of mighty nations, no trace even of the mortal agony of the innumerable host buried beneath her bosom. Byron truly says, Time writes no wrinkle on thine azure brow, such as creation's dawn beheld, thou rollest now. When we embarked on the Sirius we had grave doubts as to our safety and the probability of our reaching the other side, as we did not feel that ocean steamers had yet been fairly tried. But after a passage of eighteen days, eleven hours, and fifteen minutes, we reached Boston, having spent six hours at Halifax. We little thought that the steamer Sirius of fifty years ago would ever develop into the magnificent floating palaces of today, three times as large and three times as swift. In spite of the steamer, however, we had a cold, rough, dreary voyage, and I have no pleasant memories connected with it. Our fellow passengers were all in their staterooms most of the time. Our good friend Mr. Burney had sailed two weeks before us, and as Mr. Stanton was confined to his berth, I was thrown on my own resources. I found my chief amusement in reading novels and playing chess with a British officer on his way to Canada. When it was possible, I walked on deck with the captain, or sat in some sheltered corner watching the waves. We arrived in New York by rail the day before Christmas. Everything looked bright and gay in our streets. It seemed to me that the sky was clearer, the air more refreshing, and the sunlight more brilliant than in any other land. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Eighty Years and More This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Chapter 7 Motherhood We found my sister Harriet in a new home in Clinton Place, 8th Street, New York City, then considered so far uptown that Mr. Eaton's friends were continually asking him why he went so far away from the social center, though in a few months they followed him. Here we passed a week. I especially enjoyed seeing my little niece and nephew, the only grandchildren in the family. The girl was the most beautiful child I ever saw, and the boy the most intelligent and amusing. He was very fond of hearing me recite the poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes, entitled The Height of the Ridiculous which I did many times, but he always wanted to see the lines that almost killed the man with laughing. He went around to a number of the bookstores one day and inquired for them. I told him afterward they were never published, that when Mr. Holmes saw the effect on his servant he suppressed them, lest they should produce the same effect on the typesetters, editors, and the readers of the Boston newspapers. My explanation never satisfied him. I told him he might write to Mr. Holmes and ask the privilege of reading the original manuscript if it still was or ever had been in existence. As one of my grandnephews was troubled in exactly the same way, I decided to appeal myself to Dr. Holmes for the enlightenment of this second generation. So I wrote him the following letter, which he kindly answered. 
telling us that his wretched man was a myth like the heroes in Mother Goose's melodies. Quote, Dear Dr. Holmes, I have a little nephew to whom I often recite The Height of the Ridiculous, and he invariably asks for the lines that produced the fatal effect on your servant. He visited most of the bookstores in New York City to find them, and nothing but your own word, I am sure, will ever convince him that the wretched man is but a figment of your imagination. I tried to satisfy him by saying you did not dare to publish the lines lest they should produce a similar effect on the typesetters, editors, and the readers of the Boston journals. However, he wishes me to ask you whether you kept a copy of the original manuscript, or could reproduce the lines with equal power. If not too much trouble, please send me a few lines on this point, and greatly oblige. Yours sincerely, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Unquote. Quote, my dear Mrs. Stanton, I wish you would explain to your little nephew that the story of the poor fellow who almost died laughing was a kind of a dream of mine, and not a real thing that happened, any more than an old woman lived in a shoe and had so many children she didn't know what to do, or that Jack climbed the beanstalk and found the giant who lived at the top of it. You can explain to him what is meant by imagination, and thus turn my youthful rhymes into a text for a discourse worthy of the Concord School of Philosophy. I have not my poems by me here, but I remember that the height of the ridiculous ended with this verse. Ten days and nights with sleepless eye I watched that wretched man, and since I never dare to write as funny as I can. But tell your nephew he mustn't cry about it any more than because geese go barefoot and bald eagles have no nightcaps. The verses are in all the editions of my poems. Believe me, dear Mrs. Stanton, very truly and respectfully yours, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Unquote. After spending the holidays in New York City, we started for Johnstown in a stage sleigh conveying the United States mail, drawn by a spanking team of four horses up the Hudson River Valley. We were three days going to Albany, stopping overnight at various points, a journey now performed in three hours. The weather was clear and cold, the sleighing fine, the scenery grand, and our traveling companions most entertaining, so the trip was very enjoyable. From Albany to Schenectady we went in the railway cars, then another sleigh ride of thirty miles brought us to Johnstown. My native hills, buried under two feet of snow, tinted with the last rays of the setting sun, were a beautiful and familiar sight. Though I had been absent but ten months, it seemed like years, and I was surprised to find how few changes had occurred since I left. My father and mother, sisters, Madge and Kate, and the old house and furniture, the neighbors, all looked precisely the same as when I left them. I had seen so much and been so constantly on the wing that I wondered that all things here should have stood still. I expected to hear of many births, marriages, deaths, and social upheavals, but the village news was remarkably meager. This hunger for home news on returning is common, I suppose, to all travelers. Our trunks unpacked, wardrobes arranged in closets and drawers, the excitement of seeing friends over, we spent some time in making plans for the future. My husband, after some consultation with my father, decided to enter his office and commence the study of law. As this arrangement kept me under the parental roof, I had two added years of pleasure walking, driving, and riding on horseback with my sisters. Madge and Kate were dearer to me than ever, as I saw the inevitable separation awaiting us in the near future. In due time they were married and commenced housekeeping, Madge in her husband's house nearby, and Kate in Buffalo. All my sisters were peculiarly fortunate in their marriage. Their husbands being men of fine presence, liberal education, high moral character, and marked ability. These were pleasant and profitable years. I devoted them to reading law, history, and political economy, with occasional interruptions to take part in some temperance or anti-slavery excitement. 
Eliza Murray and I had classes of colored children in the Sunday school. On one occasion, when there was to be a festival speaking in the church, a procession through the streets and other public performances for the Sunday school celebration, some narrow-minded bigots objected to the colored children taking part. They approached Miss Murray and me with most persuasive tones on the wisdom of not allowing them to march in the procession to the church. We said, Oh, no, it won't do to disappoint the children. They are all dressed with their badges on and looking forward with great pleasure to the festivities of the day. Besides, we would not cater to any of these contemptible prejudices against color. We were all assembled in the courthouse preparatory to forming in the line of march. Some were determined to drive the colored children home, but Miss Murray and I, like two defiant hens, kept our little brood close behind us, determined to conquer or perish in the struggle. At last milder counsels prevailed, and it was agreed that they might march in the rear. We made no objection and fell into line, but when we reached the church door it was promptly closed as the last white child went in. We tried two other doors, but all were guarded. We shed tears of vexation and pity for the poor children, and when they asked us the reason why they could not go in, we were embarrassed and mortified with the explanation we were forced to give. However, I invited them to my father's house, where Miss Murray and I gave them refreshments and entertained them for the rest of the day. The puzzling questions of theology and poverty that had occupied so much of my thoughts now gave place to the practical one what to do with a baby. Though motherhood is the most important of all the professions, requiring more knowledge than any other department in human affairs, yet there is not sufficient attention given to the preparation for this office. If we buy a plant of a horticulturist, we ask him many questions as to its needs, whether it thrives best in sunshine or in shade, whether it needs much or little water, what degrees of heat or cold, but when we hold in our arms for the first time a being of infinite possibilities, in whose wisdom may rest destiny of a nation, we take it for granted that the laws governing its life, health, and happiness are intuitively understood, that there is nothing new to be learned in regard to it. Yet here is a science to which philosophers have as yet given but little attention. An important fact has only been discovered and acted upon within the last ten years, that children come into the world tired and not hungry, exhausted with the perilous journey. Instead of being thoroughly bathed and dressed and kept on the rack while the nurse makes a prolonged toilette and feeds at some nostrum supposed to have much needed medicinal influence, the child's face, eyes, and mouth should be hastily washed with warm water and the rest of its body thoroughly oiled, and then it should be slipped into a soft pillowcase, wrapped in a blanket, and laid to sleep. Ordinarily, in the proper conditions, with its face uncovered in a cool, pure atmosphere, it will sleep twelve hours. Then it should be bathed, fed, and clothed in a high-necked, long-sleeved silk shirt and blanket, all of which should be done in five minutes. As babies lie still most of the time the first six weeks, they need no dressing. I think the nurse was a full hour bathing and dressing my firstborn, who protested with a melancholy wail every blessed minute. Ignorant myself of the initiative steps on the threshold of time, I suppose this proceeding was approved by the best authorities. However, I had been thinking, reading, observing, and had as little faith in the popular theories in regard to babies as on any other subject. I saw them on all sides ill half the time, pale and peevish, dying early, having no joy in life. I heard parents complaining of weary days and sleepless nights, while each child in turn ran the gauntlet of red gum, jaundice, whooping cough, chicken pox, mumps, measles, scarlet fever, and fits. They all seemed to think these inflictions were a part of the eternal plan, that Providence had a kind of Pandora's box from which he scattered those venerable diseases most liberally among those whom he especially loved. Having gone through the ordeal of bearing a child, I was determined, if possible, to keep him, so I read everything I could find on the subject. 
but the literature on this subject was as confusing and unsatisfactory as the longer and shorter catechisms and the thirty-nine articles of our faith. I had recently visited our dear friends Theodore and Angelina Grimke Weld, and they warned me against books on this subject. They had been so misled by one author, who assured them that the stomach of a child could only hold one tablespoonful, that they nearly starved their firstborn to death. Though the child dwindled day by day, and at the end of a month looked like a little old man, yet they still stood by the distinguished author. Fortunately, they both went off one day and left the child with Sister Sarah, who thought she would make an experiment and see what a child's stomach could hold, as she had grave doubts about the tablespoon theory. To her surprise, the baby took a pint bottle full of milk, and had the sweetest sleep thereon he had known in his earthly career. After that he was permitted to take what he wanted, and the author was informed of his libel on the infantine stomach. So here again I was entirely afloat, launched on the seas of doubt, without chart or compass. The life and well-being of the race seemed to hang on the slender thread of such traditions as were handed down by ignorant mothers and nurses. One powerful ray of light illuminated the darkness. It was the work of Andrew Combe on infancy. He had evidently watched some of the manifestations of man in the first stages of his development, and could tell at least as much of babies as naturalists could of beetles and bees. He did give young mothers some hints of what to do, and the whys and wherefores of certain lines of procedure during antenatal life, as well as the proper care thereafter. I read several chapters to the nurse. Although out of her ten children she had buried five, she still had too much confidence in her own wisdom and experience to pay much attention to any new idea that might be suggested to her. Among other things, Combe said that a child's bath should be regulated by the thermometer in order to be always of the same temperature. She ridiculed the idea and said her elbow was better than any thermometer, and when I insisted on its use, she would invariably, with a smile of derision, put her elbow in first to show how exactly it tallied with the thermometer. When I insisted that the child should not be bandaged, she rebelled outright and said she would not take the responsibility of nursing a child without a bandage. I said, Pray sit down, dear nurse, and let us reason together. Do not think I am setting up my judgment against yours with all your experience. I am simply trying to act on the opinions of a distinguished physician, who says there should be no pressure on a child anywhere, that the limbs and body should be free, that it is cruel to bandage an infant from hip to armpit, as is usually done in America, or both body and legs, as is done in Europe, or strap them to boards, as is done by savages on both continents. Can you give me one good reason, nurse, why a child should be bandaged? Yes, she said emphatically, I can give you a dozen. I only asked for one, I replied. Well, she said, after much hesitation, the bones of a newborn infant are soft, like cartilage, and unless you pin them up snugly, there is danger of their falling apart. It seems to me, I replied, you have given the strongest reason why they should be carefully guarded against the slightest pressure. It is very remarkable that kittens and puppies should be so well put together that they need no artificial bracing, and the human family be left wholly to the mercy of a bandage. Suppose a child was born where you could not get a bandage, what then? Now I think this child will remain intact without a bandage, and if I am willing to take the risk, why should you complain? Because, said she, if the child should die, it would injure my name as a nurse. I, therefore, wash my hands of all these newfangled notions. So she bandaged the child every morning, and I as regularly took it off. It has been fully proved since to be as useless an appendage as the vermiform. She had several cups with various concoctions of herbs standing on the chimney corner ready for insomnia, colic, indigestion, etc., etc., all of which were spirited away when she was at her dinner. In vain I told her we were homeopathists and afraid of everything in the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdoms lower than the two hundredth dilution. I tried to explain the Hahnemann system of therapeutics. 
the philosophy of the principal similia similibus curantur, but she had no capacity for first principles and did not understand my discourse. I told her that if she would wash the baby's mouth with pure cold water morning and night and give it a teaspoonful to drink occasionally during the day, there would be no danger of red gum, that if she would keep the blinds open and let in the air and sunshine, keep the temperature of the room at sixty-five degrees, leave the child's head uncovered so that it could breathe freely, stop rocking and trotting it and singing such melancholy hymns as Hark from the tombs a doleful sound. The baby and I would both be able to weather the cape without a bandage. I told her I should nurse the child once in two hours, and that she must not feed it any of her nostrums in the meantime, that a child's stomach, being made on the same general plan as our own, needed intervals of rest as well as ours. She said it would be racked with colic if the stomach was empty any length of time, and that it would surely have rickets if it were kept too still. I told her if the child had no anodynes, nature would regulate its sleep and motions. She said she could not stay in a room with the thermometer at sixty-five degrees, so I told her to sit in the next room and regulate the heat to suit herself, that I would ring a bell when her services were needed. The reader will wonder, no doubt, that I kept such a cantankerous servant. I could get no other. Dear Mother Monroe, as wise as she was good, and as tender as she was strong, who had nursed two generations of mothers in our village, was engaged at that time, and I was compelled to take an exotic. I had often watched Mother Monroe with admiration, as she turned and twisted my sister's baby. It lay as peacefully in her hands as if they were lined with eiderdown. She bathed and dressed it by easy stages, turning the child over and over like a pancake. But she was so full of the magnetism of human love, giving the child all the time the most consoling assurance that the operation was to be a short one, that the whole proceeding was quite entertaining to the observer, and seemingly agreeable to the child, though it had a rather surprised look as it took a bird's-eye view, in quick succession, of the ceiling and the floor. Still my nurse had her good points. She was very pleasant when she had her own way. She was neat and tidy, and ready to serve me at any time, night or day. She did not wear false teeth that rattled when she talked, nor boots that squeaked when she walked. She did not snuff, nor chew cloves, nor speak except when spoken to. Our discussions on various points went on at intervals, until I succeeded in planting some ideas in her mind, and when she left me at the end of six weeks, she confessed that she had learned some valuable lessons. As the baby had slept quietly most of the time, had no crying spells nor colic, and I looked well, she naturally came to the conclusion that pure air, sunshine, proper dressing, and regular feeding were more necessary for babies than herb teas and soothing syrups. Besides the obstinacy of the nurse, I had the ignorance of the physicians to contend with. When the child was four days old, we discovered that the collarbone was bent. The physician, wishing to get a pressure on the shoulder, braced the bandage round the wrist. Leave that, he said, ten days, and then it will be all right. Soon after he left, I noticed that the child's hand was blue, showing that the circulation was impeded. That will never do, said I. Nurse, take it off. No, indeed, she answered. I shall never interfere with the doctor. So I took it off myself, and sent for another doctor, who was said to know more of surgery. He expressed great surprise that the first physician called should have put on so severe a bandage. That, said he, would do for a grown man, but ten days of it on a child would make him a cripple. However, he did nearly the same thing, only fastening it round the hand instead of the wrist. I soon saw that the ends of the fingers were all purple, and that to leave that on ten days would be as dangerous as the first. So I took that off. "'What a woman!' exclaimed the nurse. "'What do you propose to do?' "'Think out something better myself. "'So brace me up with some pillows and give the baby to me.' "'She looked at me aghast and said, "'You'd better trust the doctors, or your child will be a helpless cripple.' "'Yes,' I replied, "'he would be, if we had left either of those bandages on. "'But I have an idea of something better.' "'Now,' said I, talking partly to myself and partly to her, 
What we want is a little pressure on that bone. That is what both those men aimed at. How can we get it without involving the arm, is the question. I'm sure I don't know, said she, rubbing her hands and taking two or three brisk turns round the room. Well, bring me three strips of linen, four double. I then folded one, wet in arnica and water, and laid it on the collarbone, put two other bands, like a pair of suspenders over the shoulders, crossing them both in front and behind, pinning the ends to the diaper, which gave the needed pressure without impeding the circulation anywhere. As I finished, she gave me a look of budding confidence, and seemed satisfied that all was well. Several times, night and day, we wet the compress and readjusted the bands, until all appearances of inflammation had subsided. At the end of ten days, the two sons of Aesculapius appeared, and made their examination and said all was right, whereupon I told them how badly their bandages worked, and what I had done myself. They smiled at each other, and one said, well, after all, a mother's instinct is better than a man's reason. Thank you, gentlemen. There was no instinct about it. I did some hard thinking before I saw how I could get a pressure on the shoulder without impeding the circulation as you did. Thus, in the supreme moment of a young mother's life, when I needed tender care and support, I felt the whole responsibility of my child's supervision. But though uncertain at every step of my own knowledge, I learned another lesson in self-reliance. I trusted neither men nor books absolutely after this, either in regard to the heavens above or the earth beneath, but continued to use my mother's instinct, if reason is too dignified a term to apply to a woman's thoughts. My advice to every mother is, above all other arts and sciences, Study first what relates to babyhood, as there is no department of human action in which there is such lamentable ignorance. At the end of six weeks my nurse departed, and I had a good woman in her place who obeyed my orders, and now a new difficulty arose from an unexpected quarter. My father and husband took it into their heads that the child slept too much. If not awake when they wished to look at him or to show him to their friends, they would pull him up out of his crib on all occasions. When I found neither of them was amenable to reason on this point, I locked the door, and no amount of eloquent pleading ever gained them admittance during the time I considered sacred to the baby's slumbers. At six months, having as yet had none of the diseases supposed to be inevitable, the boy weighed thirty pounds. Then the stately Peter came again into requisition, and in his strong arms the child spent many of his waking hours. Peter, with a long elephantine gait, slowly wandered over the town, lingering especially in the busy marts of trade. Peter's curiosity had strengthened with years, and wherever a crowd gathered round a monkey and a hand organ, a vendor's wagon, an auction stand, or the post office at mail time, there stood Peter, black as coal, with the beautiful boy in white, the most conspicuous figure in the crowd. As I told Peter never to let children kiss the baby for fear of some disease, he kept them well aloft, allowing no affectionate manifestations except toward himself. My reading at this time centered on hygiene. I came to the conclusion, after much thought and observation, that children never cried unless they were uncomfortable. A professor at Union College, who used to combat many of my theories, said he gave one of his children a sound spanking at six weeks, and it never disturbed him a night afterward. Another Solomon told me that a very weak preparation of opium would keep a child always quiet and take it through the dangerous period of teething without a ripple on the surface of domestic life. As children cannot tell what ails them, and suffer from many things of which parents are ignorant, the crying of the child should arouse them to an intelligent examination. To spank it for crying is to silence the watchman on the tower through fear. To give soothing syrup is to drug the watchman while the evils go on. Parents may thereby ensure eight hours sleep at the time, but at the risk of greater trouble in the future with sick and dying children. Tom Moore tells us, The heart from love to one, 
grows bountiful to all. I know the care of one child made me thoughtful of all. I never hear a child cry now that I do not feel that I am bound to find out the reason. In my extensive travels on lecturing tours in after years, I had many varied experiences with babies. One day, in the cars, a child was crying near me, while the parents were alternately shaking and slapping it. First one would take it with an emphatic jerk, and then the other. At last I heard the father say in a spiteful tone, "'If you don't stop, I'll throw you out of the window!' One naturally hesitates about interfering between parents and children, so I generally restrain myself as long as I can endure the torture of witnessing such outrages, but at length I turned and said, "'Let me take your child and see if I can find out what ails it.' "'Nothing ails it,' said the father, "'but bad temper.' The child readily came to me. I felt all around to see if its clothes pinched anywhere, or if there were any pins pricking. I took off its hat and cloak to see if there were any strings cutting its neck or choking it. Then I glanced at the feet, and lo, there was the trouble. The boots were at least one size too small. I took them off, and the stockings too, and found the feet were as cold as ice, and the prints of the stockings clearly traced on the tender flesh. We all know the agony of tight boots. I rubbed the feet and held them in my hands until they were warm, when the poor little thing fell asleep. I said to the parents, You are young people, I see, and this is probably your first child. They said, Yes. You don't intend to be cruel, I know, but if you had thrown those boots out of the window when you threatened to throw the child, it would have been wiser. This poor child has suffered ever since it was dressed this morning. I showed them the marks on the feet, and called their attention to the fact that the child fell asleep as soon as its pain was relieved. The mother said she knew the boots were tight, as it was with difficulty she could get them on, but the old ones were too shabby for the journey, and they had no time to change the others. Well, said the husband, if I had known those boots were tight, I would have thrown them out the window. Now, said I, let me give you one rule. When your child cries, remember it is telling you as well as it can that something hurts it, either outside or in, and do not rest until you find what it is. Neither spanking, shaking, or scolding can relieve pain. I have seen women enter the cars with their babies' faces completely covered with a blanket shawl. I have often thought I would like to cover their faces for an hour and see how they would bear it. In such circumstances, in order to get the blanket open, I have asked to see the baby, and generally found it as red as a beet. Ignorant nurses and mothers have discovered that children sleep longer with their heads covered. They don't know why, nor the injurious effect of breathing over and over the same air that has been thrown off the lungs polluted with carbonic acid gas. This stupefies the child and prolongs the unhealthy slumber. One hot day in the month of May I entered a crowded car at Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and took the only empty seat beside a gentleman who seemed very nervous about a crying child. I was scarcely seated when he said, "'Mother, do you know anything about babies?' "'Oh, yes,' I said, smiling. "'That is a department of knowledge on which I especially pride myself.' "'Well,' said he, "'there is a child that has cried most of the time for the last twenty-four hours. "'What do you think ails it?' "'Making a random supposition,' I replied, "'it probably needs a bath.' "'He promptly rejoined, "'If you will give it one, I will provide the necessary means.' "'I said, I will first see if the child will come to me and if the mother is willing. I found the mother only too glad to have a few minutes rest, and the child too tired to care who took it. She gave me a suit of clean clothes throughout. The gentleman spread his blanket shawl on the seat, securing the opposite one for me and the bathing appliances. Then he produced a towel, sponge, and an India rubber bowl full of water, and I gave the child a generous drink and a thorough ablution. It stretched and seemed to enjoy every step of the proceeding, and while I was brushing its golden curls as gently as I could, it fell asleep. 
so I covered it with the towel and blanket shawl, not willing to disturb it for dressing. The poor mother, too, was sound asleep, and the gentleman very happy. He had children of his own, and, like me, felt great pity for the poor, helpless little victim of ignorance and folly. I engaged one of the ladies to dress it when it awoke, as I was soon to leave the train. It slept the two hours I remained, how much longer I never heard. A young man who had witnessed the proceeding got off at the same station and accosted me, saying, "'I should be very thankful if you would come and see my baby. It is only one month old and cries all the time, and my wife, who is only sixteen years old, is worn out with it, and neither of us know what to do. So we all cry together, and the doctor says he does not see what ails it.' So I went on my mission of mercy, and found the child bandaged as tight as a drum. When I took out the pins and unrolled it, it fairly popped like the cork out of a champagne bottle. I rubbed its breast and its back, and soon soothed it to sleep. I remained a long time telling them how to take care of the child, and the mother, too. I told them everything I could think of in regard to clothes, diet, and pure air. I asked the mother why she bandaged her child as she did. She said her nurse told her that there was danger of hernia unless the abdomen was well bandaged. I told her that the only object of a bandage was to protect the navel for a few days until it was healed, and for that purpose all that was necessary was a piece of linen four inches square, well oiled, folded four times double with a hole in the center, laid over it. I remembered next day that I forgot to tell them to give the child water, so I telegraphed them. Give the baby water six times a day. I heard of that baby afterward. It lived and flourished, and the parents knew how to administer to the wants of the next one. The father was a telegraph operator and had many friends, Knights of the Key, throughout Iowa. For many years afterward, in leisure moments, these knights would call up this parent and say over the wire, Give the baby water six times a day. Thus did they repeat the story and spread the truth from pole to pole. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Eighty Years and More This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 8 Boston and Chelsea. In the autumn of 1843, my husband was admitted to the bar and commenced the practice of law in Boston with Mr. Bowles, brother in law of the late General John A. Dix. This gave me the opportunity to make many pleasant acquaintances among the lawyers in Boston, and to meet intimately among the noble men and women among reformers, whom I had long worshipped at a distance. Here, for the first time, I met Lydia Maria Child, Abby Kelly, Paulina Wright, Elizabeth Peabody, Maria Chapman, and her beautiful sisters, the Mrs. Weston, Oliver, and Marianna Johnson, Joseph and Thankful Southwick, and their three bright daughters. The home of the Southwicks was always a harbor of rest for the weary, where the anti-slavery hosts were wont to congregate, and where one was always sure to meet someone worth knowing. Their hospitality was generous to an extreme, and so boundless that they were at last fairly eaten out of house and home. Here, too, for the first time, I met Theodore Parker, John Pierpont, John G. Whittier, Emerson, Alcott, Lowell, Hawthorne, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel E. Sewell, Sidney Howard Gay, Pillsbury, Foster, Frederick Douglass, and last, though not least, those noble men Charles Hovey and Francis Jackson, the only men who ever left any money to the cause of woman suffrage. I also met Miss Jackson, afterward Mrs. Eddy, who left half her fortune fifty thousand dollars for the same purpose. I was a frequent visitor at the home of William Lloyd Garrison. Though he had a prolonged battle to fight in the rough outside world, his home was always a haven of rest. 
Mrs. Garrison was a sweet-tempered, conscientious woman who tried, under all circumstances, to do what was right. She had sound judgment and rare common sense, was tall and fine-looking, with luxuriant brown hair, large tender blue eyes, delicate features, and affable manners. They had an exceptionally fine family of five sons and one daughter. Fanny, now the wife of Henry Villard, the financier, was the favorite and pet. All the children in their maturer years have fulfilled the promises of their childhood. Though always in straitened circumstances, the garrisons were very hospitable. It was next to impossible for Mr. Garrison to meet a friend without inviting him to his house, especially at the close of a convention. I was one of twelve at one of his impromptu tea-parties. We all took it for granted that his wife knew we were coming, and that her preparations were already made. Surrounded by half a dozen children, she was performing the last act in the opera of Lullaby, wholly unconscious of the invasion downstairs. But Mr. Garrison was equal to every emergency, and after placing his guests at their ease in the parlor, he hastened to the nursery, took off his coat, and rocked the baby until his wife had disposed of the remaining children. Then they had a consultation about the tea, and when, basket in hand, the good man sallied forth for the desired viands, Mrs. Garrison, having made a hasty toilette, came down to welcome her guests. She was as genial and self-possessed as if all things had been prepared. She made no apologies for what was lacking in the general appearance of the house, nor in the variety of the menu. It was sufficient for her to know that Mr. Garrison was happy and feeling free to invite his friends. The impromptu meal was excellent, and we had a most enjoyable evening. I have no doubt that Mrs. Garrison had more real pleasure than if she had been busy all day making preparations and had been tired out when her guests arrived. The anti-slavery conventions and fairs, held every year during the holidays, brought many charming people from other states, and made Boston a social center for the coadjutors of Garrison and Phillips. These conventions surpassed any meetings I had ever attended. The speeches were eloquent, and the debates earnest and forcible. Garrison and Phillips were in their prime, and slavery was a question of national interest. The hall in which the fairs were held, under the auspices of Mrs. Chapman and her cohorts, was most artistically decorated. There one could purchase whatever the fancy could desire, for English friends, stimulated by the appeals of Harriet Martineau and Elizabeth Peace, used to send boxes of beautiful things, gathered from all parts of the eastern continent. There, too, one could get a most recherché luncheon in the Society of the Literati of Boston, for however indifferent many were to slavery, per se, they enjoyed these fairs, and all classes flocked there till far into the night. It was a kind of ladies' exchange for the holiday week, where each one was sure to meet her friends. The fair and the annual convention coming in succession intensified the interest in both. I never grew weary of the conventions, though I attended all the sessions, lasting sometimes until eleven o'clock at night. The fiery eloquence of the abolitionists, the amusing episodes that occurred when some crank was suppressed and borne out on the shoulders of his brethren, gave sufficient variety to the proceedings to keep the interest up to high water mark. There was one old man dressed in white, carrying a scythe, who imagined himself the personification of time though called Father Lampson. Occasionally he would bubble over with some prophetic vision, and as he could not be silenced he was carried out. He usually made himself as limp as possible, which added to the difficulty of his exit and the amusement of the audience. A ripple of merriment would unsettle, for a moment, even the dignity of the platform, when Abigail Folsom, another crank, would shout from the gallery, stop not my brother on the order of your going but go the abolitionists were making the experiment at this time of a free platform allowing every one to speak as moved by the spirit but they soon found that would not do as those evidently moved by the spirit of mischief were quite as apt to air their vagaries as those moved by the spirit of truth 
However, the Garrisonian platform always maintained a certain degree of freedom outside its regular program, and although this involved extra duty in suppressing cranks, yet the meeting gained enthusiasm by some good spontaneous speaking on the floor as well as on the platform. A number of immense mass meetings were held in Fanuel Hall, a large dreary place with its bare walls and innumerable dingy windows. The only attempt at an ornament was the American Eagle, with its wings spread and claws firmly set in the middle of the gallery. The gilt was worn off its beak, giving it the appearance, as Edmund Quincy said, of having a bad cold in the head. This old hall was sacred to so many memories connected with the early days of the Revolution that it was a kind of mecca for the lovers of liberty visiting Boston. The anti-slavery meetings held there were often disturbed by mobs that would hold the most gifted orator at bay hour after hour, and would listen only to the songs of the Hutchinson family. Although these songs were a condensed extract of the whole anti-slavery constitution and by-laws, Yet the mob was as peaceful under these peons to liberty as a child under the influence of an anodyne. What a welcome and beautiful vision that was when the four brothers in blue broadcloth and white collars turned down a la Byron and little sister Abby in silk, soft lace, and blue ribbon appeared on the platform to sing their quaint ballads of freedom. Fresh from the hills of New Hampshire, they looked so sturdy, so vigorous, so pure, so true that they seemed fitting representatives of all the cardinal virtues, and even a howling mob could not resist their influence. Perhaps, after one of their ballads, the mob would listen five minutes to Wendell Phillips or Garrison until he gave some home thrusts, when all was uproar again. The northern merchants who made their fortunes out of southern cotton, the politicians who wanted votes, and the ministers who wanted to keep peace in the old churches were all as much opposed to the anti-slavery agitation as were the slaveholders themselves. These were the classes the mob represented, though seemingly composed of gamblers, liquor-dealers, and demagogues. For years the anti-slavery struggle at the North was carried on against statecraft, priestcraft, the cupidity of the moneyed classes, and the ignorance of the masses. But in spite of all these forces of evil, it triumphed at last. I was in Boston at the time that Lane and Wright, some metaphysical Englishmen, and our own Alcott held their famous philosophical conversations, in which Elizabeth Peabody took part. I went to them regularly. I was ambitious to absorb all the wisdom I could. But really, I could not give an intelligent report of the points under discussion at any sitting. Oliver Johnson asked me one day if I enjoyed them. I thought, from a twinkle in his eye, that he thought I did not, so I told him I was ashamed to confess that I did not know what they were talking about. He said, Neither do I. Very few of their hearers do. So you need not be surprised that they are incomprehensible to you, nor think less of your own capacity. I was indebted to Mr. Johnson for several of the greatest pleasures I enjoyed in Boston. He escorted me to an entire course of Theodore Parker's lectures, given in Marlborough Chapel. This was soon after the great preacher had given his famous sermon on The Permanent and Transient in Religion when he was ostracized, even by the Unitarians, for his radical utterances, and not permitted to preach in any of their pulpits. His lectures were deemed still more heterodox than that sermon. He shocked the Orthodox churches of that day, more even than Ingersoll has in our times. The lectures, however, were so soul-satisfying to me, that I was surprised at the bitter criticisms I heard expressed. Though they were two hours long, I never grew weary, and when the course ended I said to Mr. Johnson, I wish I could hear them over again. Well, you can, said he. Mr. Parker is to repeat them in Cambridgeport, beginning next week. Accordingly, we went there and heard them again with equal satisfaction. 
During the winter in Boston I attended all the lectures, churches, theaters, concerts, and temperance, peace, and prison reform conventions within my reach. I had never lived in such an enthusiastically literary and reform latitude before, and my mental powers were kept at the highest tension. We went to Chelsea for the summer and boarded with the Baptist minister, the Rev. John Wesley Olmsted, afterward editor of The Watchman and Reflector. He had married my cousin, Mary Livingston, one of the most lovely unselfish characters I ever knew. There I had the opportunity of meeting several of the leading Baptist ministers in New England, and as I was thoroughly imbued with Parker's ideas, we had many heated discussions on theology. There, too, I met Orestes Bronson, a remarkably well-read man who had gone through every phase of religious experience from blank atheism to the bosom of the Catholic Church, where I believe he found repose at the end of his days. He was so arbitrary and dogmatic that most people did not like him. But I appreciated his acquaintance, as he was a liberal thinker, and had a world of information which he readily imparted to those of a teachable spirit. As I was then in a hungering, thirsting condition for truth on every subject, the friendship of such a man was, to me, an inestimable blessing. Reading Theodore Parker's lectures years afterward, I was surprised to find how little there was in them to shock anybody, the majority of thinking people having grown up to them. While living in Chelsea two years I used to walk, there being no public conveyances running on Sunday, from the ferry to Marlborough Chapel to hear Mr. Parker preach. It was a long walk, over two miles, and I was so tired on reaching the chapel that I made it a point to sleep through all the preliminary service, so as to be fresh for the sermon, as the friend next whom I sat always wakened me in time. One Sunday, when my friend was absent, it being a very warm Sunday, and I unusually fatigued, I slept until the sexton informed me that he was about to close the doors. In an unwary moment I imparted this fact to my Baptist friends. They made all manner of fun ever afterward of the soothing nature of Mr. Parker's theology, and my long walk every Sunday to repose in the shadow of a heterodox altar. Still the loss of the sermon was the only vexatious part of it, and I had the benefit of the walk and the refreshing slumber to the music of Mr. Parker's melodious voice and the deep-toned organ. Mrs. Oliver Johnson and I spent two days at the Brook Farm community when in the height of its prosperity. There I met the Ripleys, who were, I believe, the backbone of the experiment. William Henry Channing, Bronson Alcott, Charles A. Dana, Frederick Cabot, William Chase, Mrs. Horace Greeley, who was spending a few days there, and many others whose names I cannot recall. Here was a charming family of intelligent men and women doing their own farm and housework, with lectures, readings, music, dancing, and games when desired, realizing in a measure Edward Bellamy's beautiful vision of the equal conditions of the human family in the year 2000. The story of the beginning and end of this experiment of community life has been told so often that I will simply say that its failure was a grave disappointment to those most deeply interested in its success. Mr. Channing told me years after, when he was a pastor of the Unitarian Church in Rochester, as we were wandering through Mount Hope one day, that when the Roxbury community was dissolved and he was obliged to return to the old life of competition, he would gladly have been laid under the sod, as the isolated home seemed so solitary, silent, and selfish that the whole atmosphere was oppressive. In 1843 my father moved to Albany to establish my brothers-in-law, Mr. Wilkeson and Mr. McMartin, in the legal profession. That made Albany the family rallying point for a few years. This enabled me to spend several winters at the Capitol and to take an active part in the discussion of the Married Woman's Property Bill, then pending in the legislature. William H. Seward, governor of the state from 1839 to 1843, recommended the bill, and his wife, a woman of rare intelligence, advocated it in society. Together we had the opportunity of talking with many members, both of the Senate and the Assembly, in social circles as well as in their committee rooms.
bills were pending from 1836 until 1848 when the measure finally passed. My second son was born in Albany in March 1844 under more favorable auspices than the first, as I knew then what to do with a baby. Returning to Chelsea we commenced housekeeping, which afforded me another chapter of experience. A new house, newly furnished, with beautiful views of Boston Bay, was all I could desire. Mr. Stanton announced to me in starting that his business would occupy all his time, and that I must take entire charge of the housekeeping. So with two good servants and two babies under my sole supervision, my time was pleasantly occupied. When first installed as mistress over an establishment, one has that same feeling of pride and satisfaction that a young minister must have in taking charge of his first congregation. It is a proud moment in a woman's life to reign supreme within four walls, to be the one to whom all questions of domestic pleasure and economy are referred, and to hold in her hand that little family book in which the daily expenses, the outgoings and incomings are duly registered. I studied up everything pertaining to housekeeping, and enjoyed it all. Even washing day, that day so many people dread, had its charms for me. The clean clothes on the lines and on the grass looked so white, and smelled so sweet, that it was to me a pretty sight to contemplate. I inspired my laundress with an ambition to have her clothes look white, and to get them out earlier than our neighbors, and have them ironed and put away sooner. As Mr. Stanton did not come home to dinner, we made a picnic of our noon meal on Mondays, and all thoughts and energies were turned to speed the washing. No unnecessary sweeping or dusting, no visiting nor entertaining angels unawares on that day. It was held sacred to soap suds, blue bags, and clotheslines. The children only had no deviation in the regularity of their lives. They had their drives and walks, their naps and rations in quantity and time as usual. I had all the most approved cookbooks, and spent half my time preserving, pickling, and experimenting in new dishes. I felt the same ambition to excel in all departments of the culinary art that I did at school in the different branches of learning. My love of order and cleanliness was carried throughout from parlor to kitchen, from the front door to the back. I gave a man an extra shilling to pile the logs of firewood with their smooth ends outward though I did not have them scoured white, as did our Dutch grandmothers. I tried, too, to give an artistic touch to everything, the dress of my children and servants included. My dining-table was round, always covered with a clean cloth of a pretty pattern, and a centerpiece of flowers in their season, pretty dishes, clean silver, and set with neatness and care. I put my soul into everything, and hence enjoyed it. I never could understand how housekeepers could rest with rubbish all round their back doors, eggshells, broken dishes, tin cans, and old shoes scattered round their premises, servants ragged and dirty, with their hair in papers and with the kitchen and dining room full of flies. I have never known even artists to be indifferent to their personal appearance and their surroundings. Surely a mother and child, tastefully dressed, and a pretty home for a framework, is as a picture even more attractive than a domestic scene hung on the wall. The love of the beautiful can be illustrated as well in life as on canvas. There is such a struggle among women to become artists that I really wish some of their gifts could be illustrated in clean, orderly, beautiful homes. Our house was pleasantly situated on the Chelsea Hills, commanding a fine view of Boston, the harbor, and surrounding country. There, on the upper piazza, I spent some of the happiest days of my life, enjoying in turn the beautiful outlook, my children, and my books. Here, under the very shadow of Bunker Hill Monument, my third son was born. Shortly after this, Garrett Smith and his wife came to spend a few days with us, so this boy, much against my will, was named after my cousin. I did not believe in old family names unless they were peculiarly euphonious. I had a list of beautiful names for sons and daughters from which to designate each newcomer, but as yet not one on my list had been used. However, I put my foot down at number four and named him Theodore, and thus far he has proved himself a veritable gift of God, doing his uttermost in every way possible to fight the battle of freedom for woman. 
during the visit of my cousin I thought I would venture on a small select dinner party, consisting of the Reverend John Pierpont and his wife, Charles Sumner, John G. Whittier, and Joshua Levitt. I had a new cook, Rose, whose viands thus far had proved delicious, so I had no anxiety on that score. But unfortunately on this occasion I had given her a bottle of wine for the pudding sauce and whipped cream, of which she imbibed too freely, and hence there were some glaring blunders in the menu that were exceedingly mortifying. As Mr. Smith and my husband were both good talkers, I told them they must cover all defects with their brilliant conversation, which they promised to do. Rose had all the points of a good servant, phrenologically and physiologically. She had a good large head, with great bumps of caution and order. Her eyes were large and soft and far apart. In selecting her, scientifically, I had told my husband, in triumph, several times what a treasure I had found. Shortly after dinner, one evening when I was out, she held the baby while the nurse was eating her supper, and carelessly burned his foot against the stove. Then Mr. Stanton suggested that, in selecting the next cook, I would better not trust to science, but inquire of the family where she lived as to her practical virtues. Poor Rose! She wept over her lapses when sober, and made fair promises for the future, but I did not dare to trust her, so we parted. The one drawback to the joys of housekeeping was then, as it is now, the lack of faithful, competent servants. The hope of cooperative housekeeping in the near future gives us some promise of a more harmonious domestic life. One of the books in my library I value most highly is the first volume of Whittier's poems, published in 1838, dedicated to Henry B. Stanton, as a token of the author's personal friendship and of his respect for the unreserved devotion of exalted talents to the cause of humanity and freedom. Soon after our marriage we spent a few days with our gifted Quaker poet on his farm in Massachusetts. I shall never forget those happy days in June, the long walks and drives and talks under the old trees of anti-slavery experiences, and Whittier's mirth and indignation as we described different scenes in the world's anti-slavery convention in London. He laughed immoderately at the Tom Campbell episode. Poor fellow, he had taken too much wine that day, and when Whittier's verses addressed to the convention were read, he criticized them severely and wound up by saying that the soul of a poet was not in him. Mr. Stanton sprang to his feet and recited some of Whittier's stirring stanzas on freedom, which electrified the audience, and turning to Campbell he said, "'What do you say to that?' "'Ah, that's real poetry,' he replied. "'And John Greenleaf Whittier is its author,' said Mr. Stanton. I enjoyed, too, the morning and evening service, when the revered mother read the scriptures and we all bowed our heads in silent worship. There was at times an atmosphere of solemnity pervading everything that was oppressive in the midst of so much that appealed to my higher nature. There was a shade of sadness in even the smile of the mother and sister, and a rigid plainness in the house and its surroundings, a depressed look in Whittier himself that the songs of the birds the sunshine and the bracing New England air seemed powerless to chase away, caused, as I afterward heard, by pecuniary embarrassment and fears in regard to the delicate health of the sister. She, too, had rare poetical talent, and in her Whittier found not only a helpful companion in the practical affairs of life, but one who sympathized with him in the highest flights of which his muse was capable. Their worst fears were realized in the death of the sister not long after. In his last volume several of her poems were published, which are quite worthy the place the brother's appreciation has given them. Whittier's love and reverence for his mother and sister, so marked in every word and look, were charming features of his home life. All his poems to our sex breathe the same tender, worshipful sentiments. Soon after this visit at Amesbury, our noble friend spent a few days with us in Chelsea, near Boston. One evening, after we had been talking a long time of the unhappy dissensions among anti-slavery friends, 
by way of dissipating the shadows, I opened the piano, and proposed that we should sing some cheerful songs. "'Oh, no!' exclaimed Mr. Stanton. "'Do not touch a note. You will put every nerve of Whittier's body on edge. It seemed to me so natural for a poet to love music that I was surprised to know that it was a torture to him. From our upper piazza we had a fine view of Boston Harbor. Sitting there late one moonlight night, admiring the outlines of Bunker Hill Monument and the weird effect of the sails and masts of the vessels lying in the harbor, we naturally passed from the romance of our surroundings to those of our lives. I have often noticed that the most reserved people are apt to grow confidential at such an hour. It was under such circumstances that the good poet opened to me a deeply interesting page of his life, a sad romance of love and disappointment that may not yet be told, as some who were interested in the events are still among the living. Whittier's poems were not only one of the most important factors in the anti-slavery war and victory, but they have been equally potent in emancipating the minds of his generation from the gloomy superstitions of the puritanical religion. Oliver Wendell Holmes, in his eulogy of Whittier, says that his influence on the religious thought of the American people has been far greater than that of the occupant of any pulpit. As my husband's health was delicate and the New England winters proved too severe for him, we left Boston with many regrets, and sought a more genial climate in central New York. End of chapter 8「Chapter nine eighty years and more this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org eighty years and more by elizabeth cady stanton chapter nine the first woman's rights convention in the spring of eighteen forty seven we moved to seneca falls here we spent sixteen years of our married life, and here our other children, two sons and two daughters, were born. Just as we were ready to leave Boston, Mr. and Mrs. Eaton and their two children arrived from Europe, and we decided to go together to Johnstown, Mr. Eaton being obliged to hurry to New York on business, and Mr. Stanton to remain still in Boston a few months. At the last moment my nurse decided she could not leave her friends and go so far away. Accordingly, my sister and I started, by rail, with five children and seventeen trunks, for Albany, where we rested overnight and part of the next day. We had a very fatiguing journey, looking after so many trunks and children, for my sister's children persisted in standing on the platform at every opportunity, and the younger ones would follow their example. This kept us constantly on the watch. We were thankful when safely landed once more in the old homestead in Johnstown, where we arrived at midnight. As our beloved parents had received no warning of our coming, the whole household was aroused to dispose of us. But now in safe harbor, mid familiar scenes and pleasant memories, our slumbers were indeed refreshing. How rapidly one throws off all care and anxiety under the parental roof, and how at sea one feels, no matter what the age may be, when the loved ones are gone forever, and the home of childhood is but a dream of the past. After a few days of rest I started alone from my new home, quite happy with the responsibility of repairing a house and putting all things in order. I was already acquainted with many of the people and the surroundings in Seneca Falls, as my sister, Mrs. Bayard, had lived there several years, and I had frequently made her long visits. We had quite a magnetic circle of reformers, too, in central New York. At Rochester were William Henry Channing, Frederick Douglass, the Anthonys, Post, Hallowell, Stebbins, and some grand old Quaker families at Farmington, the Sedgwicks, Mays, Mills, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage at Syracuse, Garrett Smith at Peterborough, and Beriah Green at Whitesboro. The house we were to occupy had been closed for some years and needed many repairs, and the grounds comprising five acres were overgrown with weeds. My father gave me a check and said with a smile, You believe in woman's capacity to do and dare. Now go ahead and put your place in order. After a minute survey of the premises and due consultation with one or two sons of Adam, I set the carpenters, painters, paper hangers, and gardeners at work, built a new kitchen and woodhouse, and in one month took possession. 
Having left my children with my mother, there were no impediments to a full display of my executive ability. In the purchase of brick, timber, paint, etc., and in making bargains with workmen, I was in frequent consultation with Judge Sackett and Mr. Bascom. The latter was a member of the Constitutional Convention, then in session in Albany, and as he used to walk down whenever he was at home to see how my work progressed, we had long talks, sitting on boxes in the midst of tools and shavings, on the status of women. I urged him to propose an amendment to Article Two, Section 3 of the State Constitution, striking out the word male, which limits the suffrage to men. But while he fully agreed with all I had to say on the political equality of women, he had not the courage to make himself the laughing-stock of the Convention. Whenever I cornered him on this point, manlike, he turned the conversation to the painters and carpenters. However, these conversations had the effect of bringing him into the First Woman's Convention, where he did us good service. In Seneca Falls, my life was comparatively solitary, and the change from Boston was somewhat depressing. There, all my immediate friends were reformers. I had near neighbors, a new home with all the modern conveniences, and well-trained servants. Here, our residence was on the outskirts of the town, roads very often muddy, and no sidewalks most of the way. Mr. Stanton was frequently from home. I had poor servants and an increasing number of children. To keep a house and grounds in good order, purchase every article for daily use, keep the wardrobes of half a dozen human beings in proper trim, take the children to dentists, shoemakers, and different schools, or find teachers at home, altogether made sufficient work to keep one brain busy, as well as all the hands I could impress into the service. Then, too, the novelty of housekeeping had passed away, and much that was once attractive in domestic life was now irksome. I had so many cares that the company I needed for intellectual stimulus was a trial rather than a pleasure. There was quite an Irish settlement at a short distance, and continual complaints were coming to me that my boys threw stones at their pigs, cows, and the roofs of their houses. This involved constant diplomatic relations in the settlement of various difficulties, in which I was so successful that at length they constituted me a kind of umpire in all their own quarrels. If a drunken husband was pounding his wife, the children would run for me. Hastening to the scene of action, I would take Patrick by the collar, and much to his surprise and shame, make him sit down and promise to behave himself. I never had one of them offer the least resistance, and in time they all came to regard me as one having authority. I strengthened my influence by cultivating good feeling. I lent the men papers to read, and invited their children into our grounds giving them fruit, of which we had abundance, and my children's old clothes, books, and toys. I was their physician also. With my box of homeopathic medicines, I took charge of the men, women, and children in sickness. Thus the most amicable relations were established, and in any emergency these poor neighbors were good friends, and always ready to serve me. But I found police duty rather irksome, especially when called out dark nights to prevent drunken fathers from disturbing their sleeping children, or to minister to poor mothers in the pangs of maternity. Alas, alas, who can measure the mountains of sorrow and suffering endured in unwelcome motherhood in the abodes of ignorance, poverty, and vice, where terror-stricken women and children are the victims of strong men frenzied with passion and intoxicating drink? Up to this time life had glided by with comparative ease, but now the real struggle was upon me. My duties were too numerous and varied, and none sufficiently exhilarating or intellectual to bring into play my higher faculties. I suffered with mental hunger, which, like an empty stomach, is very depressing. I had books, but no stimulating companionship. To add to my general dissatisfaction at the change from Boston, I found that Seneca Falls was a malarial region, and in due time all the children were attacked with chills and fever, which under homeopathic treatment in those days lasted three months. The servants were afflicted in the same way. Cleanliness, order, the love of the beautiful and artistic all faded away in the struggle to accomplish what was absolutely necessary from hour to hour. Now I understood, as I never had before, how women could sit down and rest in the midst of general disorder. Housekeeping under such conditions was impossible. So I packed our clothes, locked up the house, and went to that harbor of safety, home, 
as I did ever after, in stress of the weather. I now fully understood the practical difficulties most women had to contend with in the isolated household, and the impossibility of woman's best development if in contact, the chief part of her life, with servants and children. Four years, Falsonstery community life and cooperative households had a new significance for me. Emerson says, quote, A healthy discontent is the first step to progress. Unquote. The general discontent I felt with woman's portion as wife, mother, housekeeper, physician, and spiritual guide, the chaotic conditions into which everything fell without her constant supervision, and the wearied, anxious look of the majority of women impressed me with a strong feeling that some active measures should be taken to remedy the wrongs of society in general, and of women in particular. My experience at the world's anti-slavery convention, all I had read of the legal status of women, and the oppression I saw everywhere, together swept across my soul, intensified now by many personal experiences. It seemed as if all the elements had conspired to impel me to some onward step. I could not see what to do or where to begin. My only thought was a public meeting for protest and discussion. In this tempest-tossed condition of mind, I received an invitation to spend the day with Lucretia Mott at Richard Hunt's in Waterloo. There I met several members of different families of friends, earnest, thoughtful women. I poured out that day the torrent of my long-accumulating discontent with such vehemence and indignation that I stirred myself, as well as the rest of the party, to do and dare anything. My discontent, according to Emerson, must have been healthy, for it moved us all to prompt action, and we decided, then and there, to call a woman's rights convention. We wrote the call that evening, and published it in the Seneca County Courier the next day, the 14th of July, 1848, giving only five days' notice, as the convention was to be held on the 19th and 20th. The call was inserted without signatures, in fact, it was a mere announcement of a meeting, but the chief movers and managers were Lucretia Mott, Mary Ann McClintock, Jane Hunt, Martha C. Wright, and myself. The convention, which was held two days in the Methodist Church, was in every way a grand success. The house was crowded at every session, the speaking good, and a religious earnestness dignified all the proceedings. These were the hasty initiative steps of, quote, the most momentous reform that had yet been launched on the world, the first organized protest against the injustice which had brooded for ages over the character and destiny of one half the race, unquote. No words could express our astonishment on finding a few days afterward that what seemed to us so timely, so rational, so sacred, should be a subject for sarcasm and ridicule to the entire press of the nation. With our Declaration of Rights and Resolutions for a text, it seemed as if every man who could wield a pen prepared a homily on women's sphere. All the journals from Maine to Texas seemed to strive with each other to see which could make our movement appear the most ridiculous. The anti-slavery paper stood by us manfully, and so did Frederick Douglass, both in the convention and in his paper, The North Star, but so pronounced was the popular voice against us in the parlor, press, and pulpit that most of the ladies who had attended the convention and signed the declaration one by one withdrew their names and influence and joined our persecutors. Our friends gave us the cold shoulder and felt themselves disgraced by the whole proceeding. If I had had the slightest premonition of all that was to follow that convention, I fear I should not have had the courage to risk it, and I must confess it was with fear and trembling that I consented to another one month afterward in Rochester. Fortunately, the first one seemed to have drawn all the fire, and of the second but little was said. But we had set the ball in motion, and now, in quick succession, conventions were held in Ohio, Indiana, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and in the city of New York, and have been kept up nearly every year since. The most noteworthy of the early conventions were those held in Massachusetts, in which such men as Garrison, Phillips, Channing, Parker, and Emerson took part. It was one of these that first attracted the attention of Mrs. John Stuart Mill, and drew from her pen that able article on the enfranchisement of woman in the Westminster Review of October, 1852. 
the same year of the convention the married woman's property bill which had given rise to some discussion on women's rights in new york had passed the legislature this encouraged action on the part of women as the reflection naturally arose that if the men who make the laws were ready for some onward step surely the women themselves should express some interest in the legislation ernestine l ross paulina wright Davis, and I had spoken before committees of the legislature years before demanding equal property rights for women. We had circulated petitions for the Married Woman's Property Bill for many years, and so also had the leaders of the Dutch aristocracy, who desired to see their lifelong accumulations descend to their daughters and grandchildren, rather than pass into the hands of the dissipated, thriftless sons-in-law. Judge Hertel, Judge Fine, and Mr. Geddes of Syracuse prepared and championed the several bills at different times before the legislature. Hence the demands made in the convention were not entirely new to the reading and thinking public of New York, the first state to take any action on the question. As New York was the first state to put the word male in her constitution in 1778, it was fitting that she should be the first in more liberal legislation. The effect of the convention on my own mind was most salutary. The discussions had cleared my ideas as to the primal steps to be taken for woman's enfranchisement, and the opportunity of expressing myself fully and freely on a subject I felt so deeply about was a great relief. I think all women who attended the convention felt better for the statement of their wrongs, believing that the first step had been taken to right them. Soon after this I was invited to speak at several points in the neighborhood. One night, in the Quaker Meeting House at Farmington, I invited, as usual, discussion and questions when I had finished. We all waited in silence for a long time. At length, a middle-aged man with a broad-brimmed hat arose and responded in a sing-song tone. All I have to say is, if a hen can crow, let her crow! Woo-hoo! Emphasizing crow with an upward inflection on several notes of the gamut. The meeting adjourned with mingled feelings of surprise and merriment. I confess that I felt somewhat chagrined in having what I considered my unanswerable arguments so summarily disposed of, and the serious impression I had made on the audience so speedily dissipated. The good man intended no disrespect, as he told me afterward. He simply put the whole argument in a nutshell. Let a woman do whatever she can. With these new duties and interests, and a broader outlook on human life, my petty domestic annoyances gradually took a subordinate place. Now I began to write articles for the press, letters to conventions held in other states, and private letters to friends, to arouse them to thought on this question. The pastor of the Presbyterian Church, Mr. Bogue, preached several sermons on the woman's sphere, criticizing the action of the conventions in Seneca Falls and Rochester. Elizabeth McClintock and I took notes and answered them in the county papers. Gradually we extended our labors and attacked our opponents in the New York Tribune, whose columns were open to us in the early days, Mr. Greeley being at that time one of our most faithful champions. In answering all the attacks, we were compelled to study canon and civil law, constitutions, Bibles, science, philosophy, and history, sacred and profane. Now my mind, as well as my hands, was fully occupied, and instead of mourning as I had done over what I had lost in leaving Boston, I tried in every way to make the most of life in Seneca Falls. Seeing that elaborate refreshments prevented many social gatherings, I often gave an evening entertainment without any. I told the young people whenever they wanted a little dance or a merry time to make our house their rallying point, and I would light up and give them a glass of water and some cake. In that way we had many pleasant informal gatherings. Then, in imitation of Margaret Fuller's conversationals, we started one which lasted several years. We selected a subject each week on which we all read and thought, each in turn preparing an essay ten minutes in length. These were held at different homes, Saturday of each week. On coming together we chose a presiding officer for the evening, who called the meeting to order, and introduced the essayist. That finished, he asked each member in turn what he or she had read or thought on the subject, and if any had criticisms to make on the essay. Everyone was expected to contribute something. Much information was thus gained, and many spicy discussions followed. All the ladies, as well as the gentlemen, presided in turn, and so became familiar with parliamentary rules. 
The evening ended with music, dancing, and a general chat. In this way we read and thought over a wide range of subjects and brought together the best minds in the community. Many young men and women who did not belong to what was considered the first circle, for in every little country village there is always a small clique that constitutes the aristocracy, had the advantages of a social life otherwise denied them. I think that all who took part in this conversation club would testify to its many good influences. I had three quite intimate young friends in the village who spent much of their spare time with me, and who added much to my happiness. Francis Hoskins, who was principal of the girls' department in the academy, with whom I discussed politics and religion, Mary Bascom, a good talker on the topics of the day, and Mary Crowninshield, who played well on the piano. As I was very fond of music, Mary's coming was always hailed with delight. Her mother, too, was a dear friend of mine, a woman of rare intelligence, refinement, and conversational talent. She was a Schuyler, and belonged to the Dutch aristocracy in Albany. She died suddenly, after a short illness. I was with her in the last hours, and held her hand until the gradually fading spark of life went out. Her son is Captain A. S. Crowninshield of our Navy. My nearest neighbors were a very agreeable, intelligent family of sons and daughters, but I always felt that the men of that household were given to domineering. As the mother was very amiable and self-sacrificing, the daughters found it difficult to rebel. One summer, after general house-cleaning, when fresh paint and paper had made even the kitchen look too dainty for the summer invasion of flies, the queens of the household decided to move the somber cook-stove into a spacious wood-house, where it maintained its dignity one week, in the absence of the head of the home. The mothers and daughters were delighted with the change, and wondered why they had not made it before during the summer months. But their pleasure was short-lived. Father and sons rose early the first morning after his return and moved the stove back to its old place. When the wife and daughters came down to get their breakfast, for they did all their own work, they were filled with grief and disappointment. The breakfast was eaten in silence, the women humbled with a sense of their helplessness, and the men gratified with a sense of their power. These men would probably all have said, Home is woman's sphere, though they took the liberty of regulating everything in her sphere. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Eighty Years and More This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Chapter 10 Susan B. Anthony the reports of the conventions held in Seneca Falls and Rochester, New York, in 1848 attracted the attention of one destined to take a most important part in the new movement, Susan B. Anthony, who for her courage and executive ability was facetiously called by William Henry Channing the Napoleon of our struggle. At this time she was teaching in the academy at Kana Johari, a little village in the beautiful valley of the Mohawk. The woman's declaration of independence issued from those conventions startled and amused her, and she laughed heartily at the novelty and presumption of the demand. But on returning home to spend her vacation she was surprised to find that her sober Quaker parents and sister, having attended the Rochester meetings, regarded them as very profitable and interesting, and the demands made as proper and reasonable. She was already interested in the anti-slavery and temperance reforms was an active member of an organization called the Daughters of Temperance, and had spoken a few times in their public meetings. But the new gospel of woman's rights found a ready response in her mind, and from that time her best efforts have been given to the enfranchisement of women. As from this time my friend is closely associated with my narrative and will frequently appear therein, a sketch of her seems appropriate. Lord Bacon has well said, Quote, he that hath wife and children hath given hostages to fortune, for they are impediments to great enterprises, either of virtue or mischief. Certainly the best works, and of greatest merit for the public, have proceeded from the unmarried or childless men, which both in affection and means have married and endowed the public. End quote. This bit of Baconian philosophy 
as alike applicable to women, was the subject not long since of a conversation with a remarkably gifted Englishwoman. She was absorbed in many public interests, and had conscientiously resolved never to marry, lest the cares necessarily involved in matrimony should make inroads upon her time and thought, to the detriment of the public good. Unless, said she, some women dedicate themselves to the public service, society is robbed of needed guardians for the special wants of the weak and unfortunate. There should be, in the secular world, certain orders corresponding in a measure to the grand sisterhoods of the Catholic Church, to the members of which, as freely as to men, all offices, civic and ecclesiastical, should be open. That this ideal will be realized may be inferred from the fact that exceptional women have, in all ages, been leaders in great projects of charity and reform, and that now many stand waiting only the sanction of their century, ready for wide altruistic labors. The world has ever had its vestal virgins, its holy women, mothers of ideas rather than of men, its Marys as well as its Marthas, who, rather than be busy housewives, preferred to sit at the feet of divine wisdom and ponder the mysteries of the unknown. All hail to Maria Mitchell, Harriet Hosmer, Charlotte Cushman, Alice and Phoebe Gary, Louisa Alcott, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, Frances Willard, and Clara Barton. All honor to the noble women who have devoted earnest lives to the intellectual and moral needs of mankind. Susan B. Anthony was of sturdy New England stock, and it was at the foot of Old Greylock, South Adams, Massachusetts, that she gave forth her first rebellious cry. There the baby steps were taken, and at the village school the first stitches were learned, and the ABC duly mastered. When five winters had passed over Susan's head, there came a time of great domestic commotion, and in her small way the child seized the idea that permanence is not the rule of life. The family moved to Battenville, New York, where Mr. Anthony became one of the wealthiest men in Washington County. Susan can still recall the stately coldness of the great house. How large the bare rooms, with their yellow-painted floors, seemed in contrast with her own diminutiveness, and the outlook of the schoolroom, where for so many years, with her brothers and sisters, she pursued her studies under private tutors. Mr. Anthony was a stern Hicksite Quaker. In Susan's early life he objected on principle to all forms of frivolous amusement, such as music, dancing, or novel reading, while games and even pictures were regarded as meaningless luxuries. Such puritanical convictions might have easily degenerated into mere cant, but underlying all was a broad and firm basis of wholesome respect for individual freedom, and a brave adherence to truth. He was a man of good business capacity, and a thorough manager of his wide and lucrative interests. He saw that compensation and not chance ruled in the commercial world, and he believed in the same just, though often severe, law in the sphere of morals. Such a man was not apt to walk humbly in the path mapped out by his religious sect. He early offended by choosing a Baptist for a wife. For this offense he was disowned, and according to Quaker usage could only be received into fellowship again by declaring himself sorry for his crime in full meeting. He was full of devout thankfulness for the good woman by his side, and destined to be thankful to the very end for this companion, so calm, so just, so far-seeing. He rose in meeting and said he was sorry, that the rules of the society were such that in marrying the woman he loved he had committed offense. He admitted that he was sorry for something, so was taken back into the body of the faithful. But his faith had begun to weaken in many minor points of discipline. His coat soon became a cause of offense and called forth another reproof from those buttoned up in conforming garments. The petty forms of Quakerism began to lose their weight with him altogether, and he was finally disowned for allowing the village youth to be taught dancing in an upper room of his dwelling. He was applied to for this favor on the ground that young men were under great temptation to drink if the lessons were given in the hotel, and being a rigid temperance man, he readily consented though his principles in regard to dancing would not allow his own sons and daughters to join in the amusement. But the society could accept no such discrimination in what it deemed sin, 
nor such compromise with worldly frivolity. And so Mr. Anthony was seen no more in meeting. But in later years, in Rochester, he was an attentive listener to Rev. William Henry Channing. The effect of all this on Susan is the question of interest. No doubt she early weighed the comparative moral effects of coats cut with capes and those cut without, of purely Quaker conjugal love, and that deteriorated with Baptist affection. Susan had an earnest soul and a conscience tending to morbidity, but a strong, well-balanced body and simple family life soothed her too active moral nature and gave the world, instead of a religious fanatic, a sincere, concentrated worker. Every household art was taught her by her mother, and so great was her ability that the duty demanding a special care was always given into her hands. But ever, amid school and household tasks, her daydream was that in time she might be a high-seat Quaker. Each Sunday, up to the time of the third disobedience, Mr. Anthony went to the Quaker meeting house, some thirteen miles from home, his wife and children usually accompanying him, though as non-members they were rigidly excluded from all business discussions. Exclusion was very pleasant in the bright days of summer, but on one occasion in December decidedly unpleasant for the seven-year-old Susan. When the blinds were drawn, at the close of the religious meeting, and non-members retired, Susan sat still. Soon she saw a thin old lady with blue goggles come down from the high seat, Approaching her, the Quakeress said softly, Thee is not a member, thee must go out. No, my mother told me not to go out in the cold, was the child's firm response. Yes, but thee must go out, thee is not a member. But my father is a member. Thee is not a member. And Susan felt as if the spirit was moving her, and soon found herself in outer coldness fingers and toes becoming numb, and a bright fire in a cottage over the way beckoning warmly to her, the exile from the chapel resolved to seek secular shelter. But alas, she was confronted by a huge dog, and just escaped with whole skin, though capeless jacket. We may be sure there was much talk that night at the home fireside, and the good Baptist wife declared that no child of hers should attend meeting again till made a member. Thereafter, by request of her father, Susan became a member of the Quaker Church. Later, definite convictions took root in Miss Anthony's heart. Hers is, indeed, a sincerely religious nature. To be a simple, earnest Quaker was the aspiration of her girlhood, but she shrank from adopting the formal language and plain dress. Dark hours of conflict were spent over all this, and she interpreted her disinclination as evidence of unworthiness. Poor little Susan! As we look back with the knowledge of our later life, we translate the heart-burnings as unconscious protests against labeling your free soul, against testing your reasoning conviction of tomorrow by any shibboleth of today's belief. We hail this child intuition as a prophecy of the uncompromising truthfulness of the mature woman. Susan Anthony was taught simply that she must enter into the holy of holies of her own self, meet herself, and be true to the revelation. She first found words to express her convictions in listening to Rev. William Henry Channing, whose teaching had a lasting spiritual influence upon her. Today, Miss Anthony is an agnostic. As to the nature of the Godhead and of the life beyond her horizon, she does not profess to know anything. Every energy of her soul is centered upon the needs of this world. To her, work is worship. She has not stood aside, shivering in the cold shadows of uncertainty, but has moved on with the whirling world, has done the good given her to do, and thus, in darkest hours, has been sustained by an unaltering faith in the final perfection of all things. Her belief is not orthodox, but it is religious. In ancient Greece she would have been a Stoic, in the era of the Reformation a Calvinist, in King Charles's time a Puritan. But in this nineteenth century, by the very laws of her being, she is a reformer. For the arduous work that awaited Miss Anthony, her years of young womanhood had given preparation. Her father, though a man of wealth, made it a matter of conscience to train his girls as well as his boys to self-support. 
Accordingly, Susan chose the profession of teacher, and made her first essay during a summer vacation in a school her father had established for the children of his employees. Her success was so marked, not only in imparting knowledge, but also as a disciplinarian, that she followed this career steadily for fifteen years, with the exception of some months given in Philadelphia to her own training. Of the many school rebellions which she overcame, one rises before me, prominent in its ludicrous aspect. This was in the district school at Center Falls in the year 1839. Bad reports were current there of male teachers driven out by a certain strapping lad. Rumor next told of a Quaker maiden coming to teach, a Quaker maiden of peace principles. The anticipated day, and Susan arrived. She looked very meek to the barbarian of fifteen, so he soon began his antics. He was called to the platform, told to lay aside his jacket, and thereupon, with much astonishment received from the mild Quaker maiden, with a birch rod applied calmly but with precision, an exposition of the argumentum ad hominem, based on the a posteriori method of reasoning. Thus Susan departed from her principles, but not from the school. About the year 1850, Susan B. Anthony hid her feral away. Temperance, anti-slavery, woman suffrage, three pregnant questions presented themselves demanding her consideration. Higher, ever higher, rose their appeals, until she resolved to dedicate her energy and thought to the burning needs of the hour. Owing to early experience of the disabilities of her sex, the first demand for equal rights for women found echo in Susan's heart and though she was in the beginning startled to hear that women had actually met in convention, and by speeches and resolutions had declared themselves man's peer in political rights, and had urged radical changes in state constitutions and the whole system of American jurisprudence, yet the most casual review convinced her that these claims were but the logical outgrowth of the fundamental theories of our republic. At this stage of her development I met my future friend and coadjutor for the first time. How well I remember the day! George Thompson and William Lloyd Garrison having announced an anti-slavery meeting in Seneca Falls, Miss Anthony came to attend it. These gentlemen were my guests. Walking home after the adjournment we met Mrs. Bloomer and Miss Anthony on the corner of the street waiting to greet us. There she stood with her good, earnest face and genial smile dressed in gray delaine, hat and all the same color, relieved with pale blue ribbons, the perfection of neatness and sobriety. I liked her thoroughly, and why I did not at once invite her home with me to dinner I do not know. She accuses me of that neglect, and has never forgiven me, as she wished to see and hear all that she could of our noble friends. I suppose my mind was full of what I had heard, or my coming dinner, or the probable behavior of three mischievous boys who had been busily exploring the premises while I was at the meeting. That I had abundant cause for anxiety in regard to the philosophical experiments these young savages might try, the reader will admit, when informed of some of their performances. Henry imagined himself possessed of rare powers of invention, an ancestral weakness for generations and so made a life-preserver of corks, and tested its virtues on his brother, who was about eighteen months old. Accompanied by a troop of expectant boys, the baby was drawn in his carriage to the banks of the Seneca, stripped, and string of corks tied under his arms, and set afloat in the river, the philosopher and his satellites in a rowboat watching the experiment. The baby, accustomed to a morning bath in a large tub, splashed about joyfully, keeping his head above water. He was as blue as indigo and as cold as a frog when rescued by his anxious mother. The next day the same victimized infant was seen by a passing friend, seated on the chimney, on the highest peak of the house. Without alarming anyone, the friend hurried up to the housetop and rescued the child. Another time the three elder brothers entered into a conspiracy and locked up the fourth, Theodore, in the smokehouse. Fortunately, he sounded the alarm loud and clear, and was set free in safety, whereupon the three were imprisoned in a garret with two barred windows. They summarily kicked out the bars, and sliding down on the lightning rod, betook themselves to the barn for liberty. The youngest boy, Garrett, then only five years old, skinned his hands on the descent. This is a fair sample of the quiet happiness I enjoyed in the first years of motherhood. 
It was mid such exhilarating scenes that Miss Anthony and I wrote addresses for temperance, anti-slavery, educational, and women's rights conventions. Here we forged resolutions, protests, appeals, petitions, agricultural reports, and constitutional arguments, for we made it a matter of conscience to accept every invitation to speak on every question in order to maintain woman's right to do so. To this end we took turns on the domestic watchtowers, directing amusements, settling disputes, protecting the weak against the strong, and trying to secure equal rights to all in the home as well as the nation. I can recall many a stern encounter between my friend and the young experimenter. It is pleasant to remember that he never seriously injured any of his victims, and only once came near fatally shooting himself with a pistol. The ball went through his hand. Happily, a brass button prevented it from penetrating his heart. It is often said by those who know Miss Anthony best that she has been my good angel, always pushing and goading me to work, and that but for her pertinacity I should never have accomplished the little I have. On the other hand, it has been said that I forged the thunderbolts, and she fired them. Perhaps all this is in a measure true. With the cares of a large family, I might in time, like too many women, have become wholly absorbed in a narrow family selfishness, had not my friend been continually exploring new fields for missionary labors. Her description of a body of men on any platform, complacently deciding questions in which woman had an equal interest, without an equal voice, readily roused me to a determination to throw a firebrand into the midst of their assembly. Thus, whenever I saw that stately Quaker girl coming across my lawn, I knew that some happy convocation of the sons of Adam was to be set by the ears, by one of our appeals or resolutions. The little portmanteau, stuffed with facts, was opened, and there we had what the Reverend John Smith and Honorable Richard Rowe had said, false interpretations of Bible texts, the statistics of women robbed of their property, shut out of some college, half paid for their work, the reports of some disgraceful trial, injustice enough to turn any woman's thoughts from stockings and puddings. Then we would get out our pens and write articles for papers, or a petition to the legislature, indict letters to the faithful here and there, stir up the women in Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Massachusetts, call on the lily, the una, the liberator, the standard to remember our wrongs as well as those of the slave. We never met without issuing a pronunciamento on some question. In thought and sympathy we were one, and in the division of labor we exactly complemented each other. In writing we did better work than either could alone. While she is slow and analytical in composition, I am rapid and synthetic. I am the better writer, she the better critic. She supplied the facts and statistics, I the philosophy and rhetoric, and together we have made arguments that have stood unshaken through the storms of long years, arguments that no one has answered. Our speeches may be considered the united product of our two brains. So entirely one are we, that in all our associations, ever side by side on the same platform, not one feeling of envy or jealousy has ever shadowed our lives. We have indulged freely in criticism of each other when alone, and hotly contended whenever we have differed, but in our friendship of years there has never been the break of one hour. To the world we always seem to agree and uniformly reflect each other. Like husband and wife, each has the feeling that we must have no differences in public. Thus united, at an early day we began to survey the state and nation, the future field of our labors. We read with critical eyes the proceedings of Congress and legislatures, of general assemblies and synods, of conferences and conventions, and discovered that, in all alike, the existence of woman was entirely ignored. Night after night, by an old-fashioned fireplace, we plotted and planned the coming agitation. How, when, and where each entering wedge could be driven, by which women might be recognized and their rights secured. Speedily the state was aflame with disturbances in temperance and teachers' conventions, and the press heralded the news far and near that women delegates had suddenly appeared, demanding admission in men's conventions, that their rights had been hotly contested session after session by liberal men on the one side, the clergy and learned professors on the other. 
an overwhelming majority rejecting the women with terrible anathemas and denunciations. Such battles were fought over and over in the chief cities of many of the northern states, until the bigotry of men in all the reforms and professions was thoroughly exposed. Every right achieved to enter a college, to study a profession, to labor in some new industry, or to advocate a reform measure was contended for inch by inch. Many of those enjoying all these blessings now complacently say, if these pioneers in reform had only pressed their measures more judiciously, in a more ladylike manner, in more choice language, with a more deferential attitude, the gentlemen could not have behaved so rudely. I give in these pages enough of the characteristics of these women, of the sentiments they expressed, of their education, ancestry, and position, to show that no power could have met the prejudice and bigotry of that period more successfully than they did, who so bravely and persistently fought and conquered them. Miss Anthony first carried her flag of rebellion into the state conventions of teachers, and there fought, almost single-handed, the battle for equality. At the close of the first decade she had compelled conservatism to yield its ground so far as to permit women to participate in all debates, deliver essays, vote, and hold honored positions as officers. She labored as sincerely in the temperance movement, until convinced that woman's moral power amounted to little as a civil agent, until backed by ballot and coined into state law. She still never loses an occasion to defend co-education and prohibition, and solves every difficulty with the refrain, woman suffrage, as persistent as the nevermore of Poe's Raven. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven, Eighty Years and More. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter Eleven, Susan B. Anthony continued. It was in 1852 that anti-slavery, through the eloquent lips of such men as George Thompson, Phillips, and Garrison, first proclaimed to Miss Anthony its pressing financial necessities. To their inspired words she gave answer, four years afterward, by becoming a regularly employed agent in the Anti-Slavery Society. For her espoused cause she has always made boldest demands. In the abolition meetings she used to tell each class why it should support the movement financially, invariably calling upon Democrats to give liberally, as the success of the cause would enable them to cease bowing the knee to the slave power. There is scarce a town, however small, from New York to San Francisco that has not heard her ringing voice. Who can number the speeches she has made on lyceum platforms, in churches, schoolhouses, halls, barns? and in the open air, with a lumber wagon or a cart for her rostrum? Who can describe the varied audiences and social circles she has cheered and interested? Now we see her on the far-off prairies, entertaining with sterling common sense large gatherings of men, women, and children, seated on rough boards in some unfinished building, again holding debates in some town with half-fledged editors and clergymen, next sailing up the Columbia River, and, in hot haste to meet some appointment, jolting over the rough mountains of Oregon and Washington, and then, before legislative assemblies, constitutional conventions, and congressional committees, discussing with senators and judges the letter and spirit of constitutional law. Miss Anthony's style of speaking is rapid and vehement. In debate she is ready and keen, and she is always equal to an emergency. Many times in traveling with her through the West, especially on our first trip to Kansas and California, we were suddenly called upon to speak to the women assembled at the stations. Filled with consternation, I usually appealed to her to go first, and without a moment's hesitation she could always fill five minutes with some appropriate words and inspire me with thoughts and courage to follow. The climax of these occasions was reached in an institution for the deaf and dumb in Michigan. I had just said to my friend, there is one comfort in visiting this place. We shall not be asked to speak. 
when the superintendent, approaching us, said, Ladies, the pupils are assembled in the chapel ready to hear you. I promised to invite you to speak to them as soon as I heard you were in town. The possibility of addressing such an audience was as novel to Miss Anthony as to me, yet she promptly walked down the aisle to the platform as if to perform an ordinary duty, while I, half distracted with anxiety, wondering by what process I was to be placed in communication with the deaf and dumb, reluctantly followed. But the manner was simple enough when illustrated. The superintendent, standing by our side, repeated in the sign language what was said as fast as uttered, and by laughter, tears, and applause, the pupils showed that they fully appreciated the pathos, humor, and argument. One night, crossing the Mississippi at McGregor, Iowa, we were ice-bound in the middle of the river. The boat was crowded with people, hungry, tired, and cross with the delay. Some gentlemen, with whom we had been talking on the cars, started the cry, "'Speech on woman suffrage!' Accordingly, in the middle of the Mississippi River, at midnight, we presented our claims to political representation and debated the question of universal suffrage until we landed. Our voyagers were quite thankful that we had shortened the many hours, and we equally so at having made several converts and held a convention on the very bosom of the great Mother of Waters. Only once in all these wanderings was Miss Anthony taken by surprise, and that was on being asked to speak to the inmates of an insane asylum. "'Bless me,' she said, "'it is as much as I can do to talk to the sane. What could I say to an audience of lunatics?' Her companion, Virginia L. Minor of St. Louis, replied, "'This is a golden moment for you, the first opportunity you have ever had, according to the constitutions, to talk to your peers, for is not the right of suffrage denied to idiots, criminals, lunatics, and women?' Much curiosity has been expressed as to the love life of Miss Anthony. But if she has enjoyed or suffered any of the usual triumphs or disappointments of her sex, she has not yet vouchsafed this information to her biographers. While few women have had more sincere and lasting friendships, or a more extensive correspondence with a large circle of noble men, yet I doubt if one of them can boast of having received from her any exceptional attention. She has often playfully said, when questioned on this point, that she could not consent that the man she loved, described in the Constitution as a white male, native-born, American citizen, possessed of the right of self-government, eligible to the office of President of the Great Republic, should unite his destinies in marriage with a political slave and pariah. No, no, when I am crowned with all the rights, privileges, and immunities of a citizen, I may give some consideration to this social institution, but until then I must concentrate all my energies on the enfranchisement of my own sex. Miss Anthony's love life, like her religion, has manifested itself in steadfast, earnest labors for men in general. She has been a watchful and affectionate daughter, sister, friend, and those who have felt the pulsations of her great heart know how warmly it beats for all. As the custom has been observed among married women of celebrating the anniversaries of their wedding day, quite properly the initiative has been taken, in late years, of doing honor to the great events in the lives of single women. Being united in the closest bonds to her profession, Dr. Harriet K. Hunt of Boston celebrated her twenty-fifth year of faithful services as a physician by giving to her friends and patrons a large reception, which she called her silver wedding. From a feeling of the sacredness of her life work, the admirers of Susan B. Anthony have been moved to mark, by reception and convention, her rapid flowing years and the passing decades of the suffrage movement. To the most brilliant occasion of this kind, the invitation cards were as follows. The ladies of the Woman's Bureau invite you to a reception on Tuesday evening, February 15th, to celebrate the 50th birthday of Susan B. Anthony when her friends will have an opportunity to show their appreciation of her long services in behalf of woman's emancipation. Number 49, East 23rd Street, New York, February 10, 1870. Elizabeth B. Phelps, Anna B. Darling, Charlotte B. Wilbur. In response to the invitation, the parlors of the Bureau were crowded with friends to congratulate Miss Anthony on the happy event, many bringing valuable gifts as an expression of their gratitude. 
among other presents were a handsome gold watch and checks to the amount of a thousand dollars. The guests were entertained with music, recitations, and reading of many piquant letters of regret from distinguished people, and witty rhymes written for the occasion by the Carey sisters. Miss Anthony received her guest with her usual straightforward simplicity, and in a few earnest words expressed her thanks for the presents and praises showered upon her. The comments of the leading journals next day were highly complimentary, and as genial as amusing. All dwelt on the fact that, at last, a woman had arisen brave enough to assert her right to grow old, and openly declare that a half a century had rolled over her head. Of carefully prepared written speeches Miss Anthony has made few, but these, by the high praise they called forth, prove that she can, in spite of her own declaration to the contrary, put her sterling thoughts on paper concisely and effectively. After her exhaustive plea in 1880 for a Sixteenth Amendment before the Judiciary Committee of the Senate, Senator Edmonds accosted her as she was leaving the Capitol, and said he neglected to tell her in the committee room that she had made an argument, no matter what his personal feelings were as to the conclusions reached, which was unanswerable. An argument, unlike the usual platform oratory given at hearings, suited to a committee of men trained to the law. It was in 1876 that Miss Anthony gave her much-criticized lecture on social purity in Boston. As to the result, she felt very anxious, for the intelligence of New England composed her audience, and it did not still her heartbeats to see, sitting just in front of the platform, her revered friend, William Lloyd Garrison. But surely every fear vanished when she felt the grand old abolitionist's hand warmly pressing hers, and heard him say that to listen to no one else would he have had the courage to leave his sick room, and that he felt fully repaid by her grand speech, which neither in matter nor manner would he have changed in the smallest particle. But into Miss Anthony's private correspondence one must look for examples of her most effective writing. Verb or substantive is often wanting, but you can always catch the thought, and will ever find it clear and suggestive. It is a strikingly strange dialect, but one that touches at times the deepest chords of pathos and humor, and when stirred by some great event, is highly eloquent. From being the most ridiculed and mercilessly persecuted woman, Miss Anthony has become the most honored and respected in the nation. Witness the praises of press and people, and the enthusiastic ovations she received on her departure for Europe in 1883. Never were warmer expressions of regret for an absence, nor more sincere prayers for a speedy return, accorded to any American on leaving his native shores. This slow awaking to the character of her services shows the abiding sense of justice in the human soul. Having spent the winter of 1882 to 1883 in Washington, trying to press to a vote the bill for a Sixteenth Amendment before Congress, and the autumn in a vigorous campaign through Nebraska, where a constitutional amendment to enfranchise women had been submitted to the people, she felt the imperative need of an entire change in the current of her thoughts. Accordingly, after one of the most successful conventions ever held at the national capital, and a most flattering ovation in the spacious parlors of the Riggs House, and a large reception in Philadelphia, she sailed for Europe. Fortunate in being perfectly well during the entire journey, our traveler received perpetual enjoyment in watching the ever-varying sea and sky. To the captain's merry challenge to find anything so grand as the ocean, she replied, Yes, these mighty forces in nature do indeed fill me with awe, but this vessel, with deep buried fires, powerful machinery, spacious decks, and tapering masts, walking the waves like a thing of life, and all the work of man impresses one still more deeply. Lo, in man's divine creative power is fulfilled the prophecy, Ye shall be as gods. In all her journeyings through Germany, Italy, and France, Miss Anthony was never the mere sightseer, but always the humanitarian and reformer in traveler's guise. Few of the great masterpieces of art gave her real enjoyment. The keen appreciation of the beauties of sculpture, painting, and architecture, which one would have expected to find in so deep a religious nature, was wanting, warped, no doubt, by her early Quaker training. 
that her travels gave her more pain than pleasure was perhaps not so much that she had no appreciation of aesthetic beauty, but that she quickly grasped the infinitude of human misery, not because her soul did not feel the heights to which art had risen, but that it vibrated in every fiber to the depths of which mankind had fallen. Wandering through a gorgeous palace one day, she exclaimed, what do you find to admire here? If it were a school of five hundred children being educated into the right of self-government, I could admire it too. But standing for one man's pleasure, I say no. In the quarters of one of the devotees at the old monastery of the Certosa at Florence, there lies on a small table an open book in which visitors register. On the occasion of Miss Anthony's visit, the pen and ink proved so unpromising that her entire party declined this opportunity to make themselves famous, but she made the rebellious pen inscribe, Perfect Equality for Women, Civil, Political, Religious, Susan B. Anthony, USA. Friends who visited the monastery next day reported that lines had been drawn through this heretical sentiment. During her visit at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Sargent in Berlin, Miss Anthony quite innocently posted her letters in the official envelopes of our suffrage association, which bore the usual mottoes, No just government can be formed without the consent of the governed, etc. In a few days an official brought back a large package saying, Such sentiments are not allowed to pass through the post office. Probably nothing saved her from arrest as a socialist under the tyrannical police regulations but the fact that she was the guest of the minister plenipotentiary of the United States. My son Theodore wrote of Miss Anthony's visit in Paris. I had never before seen her in the role of tourist. She seemed interested only in the historical monuments and in the men in questions of the hour. The galleries of the Louvre had little attraction for her but she gazed with deep pleasure at Napoleon's tomb, Notre Dame, and the ruins of the Tuileries. She was always ready to listen to discussions on the political problems before the French people, the prospects of the Republic, the divorce agitation, and the education of women. I had rather see Jules Ferry than all the pictures of the Louvre, Luxembourg, and Salon, she remarked at table. A day or two later she saw Ferry at Le Bouillet's funeral. The three things which made the deepest impression on Miss Anthony during her stay at Paris were, in, were probably the interment of Le Bouillet, the friend of the United States of the woman movement, the touching anniversary demonstration of the communists at the cemetery of Père Lachaise, on the very spot where the last defenders of the Commune of 1871 were ruthlessly shot and buried in a common grave, and a woman's rights meeting held in a little hall in the Rue de Rivoli, at which the brave, far-seeing Mademoiselle Hubertine Auchet was the leading spirit. While on the continent, Miss Anthony experienced the unfortunate sensation of being deaf and dumb, to speak and not to be understood, to hear and not to comprehend, were her bitter realities. We can imagine to what desperation she was brought when her Quaker prudishness could hail an emphatic oath in English from a French official with the exclamation, Well, it sounds good to hear someone even swear in Anglo-Saxon. After two months of enforced silence, she was buoyant in reaching the British Islands once more, where she could enjoy public speaking and general conversation. Here she was the recipient of many generous social attentions, and on May 25th, a large public meeting of representative people presided over by Jacob Bright was called in our honor by the National Association of Great Britain. She spoke on the educational and political status of women in America, I of their religious and social position. Before closing my friend's biography, I shall trace two golden threads in this closely woven life of incident. One of the greatest services rendered by Miss Anthony to the suffrage cause was in casting a vote in the presidential election of 1872 in order to test the rights of women under the 14th Amendment. For this offense, the brave woman was arrested on Thanksgiving Day, the national holiday handed down to us by pilgrim fathers escaped from England's persecutions. She asked for a writ of habeas corpus the writ being flatly refused, in January 1873, her counsel gave bonds. 
the daring defendant finding when too late that this not only kept her out of jail, but her case out of the Supreme Court of the United States, regretfully determined to fight on and gain the uttermost by a decision in the United States Circuit Court. Her trial was set down for the Rochester term in May. Quickly she canvassed the whole county, laying before every probable juror the strength of her case. When the time for the trial arrived, the district attorney, fearing the result if the decision were left to a jury drawn from Miss Anthony's enlightened county, transferred the trial to the Ontario County term in June 1873. It was now necessary to instruct the citizens of another county. In this task, Miss Anthony received valuable assistance from Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and to meet all this new expense, financial aid was generously given, unsolicited, by Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Garrett Smith, and other sympathizers. But in vain was every effort. In vain the appeal of Miss Anthony to her jurors. In vain the moral influence of the leading representatives of the bar of central New York filling the courtroom. For Judge Hunt, without precedent to sustain him, declared it a case of law, and not a fact, refused to give the case to the jury, reserving it to himself final decision. Was it not an historic scene which was enacted there in that little courthouse in Canandaigua? All the inconsistencies were embodied in that judge, punctilious in manner, scrupulous in attire, conscientious in trivialities, and obtuse on great principles, fitly described by Charles O'Connor, a very ladylike judge. Behold him sitting there balancing all the niceties of law and equity in his old world scales, and at last saying, The prisoner will stand up. Whereupon the accused arose. The sentence of the court is that you pay a fine of one hundred dollars and the costs of the prosecution. Then the unruly defendant answers, May it please your honor, I shall never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty, and more to the same effect, all of which she has lived up to. The ladylike judge had gained some insight into the determination of the prisoner. So, not wishing to incarcerate her to all eternity, he added gently, Madam, the court will not order you committed until the fine is paid. It was on the 17th of June that the verdict was given. On that very day, a little less than a century before, the brave militia was driven back at Bunker Hill. Back, back, almost wiped out. Yet truth was in their ranks, and justice too. But how ended that rebellion of weak colonists? The cause of American womanhood, embodied for the moment in the liberty of a single individual, received a rebuff on June seventeenth, 1873. But just as surely as our revolutionary heroes were in the end victorious, so will the inalienable rights of our heroines of the nineteenth century receive final vindication. In his speech of 1880, before the Phi Beta Kappa Society at Harvard, Wendell Phillips said, what as a rule is true, that a reformer to be conscientious must be free from breadwinning. I will open Miss Anthony's accounts and show that this reformer, being perhaps the exception which proves the rule, has been consistently and conscientiously in debt. Turning over her yearbooks, the pages give a fair record up to 1863. Here began the first Herculean labor. The Woman's Loyal League, sadly in need of funds, was not an incorporated association so its secretary assumed the debts. Accounts here became quite lamentable, the deficit reaching five thousand dollars. It must be paid, and in fact will be paid. Anxious, weary hours were spent in crowding the Cooper Institute from week to week with paying audiences to listen to such men as Phillips, Curtis, and Douglas, who contributed their service and lifted the secretary out of debt. At last, after many difficulties, her cash book of 1863 was honorably pigeonholed. In 1867, we can read account of Herculean labor the second. Twenty thousand tracts are needed to convert the voters of Kansas to woman suffrage. Traveling expenses to Kansas and the tracts make the debtor column overreach the creditor some two thousand dollars. There is recognition on these pages of more than one thousand dollars obtained by soliciting advertisements, 
but no note is made of the weary, burning July days spent in the streets of New York to procure this money, nor of the ready application of the savings made by petty economies from her salary from the Hovey Committee. It would have been fortunate for my brave friend if cash books, 1868, 1869, and 1870, had never come down from their shelves, for they sing and sing in notes of debts, till all unite in one vast chorus of far more than ten thousand dollars. These were the days of the revolution, the newspaper, not the war, though it was warfare for the debt-ridden manager. Several thousand dollars she paid with money earned by lecturing, and with money given her for personal use. One Thanksgiving was, in truth, a time for returning thanks, for she received, cancelled from her cousin, Anson Laffam, her note for four thousand dollars. After the funeral of Paulina Wright Davis, the bereaved widower pressed into Miss Anthony's hand cancelled notes for five hundred dollars, bearing on the back the words, In memory of my beloved wife. One other note was cancelled in recognition of her perfect forgetfulness of self-interest and ready sacrifice to the needs of others. When laboring in 1874 to fill every engagement in order to meet her debts, her mother's sudden illness called her home. Without one selfish regret, the anxious daughter hastened to Rochester. When recovery was certain, and Miss Anthony was about to return to her fatiguing labors, her mother gave her, at parting, her note for a thousand dollars, on which was written in trembling lines, In just consideration of the tender sacrifice made to nurse me in severe illness. At last all the revolution debt was paid, except that due to her generous sister, Mary Anthony, who used often humorously to assure her she was a fit subject for the Bankrupt Act. There is something humorously pathetic in the death of the Revolution, that firstborn of Miss Anthony. Mrs. Laura Curtis Bullard generously assumed the care of the troublesome child, and in order to make the adoption legal gave the usual consideration, one dollar. The very night of the transfer Miss Anthony went to Rochester with the dollar in her pocket and the little change left after purchasing her ticket. She arrived safely with her debts, but nothing more. Her pocket had been picked. Oh, thief, you could not know what value of faithful work you purloined. From the close of the year 1876, Miss Anthony's account showed favorable signs as to the credit column. Indeed, at the end of five years, there was a solid balance of several thousand dollars earned on lecturing tours. But, alas, the accounts grow dim again. In fact, the credit column fades away. The history of woman suffrage ruthlessly swallowed up every vestige of Miss Anthony's bank account. But in 1886, by the will of Mrs. Eddy, daughter of Francis Bacon of Boston, Miss Anthony received $24,000 for the woman suffrage movement, which lifted her out of debt once more. In vain you will search these tell-tale books for evidence of personal extravagance, for although Miss Anthony thinks it true economy to buy the best, her tastes are simple. Is there not something very touching in the fact that she never bought a book or picture for her own enjoyment? The meager personal balance sheets show four lapses from discipline, lapses that she even now regards as ruthless extravagance viz. the purchase of two inexpensive brooches, a much-needed watch, and a pair of cuffs to match a point-lace collar presented by a friend. Those interested in Miss Anthony's personal appearance long ago ceased to trust her with the purchase money for any ornament, for however firm her resolution to comply with their wish, the check invariably found its way to the credit column of those little cash books, as money received for the cause. Now, reader, you have been admitted to a private view of Miss Anthony's financial records, and you can appreciate her devotion to an idea. Do you not agree with me that a breadwinner can be a conscientious reformer? In finishing this sketch of the most intimate friend I have had for the past forty-five years, with whom I have spent weeks and months under the same roof, I can truly say that she is the most upright, courageous, self-sacrificing, magnanimous human being I have ever known. I have seen her beset on every side with the most petty annoyances, ridiculed and misrepresented, slandered and persecuted. I have known women refuse to take her extended hand. 
women to whom she presented copies of the history of woman suffrage return it unnoticed others to keep it without one word of acknowledgment others to write most insulting letters in answer to hers of affectionate conciliation and yet under all the cross-fires incident to a reform never has her hope flagged her self-respect wavered or a feeling of resentment shadowed her mind oftentimes when i have been sorely discouraged thinking that the prolonged struggle was a waste of force in which other directions might be rich in achievement with her sublime faith in humanity she would breathe into my soul renewed inspiration saying pity rather than blame those who persecute us so closely interwoven have been our lives our purposes and experiences that separated we have a feeling of incompleteness united such strength of self-assertion that no ordinary obstacles difficulties or dangers ever appear to us insurmountable reviewing the life of susan b anthony i ever liken her to the doric column in grecian architecture so simply so grandly she stands free from every extraneous ornament supporting her one vast idea the enfranchisement of woman as our estimate of ourselves and our friendship may differ somewhat from that taken from an objective point of view i will give an extract from what our common friend theodore tilton wrote of us in eighteen sixty eight miss susan b anthony a well-known indefatigable and lifelong advocate of temperance anti-slavery and woman's rights has been since eighteen fifty one mrs stanton's intimate associate in reformatory labors these celebrated women are of about equal age but of the most opposite characteristics and illustrate the theory of counterparts in affection by entertaining for each other a friendship of extraordinary strength mrs stanton is a fine writer but a poor executant miss anthony is a thorough manager but a poor writer both have large brains and great hearts neither has any selfish ambition for celebrity but each vies with the other in a noble enthusiasm for the cause to which they are devoting their lives. Nevertheless, to describe them critically, I ought to say that as opposites though they may be, each does not so much supplement the other's deficiencies as augment the other's eccentricities. Thus they often stimulate each other's aggressiveness, and at the same time diminish each other's discretion. But whatever may be the imprudent utterances of the one or the impolitic methods of the other, the animating motives of both are evermore as white as the light. The good that they do is by design, the harm by accident. These two women sitting together in their parlors have for the last thirty years been diligent forgers of all manner of projectiles, from fireworks to thunderbolts and have hurled them with unexpected explosion into the midst of all manner of educational, reformatory, religious, and political assemblies, sometimes to the pleasant surprise and half-welcome of the members, more often to the bewilderment and prostration of numerous victims, and in a few signal instances to the gnashing of angry men's teeth. I know of no two more pertinacious incendiaries in the whole country nor will they themselves deny the charge. In fact, this noise-making twain are the two sticks of a drum, keeping up what Daniel Webster called the rub-a-dub of agitation. End of chapter 11《Reminiscences 1815 to 1897 》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Geisel. « Eighty Years and More — Reminiscences 1815 to 1897 » by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 12 — My First Speech Before a Legislature Women had been willing so long to hold a subordinate position, both in private and public affairs, that a gradually growing feeling of rebellion among them quite exasperated the men, and their manifestations of hostility in public meetings were often as ridiculous as humiliating. True, 
these gentlemen were all quite willing that women should join their societies and churches to do the drudgery to work up the enthusiasm in fairs and revivals conventions and flag presentations to pay a dollar apiece into their treasury for the honor of being members of their various organizations to beg money for the church to circulate petitions from door to door to visit saloons to pray with or defy rum sellers to teach school at half price and sit round the outskirts of a hall in teachers state conventions like so many wallflowers but they would not allow them to sit on the platform address the assembly or vote for men and measures those who had learned the first lessons of human rights from the lips of henry b stanton samuel j may and garrett smith would not accept such position when women abandoned the temperance reform all interest in this question gradually died out in the state and practically nothing was done in new york for nearly twenty years garrett smith made one or two attempts towards an anti-dram shop party but as women could not vote they felt no interest in the measure and failure was the result i soon convinced miss anthony that the ballot was the key to the situation that when we had a voice in the laws we should be welcome to any platform in turning the intense earnestness and religious enthusiasm of this great souled woman into this channel i soon felt the power of my convert in goading me forever forward to more untiring work soon fastened heart to heart with hooks of steel and a friendship that years of confidence and affection have steadily strengthened we have labored faithfully together from the year 1850 conventions were held in various states and their respective legislatures were continually besieged new york was thoroughly canvassed by miss anthony and others appeals calls for meeting and petitions were circulated without number in 1854 i prepared my first speech for the new york legislature this was a great event in my life i felt so nervous over it least it should not be worthy the occasion that miss anthony suggested that i should slip up to rochester and submit it to rev william henry channing who was preaching there at the time i did so and his opinion was so favorable as to the merits of my speech that i felt quite reassured my father felt equally nervous when he saw from the albany evening journal that i was to speak at the capitol and asked me to read my speech to him also accordingly i stopped in jonestown on my way to albany and late one evening when he was alone in his office i entered and took my seat on the opposite side of his table on no occasion before or since was i ever more embarrassed an audience of one and that the one of all others whose approbation i most desired whose disapproval i most feared i knew he condemned the whole movement and was deeply grieved at the active part i had taken hence i was fully aware that i was about to address a wholly unsympathetic audience however i began with a dog determination to give all the power i could to my manuscript and not to be discouraged or turned from my purpose by any tender appeals or adverse criticisms i described the widow in the first hours of her grief subject to the intrusions of the coarse minions of the law taking inventory of the household goods of the old armchair in which her loved one had breathed his last of the old clock in the corner that told the hour he passed away i threw all the pathos i could into my voice and language at this point and to my intense satisfaction i saw tears filling my father's eyes i cannot express the exultation i felt thinking that now he would see with my eyes the injustice women suffered under the laws he understood so well feeling that i had touched his heart i went on with renewed confidence and when i had finished i saw he was thoroughly magnetized with beating heart i waited for him to break the silence he was evidently deeply pondering over all he had heard and did not speak for a long time i believe i had opened to him a new world of thought he had listened long to the complaints of women but from the lips of his own daughter they had come with a deeper pathos and power at last he turned abruptly and said surely you have had a happy comfortable life with all your wants and needs supplied and yet that speech fills me with self-reproach for one might naturally ask how can a young woman tenderly brought up who has had no bitter personal experience feel so keenly the wrongs of her sex 
Where did you learn this lesson? I learned it here, I replied, in your office. When a child, listening to the complaints women made to you, they who have sympathy and imagination to make the sorrows of others their own can rapidly learn all the hard lessons of life from the experience of others. Well, well, he said, you have made your points clear and strong, but I think I can find you even more cruel laws than those you have quoted. He suggested some improvements in my speech, looked up other laws, and it was one o'clock in the morning before we kissed each other good night. How he felt on the question after that I do not know, as he never said anything in favor of or against it. He gladly gave me any help I needed from time to time in looking up the laws, and was very desirous that whatever I gave to the public should be carefully prepared. Miss Anthony printed 20,000 copies of this address, laid it on the desk of every member of the legislature, both in the Assembly and Senate, and in her travels that winter she circulated it throughout the state. I am happy to say I never felt so anxious about the fate of a speech since. The first women's convention in Albany was held at this time, and we had a kind of protracted meeting for two weeks after. There were several hearings before both branches of the legislature and a succession of meetings in Association Hall, in which Phillips, Channing, Ernest L. Rose, Antoinette L. Brown, and Susan B. Anthony took part. Being at the capital of the state, Discussion was aroused at every fireside, while the comments of the press were numerous and varied. Every little country paper had something witty or silly to say about the uprising of the strong-minded. Those editors whose heads were about the size of an apple were the most opposed to the uprising of women, illustrating what Sidney Smith said long ago. There always was and there always will be a class of men so small that if women were educated, there would be nobody left below them. Poor human nature loves to have something to look down upon. Here is a specimen of the way such editors talked at that time. The Albany Register, in an article on women's rights in the legislature, dated March 7, 1854, says, While the feminine propagandists of women's rights confine themselves to the exhibition of short petticoats and long-legged boots, and to the holding of conventions and speech-making in concert rooms, the people were disposed to be amused by them as they are by the wit of the clown in the circus, or the performances of Punch and Judy on fair days, or the minstrel of gentlemen with blackened faces on banjos, the tambourine, and bones. But the joke is becoming stale. People are getting cloyed with their performances, and are looking for some healthier and more intellectual amusement. The ludicrous is wearing away, and disgust is taking the place of pleasurable sensations arising from the novelty of this new phase of hypocrisy and infidel. People are beginning to inquire how far public sentiment should sanction or tolerate these unsexed women, who would step out from the true spear of the mother, the wife, the daughter, and taking upon themselves the duties and the business of men, stalk into the public gaze, and, by engaging in the politics, the rough controversies and trafficking of the world, upheave existing institutions and overrun all the social relations of life. It is a melancholy reflection that among our American women, who have been educated to better things, there should be found any who are willing to follow the lead of such foreign propagandist as the ringleted, gloved exotic Ernestine L. Rose. We can understand how such a man as the Reverend Mr. May or the sleek-headed Dr. Channing, may be deluded by her into becoming one of her disciples. They are not the first instances of infatuation that may overtake weak-minded men, if they are honest in their devotion to her and her doctrines, nor would they be the first examples of a low ambition that seeks notoriety as a substitution for true fame, as they are dishonest. Such men there are always, and, honest or dishonest, their true position is that of being tied to the apron strings of some strong-minded woman, and to be exhibited as rare specimens of human wickedness or human weakness and folly. But that one educated American should become her disciple and follow her insane teachings is a marvel. When we see the abuse and ridicule to which the best of men are subjected for standing on our platform in the early days, we need not wonder that so few have been brave enough to advocate our cause in later years, 
either in conventions or in the halls of legislation. After twelve added years of agitation, following the passage of the property bill, New York conceded other civil rights to married women. Pending the discussion of these various bills, Susan B. Anthony circulated petitions, both for the civil and political rights of women, throughout the state, traveling on stagecoaches, open wagons, and sleighs in all seasons, and on foot, from door to door through towns and cities, doing her utmost to rouse women to some sense of their natural rights as human beings, and to their civil and political rights as citizens of a republic. And while extending her time, strength, and money to secure these blessings for the women of the state, they would gruffly tell her that they had all the rights they wanted, or rudely shut the door in her face, leaving her to stand outside, petition in hand, treating her with as much contempt as if she were asking alms for herself. None but those who did that work in the early days, for the slaves and the women, can ever know the hardships and humiliations that were endured. But it was done because it was only through petitions, a power seemingly so inefficient, that disfranchised classes could be heard in the state and national councils, hence their importance. The frivolous objections some women made to our appeals were as exasperating as they were ridiculous. To reply to them politely, at all times, required a divine patience. On one occasion, after addressing the legislature, some of the ladies in congratulating me inquired in the depreciating tone, What do you do with your children? Ladies, I said, it takes me no longer to speak than you to listen. What have you done with your children the two hours you have been sitting here? But to answer your question, I never leave my children to go to Saratoga, Washington, Newport, or Europe, or even to come here. They are, at this moment, with a faithful nurse in the Delavan House, and having accomplished my mission, we shall all return home together. When my children reached the magic number of seven, my good angel, Susan B. Anthony, would sometimes take one or two of them to her own quiet home just out of Rochester, where, on a well-cultivated little farm, one could enjoy uninterrupted rest and the choicest fruits of the season. That was always a safe harbor for my friend, as her family sympathized fully in the reforms to which she gave her life. I have many pleasant memories of my own flying visits to the hospitable Quaker home and the broad Catholic spirit of Daniel and Lucy Anthony. Whatever opposition and ridicule their daughter endured elsewhere, she enjoyed the steadfast sympathy and confidence of her own home circle. Her faithful sister Mary, a most successful teacher in the public schools of Rochester for a quarter of a century, and a good financier, who with her patrimony and salary had laid by a competence, took on her shoulders double duty at home in cheering the declining years of her parents, that Susan might do the public work and the reforms in which they were equally interested. Now with life's earnest work nearly accomplished, the sisters were living happily together, illustrating another of the many charming homes of single women, so rapidly multiplying of late. Miss Anthony, who was a frequent guest at my home, sometimes stood guard when I was absent. The children of our household say that among their earliest recollections is the tableau of Mother and Susan, seated by a large table covered with books and papers always writing and talking about the Constitution, interrupted with occasional visits from others of the faithful. Hither came Elizabeth Oakes Smith, Paulina Wright Davis, Frances Dana Gage, Dr. Harriet Hunt, Rev. Antoinette Brown, Lucy Stone, and Abby Kelly, until all these names were as familiar as household words to the children. Martha C. Wright of Auburn was a frequent visitor at the center of the rebellion, as my sequestered cottage on Locust Hill was fastidiously called. She brought to these councils of war not only her own wisdom, but that of the wife and sister of William H. Seward, and sometimes encouraging suggestions from the great statesman himself, from whose writings we often gleaned grand and radical sentiments. Luceretta Moat, too, being an occasional guest of her sister, Martha C. Wright, added the dignity of her presence at many of these important consultations. She was uniformly in favor of toning down our fiery pronouncementos. For Miss Anthony and myself, the English language had no words strong enough to express the indignation we felt at the prolonged injustice to women. We found, however, that after expressing ourselves in the most vehement manner, and thus in a measure giving our feelings an outlet, 
we were reconciled to issue the documents in milder terms. If the men of the state could have known the stern rebukes, the denunciations, the wit, the irony, the sarcasm that were gardenered there, and then judiciously pigeonholed, and milder, more persuasive appeals substituted, they would have been truly thankful that they fared no worse. Senator Seward frequently left Washington to visit in our neighborhood at the house of Judge G. V. Sackett, a man of wealth and political influence. One of the senator's standing antidotes, at dinner, to illustrate the purifying influence of women at the polls, which he always told with great zest for my especial benefit, was in regard to the manner in which his wife's sister exercised the right of suffrage. He said, Mrs. Warden, having the supervision of a farm near Auburn, was obliged to hire two or three men for its cultivation. It was her custom, having examined them as to their capacity to perform the required labor, their knowledge of tools, horses, cattle, and horticulture, to inquire as to their politics. She informed them that, being a widow and having no one to represent her, she must have Republicans to do her voting and to represent her political opinions. And it always so happened that the men who offered their services belonged to the Republican Party. I remarked to her one day, Are you sure your men vote as they promise? Yes, she replied. I trust nothing to their discretion. I take them in my carriage within sight of the polls and put them in charge of some Republican who can be trusted. I see that they have the right tickets, and then I feel sure that I am faithfully represented, and I know I am right in doing so. I have neither husband, father, nor son. I am responsible for my own taxes, am amenable to all the laws of the state, must pay the penalty of my own crimes if I commit any. Hence, I have the right, according to the principles of our government, to representation and so long as I am not permitted to vote in person, I have a right to do so by proxy. Hence, I hire men to vote my principles. These two sisters, Mrs. Warden and Mrs. Seward, daughters of Judge Miller, an influential man, were women of culture and remarkable natural intelligence, and interested in all progressive ideas. They had rare common sense and independence of character, great simplicity of manner, and were wholly indifferent to the little arts of the toilet. I was often told by fashionable women that they objected to the women's rights movements because the publicity of a convention, the immodesty of speaking from a platform, and the trial of seeing one's name in the papers. Several ladies made such remarks to me one day as a bevy of us were sitting together in one of the fashionable hotels in Newport. We were holding a convention there at the time, and some of them had been present at one of the sessions. Really, I said, Ladies, you surprise me. Our conventions are not as public as the ballroom where I saw you all dancing last night. As to modesty, it may be a question in many minds whether it is less modest to speak words of stubbornness and truth, plainly dressed on a platform, than gorgeously arrayed with bare arms and shoulders, to waltz in the arms of strange gentlemen. As to the press, I noticed you all reading in this morning's papers, with evident satisfaction, the personal compliments and full descriptions of your dresses at the last ball. I presume that any one of you would have felt slighted if your name had not been mentioned in the general description. When my name is mentioned, it is in connection with some great reform movement. Thus, we all suffer or enjoy the same publicity. We are alike ridiculed. Wise men pity and ridicule you, and fools pity and ridicule me. You as the victims of folly and fashion, me as the representative of many of the disagreeable isms of the age, as they chose to style liberal opinions. It is amusing, in analyzing prejudices, to see what slender foundation they rest, and the ladies around me were so completely cornered that no one attempted an answer. I remember being at a party at Secretary Seward's home in Auburn one evening when Mr. Burlingame, special administrator from China to the United States, with a Chinese delegation, were among the guests. As soon as the dance commenced, the young ladies and gentlemen, locked in each other's arms, began to whirl in a giddy waltz. These Chinese gentlemen were so shocked that they covered their faces with their fans, occasionally peeping out each side and expressing their surprise to each other. They thought us the most immodest women on the face of the earth. Modesty and taste are questions of latitude and education. The more people know, the more their ideas are expanded by travel, experience, and observation. The less easily they are shocked. The narrowness and bigotry of women 
are the result of their circumscribed sphere of thought and action. A few years after Judge Holbert had published his work on human rights, in which he advocated women's rights to the suffrage, and I addressed the legislature, we met at a dinner party in Albany. Senator and Mrs. Seward were there. The senator was very merry on this occasion, and made Judge Holbert and myself the target for all his ridicule on the women's rights question, in which the most of the company joined, so that he quite stood alone. Sure that we had the right on our side, and the arguments clearly defined in our minds, and both being cool and self-possessed, and in wit and sarcasm quite equal to any of them, we fought the senator, inch by inch, until he had a very narrow platform to stand on. Mrs. Seward, maintaining an unbroken silence, while those ladies who did open their lips were with the opposition, supposing no doubt that Senator Stewart represented his wife's opinions. When we ladies withdrew from the table, my embarrassment may be easily imagined. Separated from the judge, I would now be an hour with a bivy of ladies who evidently felt repugnance to all my most cherished opinions. It was the first time I had met Mrs. Seward, and I did not then know the broad liberal tendencies of her mind. What a tide of disagreeable thought rushed through me at that short passage from the dining room to the parlor! how gladly I would have glided out the front door. But that was impossible, so I made up my mind to stroll round as if self-absorbed and look at the books and paintings until the judge appeared, as I took it for granted that after all that I had said at the table on the political, religious, and social equality of women, not a lady would have anything to say to me. Imagine then my surprise when, the moment the parlor door was closed upon us, Mrs. Seward approached me most affectionately and said, let me thank you for your brave words you uttered at the dinner-table, and for your speech before the legislature, that thrilled my soul as you read it over and over. I was filled with joy and astonishment. Recovering myself, I said, Is it possible, Mrs. Seward, that you agree with me? Then why, when I was so hard-pressed by foes on every side, did you not come to the defenses? I supposed that all you ladies were hostile to every one of my ideas on this question." No, no, she said, I am with you thoroughly, but I am a born coward. There is nothing I dread more than Mr. Seward's ridicule. I would rather walk up to the cannon's mouth and encounter it. I, too, am with you, and I, said two or three others, who had been silent at the table. I never had a more serious, heartfelt conversation than with these ladies. Mrs. Seward's spontaneity and earnestness had moved them all deeply and when the senator appeared, the first words he said were, Before we part, I must confess that I was fairly vanquished by you and the judge, on my own principles, for we had quoted some of his most radical utterances. You have the argument, but custom and prejudice are against you, and they are stronger than truth and logic. End of chapter 12. Recording by Lynette Geisel. Chapter 13 of Eighty Years and More, Reminisces, 1815 to 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Wesolowski. Chapter 13 Reforms and Mobs. There was one bright woman, among the many in our Seneca Falls literary circle, to whom I would give more than a passing notice, Mrs. Amelia Bloomer, who represented three novel phases of woman's life. She was assistant postmistress, an editor of a reform paper advocating temperance and women's rights, and an advocate of the new costume which bore her name. In 1849 her husband was appointed postmaster, and she became his deputy was duly sworn in, and during the administration of Taylor and Fillmore, served in that capacity. When she assumed her duties, the improvement in the appearance and conduct of the office was generally acknowledged. A neat little room adjoining the public office became a kind of ladies' exchange, where those coming from different parts of the town could meet to talk over the news of the day and read the papers and magazines that came to Mrs. Bloomer as editor of The Lily. 
those who enjoyed the brief reign of a woman in the post office can readily testify to the void felt by the ladies of the village when mrs bloomer's term expired and a man once more reigned in her stead however she still edited the lily and her office remained a fashionable centre for several years although she wore the bloomer dress its originator was elizabeth smith miller the only daughter of garrett smith in the winter of eighteen fifty two mrs miller came to visit me in seneca falls dressed somewhat in the turkish style short skirt full trousers of fine black broadcloth a spanish cloak of the same material reaching to the knee beaver hat and feathers and dark furs altogether a most becoming costume and exceedingly convenient for walking in all kinds of weather to see my cousin with a lamp in one hand and a baby in the other walk upstairs with ease and grace while with flowing robes i pulled myself up with difficulty lamp and baby out of the question readily convinced me that there was sore need of reform in woman's dress and i promptly donned a similar attire what incredible freedom i enjoyed for two years like a captive set free from his ball and chain i was always ready for a brisk walk through sleet and snow and rain to climb a mountain jump over a fence work in the garden and in fact for any necessary locomotion bloomer is now a recognized word in the english language mrs bloomer having the lily in which to discuss the merits of the new dress the press generally took up the question and much valuable information was elicited on the physiological results of woman's fashionable attire the crippling effect of tight waists and long skirts the heavy weight on the hips and high heels all combined to throw the spine out of plumb and lay the foundation for all manner of nervous diseases but while all agreed that some change was absolutely necessary for the health of women the press stoutly ridiculed those who were ready to make the experiment a few sensible women in different parts of the country adopted the costume and farmers wives especially proved its convenience it was also worn by skaters gymnasts tourists and in sanitariums but while the few realized its advantages, the many laughed it to scorn, and heaped such ridicule on its wearers that they soon found that the physical freedom enjoyed did not compensate for the persistent persecution and petty annoyances offered at every turn. To be rudely gazed at in public and in private, to be the conscious subjects of criticism, and to be followed by crowds of boys in the streets, were all, to the very last degree, exasperating a favorite doggerel that our tormentors chanted when we appeared in public places ran thus hi ho in rain and snow the bloomer now is all the go twenty tailors take the stitches twenty women wear the breeches hi ho in rain or snow the bloomer now is all the go the singers were generally invisible behind some fence or attic window those who wore the dress can recall countless amusing and annoying experiences the patience of most of us was exhausted in about two years but our leader mrs miller bravely adhered to the costume for nearly seven years under the most trying circumstances while her father was in congress she wore it at many fashionable dinners and receptions in washington she was bravely sustained however by her husband colonel miller who never flinched in escorting his wife and her coadjutors however inartistic their costumes might be to tall gaunt women with large feet and to those who were short and stout it was equally trying mrs miller was also encouraged by the intense feeling of her father on the question of woman's dress to him the whole revolution in woman's position turned on her dress the long skirt was the symbol of her degradation the names of those who wore the bloomer costume besides those already mentioned were paulina wright davis lucy stone susan b anthony sarah and angelina grimke mrs william burley celia burley charlotte beebe wilbur helen jarvis lydia jenkins amelia willard dr harriet n austin and many patients in sanitariums whose names i cannot recall looking back to this experiment I am not surprised at the hostility of men in general to the dress, 
as it made it very uncomfortable for them to go anywhere with those who wore it. People would stare, many men and women make rude remarks, boys followed in crowds with jeers and laughter, so that gentlemen in attendance would feel it their duty to show fight, unless they had sufficient self-control to pursue the even tenor of their way, as the ladies themselves did, without taking the slightest notice of the commotion they created. But Colonel Miller went through the ordeal with coolness and dogged determination, to the vexation of his acquaintances, who thought one of his duties as a husband was to prescribe his wife's costume. Though we did not realize the success we hoped for by making the dress popular, yet the effort was not lost. We were well aware that the dress was not artistic, and though we made many changes, our own good taste was never satisfied until we threw aside the loose trousers and adopted buttoned leggings. After giving up the experiment, we found that the costume in which Diana the Huntress is represented, and that worn on the stage by Ellen Tree in the play of Ion, would have been more artistic and convenient. But we, who had made the experiment, were too happy to move about unnoticed and unknown, to risk, again, the happiness of ourselves and our friends by any further experiments. I have never wondered since that the Chinese women allow their daughters' feet to be encased in iron shoes, nor that the Hindu widows walk calmly to the funeral pyre, for great are the penalties of those who dare to resist the behests of the tyrant custom. Nevertheless, the agitation has been kept up, in a mild form, both in England and America. Lady Harberton, in 1885, was at the head of an organized movement in London to introduce the bifurcated skirt. Mrs. Janice Miller, in this country, is making an entire revolution in every garment that belongs to a woman's toilet, and common-sense shoemakers have vouchsafed to us, at last, a low, square heel to our boots, and a broad sole in which the five toes can spread themselves at pleasure. Evidently a new day of physical freedom is at last dawning for the most cribbed and crippled of Eve's unhappy daughters. It was while living in Seneca Falls, and at one of the most despairing periods of my young life, that one of the best gifts of the gods came to me in the form of a good, faithful housekeeper. She was indeed a treasure, a friend and comforter, a second mother to my children, and understood all life's duties and gladly bore its burdens. She could fill any department in domestic life, and for thirty years was the joy of our household. But for this noble, self-sacrificing woman, much of my public work would have been quite impossible. If by word or deed I have made the journey of life easier for any struggling soul, I must, in justice, share the meed of praise accorded me with my little Quaker friend, Amelia Willard. There are two classes of housekeepers, one that will get what they want, if in the range of human possibilities, and then accept the inevitable inconveniences with cheerfulness and heroism, the other, from a kind of chronic inertia and a fear of taking responsibility, accept everything as they find it, though with gentle, continuous complainings. The latter are called amiable women. Such a woman was our congressman's wife in 1854, and, as I was the reservoir of all her sorrows, great and small, I became very weary of her amiable non-resistance. Among other domestic trials, she had a kitchen stove that smoked and leaked, which could neither bake nor broil, a worthless thing, and too small for any purpose. Consequently, half their viands were spoiled in the cooking, and the cooks left in disgust, one after another. In telling me one day of these kitchen misadventures, she actually shed tears, which so roused my sympathies that, with surprise, I exclaimed, "'Why do you not buy a new stove?' To my unassisted common sense that seemed the most practical thing to do. Why, she replied, I have never purchased a darning needle to put the case strongly without consulting Mr. S., and he does not think a new stove necessary. What, pray, said I, does he know about stoves sitting in his easy chair in Washington? If he had a dull old knife with broken blades, he would soon get a new one with which to sharpen his pens and pencils, and if he attempted to cook a meal, granting he knew how, on your old stove, he would set it out of doors the next hour. 
Now my advice to you is to buy a new one this very day. Bless me, she said. That would make him furious. He would blow me sky high. Well, I replied, suppose he did go into a regular tantrum and use all the most startling expletives in the vocabulary for fifteen minutes. What is that compared with a good stove three hundred and sixty-five days in the year? Just put all he could say on one side, and all the advantages you would enjoy on the other, and you must readily see that his wrath would kick the beam. As my logic was irresistible, she said, Well, if you will go with me and help me select a stove, I think I will take the responsibility. Accordingly, we went to the hardware store and selected the most approved, largest size stove with all the best cooking utensils, best Russian pipe, etc. Now, said she, I am in equal need of a good stove in my sitting room, and I would like the pipes of both stoves to lead into dumb stoves above and thus heat two or three rooms upstairs for my children to play in, as they have no place except the sitting room where they must always be with me. But I suppose it is not best to do too much at one time. On the contrary, I replied, as your husband is wealthy, you had better get all you really need now. Mr. S. will probably be no more surprised with two stoves than with one, and, as you expect a hot scene over the matter, the more you get out of it, the better. So the stoves and pipes were ordered, holes cut through the ceiling, and all were in working order the next day. The cook was delighted over her splendid stove and shining tins, copper-bottomed tea kettle and boiler, and warm sleeping room upstairs. The children were delighted with their large playrooms, and Madame jubilant with her added comforts and that newborn feeling of independence one has in assuming responsibility. She was expecting Mr. S. home in the holidays, and occasionally weakened at the prospect of what she feared might be a disagreeable encounter. At such time she came to consult with me as to what she would say and do when the crisis arrived. Having studied the genus Homo alike, on the divine heights of exaltation and in the valleys of humiliation, I was able to make some valuable suggestions. Now, said I, when your husband explodes, as you think he will, neither say nor do anything. Sit and gaze out of the window with that far away, sad look women know so well how to affect. If you can summon tears at pleasure, a few would not be amiss. A gentle shower, not enough to make the nose and eyes red, or to detract from your beauty. Men cannot resist beauty and tears. Never mar the effect with anything bordering on sobs and hysteria, such violent manifestations being neither refined nor artistic. A scene in which one person does the talking must be limited in time. No ordinary man can keep at white heat fifteen minutes if his victim says nothing. He will soon exhaust himself. Remember, every time you speak in the way of defense, you give him a new text on which to branch out again. If silence is ever golden, it is when a husband is in a tantrum. In due time Mr. S. arrived, laden with Christmas presents, and Charlotte came over to tell me that she had passed through the ordeal. I will give the scene in her own words as nearly as possible. My husband came yesterday, just before dinner, and, as I expected him, I had all things in order. He seemed very happy to see me and the children and we had a gay time looking at our presents and chatting about Washington and all that had happened since we parted. It made me sad, in the midst of our happiness, to think how soon the current of his feelings would change, and I wished in my soul that I had not bought the stoves. But at last dinner was announced, and I knew that the hour had come. He ran upstairs to give a few touches to his toilet, when, lo, the shining stoves and pipes caught his eyes. He explored the upper apartments, and came down the back stairs, glanced at the kitchen stove, then into the dining room, and stood confounded for a moment, before the nickel-plated morning glory. Then he explained, "'Heavens and earth! Charlotte, what have you been doing?' I remembered what you told me, and said nothing, but looked steadily out of the window. I summoned no tears, however, for I felt more like laughing than crying. He looked so ridiculous, flying around spasmodically, like popcorn on a hot griddle, and talking as if making a stump speech on the corruptions of the Democrats. The first time he paused to take breath, I said in my softest tones, William, dinner is waiting. I fear the soup will be cold. Fortunately, he was hungry, and that great central organ of life and happiness asserted its claims on his attention, and when he took his seat at the table. 
I broke what might have been an awkward silence, chatting with the older children about their school lessons. Fortunately, they were late and did not know what had happened, so they talked to their father and gradually restored his equilibrium. We had a very good dinner, and I have not heard a word about the stove since. I suppose we shall have another scene when the bill is presented. A few years later, Horace Greeley came to Seneca Falls to lecture on temperance. As he stayed with us, we invited Mr. S., among others, to dinner. The chief topic at the table was the idiosyncrasies of women. Mr. Greeley told many amusing things about his wife, of her erratic movements and sudden decisions to do and dare what seemed most impracticable. Perhaps, on rising some morning, she would say, "'I think I'll go to Europe by the next steamer, Horace. Will you get tickets today for me, the nurse, and the children?' Well, said Mr. S., she must be something like our hostess. Every time her husband goes away, she cuts a door or window. They only have ten doors to lock every night now. Yes, I said, and your own wife, too, Mrs. S., has the credit of some high-handed measures when you are in Washington. Then I told the whole story, amid peals of laughter, just as related above. The dinner-table scene fairly convulsed the congressman. The thought that he had made such a fool of himself in the eyes of Charlotte that she could not even summon a tear in her defense particularly pleased him. When sufficiently recovered to speak, he said, Well, I never could understand how it was that Charlotte suddenly emerged from her thraldom and manifested such rare executive ability. Now I see to whom I am indebted for the most comfortable part of my married life. I am a thousand times obliged to you. You did just right, and so did she and she has been a happier woman ever since. Now she gets what she needs, and frets no more to me about ten thousand little things. How can a man know what implements are necessary for the work he never does? Of all agencies for upsetting the equanimity of family life, none can surpass an old, broken-down kitchen stove. In the winter of 1861, just after the election of Lincoln, the abolitionists decided to hold a series of conventions in the chief cities of the North. All their available speakers were pledged for active service. The Republican Party, having absorbed the political abolitionists within its ranks by declaring its hostility to the extension of slavery, had come into power with overwhelming majorities. Hence the Garrisonian abolitionists, opposed to all compromises, felt that this was the opportune moment to rouse the people to the necessity of holding that party to its declared principles, and pushing it, if possible, a step or two forward. I was invited to accompany Miss Anthony and Beriah Green to a few points in central New York, but we soon found, by the concerted action of Republicans all over the county, that anti-slavery conventions would not be tolerated. Thus Republicans and Democrats made common cause against the abolitionists. The John Brown raid, the year before, had intimidated northern politicians as much as southern slaveholders, and the general feeling was that the discussion of the question at the north should be altogether suppressed. From Buffalo to Albany our experience was the same, varied only by the fertile resources of the actors and their surroundings. Thirty years of education had somewhat changed the character of the northern mobs. They no longer dragged men through the streets with ropes around their necks, nor broke up women's prayer meetings. They no longer threw eggs and brickbats at the apostles of reform, nor dipped them in barrels of tar and feathers. They simply crowded the halls, and with laughing, groaning, clapping, and cheering, effectually interrupted the proceedings. Such was our experience during the two days we attempted to hold a convention in St. James Hall, Buffalo. As we paid for the hall, the mob enjoyed themselves at our expense in more ways than one. Every session at the appointed time we took our places at the platform, making, at various intervals of silence, renewed efforts to speak. Not succeeding, we sat and conversed with each other and the many friends who crowded the platform and anterooms. Thus, among ourselves, we had a pleasant reception and a discussion of many phases of the question that brought us together. The mob not only vouchsafed to us the privilege of talking to our friends without interruption, but delegations of their own came from behind the scenes, from time to time, to discuss with us the right of free speech and the constitutionality of slavery. These Buffalo rowdies were headed by ex-Justice Hinson, aided by younger members of the Fillmore and Seymour families, 
and the chief of police and fifty subordinates, who were admitted to the hall free, for the express purpose of protecting our right of free speech, but who, in defiance of the mayor's orders, made not the slightest effort in our defense. At Lockport there was a feeble attempt in the same direction. At Albion neither hall, church, nor schoolhouse could be obtained, so we held small meetings in the dining-room of the hotel. At Rochester, Corinthian Hall was packed long before the hour advertised. This was a delicately appreciative, jocose mob. At this point Aaron Powell joined us. As he had just risen from a bed of sickness, looking pale and emaciated, he slowly mounted the platform. The mob at once took in his look of exhaustion, and as he seated himself, they gave an audible, simultaneous sigh, as if to say, what a relief it is to be seated. So completely did the tender manifestation reflect Mr. Powell's apparent condition that the whole audience burst into a roar of laughter. Here, too, all attempts to speak were futile. At Port Byron, a generous sprinkling of cayenne pepper on the stove soon cut short all constitutional arguments and pains to liberty. And so it was all the way to Albany. The whole state was aflame with the mob spirit and from Boston and various points in other states the same news reached us. As the legislature was in session, and we were advertised in Albany, a radical member sarcastically moved, that as Mrs. Stanton and Miss Anthony were about to move on Albany, the militia be ordered out for the protection of the city. Happily, Albany could then boast of a democratic mayor, a man of courage and conscience, who said the right of free speech should never be trodden under foot where he had the right to prevent it. And grandly did that one determined man maintain order in his jurisdiction. Throughout all the sessions of the convention, Mayor Thatcher sat on the platform, his police stationed in different parts of the hall and outside the building, to disperse the crowd as fast as it collected. If a man or boy hissed or made the slightest interruption, he was immediately ejected. And not only did the mayor preserve order in the meetings, but with a company of armed police he escorted us every time to and from the Delavan house. The last night Garrett Smith addressed the mob from the steps of the hotel, after which they gave him three cheers and dispersed in good order. When proposing for the mayor a vote of thanks at the close of the convention, Mr. Smith expressed his fears that it had been a severe ordeal for him to listen to these prolonged anti-slavery discussions. He smiled and said, I have really been deeply interested and instructed. I rather congratulate myself that a convention of this character has, at last, come in the line of my business. Otherwise, I should have probably remained in ignorance of many important facts and opinions I now understand and appreciate. While all this was going on publicly, an equally trying experience was progressing, day by day, behind the scenes. Miss Anthony had been instrumental in helping a much-abused mother, with her child, to escape from a husband who had immured her in an insane asylum. The wife belonged to one of the first families of New York, her brother being a United States Senator, and the husband, also a man of position, a large circle of friends and acquaintances, was interested in the result. Though she was incarcerated in an insane asylum for eighteen months, yet members of her own family again and again testified that she was not insane. Miss Anthony, knowing that she was not, and believing fully that the unhappy mother was the victim of a conspiracy, would not reveal her hiding place. Knowing the confidence Miss Anthony felt in the wisdom of Mr. Garrison and Mr. Phillips, they were implored to use their influence with her to give up the fugitives. Letters and telegrams, persuasions, arguments, and warnings from Mr. Garrison Mr. Phillips, and the Senator on one side, and from Lydia Mott, Mrs. Elizabeth F. Ellett, and Abby Hopper Gibbons on the other, poured in upon her day after day, but Miss Anthony remained immovable, although she knew that she was defying and violating the law and might be arrested any moment on the platform. We had known so many aggravated cases of this kind that, in daily counsel, we resolved that this woman should not be recaptured if it were possible to prevent it. To us it looked as an imperative duty to shield a sane mother who had been torn from a family of little children and doomed to the companionship of lunatics, and to aid her fleeing to a place of safety, as to help a fugitive from slavery to Canada. In both cases an unjust law was violated, 
In both cases the supposed owners of the victims were defied. Hence, in point of law and morals, the act was the same in both cases. The result proved the wisdom of Miss Anthony's decision, as all with whom Mrs. P. came into contact for years afterward expressed the opinion that she was, and always had been, perfectly sane. Could the dark secrets of insane asylums be brought to light, we should be shocked to know the great number of rebellious wives, sisters, and daughters who are thus sacrificed to false customs and barbarous laws made by men for women. End of chapter 13 Recording by Jill Wasilowski, Milwaukee, Wisconsin Chapter 14 of Eighty Years and More Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2010. Eighty Years and More Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897 by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 14 views on marriage and divorce the widespread discussion we are having just now on the subject of marriage and divorce reminds me of an equally exciting one in eighteen sixty a very liberal bill introduced into the indiana legislature by robert dale owen and which passed by a large majority roused much public thought on the question and made that state free soil for unhappy wives and husbands a similar bill was introduced into the legislature of new york by mr ramsay which was defeated by four votes owing mainly to the intense opposition of horace greeley he and mr owen had a prolonged discussion in the new york tribune in which mr owen got decidedly the better of the argument there had been several aggravated cases of cruelty to wives among the dutch aristocracy so that strong influences in favour of the bill had been brought to bear on the legislature but the tribune thundered every morning in its editorial column its loudest pearls which reverberated through the state so bitter was the opposition to divorce for any cause that but few dared to take part in the discussion I was the only woman for many years who wrote and spoke on the question. Articles on divorce by a number of women recently published in the North American Review are a sign of progress, showing that women dare speak out now more freely on the relations that most deeply concern them. My feelings had been stirred to their depths very early in life by the sufferings of a dear friend of mine at whose wedding I was one of the bridesmaids. In listening to the facts in her case, my mind was fully made up as to the wisdom of a liberal divorce law. We read Milton's essays on divorce together and were thoroughly convinced as to the right and duty not only of separation but of absolute divorce. While the New York bill was pending, I was requested by Louis Benedict, one of the committee who had the bill in charge, to address the legislature. I gladly accepted, feeling that here was an opportunity not only to support my friend in the step she had taken, but to make the path clear for other unhappy wives who might desire to follow her example. I had no thought of the persecution I was drawing down on myself for thus attacking so venerable an institution. I was always courageous in saying what I saw to be true, for the simple reason that I never dreamed of opposition. What seemed to me to be right, I thought, must be equally plain to all other rational beings. Hence I had no dread of denunciation. I was only surprised when I encountered it, and no number of experience have, as yet, taught me to fear public opinion. What I said on divorce thirty-seven years ago seems quite in line with what many say now. The trouble was not in what I said, but that I said it too soon, and before the people were ready to hear it. It may be, however, that I helped them to get ready. Who knows? 
as we were holding a woman suffrage convention in albany at the time appointed for the hearing ernestine l rose and lucretia mott briefly added their views on the question although mrs mott had urged mrs rose and myself to be as moderate as possible in our demands she quite unconsciously made the most radical utterance of all in saying that marriage was a question beyond the realm of legislation that must be left to the parties themselves we rallied lucretia on her radicalism and some of the journals criticized us severely but the following letter shows that she had no thought of receding from her position Quote, roadside near philadelphia fourth month thirtieth eighteen sixty one my dear lydia mott i have wished ever since parting with thee and our other dear friends in albany to send thee a line and have only waited in the hope of contributing a little substantial aid toward your neat and valuable depository the twenty dollars enclosed is from our female anti-slavery society i see the annual meeting in new york is not to be held this spring sister martha is here and was expecting to attend both anniversaries but we now think the woman's rights meeting had better not be attempted and she has written elizabeth c stanton to this effect i was well satisfied with being at the albany meeting i have since met with the following from a speech of lord brougham's which pleased me as being as radical as mine in your stately hall of representatives Quote, before women can have any justice by the laws of england there must be a total reconstruction of the whole marriage system for any attempt to amend it would prove useless the great charter in establishing the supremacy of law over prerogative provides only for justice between man and man for woman nothing is left but common law accumulations and modifications of original gothic and roman heathenism which no amount of filtration through ecclesiastical courts could change into christian laws they are declared unworthy a christian people by great jurists still they remain unchanged End quote. so elizabeth stanton will see that i have authority for going to the root of the evil thine lucretia mott End quote those of us who met in albany talked the matter over in regard to a free discussion of the divorce question at the coming convention in new york it was the opinion of those present that as the laws on marriage and divorce were very unequal for men and women this was a legitimate subject for discussion on our platform accordingly i presented a series of resolutions at the annual convention in new york city to which i spoke for over an hour I was followed by Antoinette L. Brown, who also presented a series of resolutions in opposition to mine. She was in turn answered by Ernestine L. Rose. Wendell Phillips then arose and, in an impressive manner, pronounced the whole discussion irrelevant to our platform, and moved that neither the speeches nor resolutions go on the records of the convention. As I greatly admired Wendell Phillips and appreciated his good opinion, I was surprised and humiliated to find myself under the ban of his disapprobation. My face was scarlet and I trembled with mingled feelings of doubt and fear, doubt as to the wisdom of my position, and fear lest the convention should repudiate the whole discussion. My emotion was so apparent that Rev. Samuel Longfellow, a brother of the poet, who sat beside me, whispered in my ear, Nevertheless, you are right and the convention will sustain you mr phillips said that as marriage concerned man and woman alike and the laws bore equally on them women had no special ground for complaint although in my speech i had quoted many laws to show the reverse mr garrison and rev antoinette l brown were alike opposed to mr phillips motion and claimed that marriage and divorce were legitimate subjects for discussion on our platform. Miss Anthony closed the debate. She said, quote, I hope Mr. Phillips will withdraw his motion that these resolutions shall not appear on the records of the convention. 
I am very sure that it would be contrary to all parliamentary usage to say that, when the speeches which enforced and advocated the resolutions are reported and published in the proceedings, the resolutions shall not be placed there. And as to the point that this question does not belong to this platform, from that I totally dissent. Marriage has ever been a one-sided matter, resting most unequally upon the sexes. By it, man gains all, woman loses all. Tyrant law and lust reign supreme with him, meek submission and ready obedience alone befit her. Woman has never been consulted, her wish has never been taken into consideration as regards the terms of the marriage compact. By law, public sentiment and religion, from the time of Moses down to the present day, woman has never been thought of other than as a piece of property to be disposed of at the will and pleasure of man. And at this very hour, by our statute books, by our so-called enlightened Christian civilization, she has no voice whatever in saying what shall be the basis of the relation. She must accept marriage as man prophes it, or not at all. And then again, on Mr. Phillips' own ground, the discussion is perfectly in order, since nearly all the wrongs of which we complain grow out of the inequality of the marriage laws, that rob the wife of the right to herself and her children, that make her the slave of the man she marries. I hope, therefore, the resolutions will be allowed to go out to the public, that there may be a fair report of the ideas which have actually been presented here, that they may not be left to the mercy of the secular press. I trust the Convention will not vote to forbid the publication of those resolutions with the proceedings. End quote. Reverend William Hoisington, the blind preacher, followed Miss Anthony and said, quote, Publish all that you have done here and let the public know it. End quote. The question was then put on the motion of Mr. Phillips, and it was lost. As Mr. Greeley, in commenting on the convention, took the same ground with Mr. Phillips, that the laws on marriage and divorce were equal for man and woman, I answered them in the following letter to the New York Tribune. Quote, to the editor of the New York Tribune. Sir, at our recent National Woman's Rights Convention, many were surprised to hear Wendell Phillips object to the question of marriage and divorce as irrelevant to our platform. He said, quote, We had no right to discuss here any laws or customs but those where inequality existed for the sexes, that the laws on marriage and divorce rested equally on man and woman, that he suffers as much as she possibly could the wrongs and abuses of an ill-assorted marriage. End quote. Now it must strike every careful thinker that an immense difference rests in the fact that man has made the laws cunningly and selfishly for his own purpose. From Coke down to Kent, who can cite one clause of the marriage contract where woman has the advantage? When man suffers from false legislation, he has his remedy in his own hands. Shall woman be denied the right of protest against laws in which she had no voice, Laws which outrage the holiest affections of her nature, laws which transcend the limits of human legislation in a convention called for the express purpose of considering her wrongs? He might as well object to a protest against the injustice of hanging a woman because capital punishment bears equally on man and woman. The contract of marriage is by no means equal. The law permits the girl to marry at twelve years of age while it requires several years more of experience on the part of the boy. In entering this compact, the man gives up nothing that he before possessed, he is a man still, while the legal existence of the woman is suspended during marriage, and henceforth she is known but in and through the husband. She is nameless, purseless, childless, though a woman, an heiress, and a mother. Blackstone says, quote, the husband and wife are one, and that one is the husband. End quote. Chancellor Kent, in his commentaries, says, quote, 
the legal effects of marriage are generally deducible from the principle of the common law by which the husband and wife are regarded as one person and her legal existence and authority lost or suspended during the continuance of the matrimonial union End quote. the wife is regarded by all legal authorities as a femme covert placed wholly sub potestate viri her moral responsibility even is merged in her husband the law takes it for granted that the wife lives in fear of her husband that his command is her highest law hence a wife is not punishable for the theft committed in the presence of her husband an unmarried woman can make contracts sue and be sued enjoy the rights of property to her inheritance to her wages to her person to her children but in marriage she is robbed by law of all and every natural and civil right kent further says quote, the disability of the wife to contract so as to bind herself arises not from want of discretion but because she has entered into an indissoluble connection by which she is placed under the power and protection of her husband End quote. she is possessed of certain rights until she is married then all are suspended to revive again the moment the breath goes out of the husband's body see cowen's treatise volume two page seven hundred and nine if the contract be equal whence come the terms marital power marital rights obedience and restraint dominion and control power and protection etc etc many cases are stated showing the exercise of a most questionable power over the wife sustained by the courts see bishop on divorce page four hundred eighty nine the laws on divorce are quite as unequal as those on marriage yes far more so the advantages seem to be all on one side and the penalties all on the other in case of divorce if the husband be not the guilty party the wife goes out of the partnership penniless kent volume two page thirty three bishop on divorce page four hundred ninety two in new york and some other states the wife of the guilty husband can now sue for a divorce in her own name and the costs come out of the husband's estate but in the majority of the states she is still compelled to sue in the name of another as she has no means for paying costs even though she may have brought her thousands into the partnership the allowance to the innocent wife of ad interim alimony and money to sustain the suit is not regarded as a strict right in her but of sound discretion in the court bishop on divorce page five hundred eighty one quote many jurists says kent are of opinion that the adultery of the husband ought not to be noticed or made subject to the same animadversions as that of the wife because it is not evidence of such entire depravity nor equally injurious in its effects upon the morals good order and happiness of the domestic life montesquieu poutier and dr taylor all insist that the cases of husband and wife ought to be distinguished and that the violation of the marriage vow on the part of the wife is the most mischievous and the prosecution ought to be confined to the offence on her part esprit de loi volume three one hundred eighty six traite du contrat de mariage number five hundred sixteen elements of civil law page two hundred fifty four End quote. say you these are but the opinions of men on what else i ask are the hundreds of women depending who this hour depend in our courts a release from burdensome contracts are not these delicate matters left wholly to the discretion of courts are not young women from the first families dragged into our courts into assemblies of men exclusively the judges all men the jurors all men no true woman there to shield them by her presence from gross and impertinent questionings to pity their misfortunes or to protest against their wrongs the administration of justice depends far more on the opinions of eminent jurists than on law alone 
for law is powerless when at variance with public sentiment do not the above citations clearly prove inequality are not the very letter and spirit of the marriage contract based on the idea of the supremacy of man as the keeper of woman's virtue her sole protector and support out of marriage woman asks nothing at this hour but the elective franchise it is only in marriage that she must demand her right to person children property wages life liberty and the pursuit of happiness how can we discuss all the laws and conditions of marriage without perceiving its essential essence end and aim now whether the institution of marriage be human or divine whether regarded as indissoluble by ecclesiastical courts or dissoluble by civil courts woman finding herself equally degraded in each and every phase of it always the victim of the institution it is her right and her duty to sift the relation and the compact through and through until she finds out the true cause of her false position how can we go before the legislatures of our respective states and demand new laws or no laws on divorce until we have some idea of what the true relation is we decide the whole question of slavery by settling the sacred rights of the individual we assert that man cannot hold property in man and reject the whole code of laws that conflicts with the self-evident truth of the assertion again i ask is it possible to discuss all the laws of a relation and not touch the relation itself yours respectfully elizabeth cady stanton End quote. The discussion on the question of marriage and divorce occupied one entire season of the convention and called down on us severe criticisms from the metropolitan and state press. So alarming were the comments on what had been said that I began to feel that I had inadvertently taken out the underpinning from the social system. Enemies were unsparing in their denunciations and friends ridiculed the whole proceeding. I was constantly called on for a definition of marriage and asked to describe home life as it would be when men changed their wives every Christmas. Letters and newspapers poured in upon me, asking all manner of absurd questions, until I often wept with vexation. So many things that I had neither thought nor said were attributed to me that, at times, I really doubted my own identity. However, in the progress of events the excitement died away the earth seemed to turn on its axis as usual women were given in marriage children were born fires burnt as brightly as ever at the domestic altars and family life to all appearances was as stable as usual public attention was again roused to this subject by the macfarland richardson trial in which the former shot the latter being jealous of his attentions to his wife MacFarland was a brutal, improvident husband, who had completely alienated his wife's affections, while Mr. Richardson, who had long been a cherished acquaintance of the family, befriended the wife in the darkest days of her misery. She was a very refined, attractive woman, and a large circle of warm friends stood by her through the fierce ordeal of her husband's trial. Though MacFarland did not deny that he killed Richardson, Yet he was acquitted on the plea of insanity, and was, at the same time, made the legal guardian of his child, a boy then twelve years of age, and walked out of the court with him, hand in hand. What a travesty on justice and common sense that, while a man is declared too insane to be held responsible for taking the life of another, he might still be capable of directing the life and education of a child! And what an insult to that intelligent mother who had devoted twelve years of her life to his care while his worthless father had not provided for them the necessaries of life she married mr richardson on his deathbed the ceremony was performed by henry ward beecher and rev o b frothingham while such men as horace greeley and joshua leavitt witnessed the solemn service Though no shadow had ever dimmed Mrs. Richardson's fair fame, yet she was rudely treated in the court and robbed of her child, 
though by far the most fitting parent to be entrusted with his care. As the indignation among women was general, and at white heat with regard to her treatment, Miss Anthony suggested to me, one day, that it would be a golden opportunity to give women a lesson on their helplessness under the law, wholly in the power of man as to their domestic relations, as well as to their civil and political rights. Accordingly, we decided to hold some meetings, for women alone, to protest against the decision of this trial, the general conduct of the case, the tone of the press, and the laws that made it possible to rob a mother of her child many ladies readily enlisted in the movement i was invited to make the speech on the occasion and miss anthony arranged for two great meetings one in apollo hall new york city and one in the academy of music in brooklyn the result was all that we could desire miss anthony with wonderful executive ability made all the arrangements taking on her own shoulders the whole financial responsibility my latest thought on this question I gave in the arena of April 1894, from which I quote the following. There is a demand just now for an amendment to the United States Constitution that shall make the laws of marriage and divorce the same in all the states of the Union. As the suggestion comes uniformly from those who consider the present divorce laws too liberal, we may infer that the proposed national law is to place the whole question on a narrower basis, rendering null and void the laws that have been passed in a broader spirit, according to the needs and experiences, in certain sections, of the sovereign people. And here let us bear in mind that the widest possible law would not make divorce obligatory on any one, while a restricted law, on the contrary, would compel many, marrying perhaps under more liberal laws, to remain in uncongenial relations. As we are still in the experimental stage on this question, we are not qualified to make a perfect law that would work satisfactorily over so vast an area as our boundaries now embrace. I see no evidence in what has been published on this question of late, by statesmen, ecclesiastics, lawyers and judges, that any of them have thought sufficiently on the subject to prepare a well-digested code or a comprehensive amendment to the national constitution. Some view it as a civil contract, though not governed by the laws of other contracts. Some view it as a religious ordinance, a sacrament. Some think it a relation to be regulated by the state, others by the church, and still others think it should be left wholly to the individual. With this wide divergence of opinion among our leading minds, it is quite evident that we are not prepared for a national law. Moreover, as woman is the most important factor in the marriage relation, her enfranchisement is the primal step in deciding the basis of family life. Before public opinion on this question crystallizes into an amendment to the national constitution, the wife and mother must have a voice in the governing power and must be heard on this great problem in the halls of legislation. There are many advantages in leaving all these questions as now to the states. Local self-government more readily permits of experiments on mooted questions, which are the outcome of the needs and convictions of the community. The smaller the area over which legislation extends, the more pliable are the laws. By leaving the states free to experiment in their local affairs, we can judge of the working of different laws under varying circumstances, and thus learn their comparative merits. The progress education has achieved in America is due to the fact that we have left our system of public instruction in the hands of local authorities. How different would be the solution of the great educational question of manual labor in the schools if the matter had to be settled at Washington? The whole nation might find itself pledged to a scheme that a few years would prove wholly impracticable. Not only is the town meeting, as Emerson says, the cradle of American liberties, but it is the nursery of Yankee experiment and wisdom. England, with its clumsy national code of education, making one inflexible standard of scholarship for the bright children of the manufacturing districts and the dull brains of the agricultural counties, should teach us a lesson as to the wisdom of keeping apart state and national government. 
Before we can decide the just grounds for divorce, we must get a clear idea of what constitutes marriage. In a true relation, the chief object is the loving companionship of man and woman, their capacity for mutual help and happiness, and for the development of all that is noblest in each other. The second object is the building up a home and family, a place of rest, peace, security, in which child life can bud and blossom like flowers in the sunshine. The first step toward making the ideal the real is to educate our sons and daughters into the most exalted ideas of the sacredness of married life and the responsibilities of parenthood. I would have them give at least as much thought to the creation of an immortal being as the artist gives to the landscape or statue. Watch him in his hours of solitude, communing with great nature for days and weeks in all her changing moods, and when at last his dream of beauty is realized and takes a clearly defined form, behold how patiently he works through long months and years on sky and lake, on tree and flower, and when complete it represents to him more love and life, more hope and ambition than the living child at his side, to whose conception and antenatal development not one soulful thought was ever given. To this impressible period of human life few parents give any thought, yet here we must begin to cultivate virtues that can alone redeem the world. The contradictory views in which woman is represented are as pitiful as varied. While the Magnificat to the Virgin is chanted in all our cathedrals round the globe on each returning Sabbath day, and her motherhood extolled by her worshippers, maternity for the rest of womankind is referred to as a weakness, a disability, a curse, an evidence of woman's divinely ordained subjection. Yet surely the real woman should have some points of resemblance in character and position with the ideal one whom poets, novelists and artists portray. It is folly to talk of the sacredness of marriage and maternity while the wife is practically regarded as an inferior, a subject, a slave. Having decided that companionship and conscientious parenthood are the only true grounds for marriage, if the relation brings out the worst characteristics of each party, or if the home atmosphere is unwholesome for children, is not the very raison d'etre of the union wanting, and the marriage practically annulled? It cannot be called a holy relation, no, not a desirable one, when love and mutual respect are wanting. And let us bear in mind one other important fact, the lack of sympathy and content in the parents indicates radical physical unsuitability which results in badly organized offspring. If, then, the real object of marriage is defeated, it is for the interest of the state, as well as the individual concerned, to see that all such pernicious unions be legally dissolved. Inasmuch, then, as incompatibility of temper defeats the two great objects of marriage, it should be the primal cause for divorce. The true standpoint from which to view this question is individual sovereignty, individual happiness. It is often said that the interests of society are paramount and first to be considered. This was the Roman idea, the pagan idea, that the individual was made for the state. The central idea of barbarism has ever been the family, the tribe, the nation, never the individual. But the great doctrine of Christianity is the right of individual conscience and judgment. The reason it took such a hold on the hearts of the people was because it taught that the individual was primary, the state, the church, society, the family, secondary. However, a comprehensive view on any question of human interest shows that the highest good and happiness of the individual and society lie in the same direction. The question of divorce, like marriage, should be settled as to its most sacred relations by the parties themselves, neither the state nor the church having any right to intermeddle therein. As to property and children, it must be viewed and regulated as a civil contract. Then the union should be dissolved with at least as much deliberation and publicity as it was formed. There might be some ceremony and witnesses to add to the dignity and solemnity of the occasion. 
like the quaker marriage which the parties conduct themselves so in this case without any statement of their disagreements the parties might simply declare that after living together for several years they found themselves unsuited to each other and incapable of making a happy home if divorce were made respectable and recognized by society as a duty as well as a right reasonable men and women could arrange all the preliminaries often even the division of property and guardianship of children quite as satisfactorily as it could be done in the courts where the mother is capable of training the children a sensible father would leave them to her care rather than place them in the hands of a stranger but where divorce is not respectable men who have no paternal feeling will often hold the child not so much for its good or for his own affection as to punish the wife for disgracing him the love of children is not strong in most men and they feel but little responsibility in regard to them see how readily they turn off young sons to shift for themselves and unless the law compelled them to support their illegitimate children they would never give them a second thought but on the mother's soul rest forever the care and responsibility of human life her love for the child born out of wedlock is often intensified by the infinite pity she feels through its disgrace even among the lower animals we find the female ever brooding over the young and helpless limiting the causes of divorce to physical defects or delinquencies making the proceedings public prying into all the personal affairs of unhappy men and women regarding the step as quasi criminal punishing the guilty party in the suit all this will not strengthen frail human nature will not ensure happy homes will not banish scandals and purge society of prostitution no no the enemy of marriage of the state of society is not liberal divorce laws but the unhealthy atmosphere that exists in the home itself a legislative act cannot make a unit of a divided family end of chapter 14chapter 15 of 80 years and more reminiscences 1815 to 1897 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by teresa sheridan 80 years and more reminiscences 1815 to 1897 by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 15. Women as Patriots. On April 15, 1861, the President of the United States called out 75,000 militia and summoned Congress to meet July 4th, when 400,000 men were called for, and 400 millions of dollars were voted to suppress the rebellion. These startling events roused the entire people and turned the current of their thoughts in new directions. While the nation's life hung in balance, and the dread artillery of war drowned, alike the voices of commerce, politics, religion, and reform, all hearts were filled with anxious forebodings, all hands were busy in solemn preparations for the awful tragedies to come. At this eventful hour, the patriotism of women shone forth as fervently and spontaneously as did that of man, and her self-sacrifice and devotion were displayed in as many varied fields of action. While he buckled on his knapsack and marched forth to conquer the enemy, she planned the campaigns which brought the nation victory, fought in the ranks, when she could do so without detection, inspired the sanitary commission, gathered needed supplies for the Grand Army, provided nurses for the hospitals, comforted the sick, smoothed the pillows of the dying, inscribed the last messages of love to those far away, and marked the resting places where the brave men fell. The labor women accomplished, the hardships they endured, the time and strength they sacrificed in the war 
that summoned three million men to arms can never be fully appreciated. Indeed, we may safely say that there is scarcely a loyal woman in the North who did not do something in aid of the cause, who did not contribute time, labor, and money to the comfort of our soldiers and the success of our arms. The story of the war will never be fully written if the achievements of women are left untold. They do not figure in the official reports. They are not gazetted for gallant deeds. The names of thousands are unknown beyond the neighborhood where they lived, or the hospitals where they loved to labor. Yet there is no feature in our war more creditable to us as a nation, none from its positive newness so well worthy of record. While the mass of women never philosophize on the principles that underlie national existence, there were those in our late war who understood the political significance of the struggle, the irrepressible conflict between freedom and slavery, between national and state rights. They saw that to provide lint, bandages, and supplies for the army, while the war was not conducted on a wise policy, was to labor in vain, and while many organizations, active, vigilant, and self-sacrificing, were multiplied to look after the material wants of the army, these few formed themselves into a national loyal league to teach sound principles of government and to impress on the nation's conscience that freedom for the slaves was the only way to victory. Accustomed, as most women had been, to the works of charity and to the relief of outward suffering, it was difficult to rouse their enthusiasm for an idea, to persuade them to labor for a principle. They clamored for practical work, something for their hands to do, for fairs and sewing societies, to raise money for soldiers' families, for tableau, readings, theatricals, anything but conventions to discuss principles and to circulate petitions for emancipation. They could not see that the best services they could render the army was to suppress the rebellion, and that the most effective way to accomplish that was to transform the slaves into soldiers. This woman's loyal league voiced the solemn lessons of the war. Liberty to all, national protection for every citizen under our flag, universal suffrage, and universal amnesty. After consultation with Horace Greeley, William Lloyd Garrison, Governor Andrews, and Robert Dale Owen, Miss Anthony and I decided to call a meeting of women in Cooper Institute and form a Woman's Loyal League to advocate the immediate emancipation and enfranchisement of the southern slaves as the most speedy way of ending the war, so we issued in tract form and extensively circulated the following call. In the crisis of our country's destiny, it is the duty of every citizen to consider the peculiar blessings of a republican form of government and decide what sacrifices of wealth and life are demanded for its defense and preservation. The policy of the war, our whole future life, depend on a clearly defined idea of the end proposed and the immense advantages to be secured to ourselves and all mankind by its accomplishment. No mere party or sectional cry, no technicalities of constitutional or military law, no mottos of craft or policy are big enough to touch the great heart of a nation in the midst of revolution. A grand idea such as freedom or justice is needful to kindle and sustain the fires of a high enthusiasm. At this hour, the best word and work of every man and woman are imperatively demanded. To man, by common consent, are assigned the forum, camp, and field. What is woman's legitimate work and how she may best accomplish it is worthy our earnest counsel one with another. We have heard many complaints of the lack of enthusiasm among northern women, but when a mother lays her son on the altar of her country, she asks an object equal to the sacrifice. In nursing the sick and wounded, 
knitting socks, scraping lint, and making jellies the bravest and best may weary if the thoughts mount not in faith to something beyond and above it all. Work is worship only when a noble purpose fills the soul. Woman is equally interested and responsible with man in the final settlement of this problem of self-government. Therefore, let none stand idle spectators now. When every hour is big with destiny, and each delay but complicates our difficulties, it is high time for the daughters of the revolution, in solemn council, to unseal the last will and testaments of the fathers, lay hold of their birthright of freedom, and keep it a sacred trust for all coming generations. To this end we ask the loyal women of the nation to meet in the Church of the Puritans, Dr. Cheevers, New York, on Thursday, the 14th of May next. Let the women of every state be largely represented in person or by letter. On behalf of the Women's Central Committee, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony. Among other resolutions adopted at the meeting were the following. Resolved, there never can be a true peace in this republic until the civil and political rights of all citizens of African descent and all women are practically established. Resolved, that the women of the revolution were not wanting in heroism and self-sacrifice, and we, their daughters, are ready in this war to pledge our time, our means, our talents, and our lives, if need be, to secure the final and complete consecration of America to freedom. It was agreed that the practical work to be done to secure freedom for the slaves was to circulate petitions through all the northern states. For months these petitions were circulated diligently everywhere, as the signatures show, some signed on fence posts, plows, the anvil, the shoemaker's bench, by women of fashion and those in the industries, alike in the parlor and the kitchen, by statesmen, professors in colleges, editors, bishops, by sailors and soldiers, and the hard-handed children of toil, building railroads and bridges and digging canals, and in mines in the bowels of the earth. Petitions signed by 300,000 persons can now be seen in the National Archives in the Capitol at Washington. Three of my sons spent weeks in our office in Cooper Institute, rolling up the petitions from each state separately and inscribing on the outside the number of names of men and women contained therein. We sent appeals to the President, the House of Representatives, and the Senate from time to time, urging emancipation and the passage of the proposed 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the National Constitution. During these eventful months, we received many letters from Senator Sumner, saying, Send on the petitions as fast as received. They give me opportunities for speech. Robert Dale Owen, chairman of the Freedmen's Commission, was most enthusiastic in the work of the Loyal League and came to our rooms frequently to suggest new modes of agitation and to give us an inkling of what was going on behind the scenes in Washington. Those who had been specially engaged in the woman's suffrage movement suspended their conventions during the war and gave their time and thought wholly to the vital issues of the hour. Seeing the political significance of the war, they urged the emancipation of the slaves as the sure, quick way of cutting the Gordian knot of the rebellion. To this end, they organized a national league and rolled up a mammoth petition urging Congress so to amend the Constitution as to prohibit the existence of slavery in the United States. From their headquarters in Cooper Institute, New York City, they sent out the appeals to the President, Congress, and the people at large, tracts and forms of petition, franked by members of Congress, were scattered like snowflakes from Maine to Texas. Meetings were held every week, in which the policy of the government was freely discussed, and approved or condemned. 
That this league did a timely educational work is manifested by the letters received from generals, statesmen, editors, and from women in most of the northern states, fully endorsing its action and principles. The clearness to thinking women of the cause of the war, the true policy in waging it, their steadfastness in maintaining the principles of freedom, are worthy of consideration. With this league, abolitionists and Republicans heartily cooperated. A course of lectures was delivered for its benefit in Cooper Institute by such men as Horace Greeley, George William Curtis, William D. Kelly, Wendell Phillips, E. P. Whipple, Frederick Douglass, Theodore D. Weld, Reverend Dr. Tyne, and Dr. Bellows. Many letters are on its files from Charles Sumner, approving its measures and expressing great satisfaction at the large number of emancipation petitions being rolled into Congress. The Republican press, too, was highly complimentary. The New York Tribune said, the women of the Loyal League have shown great practical wisdom in restricting their efforts to one subject, the most important which any society can aim at in this hour, and great courage in undertaking to do what never has been done in the world before, to obtain one million of names to a petition. The leading journals vied with each other in praising the patience and prudence, the executive ability, the loyalty and the patriotism of the women of the league. And yet these were the same women who, when demanding civil and political rights, privileges, and immunities for themselves, had been uniformly denounced as unwise, imprudent, fanatical, and impracticable. During the six years they held their own claims in abeyance to those of the slaves of the South and labored to inspire the people with enthusiasm for the great measures of the Republican Party, they were highly honored as wise, loyal, and clear-sighted. But when the slaves were emancipated and these women asked that they should be recognized in the Reconstruction as citizens of the Republic, equal before the law, all these transcendent virtues vanished like dew before the morning sun. And thus... It ever is, so long as women labors to second man's endeavors and exalt his sex above her own, her virtues pass unquestioned. But when she dares to demand rights and privileges for herself, her motives, manners, dress, personal appearance, and character are subjects for ridicule and detraction. Liberty, victorious over slavery on the battlefield, had now more powerful enemies to encounter at Washington. The slaves set free, the master conquered, the South desolate, the two races standing face to face, sharing alike the sad results of war, turned with appealing looks to the general government, as if to say, How stand we now? What next? Questions are statesmen, beset with dangers, with fears for the nation's life, of party divisions, of personal defeat, were wholly unprepared to answer. The reconstruction of the South involved the reconsideration of the fundamental principles of our government and the natural rights of man. The nation's heart was thrilled with prolonged debates in Congress and state legislatures, in the pulpits and public journals, and at every fireside on these vital questions, which took final shape in the three historic amendments to the Constitution. The first point, his emancipation, settled. The political status of the Negro was next in order, and to this end various propositions were submitted to Congress. But to demand his enfranchisement on the broad principle of natural rights was hedged about with difficulties, as the logical result of such action must be the enfranchisement of all ostracized classes, not only the white women of the entire country, but the slave women of the South. Though our senators and representatives had an honest aversion to any proscriptive legislation against loyal women, in view of their varied and self-sacrificing work during the war, 
yet the only way they could open the constitutional door just wide enough to let the black man pass in was to introduce the word male into the national constitution. After the generous devotion of such women as Anna Carroll and Anna Dickinson in sustaining the policy of the Republicans, both in peace and war, they felt it would come with a bad grace from that party to place new barriers in woman's path to freedom. But how could the amendment be written without the word male was the question. Robert Dale Owen, being at Washington and behind the scenes at the time, sent copies of the various bills to the officers of the Loyal League in New York and related to us some of the amusing discussions. One of the committee proposed persons instead of males. That will never do, said another. It would enfranchise wenches. Suffrage for black men will be all the strain the Republican Party can stand, said another. Charles Sumner said, years afterward, that he wrote over nineteen pages of foolscap to get rid of the word male, and yet keep Negro suffrage as a party measure intact, but it could not be done. Miss Anthony and I were the first to see the full significance of the word male in the Fourteenth Amendment and we at once sounded the alarm and sent out petitions for a constitutional amendment to prohibit the states from disfranchising any of their citizens on the ground of sex. Miss Anthony, who had spent the year in Kansas, started for New York the moment she saw the proposition before Congress to put the word male into the national constitution, and made haste to rouse the women in the East to the fact that the time had come to begin vigorous work again for women's enfranchisement. Leaving Rochester October 11th, she called on Martha Wright at Auburn, Phoebe Jones and Lydia Mott at Albany, Madams Rose Gibbons Davis at New York City, Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown Blackwell in New Jersey, Stephen and Abby Foster at Worcester, Madams Severance, Dow, Noel, Dr. Harriet K. Hunt, Dr. M. E. Sacasosa, and Mr. Phillips and Garrison in Boston, urging them to join in sending protest to Washington against the pending legislation. Mr. Phillips at once consented to devote $500 from the Jackson Fund to commence the work. Miss Anthony and I spent all our Christmas holidays in writing letters and addressing appeals and petitions to every part of the country, and, before the close of the session of 1865-66, to 66, petitions with 10,000 signatures were poured into Congress. One of my letters was as follows. To the editor of the Standard. Sir, Mr. Brumall of Pennsylvania, Mr. Shank of Ohio, Mr. Jenkins of Rhode Island, and Mr. Stevens of Pennsylvania have each a resolution before Congress to amend the Constitution. Article 1st, Section 2nd, reads thus. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers. Mr. Brumall proposes to amend by saying, male electors, Mr. Shank, male citizens, Mr. Jenkins, male citizens, Mr. Stevens, male voters, as, in process of time, women may be made legal voters in the several states and would then meet that requirement of the Constitution. But those urged by the other gentlemen, neither time, effort, nor state constitutions, could enable us to meet, unless by a liberal interpretation of the amendment, a coat of mail to be worn at the polls might be judged all sufficient. Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Schenck, in their bills, have the grace not to say a word about taxes, remembering perhaps, that taxation without representation is tyranny. 
but Mr. Broomall, though unwilling that we should share in the honors of government, would fain secure us a place in its burdens. For, while he apportions representatives to male electors only, he admits all the inhabitants into the rights, privileges, and immunities of taxation. Magnanimous M.C. I would call the attention of the women of the nation to the fact that, under the federal constitution as it now exists, there is not one word that limits the right of suffrage to any privileged class. This attempt to turn the wheels of civilization backward on the part of Republicans claiming to be the Liberal Party should rouse every woman in the nation to a prompt exercise of the only right she has in the government, the right of petition. To this end, a committee in New York have sent out thousands of petitions, which should be circulated in every district and sent to its representative at Washington as soon as possible. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, New York, January 2nd, 1866. End of chapter 15. Recording by Teresa Sheridan. Chapter 16 of 80 Years and More Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Carroll. 80 Years and More Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897 by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 16. Pioneer Life in Kansas. Our Newspaper, The Revolution. In 1867, the proposition to extend the suffrage to women and to colored men was submitted to the people of the state of Kansas, and among other eastern speakers, I was invited to make a campaign through the state. As the fall elections were pending, there was great excitement everywhere. Suffrage for colored men was a Republican measure, which the press and politicians of that party advocated with enthusiasm. As woman suffrage was not a party question, we hoped that all parties would favor the measure, that we might at last have one green spot on earth where women could enjoy full liberty as citizens of the United States. Accordingly, in July, Miss Anthony and I started with high hopes of a most successful trip, and after an uneventful journey of 1,500 miles, we reached the sacred soil where John Brown and his sons had helped to fight the battles that made Kansas a free state. Lucy Stone, Mr. Blackwell, and Olympia Brown had preceded us and opened the campaign with large meetings in all the chief cities. Miss Anthony and I did the same. Then it was decided that, as we were to go to the very borders of the state, where there were no railroads, we must take carriages and economize our forces by taking different routes. I was escorted by ex-governor Charles Robinson. We had a low, easy carriage drawn by two mules, in which we stored about a bushel of tracts, two valises, a pail for watering the mules, a basket of apples, crackers, and other such refreshments as we could purchase on the way. Some things were suspended underneath the carriage, some packed on behind, and some under the seat and at our feet. It required great skill to compress the necessary baggage into the allotted space. As we went to the very verge of civilization, wherever two dozen voters could be assembled, we had a taste of pioneer life. We spoke in log cabins, in depots, unfinished schoolhouses, churches, hotels, barns, and in the open air. I spoke in a large mill one night. A solitary tallow candle shone over my head like a halo of glory. A few lanterns around the outskirts of the audience made the darkness perceptible. But all I could see of my audience was the whites of their eyes in the dim distance. People came from twenty miles around to these meetings. 
held either in the morning, afternoon, or evening, as was most convenient. As the regular state election was to take place in the coming November, the interest increased from week to week until the excitement of the people knew no bounds. There were speakers for and against every proposition before the people. This involved frequent debates on all the general principles of government, and thus a great educational work was accomplished, which is one of the advantages of our frequent elections. The friends of woman suffrage were doomed to disappointment. Those in the East on whom they relied for influence through the liberal newspapers were silent, and we learned afterward that they used what influence they had to keep the abolitionists and republicans of the state silent, as they feared the discussion of the woman question would jeopardize the enfranchisement of the black man. However, we worked untiringly and hopefully, not seeing through the game of the politicians until nearly the end of the canvass, when we saw that our only chance was in getting the Democratic vote. Accordingly, George Francis Train, then a most effective and popular speaker, was invited into the state to see what could be done to win the democracy. He soon turned the tide, strengthened the weak-kneed Republicans and abolitionists, and secured a large Democratic vote. For three months we labored diligently, day after day, enduring all manner of discomforts in traveling, eating, and sleeping. As there were no roads or guideposts, we often lost our way. In going through canyons and fording streams, it was often so dark that the governor was obliged to walk ahead to find the way, taking off his coat so that I could see his white shirt and slowly drive after him. Though seemingly calm and cool, I had a great dread of these night adventures, as I was in constant fear of being upset on some hill and rolled into the water. The governor often complimented me on my courage when I was fully aware of being tempest-tossed with anxiety. I am naturally very timid, but being silent under strong emotions of either pleasure or pain, I am credited with being courageous in the hour of danger. For days, sometimes, we could find nothing at a public table that we could eat. Then, passing through a little settlement, we could buy dried herring, crackers, gum arabic, and slippery elm. The latter, we were told, was very nutritious. We frequently sat down to a table with bacon floating in grease, coffee without milk, sweetened with sorghum, and bread or hot biscuit, green with soda while vegetables and fruit were seldom seen. Our nights were miserable, owing to the general opinion among pioneers that a certain species of insect must necessarily perambulate the beds in a young civilization. One night, after traveling over prairies all day, eating nothing but what our larder provided, we saw a light in a cottage in the distance which seemed to beckon to us. Arriving, we asked the usual question, if we could get a night's lodging, to which the response was inevitably a hearty, hospitable yes. One survey of the premises showed me what to look for in the way of midnight companionship, so I said to the governor, I will resign in your favor the comforts provided for me tonight and sleep in the carriage as you do so often. I persisted against all the earnest persuasions of our host, and in due time I was ensconced for the night, and all about the house was silent. I had just fallen into a gentle slumber when a chorus of pronounced grunts and a spasmodic shaking of the carriage revealed to me the fact that I was surrounded by those long-nosed black pigs so celebrated for their courage and pertinacity. They had discovered that the iron steps of the carriage made most satisfactory scratching posts, and each one was struggling for his turn. This scratching suggested fleas. Alas, thought I, before morning I shall be devoured. I was mortally tired and sleepy, but I reached for the whip and plied it lazily from side to side, but I soon found nothing but a constant and most vigorous application of the whip could hold them at bay one moment. I had heard that this type of pig was very combative when thwarted in its desires, 
and they seemed in such sore need of relief that I thought there was danger of their jumping into the carriage and attacking me. This thought was more terrifying than that of the fleas, so I decided to go to sleep and let them alone to scratch at their pleasure. I had a sad night of it, and never tried the carriage again, though I had many equally miserable experiences within four walls. After one of these border meetings, we stopped another night with a family of two bachelor brothers and two spinster sisters. The home consisted of one large room, not yet lathed and plastered. The furniture included a cooking stove, two double beds in remote corners, a table, a bureau, a washstand, and six wooden chairs. As it was late, there was no fire in the stove and no suggestion of supper. So the governor and I ate apples and chewed slippery elm before retiring to dream of comfortable beds and well-spread tables in the near future. The brothers resigned their bed to me just as it was. I had noticed that there was no ceremonious changing of bed linen under such circumstances, so I had learned to nip all fastidious notions of individual cleanliness in the bud and to accept the inevitable. When the time arrived for retiring, the governor and the brothers went out to make astronomical observations or smoke, as the case might be, while the sisters and I made our evening toilet and disposed ourselves in the allotted corners. That done, the stalwart sons of Adam made their beds with skins and blankets on the floor. When all was still and darkness reigned, I reviewed the situation with a heavy heart seeing that I was bound to remain a prisoner in the corner all night, come what might. I had just congratulated myself on my power of adaptability to circumstances, when I suddenly started with an emphatic, What is that? A voice from the corner asked, Is your bed comfortable? Oh, yes, I replied, but I thought I felt a mouse run over my head. Well, said the voice from the corner, I should not wonder. I have heard such squeaking from that corner during the past week that I told sister there must be a mouse nest in that bed. A confession she probably would not have made unless half asleep. This announcement was greeted with suppressed laughter from the floor, but it was no laughing matter to me. Alas, what a prospect to have mice running over one all night. But there was no escape. The sisters did not offer to make any explorations, and in my fatigue costume I could not light a candle and make any on my own account. The house did not afford an armchair in which I could sit up. I could not lie on the floor, and the other bed was occupied. Fortunately, I was very tired and soon fell asleep. What the mice did the remainder of the night I never knew, so deep were my slumbers. But as my features were intact and my facial expression as benign as usual next morning, I inferred that their gambols had been most innocently and decorously conducted. These are samples of many similar experiences which we encountered during the three months of those eventful travels. Heretofore, my idea had been that pioneer life was a period of romantic freedom, when the long, white-covered wagons bound for the far west passed by, I thought of the novelty of a six-month's journey through the bright spring and summer days in a house on wheels, meals under shady trees and beside babbling brooks, sleeping in the open air and finding a home at last, where land was cheap, the soil rich and deep, and where the grains, vegetables, fruit, and flowers grew bountifully with but little toil. But a few months of pioneer life permanently darkened my rosy ideal of the white-covered wagon, the charming picnics by the way, and the paradise at last. I found many of these adventurers in unfinished houses and racked with malaria. In one case, I saw a family of eight, all ill with chills and fever. The house was half a mile from the spring water on which they depended, and from which those best able, from day to day, carried the needed elixir to others suffering with the usual thirst. Their narrations of all the trials of the long journey were indeed heart-rending. 
In one case, a family of twelve left their comfortable farm in Illinois much against the earnest protests of the mother, she having ten children, the youngest a baby then in her arms. All their earthly possessions were stored in three wagons, and the farm which the mother owned was sold before they commenced their long and perilous journey. There was no reason for going except that the husband had the western fever. They were doing well in Illinois on a large farm within two miles of a village, but he had visions of a bonanza near the setting sun. Accordingly, they started. At the end of one month, the baby died. A piece of wood from the cradle was all they had to mark its lonely resting place. With sad hearts, they went on, and in a few weeks, with grief for her child, her old home, her kindred and friends, the mother also died. She, too, was left alone on the far-off prairies, and the sad pageant moved on. Another child soon shared the same fate. And then a span of horses died, and one wagon, with all the things they could most easily spare, was abandoned. Arrived at their destination, none of the golden dreams was realized. The expensive journey, the struggles in starting under new circumstances, and the loss of the mother's thrift and management made the father so discouraged and reckless that much of his property was wasted, and his earthly career was soon ended. Through the heroic energy and good management of the eldest daughter, the little patrimony in time was doubled, and the children well brought up and educated in the rudiments of learning, so that all became respectable members of society. Her advice to all young people is, if you are comfortably established in the East, stay there. There is no royal road to wealth and ease, even in the Western states. In spite of the discomforts we suffered in the Kansas campaign, I was glad of the experience. It gave me added self-respect to know that I could endure such hardships and fatigue with a great degree of cheerfulness. The governor and I often laughed heartily as we patiently chewed our gum arabic and slippery elm to think on what a gentle stimulus we were accomplishing such wonderful feats as orators and travelers. It was fortunate our intense enthusiasm for the subject gave us all the necessary inspiration, as the supplies we gathered by the way were by no means sufficiently invigorating for prolonged propagandism. I enjoyed these daily drives over the vast prairies, listening to the governor's descriptions of the early days when the bushwhackers and jayhawkers made their raids on the inhabitants of the young free state. The courage and endurance of the women, surrounded by dangers and discomforts, surpassed all description. I count it a great privilege to have made the acquaintance of so many noble women and men who had passed through such scenes and conquered such difficulties. They seemed to live in an atmosphere altogether beyond their surroundings. Many educated families from New England, disappointed in not finding the much-talked-of bonanzas, were living in log cabins in solitary places miles from any neighbors. But I found Emerson, Parker, Holmes, Hawthorne, Whittier, and Lowell on their bookshelves to gladden their leisure hours. Miss Anthony and I often comforted ourselves mid adverse winds with memories of the short time we spent under Mother Bickerdyke's hospitable roof at Salina. There we had clean, comfortable beds, delicious viands, and everything was exquisitely neat. She entertained us with her reminiscences of the war. With great self denial, she had served her country in camp and hospital and was with Sherman's army in that wonderful march to the sea, and here we found her on the outpost of civilization, determined to start what Kansas most needed, a good hotel. But alas, it was too good for that latitude, and proved a financial failure. It was to us an oasis in the desert, where we would gladly have lingered if the opposition would have come to us for conversion but as we had to carry the gospel of woman's equality into the highways and hedges, 
we left dear Mother Bickerdyke with profound regret. The seed sown in Kansas in 1867 is now bearing its legitimate fruits. There was not a county in the state where meetings were not held or tracts scattered with a generous hand. If the friends of our cause in the East had been true and had done for woman what they did for the colored man, I believe both propositions would have been carried. But with a narrow policy, playing off one against the other, both were defeated. A policy of injustice always bears its own legitimate fruit in failure. However, women learned one important lesson, namely that it is impossible for the best of men to understand women's feelings or the humiliation of their position. When they asked us to be silent on our question during the war and labor for the emancipation of the slave, we did so and gave five years to his emancipation and enfranchisement. To this proposition, my friend Susan B. Anthony never consented, but was compelled to yield because no one stood with her. I was convinced at the time that it was the true policy. I am now equally sure that it was a blunder, and ever since I have taken my beloved Susan's judgment against the world. I have always found that when we see eye to eye, we are sure to be right, and when we pull together, we are strong. After we discuss any point together and fully agree, our faith in our united judgment is immovable, and no amount of ridicule and opposition has the slightest influence, come from what quarter it may. Together we withstood the Republicans and abolitionists when, a second time, they made us the most solemn promises of earnest labor for our enfranchisement when the slaves were safe beyond a peradventure. They never redeemed their promise made during the war. Hence, when they urged us to silence in the Kansas campaign, we would not for a moment entertain the proposition. The women generally awoke to their duty to themselves. They had been deceived once and could not be again. If the leaders in the Republican and abolition camps could deceive us, whom could we trust? Again, we were urged to be silent on our rights when the proposition to take the word white out of the New York Constitution was submitted to a vote of the people of the state, or rather to one half the people, as women had no voice in the matter. Again, we said, no, no, gentlemen, if the white comes out of the Constitution, let the male come out also. Women have stood with the Negro thus far on equal ground as ostracized classes outside the political paradise, and now, when the door is open, it is but fair that we both should enter and enjoy all the fruits of citizenship heretofore ranked with idiots, lunatics, and criminals in the Constitution, the Negro has been the only respectable compeer we had. So pray do not separate us now for another twenty years, ere the constitutional door will again be opened. We were persistently urged to give all our efforts to get the word white out, and thus secure the enfranchisement of the colored man as that, they said, would prepare the way for us to follow. Several editors threatened that unless we did so, their papers should henceforth do their best to defeat every measure we proposed. But we were deaf alike to persuasions and threats, thinking it wiser to labor for women, constituting as they did half the people of the state, rather than for a small number of colored men who, viewing all things from the same standpoint as white men, would be an added power against us. The question settled in Kansas, we returned with George Francis Train to New York. He offered to pay all the expenses of the journey and meetings in all the chief cities on the way and see that we were fully and well reported in their respective journals. After prolonged consultation, Miss Anthony and I thought best to accept the offer, and we did so. Most of our friends thought it a grave blunder, 
but the result proved otherwise. Mr. Train was then in his prime, a large, fine-looking man, a gentleman in dress and manner, neither smoking, chewing, drinking, nor gormandizing. He was an effective speaker and actor, as one of his speeches, which he illustrated, imitating the poor wife at the wash-tub and the drunken husband reeling in, fully showed. He gave his audience charcoal sketches of everyday life rather than argument. He always pleased popular audiences, and even the most fastidious were amused with his caricatures. As the newspapers gave several columns to our meetings at every point through all the states, the agitation was widespread and of great value. To be sure, our friends on all sides fell off, and those especially who wished us to be silent on the question of woman's rights declared, the cause too sacred to be advocated by such a charlatan as George Francis Train. We thought otherwise, as the accession of Mr. Train increased the agitation twofold. If these fastidious ladies and gentlemen had come out to Kansas and occupied the ground and provided the sinews of war, there would have been no field for Mr. Train's labors, and we should have accepted their services. But as the ground was unoccupied, he had at least the right of a reform squatter to cultivate the cardinal virtues and reap a moral harvest wherever he could. Reaching New York, Mr. Train made it possible for us to establish a newspaper, which gave another impetus to our movement. The Revolution, published by Susan B. Anthony and edited by Parker Pillsbury and myself, lived two years and a half and was then consolidated with the New York Christian Inquirer, edited by the Reverend Henry Bellows, D.D., I regard the brief period in which I edited the Revolution as one of the happiest of my life, and I may add the most useful. In looking over the editorials, I find but one that I sincerely regret, and that was a retort on Mr. Garrison, written under great provocation, but not by me, which circumstances at the time forbade me to disown. Considering the pressure brought to bear on Miss Anthony and myself, I feel now that our patience and forbearance with our enemies in their malignant attacks on our good name, which we never answered, were indeed marvelous. We said at all times and on all other subjects just what we thought and advertised nothing that we did not believe in. No advertisements of quack remedies appeared in our columns. One of our clerks once published a bread powder advertisement, which I did not see until the paper appeared. So in the next number I said, editorially, what I thought of it. I was alone in the office one day when a man blustered in. Who, said he, runs this concern? You will find the names of the editors and publishers, I replied, on the editorial page. Are you one of them? I am, I replied. Well, do you know that I agreed to pay $20 to have that bread powder advertised for one month, and then you condemn it editorially? I have nothing to do with the advertising. Miss Anthony pays me to say what I think. Have you any more thoughts to publish on that bread powder? Oh, yes, I replied. I have not exhausted the subject yet. Then, said he, I will have the advertisement taken out. What is there to pay for the one insertion? Oh, nothing, I replied, as the editorial probably did you more injury than the advertisement did you good. On leaving, with prophetic vision, he said, I prophesy a short life for this paper. The business world is based on quackery, and you cannot live without it. With melancholy certainty, I replied, I fear you are right. End of chapter 16. Recording by Lynn Carroll. Chapter 17 of 80 Years and More. Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Elena. Eighty Years and More. Reminiscences, 1815-1897. to 1897, By Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 17. Lyceums and Lecturers. The Lyceum Bureau was, at one time, a great feature in American life. The three leading bureaus were in Boston, New York, and Chicago. The managers, map in hand, would lay out trips, more or less extensive according to the capacity or will of the speakers, and then, with a dozen or more victims in hand, make arrangements with the committees in various towns and cities to set them all in motion. As the managers of the bureaus had ten percent of what the speakers made, it was to their interest to keep the time well filled. Hence the engagements were made without the slightest reference to the comfort of the travelers. With our immense distances, it was often necessary to travel night and day, sometimes changing cars at midnight, and perhaps arriving at the destination half an hour or less before going on the platform, and starting again on the journey immediately upon leaving it. The route was always carefully written out, giving the time the train started from and arrived at various points, but as cross trains often failed to connect, one traveled, guidebook in hand, in a constant fever of anxiety. As, in the early days, the fees were from one to two hundred dollars a night, the speakers themselves were desirous of accomplishing as much as possible. In 1869, I gave my name, for the first time, to the New York Bureau, and on November 14th began the long, weary pilgrimages from Maine to Texas that lasted twelve years, speaking steadily for eight months, from October to June, every season. That was the heyday of the lecturing period, when a long list of bright men and women were constantly on the wing, Anna Dickinson, Olive Logan, Kate Field, later Mrs. Livermore and Mrs. Ho, Alcott, Phillips, Douglas, Tilton, Curtis, Beecher, and, several years later, General Kilpatrick, with Henry Vincent, Bradlow, and Matthew Arnold from England. These and many others were stars of the lecture platform. Some of us occasionally managed to spend Sunday together, at a good hotel in some city, to rest and feast and talk over our joys and sorrows, the long journeys, the hard fare in the country hotels, the rainy nights when committees felt blue and tried to cut down our fees, the being compelled by inconsiderate people to talk on the train, the overheated, badly ventilated cars, the halls, sometimes too warm, sometimes too cold, babies crying in our audiences, the rain pattering on the roof overhead or leaking on the platform. These were common experiences. In the West, women with babies uniformly occupied the front seats, so that the little ones, not understanding what you said, might be amused with your gestures and changing facial expression. All these things, so trying at the time to concentrated and enthusiastic speaking, afterwards served as subjects of amusing conversation. We unanimously complained of the tea and coffee. Mrs. Livermore had the wisdom to carry a spirit lamp with her own tea and coffee, and thus supplied herself with the needed stimulants for her oratorical efforts. The hardships of these lyceum trips can never be appreciated except by those who have endured them. With accidents to cars and bridges, with floods and snow blockades, the pitfalls in one of these campaigns were without number. On one occasion, when engaged to speak at Makaketa, Iowa, I arrived at Lyons about noon to find the road was blocked with snow and no chance of the cars running for days. Well, said I to the landlord, I must be at Makaketa at eight o'clock tonight. Have you a sleigh, a span of fleet horses, and a skillful driver? If so, I will go across the country. Oh, yes, madam, he replied. I have all you ask, but you could not stand a six hours drive in this piercing wind. Having lived in a region of snow, with the thermometer down to twenty degrees below zero, I had no fears of winds and drafts. So I said, Get the sleigh ready, and I will try it. Accordingly, I telegraphed the committee that I would be there, and started. I was well bundled up in a fur cloak and hood, a hot oak plank at my feet, and a thick veil over my head and face. As the landlord gave the finishing touch by throwing a large buffalo robe over all, and tying the two tails together at the back of my head, and thus effectually preventing me putting my hand to my nose, he said, There, if you can only sit perfectly still, you will come out all right at Makaketa, that is, if you get there, which I very much doubt. It was a long, hard drive against the wind and through drifts, but I scarcely moved a finger, and, as the clock struck eight, we drove into the town. 
The hall was warm, and the church bell having announced my arrival, a large audience was assembled. As I learned that all the roads in northern Iowa were blocked, I made the entire circuit from point to point in a sleigh, traveling forty and fifty miles a day. At the Sherman House in Chicago, three weeks later, I met Mr. Bradlow and General Kilpatrick, who were advertised on the same route ahead of me. Well, said I, where have you gentlemen been? Waiting here for the roads to be opened. We have lost three weeks' engagements, they replied. As the general was lecturing on his experiences in Sherman's march to the sea, I chafed him on not being able, in an emergency, to march across the state of Iowa. They were much astonished and somewhat ashamed when I told them of my long, solitary drives over the prairies from day to day. It was the testimony of all the bureaus that the women could endure more fatigue and were more conscientious than the men in filling their appointments. The pleasant feature of these trips was the great educational work accomplished for the people through their listening to lectures on all the vital questions of the hour. Wherever any of us chanced to be on Sunday, we preached in some church, and wherever I had a spare afternoon, I talked to women alone on marriage, maternity, and the laws of life and health. We made many most charming acquaintances, too, scattered all over our western world, and saw how comfortable and happy sensible people could be, living in most straitened circumstances, with none of the luxuries of life. If most housekeepers could get rid of one half their clothes and furniture and put their bric-a-brac in the town museum, life would be simplified and they would begin to know what leisure means. When I see so many of our American women struggling to be artists who cannot make a good loaf of bread nor a palatable cup of coffee, I think of what Theodore Parker said when art was a craze in Boston. The fine arts do not interest me so much as the coarse arts which feed, clothe, house, and comfort a people. I would rather be a great man like Franklin than a Michelangelo. Nay, if I had a son, I should rather see him a mechanic, like the late George Stevenson in England, than a great painter like Rubens, who only copied beauty. One day I found at the office of the Revolution an invitation to meet Mrs. Moulton in the Academy of Music, where she was to try her voice for the coming concert for the benefit of the Women's Medical College. And what a voice for power, pathos, pliability! I never heard the like. Seated beside her mother, Mrs. W. H. Greenoff, I enjoyed alike the mother's anxious pride and the daughter's triumph. I felt, as I listened, the truth of what Votemps said the first time he heard her. That is the traditional voice for which the ages have waited and longed. When on one occasion Mrs. Moulton sang a song of Mozart's to Aubrey's accompaniment, someone present asked, What could be added to make this more complete? Aubrey looked up to heaven and, with a sweet smile, said, Nothing but that Mozart should have been here to listen. Looking and listening, here, thought I, is another jewel in the crown of womanhood to radiate and glorify the lives of all. I have such an intense pride of sex that the triumphs of women in art, literature, oratory, science, or song rouse my enthusiasm as nothing else can. Hungering that day for gifted women, I called on Alice and Phoebe Carey and Mary Clemmer Ames, and together we gave the proud white male such a serving up as did our souls good, and could not hurt him, entrenched as he is, behind creeds, codes, customs, and constitutions, with visor and breastplate of self-complacency and conceit. In criticizing Jessie Boucheret's essay on superfluous women, in which she advises men in England to emigrate in order to leave room and occupation for women, the Tribune said, The idea of a home without a man in it! In visiting the Careys, one always felt that there was a home, a very charming one, too, without a man in it. Once, when Harriet Beecher Stowe was at Dr. Taylor's, I had the opportunity to make her acquaintance. In her sanctum, surrounded by books and papers, she was just finishing her second paper on the Byron family, and her sister Catherine was preparing papers on her educational work, preparatory to a coming meeting of the ladies of the school board. The women of the Beecher family, though most of them wives and mothers, all had a definite life work outside the family circle, and other objects of intense interest beside husbands, babies, cook stoves, and social conversations. Catherine said she was opposed to women's suffrage, and if she thought there was the least danger of our getting it, she would write and talk against it vehemently. But, 
As the nation was safe against such a calamity, she was willing to let the talk go on, because the agitation helped her work. "'It is rather paradoxical,' I said to her, "'that the pressing of a false principle can help a true one. But when you get the women all thoroughly educated, they will step off to the polls and vote in spite of you.' One night on the train from New York to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, I found abundant time to think over the personal peculiarities of the many noble women who adorned this nineteenth century, and, as I recalled them, one by one, in America, England, France, and Germany, and all that they are doing and saying, I wondered that any man could be so blind as not to see that woman has already taken her place as the peer of man. While the lords of creation have been debating her sphere and drawing their chalk marks here and there, woman has quietly stepped outside the barren fields where she was compelled to graze for centuries, and is now in green pastures and beside still waters, a power in the world of thought. These pleasant cogitations were cut short by my learning that I had taken the wrong train and must change at Harrisburg at two o'clock in the morning. How soon the reflection that I must leave my comfortable berth at such an unchristian hour changed the whole hue of glorious womanhood and every other earthly blessing. However, I lived through the trial and arrived at Williamsport as the day dawned. I had a good audience at the Opera House that evening, and was introduced to many agreeable people, who declared themselves converted to women's suffrage by my ministrations. Among the many new jewels in my crown, I added, that night, Judge Bentley, in November 1869, I passed one night in Philadelphia, with Miss Anthony, at Anna Dickinson's house, a neat three-story brick house in Locust Street. This haven of rest, where the world-famous little woman came, ever and anon, to recruit her overtaxed energies, was very tastefully furnished, adorned with engravings, books, and statuary. Her mother, sister, and brother made up the household, a pleasing cultivated trio, the brother was a handsome youth of good judgment, and given to sage remarks, the sister witty, intuitive, and incisive in speech, the mother dressed in rich Quaker costume, and though nearly seventy, still possessed of great personal beauty. She was intelligent, dignified, refined, and, in manner and appearance, reminded one of Angelina Grimke as she looked in her younger days. Everything about the house and its appointments indicated that it was the abode of genius and cultivation, and although Anna was absent, the hospitalities were gracefully dispensed by her family. Napoleon and Shakespeare seemed to be Anna's patron saints, looking down on all sides from the wall. The mother amused us with the sore trials her little orator had inflicted on the members of the household by her vagaries in the world of fame. On the way to Kennett Square, a young gentleman pointed out to us the home of Benjamin West, who distinguished himself, to the disgust of broad brims generally, as a landscape painter. In commencing his career, it is said he made use of the tail of a cat in lieu of a brush. Of course Benjamin's first attempts were on the sly, and he could not ask Paterfamilias for money to buy a brush without encountering the good man's scorn. Whether, in the hour of his need and fresh enthusiasm, poor Puss was led to the sacrificial altar, or whether he found her reposing by the roadside, having paid the debt of nature, our informant could not say, enough that, in time, he owned a brush and immortalized himself by his skill in its use. Such erratic ones as Whittier, West, and Anna Dickinson go to prove that even the prim, proper, perfect Quakers are subject to like infirmities with the rest of the human family. I had long heard of the progressive friends, in the region round Longwood, had read the many bulls they issued from their yearly meetings, on every question, on war, capital punishment, temperance, slavery, women's rights, had learned that they were turning the cold shoulder on the dress, habits, and opinions of their fathers, listening to the ministrations of such worldlings as William Lloyd Garrison, Theodore Tilton, and Oliver Johnson, in a new meeting-house, all painted and varnished, with cushions, easy seats, carpets, stoves, a musical instrument, shade of George Fox forgive, and three brackets with vases on the high seat, and more than all that, men and women were indiscriminately seated throughout the house. All this Miss Anthony and I beheld with our own eyes, and, in company with Sarah Pugh and Chandler Darlington, did sit together in the high seat and talk in the congregation of the people. There, too, we met Hannah Darlington and Dinah Mendenhall, names long known in every good work. 
and for the space of one day did enjoy the blissful serenity of that earthly paradise. The women of Kennet Square were celebrated not only for their model housekeeping, but also for their rare cultivation on all subjects of general interest. In November I again started on one of my western trips, but alas, on the very day the trains were changed, and so I could not make connections to meet my engagements at Saginaw and Marshall, and just saved myself at Toledo by going directly from the cars before the audience, with the dust of twenty-four hours' travel on my garments. Not being able to reach Saginaw, I went straight to Ann Arbor, and spent three days most pleasantly in visiting old friends, making new ones, and surveying the town, with its grand university. I was invited to Thanksgiving dinner at the home of Mr. Seaman, a highly cultivated democratic editor, author of Progress of Nations. A choice number of guests gathered round his hospitable board on that occasion, over which his wife presided with dignity and grace. Woman suffrage was the target for the combined wit and satire of the company, and, after four hours of uninterrupted sharpshooting, pyrotechnics, and laughter, we dispersed to our several abodes, fairly exhausted with the excess of enjoyment. One gentleman had the moral hardihood to assert that men had more endurance than women, whereupon a lady remarked that she would like to see the thirteen hundred young men in the university laced up in steel-ribbed corsets, with hoops, heavy skirts, trains, high heels, panniers, chignons, and dozens of hairpins sticking in their scalps, cooped up in the house year after year, with no exhilarating exercise, no hopes, aims, nor ambitions in life, and know if they could stand it as well as the girls. Nothing, said she, but the fact that women, like cats, have nine lives enables them to survive the present regime to which custom dooms the sex. While in Ann Arbor I gave my lecture on Our Girls in the New Methodist Church, a large building, well-lighted and filled with a brilliant audience, the students, in large numbers, were there, and strengthened the threads of my discourse with frequent and generous applause, especially when I urged on the regents of the university the duty of opening its doors to the daughters of the state. There were several splendid girls in Michigan, at that time, preparing themselves for admission to the law department. As Judge Cooley, one of the professors, was a very liberal man, as well as a sound lawyer, and strongly in favor of opening the college to girls, I had no doubt the women of Michigan would soon distinguish themselves at the bar. Some said the chief difficulty in the way of the girls of that day being admitted to the university was the want of room. That could have been easily obviated by telling the young men from abroad to betake themselves to the colleges in their respective states, that Michigan might educate her daughters. As the women owned a good share of the property of the state, and had been heavily taxed to build and endow that institution, it was but fair that they should share in its advantages. The Michigan University, with its extensive grounds, commodious buildings, medical and law schools, professors' residences, and the finest laboratory in the country, was an institution of which the state was justly proud, and, as the tuition was free, it was worth the trouble of a long, hard siege by the girls of Michigan to gain admittance there. I advised them to organize their forces at once, get their minute guns, battering rams, monitors, projectiles, bombshells, cannon, torpedoes, and crackers ready, and keep up a brisk cannonading until the grave and reverend seniors opened the door and shouted, Hold! Enough! The ladies of Ann Arbor had a fine library of their own, where their clubs met once a week. They had just formed a suffrage association. My visit ended with a pleasant reception, at which I was introduced to the chaplain, several professors, and many ladies and gentlemen ready to accept the situation. Judge Cooley gave me a glowing account of the laws of Michigan, how easy it was for wives to get possession of all the property, and then sunder the marriage tie and leave the poor husband to the charity of the cold world, with their helpless children about him. I heard of a rich lady there who made a will, giving her husband a handsome annuity, as long as he remained her widower. It was evident that the poor white male, sooner or later, was doomed to try for himself the virtue of the laws he had made for women. I hope, for the sake of the race, he will not bear oppression with the stupid fortitude we have for six thousand years. At Flint I was entertained by Mr. and Mrs. Jenny. Mr. Jenny was a democratic editor who believed in progress, and in making smooth paths for women in this great wilderness of life. His wife was a remarkable woman. She inaugurated the ladies' libraries in Michigan. 
In Flint, they had a fine brick building and nearly 2,000 volumes of choice books owned by the association, and money always in the treasury. Here, too, I had a fine audience and gave my lecture entitled, Open the Door. At Coldwater, in spite of its name, I found a warm, appreciative audience. The president of the Lyceum was a sensible young man who, after graduating at Ann Arbor, decided, instead of starving at the law, to work with his hands and brains at the same time. When all men go to their legitimate business of creating wealth, developing the resources of the country, and leave its mere exchange to the weaker sex, we shall not have so many superfluous women in the world with nothing to do. It is evident the time has come to hunt man into his appropriate sphere. Coming from Chicago, I met Governor Fairchild and Senator Williams of Wisconsin. It was delightful to find them thoroughly grounded in the faith of women's suffrage. They had been devout readers of the Revolution ever since Miss Anthony induced them to subscribe, the winter before, at Madison. Of course, a new glow of intelligence irradiated their fine faces, for they were remarkably handsome men, and there was a new point to all their words. Senator Williams, like myself, was on a lecturing tour. Man was his theme, for which I was devoutly thankful, for, if there are any of God's creatures that need lecturing, it is this one that is forever advising us. I thought of all men, from Father Gregory down to Horace Bushnell, who had wearied their brains to describe women's sphere, and how signally they had failed. Throughout my Lyceum journeys I was of great use to the traveling public, in keeping the ventilators in the cars open, and the dampers and fiery stoves shut up, especially in sleeping cars at night. How many times a day I thought what the sainted Horace man tried to impress on his stupid countrymen, that, inasmuch as the air is forty miles deep around the globe, it is a useless piece of economy to breathe any number of cubic feet over more than seven times. The babies, too, need to be thankful that I was in a position to witness their wrongs. Many, through my intercessions, received their first drink of water, and were emancipated from woolen hoods, veils, tight strings under their chins, and endless swaddling bands. It is a startling assertion, but true, that I have met few women who know how to take care of a baby, and this fact led me, on one trip, to lecture to my fair countrywoman on marriage and maternity, hoping to aid in the inauguration of a new era of happy, healthy babies. After twenty-four hours in the express, I found myself in a pleasant room in the International Hotel at La Crosse, looking out on the great mother of waters, on whose cold bosom the ice and the streamers were struggling for mastery. Beyond stretched the snow-clad bluffs, sternly looking down on the Mississippi, as if to say, Thus far shalt thou come, and no farther. Though sluggish, you are aggressive, ever pushing where you should not, but all attempts in this direction are alike vain, since creation's dawn we have defied you, and here we stand, to-day, calm, majestic, immovable, coquette as you will in other latitudes, with flowery banks and youthful piers in the busy marts of trade, and undermine them, one and all, with your deceitful wooings, but bow in reverence as you gaze on us. We have no eyes for your beauty, no ears for your endless song, our heads are in the clouds, our hearts commune with gods, you have no part in the eternal problems of the ages that fill our thoughts, yours the humble duty to wash our feet, and then pass on, remembering to keep in your appropriate sphere, within the barks that wise geographers have seen fit to mark. As I listened to these complacent hills, and watched the poor Mississippi weeping as she swept along, to lose her sorrows in ocean's depths, I thought how like the attitude of man to woman. Let these proud hills remember that they, too, slumbered for centuries in deep valleys down, down when, perchance, the sparkling Mississippi rolled above their heads, and, but for some generous outburst, some upheaval of old Mother Earth, wishing that her rock-ribbed sons, as well as graceful daughters, might enjoy the light, the sunshine, and the shower, but for this soul of love and matter as well as mind, these bluffs, and the sons of Adam, too, might not boast the altitude they glory in today. Those who have ears to hear discern low, rumbling noises that foretell convulsions in our social world that may, perchance, in the next upheaval, bring woman to the surface, up, up, from gloomy ocean depths, dark caverns, and damper valleys. 
the struggling daughters of earth are soon to walk in the sunlight of a higher civilization. Escorted by Mr. Woodward, a member of the bar, I devoted a day to the Lions of La Crosse. First we explored the courthouse, a large, new brick building, from whose dome we had a grand view of the surrounding country. The courtroom where justice is administered was large, clean, airy, the bench carpeted and adorned with a large, green stuffed chair, in which I sat down, and, in imagination, summoned up advocates, jurors, prisoners, and people, and wondered how I should feel pronouncing sentence of death on a fellow being, or, like Portia, wisely checkmating the Shylocks of our times. Here I met Judge Hugh Cameron, formerly of Johnstown. He invited us into his sanctum, where we had a pleasant chat about our native hills, Scotch affiliations, the bench and bar of New York, and the Wisconsin laws for women. The judge, having maintained a happy bachelor state, looked placidly on the aggressive movements of the sex, as his domestic felicity would be no way affected, whether women was voted up or down. We next surveyed the Pomeroy building, which contained a large, tastefully finished hall and printing establishment, where the Lacrosse Democrat was formerly published. As I saw the perfection, order, and good taste in all arrangements throughout, and listened to Mr. Huron's description of the life and leading characteristics of its chief, it seemed impossible to reconcile the tone of the Democrat with the moral status of its editor. I never saw a more complete business establishment, and the editorial sanctum looked as if it might be the abiding place of the muses. Mirrors, pictures, statuary, books, music, rare curiosities, and fine specimens of birds and minerals were everywhere. Over the editor's table was a beautiful painting of his youthful daughter, whose flaxen hair, blue eyes, and angelic face should have inspired a father to nobler, purer utterances than he was wont, at that time, to give to the world. But Pomeroy's good deeds will live long after his profane words are forgotten. Throughout the establishment, cards, set up in conspicuous places, said, "'Smoking here is positively forbidden.' Drinking, too, was forbidden, to all his employees. The moment a man was discovered using intoxicating drinks, he was dismissed. In the upper story of the building was a large, pleasant room, handsomely carpeted and furnished, where the employees, in their leisure hours, could talk, write, read, or amuse themselves in any rational way. Mr. Pomeroy was humane and generous with his employees, honorable in his business relations, and boundless in his charities to the poor. His charity, business honor, and public spirit were highly spoken of by those who knew him best. That a journal does not always reflect the editor is as much the fault of society as of the man. So long as the public will pay for gross personalities, obscenity, and slang, decent journals will be outbidden in the market. The fact that the lacrosse Democrat found a ready sale in all parts of the country showed that Mr. Pomeroy fairly reflected the popular taste. While multitudes turned up the whites of their eyes and denounced him in public, they bought his paper and read it in private. I left La Crosse in a steamer, just as the rising sun lighted the hilltops and gilded the Mississippi. It was a lovely morning, and, in company with a young girl of sixteen, who had traveled alone from some remote part of Canada, bound for a northern village in Wisconsin, I promenaded the deck most of the way to Winona, a pleased listener to the incidents of my young companion's experiences. She said that, when crossing Lake Huron, she was the only woman on board, but the men were so kind and civil that she soon forgot she was alone. I found many girls, traveling long distances, who had never been five miles from home before, with a self-reliance that was remarkable. They all spoke in the most flattering manner of the civility of our American men in looking after their baggage and advising them as to the best routes. As you approach St. Paul at Fort Snelling, where the Mississippi and Minnesota join forces, the country grows bold and beautiful. The town itself, then boasting about 30,000 inhabitants, is finely situated, with substantial stone residences. It was in one of these charming homes I found a harbor of rest during my stay in the city. Mrs. Stewart, whose hospitalities I enjoyed, was a woman of rare common sense and sound health. Her husband, Dr. Jacob H. Stewart, was one of the very first surgeons to volunteer in the late war. In the panic at Bull Run, instead of running, as everybody else did, he stayed with the wounded and was taken prisoner while taking a bullet from the head of a rebel. When exchanged, 
Beauregard gave him his sword for his devotion to the dying and wounded. I had the pleasure of seeing several of the leading gentlemen and ladies of St. Paul at the Orphans' Fair, where we all adjourned, after my lecture, to discuss women's rights over a bounteous supper. Here I met William L. Banning, the originator of the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad. He besieged Congress and capitalists for a dozen years to build his road, but was laughed at and put off with sneers and contempt, until, at last, J. Cook became so wary of his continual coming that he said, I will build the road to get rid of you. Whittier seems to have had a prophetic vision of the peopling of this region. When speaking of the Yankee, he says, He's whittling by St. Mary's Falls, upon his loaded wain. He's measuring o'er the pictured rocks, with eager eyes of gain. I hear the mattock in the mine, the axe stroke in the dell, the clamor from the Indian lodge, the Jesuit's chapel bell. I hear the tread of pioneers, of nations yet to be, the first low wash of waves, where soon shall roll a human sea. The opening of these new outlets and mines of wealth was wholly due to the forecast and perseverance of Mr. Banning. The first engine that went over a part of the road had been christened at St. Paul, with becoming ceremonies, the officiating priestess being a beautiful maiden. A cask of water from the Pacific was sent by Mr. Banning's brother from California, and a small keg was brought from Lake Superior for the occasion. A glass was placed in the hands of Miss Ella B. Banning, daughter of the President, who then christened the engine, saying, With the waters of the Pacific Ocean in my right hand, and the waters of Lake Superior in my left, invoking the genius of progress to bring together, with iron band, two great commercial systems of the globe, I dedicate this engine to the use of the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad, and name it William L. Banning. From St. Paul to Dubuque, as the boats had ceased running, a circuitous route and a night of discomfort were inevitable. Leaving the main road to Chicago at Clinton Junction, I had the pleasure of waiting at a small country inn until midnight for a freight train. This was indeed dreary, but, having Mrs. Child's sketches of Madame's de Stahl and Roland at hand, I read of Napoleon's persecutions of the one and Robespierre's of the other, until, by comparison, my condition was tolerable, and the little meagerly furnished room, with its dull fire and dim lamp, seemed a paradise compared with years of exile from one's native land or the prison cell and guillotine. How small our ordinary petty trials seem in contrast with the mountains of sorrow that have been piled up on the great souls of the past! Absorbed in communion with them, twelve o'clock soon came, and with it the train. A burly son of Adam escorted me to the passenger car filled with German immigrants, with tin cups, babies, bags, and bundles innumerable. The ventilators were all closed, the stoves hot, and the air was like that of the black hole of Calcutta. So, after depositing my cloak and bag in an empty seat, I quietly propped both doors open with a stick of wood, shut up the stoves, and opened all the ventilators with the poker. But the celestial breeze, so grateful to me, had the most unhappy effect on the slumbering exiles. Paterfamilias swore outright, the companion of his earthly pilgrimage said, We must be going north. And, as the heavy veil of carbonic acid gas was lifted from infant faces, and the pure oxygen filled their lungs and roused them to new life, they set up one simultaneous shout of joy and gratitude, which their parents mistook for agony. Altogether there was a general stir. As I had quietly slipped into my seat and laid my head down to sleep, I remained unobserved, the innocent cause of the general purification and vexation. We reached Freeport at three o'clock in the morning. As the depot for Dubuque was nearly half a mile on the other side of the town, I said to a solitary old man who stood shivering there to receive us, "'How can I get to the other station?' "'Walk, madam.' "'But I do not know the way.' "'There is no one to go with you.' "'How is my trunk going?' said I. "'I have a donkey and cart to take that.' "'Then,' said I, "'you, the donkey, the trunk, and I will go together.' So I stepped into the cart, sat down on the trunk, and the old man laughed heartily as we jogged along through the mud of that solitary town in the pale morning starlight. Just as the day was dawning, Dubuque, with its rough hills and bold scenery, loomed up. Soon, under the roof of Myron Beach, one of the distinguished lawyers of the West, with a good breakfast and sound nap, my night's sorrows were forgotten. 
I was sorry to find that Mrs. Beach, though a native of New York, and born on the very spot where the first women's rights convention was held in this country, was not sound on the question of women's suffrage. She seemed to have an idea that voting and housekeeping could not be compounded, but I suggested that, if the nation could only enjoy a little of the admirable system with which she and other women administered their domestic affairs, Uncle Sam's interest would be better secured. This is just what the nation needs today, and women must wake up to the consideration that they too have duties as well as rights in the state. A splendid audience greeted me in the opera house, and I gave our girls, bringing many male sinners to repentance, and stirring up some lethargic femme coverts to a state of rebellion against the existing order of things. From Dubuque I went to Dixon, a large town, where I met a number of pleasant people, but I have one cause of complaint against the telegraph operator, whose negligence to send a dispatch to Mount Vernon, written and paid for, came near causing me a solitary night on the prairie, unsheltered and unknown. Hearing that the express train went out Sunday afternoon, I decided to go, so as to have all day at Mount Vernon before speaking. But on getting my trunk checked, the baggageman said the train did not stop there. Well, said I, check the trunk to the nearest point at which it does stop, resolving that I would persuade the conductor to stop one minute anyway. Accordingly, when the conductor came round, I presented my case as persuasively and eloquently as possible, telling him that I had telegraphed friends to meet me, etc., etc. He kindly consented to do so, and had my trunk rechecked. On morning, as there was no light, no sound, and the depot was half a mile from the town, the conductor urged me to go to Cedar Rapids and come back the next morning, as it was Sunday night and the depot might not be opened, and I might be compelled to stay there on the platform all night in the cold. But, as I had telegraphed, I told him I thought someone would be there, and I would take the risk. So, off went the train, leaving me solitary and alone. I could see the lights in the distant town, and the dark outlines of two great mills nearby, which suggested dams and races. I heard, too, the distant barking of dogs, and I thought there might be wolves, too, but no human sound. The platform was high, and I could see no way down, and I should not have dared to go down if I had. So I walked all round the house, knocked at every door and window, called, John, James, Patrick, but no response. Dressed in all their best they had, no doubt, gone to visit Sally, and I knew they would stay late. The night wind was cold. What could I do? The prospect of spending the night there filled me with dismay. At last I thought I would try my vocal powers, so I halloed as loud as I could, in every note of the gamut, until I was hoarse. At last I heard a distant sound, a loud hello, which I returned, and so we kept it up until the voice grew near, and, when I heard a man's heavy footsteps close at hand, I was relieved. He proved to be the telegraph operator, who had been a brave soldier in the late war. He said that no message had come from Dixon. He escorted me to the hotel, where some members of the Lyceum Committee came in and had a hearty laugh at my adventure, especially that, in my distress, I should have called on James and John and Patrick instead of Jane, Anne, and Bridget. They seemed to argue that that was an admission, on my part, of man's superiority, but I suggested that, as my sex had not yet been exalted to the dignity of presiding in depots and baggage rooms, there would have been no propriety in calling Jane and Anne. Mount Vernon was distinguished for a very flourishing Methodist college, open to boys and girls alike. The president and his wife were liberal and progressive people. I dined with them in their home near the college, and met some young ladies from Massachusetts who were teachers in the institution. All who gathered round the social board on that occasion were of one mind on the woman question. Even the venerable mother of the president seemed to light up with the discussion of the theme. I gave our girls in the Methodist church, and took the opportunity to compliment them for taking the word obey out of their marriage ceremony. I heard the most encouraging reports of the experiment of educating the sexes together. It was the rule in all the Methodist institutions in Iowa, and I found that the young gentlemen fully approved of it. At Mount Vernon I also met Mr. Wright, former Secretary of State, who gave me several interesting facts in regard to the women of Iowa. The state could boast one woman who was an able lawyer, Mrs. Mansfield. Mrs. Barry and Mrs. Stebbins were notaries public. 
Miss Addington was superintendent of schools in Mitchell County. She was nominated by a convention in opposition to a Mr. Brown. When the vote was taken, lo, there was a tie. Mr. Brown offered to yield through courtesy, but she declined. So they drew lots, and Miss Addington was the victor. She once made an abstract of titles of all the lands in the county where she lived, and had received an appointment to office from the governor of the state, who requested the paper be made out L, instead of Laura Addington. He said it was enough for Iowa to appoint women to such offices, without having it known the world over. I was sorry to tell the governor's secrets, which I did everywhere, but the cause of womanhood made it necessary. End of chapter 17 Recording by Elena, Coco, Florida. Chapter 18 of Eighty Years and More Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Teresa Sheridan. Eighty Years and More. Reminiscences. 1815 to 1897. By Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 18. Westward Ho. In the month of June, 1871, Miss Anthony and I went to California, holding suffrage meetings in many of the chief cities from New York to San Francisco, where we arrived about the middle of July in time to experience the dry, dusty season. We tarried, on the way, one week in Salt Lake City. It was at the time of the Godby succession, when several hundred Mormons abjured that portion of the faith of their fathers which authorized polygamy. A decision had just been rendered by the United States Supreme Court declaring the first wife and her children the only legal heirs. Whether this decision hastened the secession, I do not know. However, it gave us the advantage of hearing all the arguments for and against the system. Those who were opposed to it said it made slaves of men. To support four wives and twenty children was a severe strain on any husband. The woman who believed in polygamy had much to say in its favor especially in regard to the sacredness of motherhood during the period of pregnancy and lactation a lesson of respect for that period being religiously taught all mormons we were very thankful for the privilege granted us of speaking to the women alone in the smaller tabernacle our meeting opened at two o'clock and lasted until seven giving us five hours of uninterrupted conversation Judge McKeon had informed me of the recent decisions and the legal aspects of the questions, which he urged me to present to them fully and frankly, as no one had had such an opportunity before to speak to Mormon women alone. So I made the most of my privilege. I gave a brief history of the marriage institution in all times and countries, of the matriarchate, when the mother was the head of the family, and owned the property and children of the patriarchate when men reigned supreme and women was enslaved of polandry polygamy monogamy and prostitution we had a full and free discussion of every phase of the question and we all agreed that we were still far from having reached the ideal position for woman in marriage however satisfied man might be with his various experiments though the mormon women like all others stoutly defend their own religion yet they are no more satisfied than any other sect all women are dissatisfied with their position as inferiors and their dissatisfaction increases in exact ratio with their intelligence and development after this convocation the doors of the tabernacle were closed to our ministrations as we thought they would be but we had crowded an immense amount of science, philosophy, history, and general reflections into the five hours of such free talk as those women had never heard before. As the seceders had just built a new hall, we held meetings there every day, discussing all the vital issues of the hour, the Mormon men and women taking an active part. 
We attended the Fourth of July celebration, and saw the immense tabernacle filled to its utmost capacity. The various states of the Union were represented by young girls, gaily dressed, carrying beautiful flags and banners. When that immense multitude joined in our national songs, and the deep-toned organ filled the vast dome, the music was very impressive, and the spirit of patriotism manifested throughout was deep and sincere. As I stood among these simple people, so earnest in making their experiment in religion and social life, and remembered all the persecutions they had suffered, and all they had accomplished in that desolate, far-off region, where they had, indeed, made the wilderness blossom like the rose, I appreciated, as never before, the danger of intermeddling with the religious ideas of any people. Their faith finds abundant authority in the Bible, in the example of God's chosen people. When learned ecclesiastics teach the people that they can safely take that book as the guide of their lives, they must expect them to follow the letter and the specific teachings that lie on the surface. The ordinary mind does not generalize nor see that the same principles of conduct will not do for all periods and latitudes. When women understand that governments and religions are human inventions, that Bibles, prayer books, catechisms, and encyclical letters are all emanations from the brain of man, they will no longer be oppressed by the injunctions that come to them with the divine authority of thus saith the lord that thoroughly democratic gathering in the tabernacle impressed me more than any other fourth of july celebration i ever attended as most of the mormon families keep no servants mothers must take their children wherever they go to churches theaters concerts and military reviews everywhere and anywhere hence the low pensive wail of the individual baby combining in large numbers, becomes a deep monotone, like the waves of the sea, a sort of violoncello accompaniment to all their holiday performances. It was rather trying to me at first to have my glowing periods punctuated with a rhythmic wail from all sides of the hall, but as soon as I saw that it did not distract my hearers, I simply raised my voice, and, with a little added vehemence, fairly rivaled the babies. Commenting on this trial to one of the theatrical performers, he replied, It is bad enough for you, but alas, imagine me in a tender death scene when the most profound stillness is indispensable, having my last gasp, my farewell message to loved ones, accentuated with the joyful crowings or impatient complainings of fifty babies. I noticed in the tabernacle that the miseries of the infantile host were in a measure mitigated by constant draughts of cold water borne around in buckets by four old men. The question of the most profound interest to us at that time in the Mormon experiment was the exercise of the suffrage by women. Emmeline B. Wells, wife of the mayor of the city, writing to a Washington convention in 1894, said of the many complications growing out of various bills before Congress to rob women of this right. Women have voted in Utah 14 years, but because of the little word male that still stands upon the statutes, no woman is eligible to any office of emolument or trust. In three successive legislatures, bills have been passed, providing that the word male be erased, but each time the governor of the territory, who has absolute veto power, has refused his signature. Yet women attend primary meetings in the various precincts and are chosen as delegates. They are also members of county and territorial central committees, and are thus gaining practical political experience and preparing themselves for positions of trust. In 1882, a convention was held to frame a constitution to be submitted to the people and presented to the Congress of the United States. Women were delegates to this convention and took part in all its deliberations. 
and were appointed to act on committees with equal privileges. It is the first instance on record, I think, where women have been members and taken an active part in a constitutional convention. Much has been said, and written, and justly, too, of suffrage for women in Wyoming, but, in my humble opinion, had Utah stood on the same ground as Wyoming, and women been eligible to office, as they are in that territory, they would, ere this, have been elected to the Legislative Assembly of Utah. It is currently reported that Mormon women vote as they are told by their husbands. I most emphatically deny the assertion. All Mormon women vote who are privileged to register. Every girl born here, as soon as she is 21 years old, registers and considers it as much a duty as to say her prayers. Our women vote with the same freedom that characterizes any class of people in the most conscientious acts of their lives. These various questions were happily solved in 1895 when Utah became a state. Its constitution gives women the right to vote on all questions and makes them eligible to any office. The journey over the Rocky Mountains was more interesting and wonderful than I had imagined. A heavy shower the morning we reached the Alkali Plains made the trip through that region, where travelers suffer so much, quite endurable. Although we reached California in its hot, dry season, we found the atmosphere in San Francisco delightful, fanned with the gentle breezes of the Pacific, cooled with the waters of its magnificent harbor. The Golden Gate does indeed open to the eye of the traveler, one of the most beautiful harbors in the world. Friends had engaged for us a suite of apartments at the Grand Hotel, then just opened. Our rooms were constantly decked with fresh flowers, which our suffrage children, as they called themselves, brought us from day to day. So many brought tokens of their good will. In fact, all our visitors came with offerings of fruits and flowers, that not only our apartments, but the public tables were crowded with rare and beautiful specimens of all varieties. We spoke every night to crowded houses on all phases of the woman question, and had a succession of visitors during the day. In fact, for one week we had a perfect ovation. As Senator Stamford and his wife were at the same hotel, we had many pleasant interviews with them. While in San Francisco, we had many delightful sails in the harbor and drives to the seashore and for miles along the beach. We spent several hours at Little Ocean House watching the gambols of the celebrated seals. These, like the big trees, were named after distinguished statesmen. One very black fellow was named Charles Sumner in honor of his love of the black race. Another, with a little squint in his eye, was called Ben Butler, a stout, rotund specimen that seemed to take life philosophically, was named Senator Davis of Illinois, a very belligerent one, who appeared determined to crowd his confreres into the sea, was called Secretary Stanton, Grant, and Lincoln on a higher ledge of the rocks, were complacently observing the gambols of the rest. California was on the eve of an important election, and John A. Bingham of Ohio and Senator Cole were stumping the state for the Republican Party. At several points we had the use of their great tents for our audiences, and of such of their able arguments as applied to woman. As Mr. Bingham's great speech was on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, every principle he laid down literally enfranchised the women of the nation. I met the Ohio statesman one morning at breakfast, after hearing him the night before. I told him his logic must compel him to advocate woman suffrage. With a most cynical smile, he said, he was not the puppet of logic, but the slave of practical politics. We met most of our suffrage coadjutors in different parts of California. I spent a few days with Mrs. Elizabeth B. Schenck, one of the earliest pioneers in the suffrage movement. 
She was a cultivated, noble woman, and her little cottage was a gem of beauty and comfort, surrounded with beautiful gardens and a hedge of fish geraniums over ten feet high, covered with scarlet flowers. It seemed altogether more like a fairy bower than a human habitation. The windmills all over California for pumping water made a very pretty feature in the landscape, as well as an important one, as people are obliged to irrigate their gardens during the dry season. In August, the hills are as brown as ours in December. Here, too, I first met Senator Sargent's family and visited them in Sacramento City, where we had a suffrage meeting in the evening and one for women alone next day. At a similar meeting in San Francisco, 600 women were present in Platts Hall. We discussed marriage, maternity, and social life in general. Supposing none but women were present, as all were dressed in feminine costume, the audience were quite free in their questions, and I equally so in my answers. To our astonishment, the next morning, a verbatim report of all that was said appeared in one of the leading papers, with most respectful comments. As I always wrote and read carefully what I had to say on such delicate subjects, the language was well chosen and the presentation of facts and philosophy quite unobjectionable, hence the information being as important for men as for women, I did not regret the publication. During the day, a committee of three gentlemen called to know if I would give a lecture to men alone. As I had no lecture prepared, I declined with the promise to do so the next time I visited California. The idea was novel, but I think women could do much good in that way. My readers may be sure that such enterprising travelers as Miss Anthony and myself visited all the wonders, saw the geysers, big trees, the Yosemite Valley, and the immense mountain ranges piled one above the other until they seemed to make a giant pathway from earth to heaven. We drove down the mountain sides with Fox, the celebrated whip, sixteen people in an open carriage drawn by six horses, down, 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 as fast as we could go. I expected to be dashed to pieces, but we were safely descended in one hour. Heights we had taken three to climb. Fox held a steady rein and seemed as calm as if we were trotting on a level, though any accident, such as a hot axle, a stumbling horse, or a break in the harness would have sent us down the mountainside, two thousand feet, to inevitable destruction. He had many amusing antidotes to tell of Horace Greeley's trip to the geysers. The distinguished journalist was wholly unprepared for the race down the mountains, and begged Fox to hold up. Sitting in front, he made several efforts to seize the lines, but Fox assured him that was only the possible way they could descend in safety, as the horses could guide the stage, but they could not hold it. At Stockton we met a party of friends just returning from Yosemite, who gave us much valuable information for the journey. Among other things, I was advised to write to Mr. Hutchins, the chief authority there, to have a good, strong horse in readiness to take me down the steep and narrow path into the valley. We took the same driver and carriage which our friends had found trustworthy, and started early in the morning. The dust and heat made the day's journey very wearisome, but the prospect of seeing the wonderful valley made all hardships of little consequence. Quite a large party were waiting to mount their donkeys and mules when we arrived. One of the attendants, a man about as thin as a stair-rod, asked me if I was the lady who had ordered a strong horse. I being the stoutest of the party, he readily arrived at that conclusion, so my steed was promptly produced. But I knew enough of horses and riding to see at a glance that he was a failure, with his low withers and high haunches, for descending steep mountains. In addition to his forward pitch, his back was immensely broad. 
Miss Anthony and I decided to ride astride, and had suits made for that purpose. But alas, my steed was so broad that I could not reach the stirrups, and the moment we began to descend I felt as if I was going over his head. So I fell behind, and, when the party had all gone forward, I dismounted, though my slender guide assured me there was no danger, he had been up and down a thousand times. But as I had never been at all, his repeated experiences did not inspire me with courage. I decided to walk. That, the guide said, was impossible. Well, I said, by way of compromise, I will walk as far as I can, and when I reach the impossible, I will try that ill-constructed beast. I cannot see what you men were thinking of when you selected such an animal for this journey. And so we went slowly down, arguing the point, whether it were better to ride or walk, to trust one's own legs, or, by chance, be precipitated thousands of feet down the mountainside. It was a hot August day, the sun in the zenith shining with full power. My blood was at boiling heat with exercise and vexation, alternately sliding and walking, catching hold of rocks and twigs, drinking at every rivulet, covered with dust, dripping with perspiration, skirts, gloves, and shoes in tatters. For four long hours I struggled down to the end, when I laid myself out on the grass and fell asleep, perfectly exhausted, having sent the guide to tell Mr. Hutchins that I had reached the valley and, as I could neither ride nor walk, to send a wheelbarrow, or four men with a blanket, to transport me to the hotel. That very day the Mariposa Company had brought the first carriage into the valley, which in due time was sent to my relief. Miss Anthony, who, with a nice little Mexican pony and narrow saddle, had made her descent with grace and dignity, welcomed me on the steps of the hotel and laughed immoderately at my helpless plight. As hour after hour had passed, she said, there had been a general wonderment as to what had become of me. But did you ever see such magnificent scenery? Alas, I replied, I have been in no mood for scenery. I have been constantly watching my hands and feet, lest I should come to grief. The next day I was too stiff and sore to move a finger. However, in due time I awoke to the glory and grandeur of that wonderful valley, of which no descriptions nor paintings can give the least idea. With Sunset Cox, the leading democratic statesman, and his wife, we had had many pleasant excursions through the valley and chats during the evening on the piazza. There was a constant succession of people going and coming, even in that far-off region, and all had their adventures to relate, but none quite equaled my experiences. We spent a day in Calvaris Grove, rested beneath the big trees, and rode on horseback through the fallen trunk of one of them. Some vandals sought off one of the most magnificent specimens twenty feet above the ground, and on this the owners of the hotel built a little octagonal chapel, the polished wood with bark for a border made a very pretty floor. Here they often had Sunday services, as it held about 100 people. Here, too, we discussed the suffrage question amid these majestic trees that had battled with the winds 2,000 years and had probably never before listened to such rebellion as we preached to the daughters of earth that day. Here, again, we found our distinguished statesmen immortalized, each with his namesake among these stately trees. We asked our guide if there were any not yet appropriated. Might we name them after women? As he readily consented, we wrote on cards the names of a dozen leading women and tacked them on their respective trees, whether Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, Phoebe Cousins, and Anna Dickinson still retain their identity, and answer when called by the goddess Sylvia in that majestic grove, I know not. Twenty-five years have rolled by since then, 
and a new generation of visitors and guides may have left no trace of our work behind them. But we whispered our hopes and aspirations to the trees, to be wafted to the powers above, and we left them indelibly pictured on the walls of that little chapel, and for more mortal eyes we scattered leaflets wherever we went, and we made all our pleasure trips so many propaganda for woman's enfranchisement. Returning from California, I made the journey straight through from San Francisco to New York. Though a long trip to make without a break, yet I enjoyed every moment, as I found most charming, companions in Bishop Janes and his daughter. The bishop, being very liberal in his ideas, we discussed the various theologies and all phases of the woman question. I shall never forget those pleasant conversations as we sat outside on the platform, day after day, and in the soft moonlight late at night. We took up the thread of our debate each morning, where we had dropped it the night before. The bishop told me about the resolution to take the word obey from the marriage ceremony, which he introduced two years before, into the Methodist General Conference, and carried with but little opposition. All praise to the Methodist Church. When our girls are educated into a proper self-respect and laudable pride of sex, they will scout all those old barbarisms of the past that point in any way to the subject condition of women in either the state, the church, or the home. Until the other sex follow her example, I hope our girls will insist on having their conjugal knots all tied by Methodist bishops. The Episcopal marriage service not only still clings to the word obey, but it has a most humiliating ceremony in giving the bride away. I was never more struck with its odious and ludicrous features than on once seeing a tall, queenly-looking woman, magnificently arrayed, married by one of the tiniest priests that ever donned a surplus and gown, given away by the smallest guardian that ever watched a woman's fortunes to the feeblest, bluest-looking little groom that ever placed a wedding ring on bridal finger. Seeing these Lilliputians around her, I thought, when the little priest said, Who gives this woman to this man? that she would take the responsibility and say, I do. But no, there she stood, calm, serene, as if it were no affair of hers, while the little guardian, placing her hand in that of the little groom, said, I do. Thus was the stately woman bandied about by these three puny men, all of whom she might have gathered up in her arms and borne off to their respective places of abode. But women are gradually waking up to the degradation of these ceremonies. Not long since, at a wedding in high life, a beautiful girl of eighteen was struck dumb at the word obey. Three times the priest pronounced it with emphasis and holy unction, each time slower, louder than before. Though the magnificent parlors were crowded, a breathless silence reigned. Father, mother, and groom were in agony. The bride, with downcast eyes, stood speechless. At length the priest slowly closed his book and said, The ceremony is at an end. One imploring word from the groom and a faint obey was heard in the solemn stillness. The priest unclasped his book and the knot was tied. The congratulations, feast, and all went on as though there had been no break in the proceedings, but the lesson was remembered and many a rebel made by that short pause. I think all these reverend gentlemen who insist on the word obey in the marriage service should be removed for a clear violation of the 13th Amendment to the Federal Constitution, which says there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude within the United States. As I gave these experiences to Bishop Janes, he laughed heartily and asked me to repeat them to each newcomer. Our little debating society was the center of attraction. One gentleman asked me if our woman suffrage conventions were as entertaining. I told him yes, that there were no meetings in Washington, 
so interesting and so well attended as ours. As I had some woman's suffrage literature in my valise, I distributed leaflets to all the earnest souls who plied me with questions. Like all other things, it requires great discretion in sowing leaflets, lest you expose yourself to a rebuff. I never offer one to a man with a small head and high heels on his boots, with his chin in the air, because I know, in the nature of things, that he will be jealous of superior women, nor to a woman whose mouth has the prunes and prisms expression, for I know she will say, I have all the rights I want. Going up to London one day a few years later, I noticed a saintly sister belonging to the Salvation Army, timidly offering some leaflets to several persons on board, all coolly declining to receive them. Having had much experience in the joys and sorrows of propagandism, I put out my hand and asked her to give them to me. I thanked her and read them before reaching London. It did me no harm and her much good in thinking that she might have planted a new idea in my mind. Whatever is given to us freely, I think, in common politeness, we should accept graciously. While I was enjoying once more the comforts of home on the blue hills of Jersey, Miss Anthony was lighting the fires of liberty on the mountain tops of Oregon and Washington Territory. All through the months of October, November, and December, 1871, she was jolting about in stages, over rough roads, speaking in every hamlet where a schoolhouse was to be found, and scattering our breezy leaflets to the four winds of heaven. From 1869 to 1873, Miss Anthony and I made several trips through Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, and Nebraska, holding meetings at most of the chief towns, I speaking in the afternoons, to women alone on marriage and maternity, as Miss Anthony had other pressing engagements in Kansas and Nebraska, I went alone to Texas, speaking in Dallas, Sherman, and Houston, where I was delayed two weeks by floods, and thus prevented from going to Austin, Galveston, and some points in Louisiana, where I was advertised to lecture. In fact, I lost all my appointments for a month. However, there was a fine hotel in Houston and many pleasant people, among whom I made some valuable acquaintances. Beside several public meetings, I had parlor talks and scattered leaflets, so that my time was not lost. As the floods had upset my plans for the winter, I went straight from Houston to New York over the Iron Mountain Railroad. I anticipated a rather solitary trip, but fortunately I met General Baird, whom I knew, and some other army officers who had been down on the Mexican border to settle some troubles in the free zone. We amused ourselves on the long journey with wits and women suffrage discussions. We noticed a dyspeptic looking clergyman, evidently of a bilious temperament, eyeing us very steadily and disapproving the first day, and in a quiet way we warned each other that in due time he would give us a sermon on the sin of card-playing. Sitting alone early next morning, he seated himself by my side and asked me if I would allow him to express his opinion on card-playing. I said, Oh, yes. I fully believe in free speech. Well, said he, I never touch cards. I think they are an invention of the devil to lead unwary souls from all serious thought of the stern duties of life and the realities of eternity. I was sorry to see you with your white hair, probably near the end of your earthly career, playing cards and talking with those reckless army officers who delight in killing their fellow beings. No, I do not believe in war or card playing. Such things do not prepare the soul for heaven. Well, said I, you are quite right, with your views to abjure the society of army officers, and all games of cards. You, no doubt, enjoy your own thoughts and the book you are reading, more than you would the conversation of those gentlemen, and a game of whist. We must regulate our conduct by our own highest ideal. While I deplore the necessity of war, 
yet I know in our army many of the noblest types of manhood, whose acquaintance I prize most highly. I enjoy all games, too, from chess down to dominoes. There is so much that is sad and stern in life that we need sometimes to lay down its burdens and indulge in innocent amusements. Thus, you see, what is wise from my standpoint is unwise from yours. I am sorry that you repudiate all amusements, as they contribute to the health of the body and soul. You are sorry that I do not think as you do and regulate my life accordingly. You are sure that you are right. I am equally sure that I am. Hence there is nothing to be done in either case but to let each other alone and wait for the slow process of evolution to give to each of us a higher standard. Just then one of the officers asked me if I was ready for a game of whist, and I excused myself from further discussion. I met many of those dolorous saints in my travels who spent so much thought on eternity and saving their souls that they lost all the joys of time, as well as those sweet virtues of courtesy and charity that might best fit them for good works on earth and happiness in heaven. In the spring I went to Nebraska, and Miss Anthony and I again made a western tour, sometimes together and sometimes by different routes. A constitutional convention was in session in Lincoln, and it was proposed to submit an amendment to strike the word male from the Constitution. Nebraska became a state in March 1867 and took equality before the law as her motto. Her territorial legislature had discussed many times proposed liberal legislation for women, and her state legislature had twice considered propositions for women's enfranchisement. I had a valise with me containing Honorable Benjamin F. Butler's minority reports as a member of the Judiciary Committee of the United States House of Representatives in favor of women's right to vote under the 14th Amendment. As we were crossing the Platte River in transferring the baggage to the boat, my valise fell into the river. My heart stood still at the thought of such a fate for all those able arguments. After the great general had been in hot water all his life, it was grievous to think of any of his lucubrations perishing in cold water at last. Fortunately, they were rescued. On reaching Lincoln, I was escorted to the home of the governor, where I spread the documents in the sunshine, and they were soon ready to be distributed among the members of the Constitutional Convention. After I had addressed the convention, some of the members called on me to discuss the points of my speech. All the gentlemen were serious and respectful with one exception. A man with an unusually small head, diminutive form, and crooked legs tried, at my expense, to be witty and facetious. During a brief pause in the conversation, he brought his chair directly before me and said, in a mocking tone, Don't you think that the best thing a woman can do is perform well her part in the role of wife and mother? My wife has presented me with eight beautiful children. Is not this a better life work than that of exercising the right of suffrage? I had had my eye on this man during the whole interview and saw that the other members were annoyed at his behavior. I decided, when the opportune moment arrived, to give him an answer not soon to be forgotten, so I promptly replied to his question, as I slowly viewed him from head to foot. I have met few men in my life worth repeating eight times. The members burst into a roar of laughter, and one of them, clapping him on the shoulder, said, There, Sonny, you have read and spelled. You better go. This scene was heralded in all the Nebraska papers, and wherever the little man went, he was asked why Mrs. Stanton thought he was not worth repeating eight times. During my stay in Lincoln, there was a celebration of the opening of some railroad. An immense crowd from miles about assembled on this occasion. The collation was spread, and speeches were made in the open air. The men congratulated each other on the wonderful progress the state had made since it became an organized territory in 1854. There was not the slightest reference at first to the women. One speaker said, This state was settled by three brothers, John, James, and Joseph, 
and from them have sprung the great concourse of people that greet us here today. I turned and asked the governor if all these people had sprung, Minerva-like, from the brains of John, James, and Joseph. He urged me to put that question to the speaker, so in one of his eloquent pauses I propounded the query, which was greeted with loud and prolonged cheers, to the evident satisfaction of the women present. The next speaker took good care to give the due meed of praise to Anne, Jane, and Mary, and to every mention of the mothers of Nebraska, the crowd heartily responded. In toasting the women of Nebraska at the collation, I said, Here's to the mothers who came hither by long, tedious journeys, closely packed with restless children, in immigrant wagons, cooking the meals by day, and nursing the babies by night while the men slept. Leaving comfortable homes in the East, they endured all the hardships of pioneer life, suffered with the men the attacks of the Dakota Indians and the constant apprehension of savage raids, of prairie fires, and the devastating locust. Man's trials, his fears, his losses, all fell on woman with double force. Yet history is silent concerning the part woman performed in the frontier life of the early settlers. Men made no mention of her heroism and divine patience. They take no thought of the mental or physical agonies women endure in the perils of maternity, oft times without nurse or physician, in the supreme hour of their need, going, as every mother does, to the very gates of death in giving life to an immortal being. Traveling all over these western states in the early days, seeing the privations women suffered, and listening to the tales of sorrow at the fireside, I wondered that men could ever forget the debt of gratitude they owed to their mothers, or fail to commemorate their part in the growth of a great people. Yet the men of Nebraska have twice defeated the woman's suffrage amendment. In 1874, Michigan was the point of interest to all those who had taken part in the woman's suffrage movement. The legislature, by a very large majority, submitted to a vote of the electors an amendment of the Constitution in favor of striking out the word male and thus securing civil and political rights to the women of the state. It was a very active campaign. Crowded meetings were held in all the chief towns and cities. Professor Moses, Coit, Tyler, and a large number of ministers preached every Sunday on the subject of woman's position. The Methodist Conference passed a resolution in favor of the amendment by a unanimous vote. I was in the state during the intense heat of May and June, speaking every evening to large audiences, in the afternoon to women alone, and preaching every Sunday in some pulpit. The Methodist, Universalist, Unitarians and Quakers all threw open their churches to the apostles of the new gospel of equality for women. We spoke in jails, prisons, asylums, depots, and the open air. Wherever there were ears to hear, we lifted up our voices, and, on the wings of the wind, the glad tidings were carried to the remote corners of the state, and the votes of forty thousand men on election day in favor of the amendment were so many testimonials to the value of the educational work accomplished. I made many valuable acquaintances on that trip, with whom I've maintained lifelong friendships. One pleasant day I passed in the home of Governor Bagley and his wife, with a group of pretty children. I found the governor deeply interested in prison reform. He had been instrumental in passing a law giving prisoners lights in their cells and pleasant reading matter until nine o'clock. His ideas of what prisons should be, as unfolded that day, have since been fully realized in the grand experiment, now being successfully tried at Elmira, New York. I visited the state prison at Jackson and addressed 700 men and boys, ranging from 70 down to 17 years of age. Seating on the dais with the chaplain, I saw them file in to dinner, and while they were eating, I had the opportunity to study the sad, despairing faces before me. 
I shall never forget the hopeless expression of one young man who had just been sentenced for twenty years, nor how ashamed I felt that one of my own sex, trifling with two lovers, had fanned the jealousy of one against the other, until the tragedy ended in the death of one and almost lifelong imprisonment of the other. If girls should be truthful and transparent in any relations in life, surely it is in those of love involving the strongest passions of which human nature is capable. As the chaplain told me the sad story, and I noticed the prisoner's refined face and well-shaped head, I felt that the young man was not under the right influences to learn the lesson he needed. Fear, coercion, punishment are the masculine remedies for moral weakness, but statistics show their failure for centuries. Why not change the system and try the education of the moral and intellectual faculties, cheerful surroundings, inspiring influences? Everything in our present system tends to lower the physical vitality, the self-respect, the moral tone, and to harden instead of reforming the criminal. My heart was so heavy I did not know what to say to such an assembly of the miserable. I asked the chaplain what I should say. Just what you please, he replied. Thinking they had probably heard enough of their sins, their souls, and the plan of salvation, I thought I would give them the news of the day. So I told them about the woman's suffrage amendment, what I was doing in the state, my amusing encounters with opponents, their arguments, my answers. I told them of the great changes that would be effected in prison life when the mothers of the nation had a voice in the buildings and discipline. I told them what Governor Bagley said, and of the good time coming when prisons would no longer be places of punishment but schools of reformation. To show them what women would do to realize this beautiful dream, I told them of Elizabeth Fry and Dorothea L. Dix, of Mrs. Farnham's experiment at Sing Sing, and Louise Michel's in New Caledonia, and in closing I said, Now I want all of you who are in favor of the amendment to hold up your right hands. They gave a unanimous vote and laughed heartily when I said, I do wish you could all go to the polls in November, and that we could lock our opponents up here until after the election. I felt satisfied that they had had one happy hour, and that I had said nothing to hurt the feelings of the most unfortunate. As they filed off to their respective workshops, my faith and hope for brighter days went with them. Then I went all through the prison. Everything looked clean and comfortable on the surface, but I met a few days after a man, just set free, who had been there five years for forgery. He told me the true inwardness of the system, of the wretched, dreary life they suffered, and the brutality of the keepers. He said the prison was infested with mice and vermin, and that, during the five years he was there, he had never lain down one night to undisturbed slumber. The sufferings endured in summer, for want of air, he said, were indescribable. In this prison the cells were in the center of the building, the corridors running all around by the windows, so the prisoners had no outlook and no direct contact with the air. Hence, if a careless keeper forgot to keep open the windows after a storm, the poor prisoners panted for air in their cells, like fish out of water. My informant worked in the mattress department, over the room where prisoners were punished. He said he could hear the lash and the screams of the victims from morning till night. Hard as the work is all day, said he, it is a blessed relief to get out of our cells, to march across the yard, and get one glimpse of the heavens above, and one breath of pure air, and to be in contact with other human souls in the workshops. For although we could never speak to each other, yet there was a hidden current of sympathy, conveyed by look, that made us one in our misery. Though the press of the state was largely in our favor, yet there were some editors who, having no arguments, exercised the little wit they did possess in low ridicule, it was in this campaign that an editor in a Kalamazoo journal said, 
that ancient daughter of Methuselah, Susan B. Anthony, passed through our city yesterday on her way to the Plainwell meeting, with a bonnet on her head looking as if it had recently descended from Noah's Ark. Miss Anthony often referred to this description of herself and said, had I represented 20,000 voters in Michigan, that political editor would not have known nor cared whether I was the oldest or the youngest daughter of Methuselah, or whether my bonnet came from the Ark or from Worth's. End of chapter 18. Recording by Teresa Sheridan. Chapter 19 of 80 Years and More, Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 80 Years and More, Reminiscences, 1815 to 1897, by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 19, The Spirit of 76. The year 1876 was one of intense excitement and laborious activity throughout the country. The anticipation of the centennial birthday of the Republic, to be celebrated in Philadelphia, stirred the patriotism of the people to the highest point of enthusiasm. As each state was to be represented in the great exhibition, local pride added another element to the public interest. Then, too, everyone who could possibly afford the journey was busy making preparations to spend the Fourth of July the natal day of the Republic, mid the scenes where the Declaration of Independence was issued in 1776, the government inaugurated, and the first national councils were held. Those interested in women's political rights decided to make the Fourth a Woman's Day, and to celebrate the occasion in their various localities by delivering orations and reading their own Declaration of Rights, with dinners and picnics in the town halls or groves, as most convenient but many from every state in the Union made their arrangements to spend the historic period in Philadelphia. Owing also to the large numbers of foreigners who came over to join in the festivities, that city was crammed to its utmost capacity. With the crowd and excessive heat, comfort was everywhere sacrificed to curiosity. The enthusiasm throughout the country had given a fresh impulse to the Lyceum Bureaus. Like the ferry boats in New York Harbor, running hither and thither, crossing each other's tracks, the whole list of lecturers were on the wing, flying to every town and city from San Francisco to New York. As soon as a new railroad ran through a village of five hundred inhabitants that could boast a schoolhouse, a church, or a hotel, and one enterprising man or woman, a course of lectures was at once inaugurated as part of the winter's entertainments. On one occasion I was invited, by mistake, to a little town to lecture the same evening when the Christie minstrels were to perform. It was arranged, as the town had only one hall, that I should speak from seven to eight o'clock, and the minstrels should have the remainder of the time. One may readily see that, with the minstrels in anticipation, a lecture on any serious question would occupy but a small place in the hearts of the people in a town where they seldom had entertainments of any kind. All the time I was speaking there was a running to and fro behind the scenes where the minstrels were transforming themselves with paints and curly wigs into Africans and laughing at each other's jests. As it was a warm evening and the windows were open, the hilarity of the boys in the street added to the general din. Under such circumstances it was difficult to preserve my equilibrium. I felt like laughing at my own comical predicament and I decided to make my address a medley of anecdotes and stories, like a string of beads held together by a fine thread of argument and illustration. The moment the hand of the clock pointed at eight o'clock, the band struck up, thus announcing that the happy hour for the minstrels had come. Those of my audience who wished to stay were offered seats at half price. Those who did not slipped out and the crowd rushed in, soon packing the house to its utmost capacity. I stayed and enjoyed the performance of the minstrels more than I had my own. As the Lyceum season lasted from October to June, I was late in reaching Philadelphia. Miss Anthony and Mrs. Gage had already been through the agony of finding appropriate headquarters for the National Suffrage Association. I found them pleasantly situated on the lower floor of number 1431 Chestnut Street, 
with the work for the coming month clearly mapped out. As it was the year for nominating candidates for the presidency of the United States, the Republicans and Democrats were about to hold their great conventions. Hence letters were to be written to them recommending a woman suffrage plank in their platforms, and asking seats for women in the conventions, with the privilege of being heard in their own behalf. On these letters our united wisdom was concentrated, and twenty thousand copies of each were published. Then it was thought preeminently proper that a woman's declaration of rights should be issued. Days and nights were spent over that document. After many twists from our analytical tweezers, with a critical consideration of every word and sentence, it was at last, by a consensus of the competent, pronounced very good. Thousands were ordered to be printed, and were folded, put in envelopes, stamped, directed, and scattered. Miss Anthony, Mrs. Gage, and I worked sixteen hours, day and night, pressing every one who came in into the service, and late at night carrying immense bundles to be mailed, with meetings, receptions, and a succession of visitors, all of whom we plied with women's suffrage literature, we felt we had accomplished a great educational work. Among the most enjoyable experiences at our headquarters were the frequent visits of our beloved Lucretia Mott, who used to come from her country home bringing us eggs, cold chickens, and fine oolong tea. As she had presented us with a little black teapot that, like Mercury's mysterious pitcher of milk, filled itself for every coming guest, we often improvised luncheons with a few friends. At parting, Lucretia always made a contribution to our depleted treasury. Here we had many prolonged discussions as to the part we should take on the 4th of July in the public celebration. We thought it would be fitting for us to read our Declaration of Rights immediately after that of the Fathers was read, as our impeachment of them and their male descendants for their injustice and oppression. Ours contained as many counts, and quite as important as those against King George in 1776. Accordingly, we applied to the authorities to allow us seats on the platform and a place in the program of the public celebration, which was to be held in the historic Independence Hall. As General Hawley was in charge of the arrangements for the day, I wrote him as follows. 1431 Chestnut Street, July 1st, 1876. General Hawley. Honored Sir, as President of the National Women's Suffrage Association, I am authorized to ask you for tickets to the platform at Independence Hall for the celebration on the 4th of July. We should like to have seats for at least one representative woman from each state. We also ask your permission to read our Declaration of Rights immediately after the reading of the Declaration of Independence of the Fathers is finished. Although these are small favors to ask as representatives of one half of the nation, yet we shall be under great obligations to you if granted. Respectfully yours, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. To this I received the following reply. USCC Headquarters, July 2nd. Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Dear Madam, I send you with pleasure half a dozen cards of invitation. As the platform is already crowded, it is impossible to reserve the number of seats you desire, I regret to say it is also impossible for us to make any changes in the program at this late hour. We are crowded for time to carry out what is already proposed. Yours very respectfully, Joseph R. Hawley, President, USCC. With this rebuff, Mrs. Mott and I decided we would not accept the offered seats, but would be ready to open our own convention called for that day at the First Unitarian Church, where the Reverend William H. Furness had preached for fifty years. But some of our younger coadjutors decided that they would occupy the seats and present our Declaration of Rights. They said truly, women will be taxed to pay the expenses of this celebration, and we have as good a right to that platform and to the ears of the people as the men have, and we will be heard. That historic Fourth of July dawned at last, one of the most oppressive days of that heated season. Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Sarah Andrews Spencer, Lily Devereux Blake, and Phoebe W. Cousins made their way through the crowd under the broiling sun of Independence Square carrying the Woman's Declaration of Rights. This declaration had been handsomely engrossed by one of their number and signed by the oldest and most prominent advocates of women's enfranchisement. 
their tickets of admission proved an open sesame through the military barriers and a few moments before the opening of the ceremonies these women found themselves within the precincts from which most of their sex were excluded the declaration of seventeen seventy six was read by richard henry lee of virginia about whose family clusters so much historic fame the moment he finished reading was determined upon as the appropriate time for the presentation of the woman's declaration not quite sure how their approach might be met not quite certain if at this final moment they would be permitted to reach the presiding officer those ladies arose and made their way down the aisle the bustle of preparation for the brazilian hymn covered their advance the foreign guests and the military and civil officers who filled the space directly in front of the speaker's stand courteously made way while miss anthony in fitting words presented the declaration to the presiding officer senator ferry's face paled as bowing low with no word he received the declaration which thus became part of the day's proceedings the ladies turned scattering printed copies as they deliberately walked down the platform on every side eager hands were outstretched men stood on seats and asked for them while general hawley thus defied and beaten in his audacious denial to women of the right to present their declaration shouted order order passing out these ladies made their way to a platform erected for the musicians in front of independence hall here under the shadow of washington's statue back of them the old bell that proclaimed liberty to all the land and all the inhabitants thereof they took their places and to a listening applauding crowd miss anthony read the woman's declaration during the reading of the declaration mrs gage stood beside miss anthony and held an umbrella over her head to shelter her friend from the intense heat of the noonday sun and thus in the same hour on opposite sides of old independence hall did the men and women express their opinions on the great principles proclaimed on the natal day of the republic the declaration was handsomely framed and now hangs in the vice president's room in the capitol at washington these heroic ladies then hurried from independence hall to the church already crowded with an expectant audience to whom they gave a full report of the morning's proceedings the hutchinsons of world-wide fame were present in their happiest vein interspersing the speeches with appropriate songs and felicitous remarks for five long hours on that hot midsummer day a crowded audience many standing listened with profound interest and reluctantly dispersed at last all agreeing that it was one of the most impressive and enthusiastic meetings they had ever attended all through our civil war the slaves on the southern plantations had an abiding faith that the terrible conflict would result in freedom for their race just so through all the busy preparations of the centennial the women of the nation felt sure that the great national celebration could not pass without the concession of some new liberties to them hence they pressed their claims at every point at the fourth of july celebration in the exposition buildings and in the republican and democratic nominating conventions hoping to get a plank in the platforms of both the great political parties the women's pavilion upon the centennial grounds was an afterthought as theologians claim woman herself to have been the women of the country after having contributed nearly one hundred thousand dollars to the centennial stock found that there had been no provision made for the separate exhibition of their work the centennial board of which mrs gillespie was president then decided to raise funds for the erection of a separate building to be known as the woman's pavilion it covered an acre of ground and was erected at an expense of thirty thousand dollars a small sum in comparison with the money which had been raised by women and expended on the other buildings not to speak of the state and national appropriations which the taxes levied on them had largely helped to swell the pavilion was no true exhibit of women's art few women are as yet owners of the business which their industry largely makes remunerative cotton factories in which thousands of women work are owned by men the shoe business in some branches of which women are doing more than half the work is under the ownership of men rich embroideries from india rugs of downy softness from turkey the muslin of decca anciently known as the woven wind the pottery and majolica ware of p pipson's widow 
cartridges and envelopes of Uncle Sam, Waltham watches whose finest mechanical work is done by women, and ten thousand other industries found no place in the pavilion, said United States Commissioner Meeker of Colorado. Woman's work comprises three-fourths of the exposition. It is scattered through every building. Take it away, and there would be no exposition. But this pavilion rendered one good service to woman in showing her capabilities as an engineer. The boiler, which furnished the force for running its work, was under the charge of a young Canadian girl, Miss Allison, who from childhood had loved machinery, spending much time in the large saw and grist mills of her father, run by engines of two and three hundred horsepower, which she sometimes managed for amusement. When her name was proposed for running the pavilion machinery, it caused much opposition. It was said that the committee would some day find the pavilion blown to atoms, that the woman engineer would spend her time reading novels instead of watching the steam gauge, that the idea was impractical and should not be thought of. But Miss Allison soon proved her capabilities, and the falseness of these prophecies by taking her place in the engine room and managing its workings with perfect ease. Six power looms on which women wove carpets, webbing, silks, etc., were run by this engine. At a later period, the printing of The New Century for Woman, a paper published by the Centennial Commission in the Women's Building, was done by its means. Miss Allison declared the work to be more cleanly, more pleasant, and infinitely less fatiguing than cooking over a kitchen stove. Since I have been compelled to earn my own living, she said, I have never been engaged in work I like so well. Teaching school is much harder, and one is not paid so well. She expressed her confidence in her ability to manage the engines of an ocean steamer, and said that there were thousands of small engines in use in various parts of the country, and no reason existed why women should not be employed to manage them, following the profession of an engineer as a regular business, an engine requiring far less attention than is given by a nursemaid or a mother to a child. But to have made the woman's pavilion grandly historic, Upon its walls should have hung the yearly protest of Harriet K. Hunt against taxation without representation. The legal papers served upon the Smith sisters when, for their refusal to pay taxes while unrepresented, their Alderney cows were seized and sold. The papers issued by the city of Worcester for the forced sale of the house and lands of Abby Kelly Foster, the veteran abolitionist, because she refused to pay taxes, giving the same reason our ancestors gave when they resisted taxation. A model of Bunker Hill Monument, its foundation laid by Lafayette in 1825, but which remained unfinished nearly twenty years, until the famous German dancers, Fanny Elsler, gave the proceeds of a public performance for that purpose. With these should have been exhibited framed copies of all the laws bearing unjustly upon women, those which rob her of her name, her earnings, her property, her children, her person, also the legal papers in the case of Susan B. Anthony, who was tried and fined for claiming her right to vote under the Fourteenth Amendment, and the decision of Mr. Justice Miller in the case of Myra Bradwell denying national protection for women's civil rights, and the later decision of Chief Justice Waite of the United States Supreme Court against Virginia L. Minor, denying women national protection for their political rights, decisions in favor of states' rights which imperil the liberties not only of all women, but of every white man in the nation. Women's most fitting contributions to the Centennial Exposition would have been these protests, laws, and decisions, which show her political slavery. But all this was left for rooms outside of the Centennial grounds, upon Chestnut Street, where the National Women's Suffrage Association hoisted its flag, made its protests, and wrote the Declaration of Rights of the Women of the United States. To many thoughtful people it seemed captious and unreasonable for women to complain of injustice in this free land, amidst such universal rejoicings. When the majority of women are seemingly happy, it is natural to suppose that the discontent of the minority is the result of their unfortunate individual idiosyncrasies, and not of adverse influences in established conditions. But the history of the world shows that the vast majority, in every generation, passively accept the conditions into which they are born, 
while those who demanded larger liberties are ever a small ostracized minority whose claims are ridiculed and ignored from our standpoint we would honor any chinese woman who claimed the right to her feet and powers of locomotion the hindu widows who refused to ascend the funeral pyre of their husbands the turkish women who threw off their masks and veils and left the harem the mormon women who abjured their faith and demanded monogamic relations why not equally honor the intelligent minority of american women who protest against the artificial disabilities by which their freedom is limited and their development arrested that only a few under any circumstances protest against the injustice of long-established laws and customs does not disprove the fact of the oppressions while the satisfaction of the many if real only proves their apathy and deeper degradation that a majority of the women of the United States accept, without protest, the disabilities which grow out of their disenfranchisement is simply an evidence of their ignorance and cowardice, while the minority who demand a higher political status clearly prove their superior intelligence and wisdom. At the close of the 47th Congress we made two new demands. First, for a special committee to consider all questions in regard to the civil and political rights of women. We naturally asked the question, as Congress has a special committee on the rights of Indians, why not on those of women? Are not women, as a factor in civilization, of more importance than Indians? Secondly, we asked for a room, in the Capitol, where our committee could meet undisturbed whenever they saw fit. Though these points were debated a long time, our demands were acceded to the last. We now have our special committee and our room, with women's suffrage and gilt letters over the door. In our struggle to achieve this, while our champion, the senior senator from Massachusetts, stood up bravely in the discussion, the opposition not only ridiculed the special demand, but all attempts to secure the civil and political rights of women. As an example of the arguments of the opposition, I give what the senator from Missouri said, it is a fair specimen of all that was produced on that side of the debate. Mr. Vest's poetical flights are most inspiring. The Senate now has forty-one committees, with a small army of messengers and clerks, one half of whom, without exaggeration, are literally without employment. I shall not pretend to specify the committees of this body, which have not one single bill, resolution, or proposition, of any sort pending before them, and have not had for months but mr president out of all our committees without business and habitually without business in this body there is one that beyond any question could take jurisdiction of this matter and do it ample justice i refer to that most respectable and antique institution the committee on revolutionary claims for thirty years it has been without business for thirty long years the placid service of that parliamentary sea has been without one single ripple if the senator from massachusetts desires a tribunal for a calm judicial equilibrium and examination a tribunal far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife a tribunal eminently respectable dignified and unique why not send this question to the committee on revolutionary claims it is eminently proper that this subject should go to that committee, because if there is any revolutionary claim in this country, it is that of woman's suffrage. It revolutionizes society. It revolutionizes religion. It revolutionizes the constitutions and laws, and it revolutionizes the opinions of those so old-fashioned among us as to believe that the legitimate and proper sphere of woman is the family circle, as wife and mother and not as politician and voter, those of us who are proud to believe that women's noblest station is retreat, her fairest virtues fly from public sight, domestic worth that shuns too strong a light. Before that Committee on Revolutionary Claims, why not this most revolutionary of all claims receive immediate and ample attention? More than that, as I said before, if there is any tribunal that could give undivided time and dignified attention, is it not this committee? If there is one peaceful haven of rest, never disturbed by any profane bill or resolution of any sort, it is the Committee of Revolutionary Claims. It is, in parliamentary life, described by that ecstatic verse in Watts's hymn. 
there shall i bathe my wearied soul in seas of endless rest and not one wave of trouble roll across my peaceful breast by all natural laws stagnation breeds disease and death and what could stir up this most venerable and respectable institution more than an application of the strong-minded with short hair and shorter skirts invading its dignified realm and elucidating all the excellences of female suffrage moreover if these ladies could ever succeed in the providence of god in obtaining a report from that committee it would end this question for ever for the public at large and myself included in view of that miracle of female blandishment and female influence would surrender at once and female suffrage would become constitutional and lawful sir i insist upon it that in deference to this committee in deference to the fact that it needs this sort of regimen and medicine this whole subject should be so referred this gives a very fair idea of the character of the arguments produced by our opponents from the inauguration of the movement but as there are no arguments in a republican government in favor of an aristocracy of sex ridicule was really the only available weapon after declaring that no just government can be formed without the consent of the governed that taxation without representation is tyranny it is difficult to see on what basis one half the people are disfranchised end of chapter nineteen recording by rhonda fetterman chapter twenty of eighty years and more reminiscences eighteen fifteen to eighteen ninety seven this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Karen Cummins. Eighty Years and More Reminiscences 1815 to 1897 by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Chapter 20 Writing the History of Woman Suffrage. The four years following the centennial were busy, happy ones, of varied interest and employments, public and private, sons and daughters graduating from college, bringing troops of young friends to visit us, the usual matrimonial entanglements, with all their promises of celestial bliss, intertwined with earthly doubts and fears, weddings, voyages to Europe, business ventures, in this whirl of plans and projects, our heads, hearts, and hands were fully occupied. Seven boys and girls dancing round the fireside, buoyant with all life's joys opening before them, are enough to keep the most apathetic parents on the watchtowers by day and anxious even in dreamland by night. My spare time, if it can be said that I ever had any, was given during these days to social festivities. The inevitable dinners, teas, picnics, and dances with country neighbors all came round in quick succession. We lived at this time in Tenafly, New Jersey, not far from the publisher of The Sun, Isaac W. England, who also had seven boys and girls as full of frolic as our own. Mrs. England and I entered into all their games with equal zest. The youngest thought half the fun was to see our enthusiasm in Blind Man's Bluff, Fox and Geese, and Bean Bags. It thrills me with delight, even now, to see these games. Mr. England was the soul of hospitality. He was never more happy than when his house was crowded with guests and his larder with all the delicacies of the season. Though he and Mr. Stanton were both connected with that dignified journal, the New York Sun, yet they often joined in the general hilarity. I laugh as I write at the memory of all the frolics we had on the Blue Hills of Jersey. In addition to the domestic cares which a large family involved, Mrs. Gage, Miss Anthony, and I, were already busy collecting material for the history of woman suffrage. This required no end of correspondence. 
Then, my lecturing trips were still a part of the annual program. Washington conventions, too, with calls, appeals, resolutions, speeches, and hearings before the committees of Congress and state legislatures. All these came round in the year's proceedings as regularly as pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving, plum pudding for Christmas, and patriotism for Washington's birthday. Those who speak for glory or philanthropy are always in demand for college commencements and Fourth of July orations, hence much of Miss Anthony's eloquence, as well as my own, was utilized in this way. On October 18, 1880, I had an impromptu dinner party. Elizabeth Boynton Harbert, May Wright Thompson, now Sewell, Phoebe W. Cousins, and Arethusa Forbes, returning from a Boston convention, all by chance met under my roof. We had a very merry time talking over the incidents of the convention, Boston proprieties, and the general situation. As I gave them many early reminiscences, they asked if I had kept a diary. No, I said, not a pen scratch of the past have I except what might be gathered from many family letters. They urged me to begin a diary at once, so I promised I would on my coming birthday. My great grief that day was that we were putting in a new range and had made no preparations for dinner. This completely upset the presiding genius of my culinary department, as she could not give us the bounteous feast she knew was expected on such occasions. I, as usual, when there was any lack in the viands, tried to be as brilliant as possible in conversation, discussing nirvana, karma, reincarnation, and thus turning attention from the evanescent things of earth to the joys of a life to come. Not an easy feat to perform with strong-minded women, but in parting, they seemed happy and refreshed, and all promised to come again. But we shall never meet there again, as the old familiar oaks and the majestic chestnut trees have passed into other hands. Strange lovers now whispered their vows of faith and trust under the tree where a most charming wedding ceremony, that of my daughter Margaret, was solemnized one bright October day. All nature seemed to do her utmost to heighten the beauty of the occasion. The verdure was brilliant with autumnal tints. The hazy noonday sun lent a peculiar softness to every shadow. Even the birds and insects were hushed to silence. As the wedding march rose soft and clear, two stately ushers led the way. Then a group of Vassar classmates, gaily decked in silks of different colors, followed by the bride and groom. An immense St. Bernard dog, on his own account, brought up the rear, keeping time with measured tread. He took his seat in full view, watching, alternately, the officiating clergyman, the bride and groom, and guessed, as if to say, What does all this mean? No one behaved with more propriety, and no one looked more radiant than he with a ray of sunlight on his beautiful coat of long hair, his bright brass collar, and his wonderful head. Bruno did not live to see the old home broken up, but sleeps peacefully there under the chestnut trees and fills a large place in many of our pleasant memories. On November 12, 1880, I was 65 years old, and pursuant to my promise, I then began my diary. It was a bright, sunny day, but the Frost King was at work. All my grand old trees that stood like sentinels to mark the boundary of my domain were stripped of their foliage, and their brilliant colors had faded into a uniform brown. But the evergreens and the tall prim cedars held their own, and when covered with snow, their exquisite beauty brought tears to my eyes. One need never be lonely mid beautiful trees. My thoughts were with my absent children, Harriet in France, Theodore in Germany, 
Margaret with her husband and brother Garrett, halfway across the continent, and Bob still in college. I spent the day writing letters and walking up and down the piazza, and enjoyed, from my windows, a glorious sunset. Alone, on birthdays or holidays, one is very apt to indulge in sad retrospections. The thought of how much more I might have done for the perfect development of my children than I had accomplished depressed me. I thought of all the blunders in my own life and in their education. Little has been said of the responsibilities of parental life. Accordingly, little or nothing has been done. I had such visions of parental duties that day that I came to the conclusion that parents never could pay the debt they owe their children for bringing them into this world of suffering unless they can ensure them sound minds and sound bodies and enough of the good things of this life to enable them to live without a continual struggle for the necessaries of existence. I have no sympathy with the old idea that children owe parents a debt of gratitude for the simple fact of existence, generally conferred without thought and merely for their own pleasure. How seldom we hear of any high or holy preparation for the office of parenthood. Here, in the most momentous act of life, all is left to chance. Men and women, intelligent and prudent in all other directions, seem to exercise no forethought here, but hand down their individual and family idiosyncrasies in the most reckless manner. On November 13th, the New York Tribune announced the death of Lucretia Mott, 88 years old. Having known her in the flush of life, when all her faculties were at their zenith, and in the repose of age, when her powers began to wane, her withdrawal from among us seemed as beautiful and natural as the changing foliage, from summer to autumn, of some grand old oak I have watched and loved. The arrival of Miss Anthony and Mrs. Gage on November 20th banished all family matters from my mind. What planning, now, for volumes, chapters, footnotes, margins, appendices, paper, and type, of engravings, title, preface, and introduction. I had never thought that the publication of a book required the consideration of such endless details. We stood appalled before the mass of material, growing higher and higher with every mail, and the thought of all the reading involved made us feel as if our life work lay before us. Six weeks of steady labor all day, and often until midnight, made no visible decrease in the pile of documents. However, before the end of the month, we had our arrangements all made with publishers and engravers, and six chapters in print. When we began to correct proof, we felt as if something was accomplished. Thus, we worked through the winter and far into the spring with no change except the Washington Convention and an occasional evening meeting in New York City. We had frequent visits from friends whom we were glad to see. Hither came Edward M. Davis, Sarah Pugh, Adeline Thompson, Frederick Cabot of Boston, Dr. William F. Channing, and sweet little Clara Spence, who recited for us some of the most beautiful selections in her repertoire. In addition, we had numberless letters from friends and foes, some praising and some condemning our proposed undertaking. And though much alone, we were kept in touch with the outside world. But so conflicting was the tone of the letters that if we had not taken a very fair gauge of ourselves and our advisors, we should have abandoned our project and buried all the valuable material collected to sleep in pine boxes forever. At this time, I received a very amusing letter from the Reverend Robert Collier on literary righteousness. 
quizzing me for using one of his anecdotes in my sketch of Lucretia Mott without giving him credit. I laughed him to scorn that he should have thought it was my duty to have done so. I told him plainly that he belonged to a class of white male citizens who had robbed me of all civil and political rights, of property, children, and personal freedom. And now it ill became him to call me to account for using one of his little anecdotes that, ten to one, he had cribbed from some woman. I told him that I considered his whole class as fair game for literary pilfering, that women had been taxed to build colleges to educate men, and if we could pick up a literary crumb that had fallen from their feast, we surely had a right to it. Moreover, I told him that man's duty in the world was to work, to dig, and to delve for jewels, real and ideal, and lay them at woman's feet for her to use as she might see fit, that he should feel highly complimented instead of complaining that he had written something I thought worth using. He answered like the nobleman he is, susceptible of taking in a new idea. He admitted that, in view of the shortcomings of his entire sex, he had not one word to say in the way of accusation, but lay prostrate at my feet in sackcloth and ashes, wondering that he had not taken my view of the case in starting. Only twice in my life have I been accused of quoting without giving due credit. The other case was that of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. I had, on two or three occasions, used a motto of hers in autograph books, just as I had sentiments from Longfellow, Lowell, Shakespeare, Moses, or Paul. In long lyceum trips, innumerable autograph books met one at every turn, in the cars, depots, on the platform, at the hotel, and in the omnibus. A sentiment, please cry half a dozen voices. One writes hastily different sentiments for each. In this way, I unfortunately used a pet sentiment of Matilda's. So here and now, I say to my autograph admirers, from New York to San Francisco, wherever you see, there is a word sweeter than mother, home, or heaven. That word is liberty. Remember, it belongs to Matilda Jocelyn Gage. I hope now that Robert and Matilda will say in their posthumous works that I made the amende honorable, as I always strive to do when friends feel they have not been fairly treated. In May 1881, the first volume of our history appeared. It was an octavo containing 871 pages with good paper, good print, handsome engravings, and nicely bound. I welcomed it with the same feeling of love and tenderness as I did my firstborn. I took the same pleasure in hearing it praised and felt the same mortification in hearing it criticized. The most hearty welcome it received was from Reverend William Henry Channing. He wrote us that it was as interesting and fascinating as a novel. He gave it a most flattering notice in one of the London papers. John W. Forney, too, wrote a good review and sent a friendly letter. Mayo W. Hazeltine, one of the ablest critics in this country, in the New York Sun, also gave it a very careful and complimentary review. In fact, we received far more praise and less blame than we anticipated. We began the second volume in June. In reading over the material concerning women's work in the war, I felt how little our labors are appreciated. Who can sum up all the ills the women of a nation suffer from war? They have all of the misery and none of the glory, nothing to mitigate their weary waiting and watching for the loved ones who will return no more. In the spring of 1881, to vary the monotony of the work on the history, we decided to hold a series of conventions through the New England states. We began during the anniversary week in Boston, 
and had several crowded, enthusiastic meetings in Tremont Temple. In addition to our suffrage meetings, I spoke before the Free Religious, Moral Education, and Heredity Associations. All our speakers stayed at the Parker House, and we had a very pleasant time visiting together in our leisure hours. We were received by Governor Long at the State House. He made a short speech in favor of woman suffrage in reply to Mrs. Hooker. We also called on the mayor at the City Hall and went through Jordan and Marsh's great mercantile establishment, where the clerks are chiefly young girls who are well fed and housed and have pleasant rooms with a good library where they sit and read in the evening. We went through the Sherburne Reformatory Prison for Women, managed entirely by women. We found it clean and comfortable, more like a pleasant home than a place of punishment. Mrs. Robinson, Miss Anthony, and I were invited to dine with the Bird Club. No woman, other than I, had ever had that honor before. I dined with them in 1870, escorted by Warrington of the Springfield Republican and Edwin Morton. There I met Frank Sanborn for the first time. Frank Bird held about the same place in political life in Massachusetts that Thurlow Weed did in the state of New York for 40 years. In the evening, we had a crowded reception at the home of Mrs. Finno Tudor, who occupied a fine old residence facing the common, where we met a large gathering of Boston reformers. On Decoration Day, May 30th, we went to Providence, where I was the guest of Dr. William F. Channing. We had a very successful convention there. Senator Anthony and ex-Governor Sprague were in the audience and expressed great pleasure, afterward, in all they had heard. I preached in Reverend Frederick Hinckley's church the previous Sunday afternoon. From Providence, I hurried home to meet my son Theodore and his bride, who had just landed from France. We decorated our house and grounds with Chinese lanterns and national flags for their reception. As we had not time to send to New York for bunting, our flags, French and American, were all made of bright red and blue cambric. The effect was fine when they arrived, but unfortunately, there came up a heavy thunderstorm in the night and so drenched our beautiful flags that they became colorless rags. My little maid announced to me early in the morning that the French and Americans had had a great battle during the night and that the piazza was covered with blood. This was startling news to one just awakening from a sound sleep. Why, Emma, I said, what do you mean? Why, she replied, the rain has washed all the color out of our flags and the piazza is covered with red and blue streams of water. As the morning sun appeared in all its glory, chasing the dark clouds away, our decorations did indeed look pale and limp and were promptly removed. I was happily surprised with my tall, stately daughter, Marguerite Berry, a fine-looking girl of 20, straight, strong, and sound, modest and pleasing. She can walk miles, sketches from nature with great skill and rapidity, and speaks three languages. I had always said to my sons, when you marry, choose a woman with a spine and sound teeth. Remember, the teeth show the condition of the bones in the rest of the body. So when Theodore introduced his wife to me, he said, You see, I have followed your advice. Her spine is as straight as it should be, and every tooth in her head is as sound as ivory. This reminds me of a young man who used to put my stoves up for the winter. He told me one day that he thought of getting married. Well, I said, above all things, get a wife with a spine and sound teeth. Stovepipe in hand, he turned to me with a look of surprise and said, Did they ever come without spines? In July 1881, sitting under the trees, Miss Anthony and I read and discussed Wendell Phillips' magnificent speech before the Phi Beta Kappa Society 
at Harvard College. This society had often talked of inviting him, but was afraid of his radical utterances. At last, hoping that years might have modified his opinions and somewhat softened his speech, an invitation was given. The elite of Boston, the presidents and college professors from far and near, were there. A great audience of the wise, the learned, the distinguished in state and church assembled. Such a conservative audience, it was supposed, would surely hold this radical in check. Alas, they were all doomed for once to hear the naked truth on every vital question of the day. Thinking this might be his only opportunity to rouse some liberal thought in conservative minds, he struck the keynote of every reform, defended labor strikes, the nihilist of Russia, prohibition, woman suffrage, and demanded reformation in our prisons, courts of justice, and halls of legislation. On the woman question, he said, Social science affirms that woman's place in society marks the level of civilization. From its twilight in Greece, through the Italian worship of the Virgin, the dreams of chivalry, the justice of the civil law, and the equality of French society, we trace her gradual recognition, while our common law, as Lord Brougham confessed, was, with relation to women, the opprobrium of the age of Christianity. For forty years, earnest men and women, working noiselessly, have washed away the opprobrium. The statute books of thirty states have been remodeled, and woman stands today almost face to face with her last claim, the ballot. It has been a weary and thankless, though successful, struggle. But if there be any refuge from that ghastly curse, the vice of great cities, before which social science stands palsied and dumb, it is in this more equal recognition of women. If, in this critical battle for universal suffrage, our Father's noblest legacy to us and the greatest trust God leaves in our hands, there be any weapon which, once taken from the armory, will make victory certain. It will be as it has been in art, literature, and society, summoning woman into the political arena. The literary class, until within half a dozen years, has taken no note of this great uprising, only to fling every obstacle in its way. The first glimpse we get of Saxon blood in history is that line of Tacitus in his Germany, which reads, In all grave matters they consult their women. Years hence, when robust Saxon sense has flung away Jewish superstition and Eastern prejudice, and put under its foot fastidious scholarship and squeamish fashion, some second Tacitus from the valley of the Mississippi will answer to him of the seven hills, In all grave questions we consult our women. If the Alps, piled in cold and silence, be the emblem of despotism, we joyfully take the ever-restless ocean for ours, only pure because never still. To be as good as our fathers, we must be better. They silenced their fears and subdued their prejudices, inaugurating free speech and equality with no precedent on the file. Let us rise to their level. Crush appetite and prohibit temptation if it rots great cities. Entrench labor in sufficient bulwarks against that wealth which, without the tenfold strength of modern incorporations, wrecked the Grecian and Roman states. And with a sterner effort still, summon woman into civil life as reinforcement to our laboring ranks in the effort to make our civilization a success. Sit not like the figure on our silver coin 
looking ever backward. New occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth. They must upward still and onward. Who would keep abreast of truth? Lo, before us gleam her watch fires. We ourselves must pilgrims be. Launch our Mayflower and steer boldly through the desperate winter sea, nor attempt the future's portal with the past's blood-rusted key. That Harvard speech, in the face of fashion, bigotry, and conservatism, so liberal, so eloquent, so brave, is a model for every young man who, like the orator, would devote his talents to the best interest of the race rather than to his personal ambition for mere worldly success. Toward the end of October, Miss Anthony returned after a rest of two months, and we commenced work again on the second volume of the history. November 2nd being Election Day, the Republican carriage, decorated with flags and evergreens, came to the door for voters. As I owned the house and paid the taxes, and as none of the white males was home, I suggested that I might go down and do the voting, whereupon the gentleman who represented the Republican committee urged me, most cordially, to do so. Accompanied by my faithful friend Miss Anthony, we stepped into the carriage and went to the poll, held in the hotel where I usually went to pay taxes. When we entered the room, it was crowded with men. I was introduced to the inspectors by Charles Everett, one of our leading citizens, who said, Mrs. Stanton is here, gentlemen, for the purpose of voting. As she is a taxpayer of sound mind and of legal age, I see no reason why she should not exercise this right of citizenship. The inspectors were thunderstruck. I think they were afraid that I was about to capture the ballot box. One placed his arms round it, with one hand close over the aperture where the ballots were slipped in, and said, with mingled surprise and pity, Oh no, madam, men only are allowed to vote. I then explained to him that, in accordance with the Constitution of New Jersey, women had voted in New Jersey down to 1801, when they were forbidden the further exercise of the right by an arbitrary act of the legislature, and by a recent amendment to the National Constitution, Congress had declared that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside and are entitled to vote. I told them that I wished to cast my vote as a citizen of the United States, for the candidates for United States offices. Two of the inspectors sat down and pulled their hats over their eyes, whether from shame or ignorance, I do not know. The other held on to the box and said, I know nothing about the constitutions, state or national. I never read either, but I do know that in New Jersey, women have not voted in my day, and I cannot accept your ballot. So I laid my ballot in his hand, saying that I had the same right to vote that any man present had, and on him must rest the responsibility of denying me my rights of citizenship. All through the winter, Miss Anthony and I worked diligently on the history. My daughter Harriet came from Europe in February, determined that I should return with her, as she had not finished her studies. To expedite my task on the history, she seized the laboring oar, prepared the last chapter, and corrected the proof as opportunity offered. As the children were scattered to the four points of the compass, and my husband spent the winter in the city, we decided to lease our house and all take a holiday. We spent a month in New York City, busy on the history to the last hour with occasional intervals of receiving and visiting friends. As I dreaded the voyage, the days flew by too fast for my pleasure. 
End of chapter 20. This recording by Karen Cummins. I invite you to visit my website at karencummins.com.